The story begins with a boy wondering how long he was blacked out. He thinks about his first day at university tomorrow and that he can't be late for it. He remembers that some boy took him to this clearing and knocked him out. One of the boys exclaims he is really unlucky to have been a classmate with trash like him in high school, but he doesn't think it will be the same in university either. His name is Ling Si, and the boy calls him quite tough for an orphan, and says he is still not dead even after being beaten up by him for three years in high school. That boy is called Huey Gu, and he is Ling Si's high school classmate, but instead of calling him a classmate, calling him a bully would be more accurate. Huey Gu says he has seen his avatar in the game, and that is quite cool and says this is because he is too ugly in real life, so he wanted to make himself look better in the game. Suddenly, he again comes forward and punches his stomach, and Ling Si thinks he has been picking on him ever since he accidentally bumped into him during his freshman year in high school. He even apologized to him, but it was futile, and it is indeed useless to apologize to someone like him. Huey Gone is awakened, which signifies the second evolution of humans in this era. Under the influence of the game Heavenland, the earlier a player reaches maximum level, the more likely they will experience the actualization of their in-game character's class. Through this, they can obtain the skills of their character's class in real life, called the second evolution. For the awakened, the younger or the stronger they are, the more valuable they are to their country. They will receive high-level treatment and education unobtainable by the ordinary people and become elites of the elites. Huey Gu then calls him dirty and says he has the blood of trash all over his hand. His friend calls him and says if he keeps hitting him, then he might die, while he counter-questions him if he is pitying this piece of trash. He replies that he is just scared that if he dies, it will be troublesome for brother Huey Gu, but he says he won't be affected by the death of human garbage like him in this society. Ling Si stares at him, but he again hits him saying this is what he hates the most about him. He activates his skill, Rippling War Cry, and its effect is the powerful roar of a warrior, which intimidates and damages the target's body and mind. He calls him a piece of trash and asks why he has such unwavering eyes. He again hits him, and Ling Si thinks if only his awakening chances were higher, and if only he were also awakened, everything would change. After some time, they decide to leave because it's too late. Huey Gu says he feels like his arms and legs haven't even warmed up, so he will do it well next time. His friend suggests that he untie him, but he doesn't listen and says if he keeps insisting, he will hang him up there too. Ling Si thinks it would be great if he could start over from the beginning. He somehow unties himself and reaches home. After taking a bath, he sees his game lying on the table. He puts on the game helmet and then lays on the bed. Inside the game, Heavenland, the main city of Kasfa, his game ID is Ling Si, and his real name is also Ling Si, and he is a level 120 maximum level thief. He considers himself talented in gaming, but it's a shame that he started an entire year later than other players. There are a lot of areas where he is falling behind compared to veteran players. It took him a lot of effort to get that dark gold parody dagger yesterday, but his ranking on the Thief's global combat power leaderboard only went lower. Some more people got ridiculously lucky and came across top-tier equipment in an unexplored cave or were boosted by a high ranker. He is currently ranked 3.96, and in years 2061 to 62, he maxed out his level in just one year and went from unranked to entering the top 100,000 of the Thief class global leaderboard. He thinks it would be considered a pretty impressive feat if it was someone else, and the first page of the Thief class CP leaderboard contains the top 100 thieves in the world, and they all all godline beings. However, he thinks he won't be able to get into the top 100 of the Thief's leaderboard anymore, he then leaves thinking he let alone the class CP leaderboard, and if he was given just one more chance, maybe he can become an awakened as well. On the other side, there is a group waiting for him. And the boy guard says to his miss that there is no need for her to get strangers to help them for this kind of mission and they can get the family's guild to help. She says there is no need for that and if he hadn't discovered her, then she would have already been teaming up with other players. She explains that she doesn't want to use the family relations. Besides, she has already listened to his suggestion and hired players instead of partying up. The man says he is the bodyguard and it's his responsibility for her safety and there are a lot of scammers and people with bad intentions in Heavenland. She exclaims she is not a child and can differentiate these things perfectly fine, 
and he has spent quite a lot of money hiring those three people back there. In the meantime, Ling Si appears there and introduces himself as a level 120 shadow thief. The bodyguard says there is no need for an introduction, and he has already looked through his information and is only there to fill in the numbers, so he just makes sure not to hinder them. Ling Si thinks he doesn't like to chat that much with people in real life, but in this game, he wonders why so many people run their mouths like Hugu. Another player comes to him and says he heard Ling Si is not a member of any guild nor a part of the all-class alliance, and he replies that he is a solo player. It is stated that the so-called all-class alliance is where the most skilled players gather, an organization that completes missions or requests for players in exchange for money. Ling Si's skill level has been high enough to qualify for the alliance for a long time. However, he can't afford the high testing fee and needs to withdraw and use his in-game currency for living expenses. A player exclaims the last thing he wanted was a solo player like him taking on the job, and he has no qualifications, no guarantees, and no one knows if he just came there to be carried. Ling Si shows him some attitude, and he doesn't like it when the girl asks them to calm down and stop fighting. Since everyone is present, they should start the mission. She worries that the mission has not started yet, and they are already not getting along well. The bodyguard asks her not to worry because he is there to help her. However, the party is formed, so they go inside the teleporter. They ask Ling Si to go first, and all the other members follow him, but they are shocked to see the energy wave of the teleporter acting so strangely. They wonder what is happening there because something like this has never happened before, and if it is a system error. This all happened just after Ling Si entered the teleporter. Conversely, Ling Si finds himself in a mysterious place and thinks he should be teleported to the mission's map. The energy wave is so chaotic there, but he feels like his body is breaking apart, and he thinks he can't leave this game and wonders if it is malfunctioning. Suddenly, his body starts tearing up, and he thinks he is unlucky to encounter a bug like that. He is about to disappear, and instead of being scared, he feels so calm. As far as his body is splitting up, he feels liberated, and he feels his heart so weary and thinks it would be nice if it also makes him disappear in real life. He thinks he has nothing he wants to hold on to in his life anymore, although he has a lot of regrets. On the other side, all the group members wonder why the thief hasn't arrived yet. He checks for his accounts, but is shocked that they are all disappearing. After some time, Ling Si wakes up and wonders where he is. He feels his hands so long. He feels something very strange. After a while, he sees himself in the mirror and is shocked to see his game avatar in real life. He wonders if he is still in the game. An old man is standing beside him, and Ling Si realizes he is in the real world. The old man asks if he is scared of him and says he doesn't remember him. He reveals that he found him when he was picking up trash. Ling Si asks him where that place is from where he was picking up the trash. The old man puts some soup in the bowl and asks him to take it. He says he has been out cold for a whole day and must be hungry. Suddenly, he hears a voice on the radio that the new game, Heavenland, which several countries co-produced, has been released for three months. Since the beginning of its launch, Heavenland has attracted countless users, and its player count has reached unprecedented heights in history. It is revealed that this is year 2060, and Ling Si is shocked because it was three years ago. He asks the old man what year it is and replies that it is 2060. He is shocked that he traveled back three years ago, but then gets happy, wondering if the heavens heard his prayers. He really was given a chance to start over, and the old man asks if he is alright, and he replies that he is fine. He now has the chance to enter the top 100 global leaderboard and become one of the godlike players, becoming the strongest awakened, creating his own guild. After that, he eats the food speedily to his fill, while the old man asks him to eat slowly because there is more food in the pot. He tells him that he realized his stomach was so hungry when he woke up, and the old man said he would bring a little more for him. He asks him if he is alone and where his parents are, and Ling Si becomes sad at his question. He thinks in the past, ever since he has known, he seems to have always been alone. He doesn't know where his parents are and always sees other students talking to their parents and demanding things from them. He now tells the old man that he is alone and replies that he doesn't even know where this is and just came there. He finds out from the environment there that the area is the city's slum. The old man says it is heaven for people who can't survive in the city. 
To put it bluntly, it is a place where the poor people gather together. Ling Si thinks he knows how it feels in his past life because he relied on school scholarships and savings from part-time jobs. He rented a cheap dormitory nearby but didn't go deep there. The old man says he spent all his savings a while ago to get the game helmet. He doesn't have enough to eat, so he has to buy it. His silly son died and told him about a new game called Tianyang Mainland. He said if he could become the awakened one, then he would be able to make him happy. He was confident that he could make a name in this game. His son wanted to take him out of there, but their reality couldn't be changed just because of a game. Ling Si says it is possible if he can become an awakened one, then it can really change lives. He exclaims that his son didn't lie to him, and the game is not an exaggeration to say that it is the second world in the future. The old man remembers when his son told him that he would make him happy. He says when he talks about the seriousness of the game, it reminds him of his son's appearance. He says he still looks like a school student and allows him to stay there if he doesn't have any place to go. After a while, he says he has something for him, and his son is no longer there, so it's useless to keep it. He gives him the first-generation gaming helmet and says his son doesn't want this thing that holds his dream to discard accumulated ash. He asks Ling Si to keep his son's dream going, and he promises him to achieve his son's dream, but also surpass his dream. He grabs the helmet and thinks everything from now on will begin. He grabs the helmet, the system asks him to create his character, and he sets his character, Ling Si. He chooses the human race, which makes him most comfortable. He receives a race notification that each level increases wisdom and perception by an additional one point. He thinks he has never been too fond of the elves' years, and they are self-proclaimed noblest race. They have a fine and delicate appearance, an agile body with long shooting and short weapons, and an additional three points of agility and three points of charisma. Each level upgrade gives an additional one point of agility and charisma. The second race is Beast, and it is a warrior known for their strength and their explosive power, their strong bodies are able to withstand more powerful attacks, three extra points of strength and three extra points of defense. Each level increases strength and defense by an additional one point. He wonders which race he should choose, although the bonuses of different races will have a certain impact on the choice of profession. There are also five major professions, warrior, mage archer, thief, cleric, and he has to choose from them. In the case of thieves, there are three types, and the general choice is the human race, shadow thief, who specializes in assassination and sneaking. If he chooses the elves, they are spiritual speed thief, who specialize in speed and dexterity, and if he chooses the orcs, they are the strong assault thieves who specialize in strong attacks and head-on confrontation. Naturally, it's still a human, and he was a shadow thief in his previous life, and the experience of the last life is not to be wasted. So, he has selected a male human race, a professional thief, and has acquired the basic active skill of backstabbing. He now has 12 attribute points, and he receives a system notification asking him if he wants to distribute them. In the previous life, the basic 12 attribute points of the first level were relatively balanced according to the recommended points. In this life, he is going to go with full point agility and make plans for the next level. He receives a system notification that his attribute assignment is complete, and he has been equipped with the Human Thief default costume, and with this, the system starts its countdown. He enters the game Tianyang Mankind, the main city of Casvador, and he receives a system notification welcoming him into the game. He thinks in his last life, he came into the game a year late, but this time, he will take the lead. But he is shocked to see so many people there who want to take this novice quest. He is shocked that only three months have passed after opening the service, yet there are so many people already there. He thinks he must hurry and make plans and is shocked to see that the highest level now is the Immovable Dark Pattern, and he thinks he is number one this time again. Immovable Dark Trace is a player who keeps his personal information hidden, and no one knows his details, and he doesn't have to join any guild. He is also the strongest person that all guilds compete to invite, and he is also known as Human Emperor, one of the strongest players in the Tianyang mainland. In the last life, he was always at the top of the list, and indeed, a master is still a master at all times. When he looks at it this way, it looks like the experts of the last life are basically at the top of the list, and only a few legendary guilds in the last life can be seen. He thinks in this life, he is going to go through what he learned in his last life to become an invincible existence. 
He then gets a fabulous outfit with devastating speed and enters the map to upgrade himself. After some time, he enters a village and thinks he has come to this village many times in his last life, but every time he goes there, he is surprised by the popularity of that place. This is a novice village in the main city of Casfedor, and he sees there many people discussing their mission. A man calls all the novices at level 1 and says they all have initial copper and silver coins, and in return he has weapons and kits that can be equipped at level 1 there. He exclaims that his pieces of equipment are better than their first level default equipment and asks them to upgrade themselves, and if they don't come there, it will be out of stock. The people rush toward him and ask if he has any soldier's armor and many more things. In his previous life, Ling Si thinks he also spent dozens of copper coins to buy a thief level 1 dagger, which has two more attacks than the default dagger for novices. This kind of equipment can be displayed on the level 3 map and this kind of businessman only does novice business and gives up on upgrading. After level 3, they get eliminated, and upgrading in the early stage is relatively easy. A novice village is a place where they can no longer enter once the level is greater than level 5, unless there is a special mission. He thinks it's more practical to grasp the training. In the meantime, an elf girl appears there and asks a player to take her with him, and she asks him to add her if he has space. Ling Si thinks players of levels 3 and 4 are particularly popular there and the man asks them to give them 3 sliven coins to take them to level 3. The highest level at Novice Village, level 5, is even more like a big boss and it is revealed that in Tianyang Mainland they can form a group at level 1 and the level difference within the team can't exceed level 2. So it's common for newcomers to group with advanced players to brush up on their skills. The level 1 player can group up players to the highest level of level 3, and the maximum number of group members is determined according to the captain level. However, the main reason groups of advanced players are leading the way is that there are too many tasks for novices. After a while, he finds a queue for a level 1 monster to be killed. There is no fixed main line, countless tasks are carried out according to personal ability, and the most important thing is the player's exploration and development. It's not hard to upgrade in the early stages, and the hard part is not being able to grab the monsters, that's why upgrading is slow. However, Ling Si thinks he has the fastest way to reach level 5. Soon, he reached the novice shop in the shopping street and saw some people talking about some NPC. He calls a boy and asks him what a level 1 player is doing there. A girl asks him what he needs, and he asks her for one primary acceleration scroll and a single-use grappling hook. The other players make him fun, and one of them asks if he thinks he can harvest by playing with a thief and buying an acceleration scroll. They make fun while the girl gives him his required thing, and it is stated that its effect is to increase his movement speed by 12% for 9 seconds. The other equipment is a single-use grappling hook, and its effect is the hooking claws catch protrusions and enable re-displacement with a length of 3 meters. She demands 90 coppers for these items, and he gives the amount and leaves the shop while the others are trying to talk to him, but he doesn't listen to them. He then turns back and asks how long it took to get to their current level, and one of them says it took him 15 days to reach level 3, and the other reaches level 3 in 13 days. Ling Si leaves them, saying he guesses they will still be in the novice village for a day or two as well. They ask him what he meant by this, but he exclaims they will see it in a day and will understand. After some time, he reaches his desired place, and the place is called the Main City Mountains Range of Casfedor Sunset Peak. The Sunset Peak is located in the northeast of the main city of Casfedor, and it is the magnificent mountain known as the Sunset Peak because its summit rises up into the clouds and appears to be so far above the sky that even the sun avoids it. As expected, fewer people are there because there are fewer quest points in the early stages. As a result, there are fewer people and fewer bee talking people, and he can comfortably upgrade there. He listens to some people talking that it seems like the quest is automatically triggered by going over and striking up a conversation, and the other says the NPC is called Sunset Old Man. They have to reach the summit in 10 minutes and wonder how they will do it. According to them, the task can't be obtained even in 20 minutes. An elf reveals that the first half is fine, and there are roads, and halfway up the main mountain, there is a fault, so they must go to the other side of the mountain to continue up. It takes at least six minutes to get around, and there are no roads, so it's even harder to get there. The girl exclaims she also jumped there once, 
thinking that there would be some hidden platform, and as a result, he directly fell to death and lost her experience point, and she cried to death. The boys there try to console her, while Ling Si ignores them and continues his mission. He says the hint that the quest pickup point should be this way is correct, and he hears a man asking if anyone wants to see the view from the top. He finds his desired old man called the Sunset Old Man, and he goes to him and pays his respect. He asks Ling Si if he wants to see the view from the top, and he agrees and says he is there to enjoy the view from the top of the mountain. The others are surprised that the level 1 thief is taking on a quest and think he has gone mad. One of them makes him fun, saying he didn't hear someone say that there was a special quest there, and the players are all over the place, not even weighing up their level and strength. The girl says this is clearly the kind of task that can only be done at a high level, and if they waste this kind of time, they might as well go and upgrade themselves. They are confident that he won't be able to do anything and decide to stay there to have a look at his mission failed. Ling Si receives a system notification asking if he wishes to accept the Ascend to the Peak quest. He has 12 points in the early stages, all in agility, just for this task, and he is trying to maximize his agility and speed bonuses. Ling Si thinks this is a special task that he has tried numerous times in his previous life, but unfortunately, he gave up in the end. If he succeeds this time, he will get a special set of equipment, which will be the first step to his success. He accepts the quest and tells the old man that he will see him at the top of the mountain. His countdown begins and he moves swiftly, thinking he will surely win in this life. He is moving quickly and reaches the top of the mountain in just a blink of an eye. The boys are surprised to see his power level and are looking forward to seeing him fail at that task. But they are shocked to see that the thief didn't take the mountain road, but went to the dense jungle on the side of the mountain road. Ling Si thinks the mountain roads are certainly safe and convenient, but the mountain road is winding and rugged. It is stated that the shortest straight line between two points will be several times the distance in a straight line by taking a fixed hill. No one takes the unexplored jungle because the system randomly spawns monsters in the dense jungle. There are many big mouth grass monsters and in his last life, he learnt the quickest route to the top for thieves and he has run this road a million times. The big mouth grass monsters are the secret to getting to the top quickly. Soon he faces many monsters, the most common and annoying little monsters of the mountain jungle. They are not a huge threat to passers-by but a headache in groups. Ling Si activates his skill backstab, one of the thief's basic skills, instantly appearing on the enemy's back and slamming into a weak spot. He jumps upon them and hits a large monster at a time, and with this, his backstab completion rate is 80%. He has shortened his climbing time using backstab. The remaining time is 9 minutes and 40 seconds. He receives a system notification that he has attracted a lot of hatred from the big-mouthed grass monsters. Soon, he cools down his backstab technique and slashes one of the monsters with his dagger. The time is going down gradually, and with this, it is shortened to 7 minutes and 50 seconds. On the other side, other players wonder how many seconds that level 1 thief would last because he chooses the jungle and is bound to encounter many big mouth grass monsters along the way. The girl guesses that he won't stay more than a minute and a boy laughs and says the sister is very smart. They think Ling Si is only level 1 and will be surrounded by a few big mouths grass monsters in 3 seconds. The time remaining is 6 minutes and 30 seconds and Ling Si is still moving quickly. He thinks he didn't even notice that he has already attracted many grass monsters. His next place is to be at the fault of that sunset peak, and this one has to go around the other side because there is a fault in the road. He reaches the desired place and thinks it takes at least 10 minutes to get around to the other side of the mountain, but he wonders if there is a way to cross the fault. He can see the top of the hill right there. The remaining time is 6 minutes and 10 seconds. He remembers that there will be a nest of grass monsters at the fault, and he can see that place from his current place. He thinks this is the time for the grappling hook and acceleration scrolls to come into use, and he activates a primary acceleration scroll. The monsters are also shocked at his power level. He hits the monster, asks him to lend him his help, and sends him up to the hill. He takes support from their bodies, jumps from there, and gets the speed. From there, it will definitely reach there. He uses the skill of a decisive cliff stump and maximizes his speed as fast as possible. He then grabs the tree branch and flies away to the top of the mountain. He is about to reach there, 
but there is just one last step. The grass monster that will appear on the mountain's edge. The monster is right before him, and he has grabbed his dagger, while the remaining time is 5 minutes and 30 seconds. He lands on the cliff 10 seconds after killing the monster. He then receives a system notification since he has completed the quest, Ascend of the Peak, while the remaining time is 4 minutes and 43 seconds. The old man is already present there and says he didn't expect that he would actually reach the top of the mountain in less than half the time. The old man says he seems to have a lot of determination when he leaps through the fog and climbs to the top in one go. Ling Si thinks if he hadn't been determined to look over the top of the mountain, he couldn't reach the top. The old man reveals his face and says he is the one who is qualified to explore glorious power. He receives a system notification that he has taken less than five minutes and has unlocked Sunset Elder's hidden quest, Proof of Glorious. Ling Si is surprised because he didn't realize there was a hidden quest for less than half the time. The old man says his determination reminds him of himself back then, and Ling Si says the kind of determination that he is mad, he will become a king. He receives an item called Dusty Proof of Glorious, and the dusty old emblems seem to hide a mysterious history and a journey, which the great men have polished through the ages to give them the light of their glory once again. He receives a system notification congratulating him on unlocking the way to glory. He has to find the clues to explore the secret behind the badge, and mission progress is 0%. There are no further instructions, and it seems to be an exploratory type of quest, while he had never heard of this task in his previous life and doesn't even have a clue. The old man says this is the ascent bonus reward based on his profession and is very pleased with his determination. He has also received an extreme creation set, which deals with 1000% damage to all level 5 and below wild monsters. He asks permission if he wants to equip this extreme creation set, and he accepts the quest. The old man exclaims his purpose there is also achieved, and Ling Si asks him who he really is and thinks it seems he is not simple. But he replies they will meet again if he keeps his determination at the top, and Ling Si wonders what he is talking about. He grabs him and says he will give him a ride, and says they will go to the people who are at the bottom of the mountain. They will witness his return as a topper, and with the blink of an eye, the old man takes him to the bottom. On the other side, the people thinks he may dies because it's been so long, and he hasn't come down yet. They think he may already failed and ran around the road for fear of being embarrassed, but they are shocked at seeing an explosion right in front of them. They get scared and wonder if it is a monster who appears suddenly, but they are shocked to see that it's the level 1 thief with the old man. Many people gather there to see what happened there just now, wondering if he completed the mission reached the peak. The girl suddenly changes her attitude to see Ling see his new pieces of equipment and thinks it can be his mission reward. They have never expected that this kind of mission would give him this kind of equipment and they all seem greedy and want his equipment. Ling Si thinks it has caused an uproar in returns with this method. It would have been weird if it didn't attract any attention, and the old man says this is as far as he will take him. He thinks he will need to deal with all these people by himself and will have to respond with the system dialogue. Suddenly, the old man uses his power and opens a special portal, and the people also wonder what the background of that NPC is. He thought that the old man was an ordinary NPC and they were shocked to see a set of equipment of the thief, indicating that it was a unique mission. The girl asks him what a special mission means, and he reveals three types of missions in Heavenland. First is the bounty missions, which are the missions for dungeons that players will usually get, and the provided rewards are normally exp, money, items, skills, or equipment. The second type is encounter missions, which usually depend on the player's luck. With these, players will have a chance to encounter special NPC or receive special information, and thus it will trigger a special mission. It rewards players with special bonus stats or special items, and the third one is unique missions. This one is very special because once someone has completed the mission, that mission will disappear forever, and other players won't be able to receive it. There are two categories for all these types of missions, individual mission and team mission. The difficulty of unique mission is fixed, and except for those, the other two are divided into five levels of difficulty. Low, Intermediate, Upper, Special, and Insanity. The girl says it is no wonder that the set of equipment he is weaning looks so cool. The old man calls Ling Si and says they will meet again in the future if he continues walking down the road of the glorious. 
Ling tries to ask him about the proof of the glorious, but he says goodbye. He receives a system reminder that his mission has been updated and wonders what his next mission is. There is a system prompt for him to search for information about the Glorious One and uncover the unknown journey. The mission's difficulty is also unknown, and he thinks he has forgotten about this, and for now, leveling up is more important. Meanwhile, the girl approaches him and calls him from behind. She praises his power, and Ling Si asks if there is anything he can help her with. She asks him about the equipment he is wearing and asks permission to take her leveling with him. The other boys call her and say she agreed with them on taking her level and say he just completed a unique mission, but they can kill him anytime. The girl gets angry and says if they are so good, they should achieve the mission, while they are shocked at her sudden switching sides. Ling Si thinks he should have his equipment and information to avoid attracting trouble in the future. He hides his equipment and the effect will still be active, and he changes his appearance like before. He then leaves the girl and leaves, saying those guys can't even handle the map he is going to write now. They shout at him and say he is just a level 1 noob, and one of them asks him to have a solo fight with him if he is that cool. Ling Si stops there and asks if he wants to try to fight him. They think this player is quite arrogant, and Ling Si says he doesn't have the time to play with him and says goodbye. The girl is also embarrassed and wonders how this thief can do this to her and now she will have to keep following those idiots. She again changes her attitude and goes to the boys and says she wants their help to level her up. On the other side, at the level 5 map, Ant Army Basin, the level 4 and 5 players are fighting against the Anner Army Basin middle circle. A level 3 player calls his captain, says his mana is almost depleted, and his potions are also gone, and asks him to retreat. But he tells her that they are at the middle circle of the basin, and the highest level of the ants there will not exceed level 4. He exclaims that they will retreat after this wave. Another player says they are already doing very well since they have leveled up one level in three days. They can try going into the inner circle, then they will be rich after getting all the loot. Suddenly, a girl appears there and attacks him through an arrow and says all the ants in the inner circle are level 5, and they will attack them in groups, so it's not same as in the middle circle. Another player jumps in the circle and says there is a rule where players cannot enter a map level higher than them in Heavenland. Reaching level 5 in the middle circle is already considered lucky enough, and the players that entered the inner circle are all level 5 elite teams from the 5 major guilds. Every one of them is level 5 with golden gear and will be paired with at least 2 healers and to heal the health of the tank that will be dropping like crazy. A player reveals that the inner circle drops good loot, but they need to be able to handle it, and the elite teams of the five major guilds went in there just to grind for good loot. Suddenly, an elf girl is shocked to see Ling Si defeating all the monsters. He is just a level 1 player, but his power level is more than a level 5 player. Everyone is shocked to see him and wonders how a level 1 thief can do this and how he came there. The girl calls others and asks them to see where he is heading, and they are shocked because he is going toward Ant Army Basin's inner circle. Ling Si runs quickly and jumps into the circle where all the beasts are of level 5 at least. Fifteen minutes earlier, he arrived at the level 5 map, Ant Army Basin. Ling Si reached the resting area. He thinks about the level 5 map, and that the players will not be able to enter the map again after surpassing level 5. There are three circles the outer, middle and inner, and the difficulty increases as they get deeper. The waves of ant soldiers in the inner circle are every player's worst nightmare, but for Ling Si, who is weaning the pinnacle set, he thinks it's the perfect place to level up, and the description of it is that it deals with 1000% damage to monsters level 5 and below. He thinks he can probably get to level 5 by clearing all the ant soldiers in the inner circle before the following wave responds. Killing monsters in a map that's higher level than him will give him a bonus exp multiplier. Now the elves are fighting each other, and one of them grabs the other from her mouth and says leveling up comes first, and she is at a higher level than her. She asks how she dares to arrive when she already has a red name. She asks her if she doesn't know that the penalty for having a red name is dropping a random piece of equipment on death. Red name players means a player killer. A player's name will turn red if they kill another player. The lasting duration of a red name will depend on the degree of the offense. The elf falls to the ground and says he has always been leveling up with the squad in the middle circle, 
and he didn't think there would be so many ant soldiers in the inner circle. The difference between the middle circle and the inner circle was too big, and the other one says the difficulty of the inner circle is not to be underestimated. Even if it's a level 5 team, they must be careful. Their entire party almost got wiped out just because of his one mistake. After dropping one level, the man is now at level 4, and they are no longer a level 5 party. Ling Si passes through them and recognizes them as the Nebulous Guild, and he remembers they are one of the five major guilds, and it seems like only the five major guilds are strong enough to go in the inner circle as of right now. He stares at them, and a level 4 player shouts at him and asks why he is staring at him, and if seeing someone get scolded brings him some sort of satisfaction. Their captain comes forward and advises him not to get in there and get himself killed because this is not a place for a level 1 like him to gain experience. She says if he came there thinking that he is lucky enough, it will just be a waste of his time and asks him to go to a level 1 or 2 maps to level up first. Ling Si thinks it seems like the Nebulous Guild members are not bad people and they are a lot better than some other people's mouths. Ling Si asks her what if he tells her that he will bring back the equipment that she dropped in there and sell it to her. They are surprised and wonder if something is wrong with this thief's brain, and the captain also shouts at him and says she doesn't have the time to joke with him. He calls him a level 1 thief and asks why he wants to enter the inner circle to help them regain their equipment. Ling Si replies that he requires money and asks them where they dropped their equipment and if they think someone else might have picked it up. The player replies that it will still be there because at that time to find a better position for dealing damage to the monsters, they specifically picked a boulder in the inner circle, and after being trampled by ant soldiers that were surrounding them, their level 5 magic staff was dropped on top of the boulder. The sun is about to set, and there was no one in the inner circle when they left, so it won't be picked up by anyone, while the captain calls him and asks if he is serious. He asks them not to worry about him because he has already considered those situations and he leaves asking them to take a break and remind him to pay him the money. A player asks the captain how much they should pay him and she asks him if he really believes that a level 1 thief is going to be able to bring it out. Ling Si finds many people grinding there so he rushes straight to the inner circle because he must reach level 5 today. He quickly moves toward the level 3 in soldiers and activates his pinnacle strength. The other players are shocked at his power level and wonder what the thing passed them just now. Soon he reaches the middle circle where there are level 4 ant soldiers and he uses the skill backstab to kill them all. At the same time, the captain orders other players to focus on their mission, while the player asks them to see toward the level 1 thief since he is heading towards the inner circle. Ling Si jumps upon the ant soldiers, fighting and defeating them all. He has used 1000% of damage and killed many monsters. He receives a system notification that he has leveled up, and his current level is 2. He is happy about this and thinks the experience that the inner circle gives really a lot, and since no one is there, he will take this opportunity to clear all the ant soldiers. After a few hours, the players are tired of waiting and think of going back since it is getting dark. They cleared the middle circles of ant soldiers, but soon they gathered around the inner circle where the ant soldiers had died. They are shocked that the thief is still alive, and he solo clears the inner circle along with the bonus experience multiplier from having a lower level than the map. He is leveled up from level 1 to level 5 in just one day, and they exclaim he must be really strong, and they think he may be hiding his pieces of equipment. He has obtained a fire chaser staff and is happy he has reached level 5. On the other side, the captain again grabs the level 4 player from his collar and says she will warn him one more time. She exclaims that even though their guild Nebulous is placed third in the rankings, then they are still one of the five major guilds. She hits him badly and asks if he is not ashamed of him, while she requests him to leave him since she can't breathe. The player says when the thief told them that he would get it back, it's hard not to trust him with that look in his eyes. They are about to leave when they hear some people saying that the guy hid his personal information, but he did rise from level 1 to level 5 in one go. They have never seen anything like this since the game launch, and they see it on the Heavenland forum, where he has set a record of single-handedly slaughtering all the monsters in the inner circle. The captain also noticed just now that everyone who came back from the inner circle has been talking about it. A player calls her from behind and asks her to see the guy. Ling Si appears there with the equipment and asks how much they will offer for it. 
She is shocked to see that he has reached level 5, and Ling Si exclaims if she doesn't recognize him, then she should at least recognize the staff. They are shocked to see that he has really brought the fire chaser back, and he replies that he just cleared out the ant soldiers in the inner circle, and it's a lot of experience due to the higher level mobs. The player thanks him, and says he only has three silver coins on him, so he will give him all of it. The captain is still in a state of shock and thinks even if they disregard the question of where he got his special equipment from, they still need to be skilled enough mechanically to go against that horrifying amount of ant soldiers. He receives a system prompt that he has received three silver coins and they thank him for doing business with them. The captain calls him from behind and asks if he has joined a guild yet and tells him that they are one of the five major guilds, Nebulous. She says if he is interested, then she can recommend him to the guild master, and Ling Si thinks this is the guild that he wasn't even able to touch in his past life. It is revealed that the Nebulous Guild was one of the five major guilds in his past life as well. When he started playing the game, those guilds were already full, and players would also feel proud just from being one of the members of the big five guilds. In his past life, he spent two years trying to reach the maximum level. And one is because unlocking the pet system, it will greatly decrease the difficulty of leveling. Thus, becoming a member of one of the five major guilds is something to be quite proud of. In his past life, his only goal was maxing out his level, so it only took him two years to do so. One reason is that unlocking the pet system greatly reduces the leveling difficulty. The other reason is that he ignored things like advanced equipment and special missions. So, by researching countless players' guilds and finding a method of leveling up most suitable for himself, he was able to reach the maximum level in a short amount of time, especially since he is relatively skilled at games. However, he can only start earning some money after reaching the maximum level. However, he thanks the captain for the offer and says he will consider it. He thinks he will join a guild sooner or later, but which guild will he join? He will have to let fate decide. Next, he will need to get that equipment set in his hands. After some time, he reaches the main city Casfido, the beginner's village, where everyone seems impressed by him, and he thinks being a level 5 gets him treated so kindly. At the same time, at the NPC shop, a player asks the girl if she thinks that stupid thief from the afternoon will come back there, and they are looking forward to his return. In the meantime, Ling Si reaches there and asks why they are still there and they have not leveled up to at least level 1. They are shocked to see him at level 5 and ask him how his level has risen so quickly and how he did this. The girl asks him how she can help him this time and he replies that he wants to sell some items. He has been successful with his trade and has received 30 silver coins and 66 bronze coins. Ling Si thinks he will sell all those useless items and prepare for the next objective. In return, he demons 20 strong Molotovs and 3 novice invisible potions. The girl thanks him for doing business with her and says all the items have been transferred into his bag. A weapon merchant comes outside and asks him if he needs anything, and Ling Si thinks he will buy some temporary ones from the weapon merchant next door. He receives a system prompt saying he has received a level 5 whitewood dagger. The reason he is speed leveling to level 5 is because Heavenland has only been launched 3 months ago, and that dungeon has not yet been unlocked by anyone. In his previous life, players discovered that there was a nest far from the Ant Army Basin, and it was an unprompted checkpoint, Queen Ant's Nest. After clearing Queen Ant's Nest, the level 5 dungeon will be refreshed, and the hidden dungeon Dark Forest will appear. This was also only discovered 5 months after the launch of Heavenland, and all this is to collect the thief's strongest equipment set under level 10 in Dark Forest, the Unyielding Slaughter set. After some time, he discovered Queen Ant's nest, and there were a lot of ant soldiers in the nest. But in his previous life, after many tries, players found a despicable way to get past the ants quickly. He drinks the novice invisible potion, and its effect is that the user will become invisible. The higher the enemy's perception is, the easier it will be to detect the user. He quickly moves through the ants from the mountains, and he receives a system prompt that the novice invisible potion has lost its effect. He again drinks the potion and activates its effect, but he has attracted the hatred of a large number of ant soldiers. He takes potions one after the other to move through the next, but soon he is done with his last potion. However, he is almost at his destination and finally meets with the queen ant. 
Some ant soldiers attack him from behind and Ling Si thinks he needs to use the ant soldier's fire of fire. It is revealed that the ants are weak to fire, so burning attacks have a damage multiplier. Although the queen ant has a lot of health, she doesn't have any attacking methods. Her entire existence is to respond the ant soldiers endlessly and have them protect her. Now the ant soldiers have been blocked by a wall of fire, the queen ant is useless. The queen calls him a despicable human and Ling Si thinks it's better if they fight one on one. He exclaims it's his fault for being such easy prey and she should not blame him for being despicable. He takes out some potions and says she will be pretty full after drinking all these molotovs he left for her, and the queen ant shouts at seeing the potions. He receives a system prompt congratulating him that he has slain queen ant, and there is also a global notice that the players who have hidden his information have cleared queen ant's nest. Level 5 hidden dungeon, Dark Forest, has been opened for him. Meanwhile at the palace they were discussing holding a guild meeting, but his companion wondered if she needed to request it for something like that. Team Nebulous Captain Bai Lai thought he had discovered some hidden items or a particular NPC and asked if there was any need for Dira to act so dramatically. Dira remarked that he wouldn't understand because he wasn't there then, that thief player was frightening as he went from level 1 to level 5 in just an afternoon. She believed he was very robust, so if they didn't get him into their guild, the four other significant guilds would take him in. That scared her most. Wasabi-kun wondered what she was afraid of and asked if she thought a mere level 5 thief could increase the gap between their guild and others, but this was nonsense. She tried to persuade them as she felt he had strange mechanics and hid his personal information, so his vibes were utterly different from those of other regular players. Vice Captain Tana agreed as she could understand that Dira was surely thinking for the sake of the guild, which was why she asked them to gather there for a meeting, so they should stop giving her a hard time. Since that thief was that talented, she instructed her to invite him to take their guild test when she had the chance. The game was launched not long ago, so there were way too many players applying for the guild, he will also get his chance if he is that talented. Dira gets quite excited because she agrees and wants to have him in her squad. Tiana agrees since she can understand her. She is amazed at how beautiful and gentle the vice captain is no matter what she is doing, and it is to see a female beast man as good looking as her. Suddenly, they received the global notice, which startled them. The notification was about the main lead. The notice explained how a player who had hidden their information had cleared the queen ant nest and attracted the hatred of the insect tribe. Dira was also amazed at seeing this notification as she assumed it was about that thief, and they received another notification that the level 5 hidden dungeon Dark Forest had been opened. Everyone was stunned to know about the hidden dungeon of level 5, and was amazed as this was a solo clear, and wondered who that godly player was. Just by looking at the announcement, it must have triggered after solo clearing the queen ant's nest. They assumed this person might indeed be a pro, and wondered which guild he belonged to. Tiana didn't want to be too excited because every player would receive this announcement. Since the level 5 hidden dungeon has been opened, all the players might be rushing there like ducks, so she also wanted to hurry there to scout some good seedlings. Captain agreed because what he said was very reasonable, and they had no time to lose. He looked at her affectionately and commanded them to head to the dark forest. Whether it's the Nebulous Guild or the other significant guilds, even the players wandering the streets were shocked by the message. All of the players received the global message and were amazed to know about the hidden dungeon, as they never thought something like that would also be present. All of the players were preparing to go to the secret dungeon, while some wondered why level 5 appeared now. They asked if any special equipment or materials would drop in that hidden dungeon. Some players were buying the potions to boost their abilities and hurry toward that dungeon, thinking they wouldn't even be able to squeeze in if they went there late. The other guilds were instructing their mages to hurry up as all other guilds might be there already. Their mage was opening a portal, but it took time, and they wondered which godlike pro player had cleared it. The discussion of countless players filled every corner, and everyone became restless because of the open dungeon. Everyone was gathered near the dungeon entrance in the dark forest, and the protagonist also reached. As he expected, the place was already full of players, he remembered that this mission was a special team mission, so there would be more and more players. One of the players rushing away wondered if there was no level gap restriction, and the man chasing him affirmed. 
He wanted him to hurry up and get there because the players level 5 or below could enter it, and his teammates were waiting for him. The protagonist was amazed, but it was just as he remembered because Dark Forest was a hidden dungeon, so there would be some special conditions or rules. This time, it allowed teams to have no Kevl gap limits, but the only restriction was that the player over level 5 couldn't enter it. Some players wanted just to go inside and snatch some loot and assumed they could go with the easiest difficulty. The main lead has already prepared all the items and equipment for his teammates, and now he needs to find four other people to form a party with. He decided to look for the people near the mission crystal. He accepted the mission of the Dark Forest and was allowed to use the dungeon portal. He knew that the yellow portals nearby were all low difficulty and the golden portal was with the upper difficulty. He saw a few people requesting the priest in their team to enter the dungeon first and they would follow him after. The mage was instructing the player that the final boss of the upper difficulty has a mutation phase, so they should take note of that and report it to the higher. The players were furious as they lost two teammates and were almost wiped out. This happened because it was challenging and challenging. The player furiously punched the ground as their equipment couldn't keep up with this hidden dungeon. He was sure that a level 5 armor couldn't even handle regular attacks from the boss as its armor penetration attack was too strong. The protagonist heard two players gossiping. They were astonished as that player was one of the five significant guilds of Celestial. They rushed onto the upper difficulty portal without hesitation when the dungeon opened. Not only did the five major guilds come there, but the other guilds also ran there. Some people have already cleared the low and intermediate difficulties, but have yet to be able to remove the upper difficulty. He didn't even want to mention the unique and insanity difficulties, as it would be at least one week before people started to challenge those too. It wouldn't be long before this place became an area for guilds to compete. The first few weeks would be full of guilds trying to break the dungeon record, just like every additional time a new dungeon unlocked. Soon enough, there would be nothing for a solo player like them to accomplish, and he was worried as he was also a slow player. Everyone was stunned as one of the players pointed toward the representative of the five major guilds in charge of recruiting new players also arrived there. They were observing the edge of the dungeon area, all level 8 to level 9 pros. Wasabi-kun suggested they must seek some quality players to recruit this time. Looking at them, the captain also agreed, as the good ones had all been stolen by other guilds last time. He thought that if he could find some good seedlings and collect enough guild contribution points, he could apply to join, and then use them to join the second guild. He imagined that Tiana would accept him as she always rejected him, so he was sure that when he reached the second team, he would make sure she wouldn't abandon him again. While he was dreaming of being accepted by her, she arrived behind him, called him, and informed him that the other guilds had also come. He blushed on seeing her and asked her if that was the case, so he looked behind where the other team was standing. Tina wanted to leave the critical task of challenging dungeon records to the first and second teams, but their job as the third team is to recruit quality newcomers. The hidden dungeon has attracted many payers, so he believes many potential seedlings will exist. She agreed, as there would be some within all these players who would stand out. She wondered if that thief Dira spoke of would be there and was looking forward to meeting him. The player was amazed to see so many people gathered at the dungeon entrance and her fellow laughed as he told her he would bring her to see something nice. The other player knew many players and wanted to see if any acquaintances were willing to carry them along. They figured out that all the players were looking to form a group, which was an excellent opportunity for them. The girl winked at him as she looked forward to see if she could level up one or two levels this time. They gladly told her it would be no problem, so she should leave it at them. She was startled as she saw that thief behind. The protagonist was also amazed to see them there, and they wondered why he was there too, but that's what he also wanted to say to them, as this was a level 5 dungeon. This dungeon requires 5 people, so he asked them if they weren't short of one person and she was stunned to know that he had already reached level 5. She praised him as excellent, asked him if he came because he missed her, and assured him that she would be fine with anything. Her teammates get furious on seeing this and are jealous, wondering how that is possible as he had just disappeared for an afternoon and had already reached level 5. The protagonist asked if they wanted to clear this dungeon, he would carry them and help them. He knew that if he had to look for other people, he had to waste his time explaining, but it wouldn't be a problem if it were these four. 
They were shocked and couldn't believe it and wanted him to know that relying on his luck wouldn't help him clear the dungeon. He asked them to tell him if they wanted to clear it, but the guy inquired if he was sure he could remove it, as he had to compensate them if they got wiped out. The protagonist had no problem with his condition, but he also had one condition. They must hide their party information for three days. He wondered why they would hide their party information because only an idiot wouldn't want some clout. As compensation, the main lead promised to take only one piece of equipment after clearing the dungeon and they could take the rest. He sent them an invite, so the system message appeared asking them if they wanted to join. All of them were thinking about it, but she was willing to accept as she finally found a reliable back to grab on and level up. The other player wanted to learn from him the way he played Thief, and his condition was also a profitable exchange, so they decided to trust him. They accepted his invitation, so he instructed them to let go as he would select a portal, but the player from the other team wanted to discuss the strategy before leaving. He asked him if he was sure what he was doing, but was stunned as they saw a dark red portal behind him. He promised to explain it after they went in, but they were shocked as they figured out they had tricked and were challenging. The message appeared as his team had accepted the Dark Forest Dungeon, whose difficulty was insanity, and the dungeon mission would be activated after three seconds, so they should be prepared. The captain was surprised to see many people gathered at a place and wondered what was happening there and why there were so many people, and told Tiana that she should also look at it. He was astonished to see the red-colored dungeon and wondered if he was not seeing it wrong. She asked what he was talking about, so she looked there and wondered what the crowd was staring at. She was astonished as she saw the dark red portal. Captain Bai Lai was shocked to see someone challenging the insanity difficulty, which was impossible for them to clear. The dungeon was opened not long ago, but someone needs to gain the skills and guts to challenge this difficulty level. They wondered which guild that team could be and if they could be members of the top one guild. The Dark Forest just happened not long ago, so the only people who are skillful enough are probably their first division. The other guild members assumed that it might be the party of a solo player who randomly chose the insanity difficulty as they saw a lot of these parties that wanted to try their luck in the past. Bai Lai also thought this situation was uncommon and asked Chana for her opinion. It makes sense to her that even if it is true, there is no way that they will clear the dungeon as there are no other possibilities, she decides to go there and look herself. All the players were shocked as they chose Insanity Difficulty and inquired if anyone knew which group this was and what their cars and equipment were. They wondered if they were the members of five major guilds or just solo players trying to test their luck. They were amazed as even the Celestial member needed help to clear the upper difficulty, but they tried to clear this dungeon with their lousy equipment. The player was worried as the crowd was getting bigger and they would humiliate themselves badly this time. He wanted to quickly enter the dungeon without caring if it was insanity. The players gathered around them were making fun of them, as they were probably just solo players going into Sightsee. Ling Si decided to go in, but the players gathered. They were shocked as the nebulous guild member appeared. They were shocked as the division captain, Bai Lei, also appeared and requested them to let them pass as so many players were blocking their way. Bai Lei gets furious, wondering if there is any need for a crowd for something this trivial. Tiana figured out they just had to squeeze in. The captain was angry as those solo players were an annoyance for him as they were making him squeeze in. The player told him they did not need to squeeze because they had already entered the dungeon. He asked for their information and found that some solo players had formed the party. The captain already concluded they might be the lone player and the player agreed as they dared to disturb him and shook his head. The player got to talk to the captain and informed him that he had previously applied for Nebulus and wanted him to put in a good word for him. Bai Lei wondered who he was and told him that if he wanted to, he must follow the proper procedure. He thought that if a fatty like him wanted to join their guild, he should dream about it. They left, and the player became furious as he thought he could look down on people because he held some power. The man behind was amazed to see Bai Lei and wondered who it was this time. The man remarked that the nebulous people are always so fast to start recruiting but fail to recruit even one player, which was quite embarrassing. The players were amazed to see the rank 3 guild Wolf Fang, as now there were three of the five major guides. They wondered if Wolf Fang was ranked third, then who was better between Nebulous and Celestial. Celestial was currently ranked fourth, 
but they should underestimate Nebulous as this guild was founded not long ago, and they heard the guild master was powerful. It was just that the third guild, Wolf Fang, liked to make things difficult for Nebulous, and currently, they were being sarcastic at them. Wolf Fang, a guild member, remarked as he heard that people from Celestial had also come, so they received an order to join in on the fun. He assured him not to worry as they wouldn't steal newbies from them this time. His harsh and sarcastic remarks irritated Bai Lei. Tiana tried to calm him down as this was not a suitable place to start an argument with them and give others a chance to make a joke out of them. The girl from the other guild remembered that Tana was the mage for the last monthly guild wars. She was shocked as she remembered her. She affirmed that she remembered her, asked if she was a Bailey woman, and remarked that she had such bad taste. She pitied as she didn't kill her last time and laughed. Tiana was calm and uttered that she didn't remember her at all. This pissed her off, and she was more stunned as she remarked that it's hard to remember someone with a generic face. She gets furious, asks what she means by that, and wants her to dare to say that again, but Tana says it is nothing and decides to leave. While leaving, she turned and informed her that not every woman is like her, who always relies on men, and she suggested that they should all work hard. She gets furious, and her companion remarks that Tiana is striking, but she furiously tells him they will be going now. She cursed her as she had a long tongue, but her companion tried to calm her down as there was a week till the next monthly guild war. He whispered in her ear that they would just focus on killing her and make her drop some level, so she smiled voraciously as she was counting on him. Meanwhile, a few people were gossiping as they heard that a part of a solo player activated the red portal, and they thought it was people from some guild, so they wanted to go back and report it. But there was no need to hurry, it would be better to gather some info on the dungeon before returning. They must catch and ask them after they leave the dungeon, so he instructs his fellow to go. Meanwhile, in the dark forest inside the dungeon, they ask him if he is out of his mind as this is a scam. The dungeon he chooses is insanity, and he wonders if he doesn't know what this means. Even the people from Celestial couldn't clear the per difficulty, so he asked if he would bring them there to feed the monster. He remarked that she was just a noob, but was just lucky as he somehow got to level 5, and now he thinks he is invincible. Other players were amazed at how prominent the place was, and the girl payer thought she would be a babe to level up there. The protagonist asked them if they were done complaining as they would attract the bud monsters there if he kept yelling. He beware them that heaven lands. Mob artificial intelligence was quite advanced, so they became calm. He asked him to tell them what they would do and exit the dungeon as they should know that dying would make them lose experience. She was worried as they had just teamed up but were still fighting, and she wasn't afraid of dropping out as she was level 1. She wanted new equipment so no one was allowed to leave. Ling Si informed them that he had already sent them the stuff so they could get it from the party interface. These were the pieces of equipment that he picked based on their classes, and they were more suitable for this dungeon and he instructed them to put them on. He sent a fire scatter arm guard for the player on level 4. For the female player, he sent a red reverend on level 1. Robe of winning fire for the player with level 3, and for the last player, he sends blazing thief leather armor. These were all bearable with their levels, and equipment elemental attributes should cost at least 10 silver in the early game. They were shocked as these were all the attributes with fire attribute attacks, so they couldn't help but admire him a little and wondered where he got so much equipment. The protagonist explained that they must drop some equipment after grinding so many mobs. Bugs are weak to fire, they all have fire attributes they would receive from their equipment. He promised to help them increase their damage by quite a bit, she was excited and couldn't wait to put it on. She instructed others to hurry and put their equipment on, and they affirmed. All of them were amazed to see their weapon, but with that equipment, the level would still be insanity, which worried them. The player was worried when the main lead called him and instructed him to come and pass these out as they were strong Molotovs, which shocked him, and he wondered if he was a merchant. The protagonist explained that his bottles are limited. His maximum is 60, so each person could take 15 bottles as needed for the boss. They wondered if the Molotov was for the boss then if he had some plans for the monster along the way. Ling Si assured them not to worry as he would tell them what to do on the way there. He had put all his stat points in agility him the early game. After he got to level 5, he distributed his stat points more evenly, and his level was enough for him to put on this level 5 equipment set. 
He changed his equipment as he purposely prepared this equipment for Dark Forest and spent a fortune on it. His costume was upgraded, which shocked the player as it was the most expensive equipment in the shop. A level 5 fire attribute thief equipment set, a starfire set. The protagonist instructed them that if they wanted to clear this game's dungeon, they needed to know that every dungeon has its specialties. There is also a weakness when there is a specialty, so they could win if they find that weakness. The so-called insanity difficulty was not exactly unbeatable, so they all confidently headed inside to be the first to clear the insanity dungeon. Through observation, people discovered that the insect race in Heavenland was a race with an extreme awareness of danger. So whenever they sense danger, they will choose to hide or flee, which is, according to Insect Observation 3rd Volume Book. Meanwhile, in the dark forest, a typical mob, Jagged Scythe Mantis, was startled as it heard the player remarking that she was charming. The protagonist pushes her down and thinks she is an idiot as she can't see the prey in her head and wonders if she wants to become like that. Jagged Scath Mantis ran away after seeing them become the insects. They were vigilant, but she still thought the monster was pretty. The protagonist gets furious at her, as if she had revealed herself in just one more second, and she would have attracted many monsters. The other player called him the boss and asked how to beat the monster. Even though the insect's rate was very fragile, their speed was very high. His companion was stunned to hear him call Ling Si boss. Furthermore, the monsters in the insanity all have additional health, attack, and defense bonuses. Insect race attacks also apply to cut damage, which decreases the target's health. Over time, just a few attacks from them will all end up dying to the continuous damage. He was right, but the main lead planned to avoid fighting head-on against all the monsters because three circular zones in the dark forest connected, each representing a different area. Normally, they will need to clear the three zones to reach the boss, and the monster guarding these three zones is the mantis they just saw, moth and spiders. An exceptional existence in the neutral mob, weeping birds, they were amazed to know about those weeping birds and thought it might be worth a lot. The protagonist explained that those weeping birds are the key to clearing the dungeon. Using the insect race's natural predator and a hidden path, they can reach the boss quickly. She tried to mimic the weeping bird and asked others if they thought those birds would be like that, and they affirmed that this was the most likely scenario. His fellow decided to take the notes of these clearing stats properly. The protagonist instructed them to listen to him carefully and stop going around as he would only say it once. As he expected, they worried him. He asked them for their nickname for more accessible communication, so his system requested to check players' personal information. One of the level 3 player IDs was an invincible J-drama run, and he advised others to call him J-run, which amazed his fellow as he was a Japanese drama fan. The other player's ID name was Bone Piercing, no loneliness, heartbreaking, no sadness, and he requested them to call him by his ID name, but they decided to call him Anti-Mainstream. He gets furious as he was an Anti-Mainstream, and the other player's ID was Long Handsome Face, and he wanted them to call him Long Face. The female player ID's name was Ziolan, and she explained that she liked money and strong boys, and they wondered if she was talking about them. Since they all introduced them with their D-name, the main lead decided to head on to the next step, finding that weeping bird. They were stunned as they saw the weeping bird, Ziolan was furious, she thought they would be cute, but the name didn't suit it. The protagonist tries calming down the weeping bird by promising to give him some good bugs, which makes the bit happy. He instructed them to feed her some bugs so they could get to the road here to express their goodwill, and then they could get an item. After they feed it bugs, the system notification congratulates them for receiving a hidden item, a weeping flute. It was the gift the weeping bird gave in the name of friendship and could make a sweet chirping sound, but to some insects it was a sign of danger. They never thought that such an ugly dumb bird would have hidden items, the main lead explained that there were no useless NPCs in Heavenland. It was about whether their uses had been discovered and Jay Run was taking notes of all his instructions. The other player asked him if they were returning to the Mantic Zone, but he denied that with this flute, they could take a shortcut to the boss portal, but it was a bit troublesome. Jay Run wondered how he knew these shortcuts and that flute too, and if he had any previous experience. But he can't tell them that he has already cleared this dungeon countless times in his past life, so he said that before coming there, he went to Casfato's main city library and read some books about insect observations and other information. 
Only after reading it could the event be triggered, for example, the weeping flutes and their effect on scaring the insects. Knowledge is necessary for the interaction with the weeping bird to be activated. He never knew that the library had such information, but Zio Lan thought that reading the books was boring, and they thought the library was just for show and didn't know it had such uses. The protagonist instructed them to open their map and pay attention, as the area on the side of the map was a swamp. The forest was surrounded by it. Normally, no one would take the swamp path because no one knew of it. They could get lost anytime. Secondly, it is becoming a scattered monster with no pattern, so it's not as safe as the normal path. Anti-Manticore comprehended that the shortcut wasn't safe and wondered if he was sending them there to die. The protagonist explained that the weeping bird is a monster that specifically hunts the onset of the insect race, and their natural predator, the flute, will be able to make the sound of the weeping bird, making them terror-stricken. Zio Lan was glad as they got an item and a shortcut, which excited her, so she was ready to head there. On their way, she wanted to ask if this was the only path and what kind of shortcut is this as she was passing the damp lake. She asked them why they were making such a beautiful girl take this kind of swamp path as she became filthy. Other players also had difficulty walking through it, they felt like they were dragging a large rock. Ling Si asked them if they wanted to go back and fight the monsters. If they weren't willing to pay such a small price, they shouldn't even consider clearing the insanity difficulty. Soon, he tells them to stay quiet as they enter the monster's area and wants them to follow him. Zio Lan was worried about her dress but was stunned as she saw the spiders appearing from her side, but he instructed her to stay calm. The player was worried that those spiders had a horrifying aura, and as expected from the insanity level monster, they got noted and attacked by those monsters. They were rushing toward them, but the main lead played his weeping flute, creating a chirping sound that terrified the beast, and they fled. They were amazed, they had never thought dumb birds were useful, as those mobs feared them. The protagonist is instructed not to get careless and quickly follow him because his shortcut isn't that easy. They completely rely on this flute. If they got lost, they would get attacked by all kinds of monsters in the dungeons, they were above them too, which saved them, so they rushed to get out of there quickly. This was the price of taking the shortcut. Soon, they reached the safe zone area. Her whole body was covered with mud, so she was quite slippery, so her fellow wanted to help her. The protagonist selected the body cleaning function, so his whole body would become clean and sparkling. They were finally ashore, and their journey went quite smoothly. Even though it was a shortcut, they still took half an hour to reach there. The main lead asked them if they thought it was not worth it. His exploration was successful, and they reached the dungeon boss portal. They were amazed as they finally arrived at the portal, and he found it quite nostalgic. The mobs before were all scary, so they wondered if they were going to fight the booze of insanity. They asked if he had read something in the library, like the secret of cleaning the dungeon without fighting the boss. He refused as they needed to use real skill to beat the dungeon boss, and the mud dragon, the lord of swamp, appeared a level 5 monster. According to the plan, they have seen the Molotovs as the protagonist instructed them, after which Jay Run receives the message from Long Face, who asks them if they can see his message. He wondered why they could use the voice chat, but Long Face thought using it would startle them as they were scared and asked if everything was ready at their side. They give the sign thumbs up as they are done preparing on their side, and they wonder how that thief knows so many details as he also knows about the terrain of the boss's territory. He remembered how he instructed them to focus on what he would say and that they wouldn't be able to beat the boss head-on with their current level and equipment. They wondered what they should do then. He instructed them that the Molotovs he gave them were for throwing onto the boss when they were fighting it. He uttered that throwing three consecutive Molotovs would apply a burning effect to it. The boss monster is weak to fire and will also receive bonus damage multiplied when in its burn state. They wondered from where they were going to throw the Molotovs, if they were to get close to it, an attack from his tail would kill them all and be too dangerous. Furthermore, there was a limited range as to how far a Molotov could be thrown. He assured them that they didn't need to worry about that because he had already set a designated location for them. He sent a map coordinate to his teammates, for the problem that when they throw it, they have to listen for his signal. Jay Run assumed that their boss must have several friends who had already cleared the lower difficulties of Dark Forest, and that should be why he knew all this information. 
He is amazed as social connections are also one of his strengths, but his friend gets furious as he keeps calling Ling Si his boss and wonders if he needs to do so. Xiao Lan was nervous and wondered why he hadn't signed yet as he said he would signal them soon. Anti-mainstream decided to believe him because he had already planned for many things, but if his instruction had any problems, they would surely make him pay for it. She took deep breaths to calm herself and received the message from Jay Run, who was shocked as he said he would lure the boss there along and wanted to see how he would do that. The boss of the insanity difficulty has its grade of sublord, so they all wanted to see how he would lure it. The protagonist was standing on the cliff while the monster was sleeping. He met that monster after a long time and had already forgotten how many times he had fought him in his previous life. After reaching level 5, he learned a passive skill called combo accumulation, so if his attacks aren't interrupted by the enemy attacks, he will be able to accumulate his attacks. Then he could use the equipment set special skill with the new skill, Rush, as the ultimate trigger skill. He attacked the monster so that he could wake him up, and he succeeded in disturbing the slumber of Mud Dragon, Lord of the Swamp. The beast roared and got furious at the despicable humans who dared to disturb him from his rest. The protagonist gazed at him and said that they had met again. The boss monster tried to attack him, but he rushed away, dodging its attack. He went on its arm and burned it, so the monster spilled the acid at him, but he jumped and escaped his attack. He looked at the boss monster and smirked as he knew all of his tricks like the back of his hand and remembered the limits of his skills. He went down to a certain distance, which was good enough for his next skill. While the monster was ready to attack him again, Ling Si activated his skill backstab and attacked its horn. One hour later, Xiao Lan was tired of waiting for him as it had been so long, so she wondered why haven't given them the signal. The other players asked if he chose to run away because they asked what he had been doing as he was in the voice chat range. They don't want him to return and tell them that the plan has failed. Jay Run was sure that wouldn't happen because, in the party info, his status bar was still full. He wondered if he hadn't started fighting the boss. Otherwise, his health bar would have gone down after so long. He was shocked as they received the sign to be prepared. A swarm of dust appeared before them, and they wondered if that could be the boss. They were amazed as that thief lured the boss there. Zio got nervous, wondering what she should do. He instructs them not to act too early and waits until he lures the boss into the middle, and he rushes toward them while being chased by the boss monster. He is sure that they can take his life in one breath. Everyone was shocked to see the status bar of the boss monster's health because he alone wore down the boss's health by two-thirds and they wondered how he did it. Soon, the protagonist reached near them and instructed them to smash those model ofs like it was their last day, and they threw it at the monster, cursing it to die. Zio doesn't care about anything and throws the model ofs at the monster, all above its head, which startled him. Soon his body started burning, and she felt good as she felt like she was smashing this ugly piece of shit to death for money. She started throwing it at the monster more vigorously and furiously, which left anti-mainstream speechless. The beast was crying out tears of blood because of excruciating pain. The protagonist instructed them to pay attention as it was about to go berserk. After it goes berserk, the Mulatovs cannot target him anymore, which is its special skill after entering berserk mode. Soon, Molotovs could not find the target, and they wondered what they should do, so he guided them to throw it at him. They were shocked, wondering if he was crazy as they didn't want to kill their teammate. Even if they couldn't win, there was no need for him to kill himself. He yelled at them to throw Molotovs at him. Jay run threw it at him and shouted that he trusted him. He praised him for his trust and obedience, and as soon as the Molotovs reached near him, he activated Starfire Set. This was the special ability. For 30 seconds, he would be immune to any fire damage, and his next attack would apply fire damage, dealing 5 times extra damage to targets on fire. He uttered that for these 30 seconds, they should dance on his raging fire, and Starfire's Inferno has been activated. Meanwhile, outside the dungeon, everyone wondered if they were still in tut as those solo players had been there for one hour. They asked if they could clear the dungeon, but his fellow agreed as even Celestial was one of the five major guilds but couldn't clear the upper difficulty. Some players get tired of waiting and decide to start with a low difficulty first instead of watching this excitement. 
they thought they might be hiding in some corner of the dungeon trembling, and his fellow felt that they were probably about to come out, and that many people were crowding there, and they wanted to see them losing their pride. Bai Lei was furious, wondering what the team of solo players thought they were doing hiding around the dungeon, and wondering if they were scared of coming out. If Tiana weren't so interested in them, he would have already left, but it's not easy for them to stay inside the dungeon with the insanity difficulty of that long. Wasabi-kun was sure that if they were to enter it, staying alive that long in that dungeon would be hard even for them. The captain still wanted to ask him if he thought they could succeed, and asked if that special item he got in that level 8 dungeon last time he hadn't shown him its use in combat. He laughed and asked if he was talking about that power breakthrough device. It is a single-use item, so it should only be used during important events. Bai Lei was aware of it and didn't want him to think that he didn't know about it. He informed him that his items even caught the interest of the vice guildmaster. Wasabi-kun planned to see that item to raise his rank in the arena, but the captain found it boring. The arena is a PvP where any player, even lowly people, could enter and make him lose motivation to participate. Even though the higher their rank is, the better the rewards are, what he is most interested in is still his beautiful Tiana. He told Tiana there was no need for him to be that interested in them, but she was taking a look, but her intuition told him that something was going to happen. Meanwhile, inside the Dungeon of the Dark Forest, the Mud Dragon Lord of the Swap has entered Berserk Mode. Jay Run requested him to be careful as the boss monster had entered the Berserk Mode, and the other player wondered if he was sure that he would be able to do it. After entering the Berserk Mode, the only thing he must be careful of is the skill he is about to use because everything will end in 30 seconds. The boss monster attacked the protagonist, so he rushed at him and kicked all the Molotovs toward the beast that appeared in his way. The players were amazed to see that he was doing the boss's best skill with such a little movement and even kicked the Molotov tar they threw at him at the boss simultaneously. They wondered who he was if he was using these skills and mechanics, and if he was not hallucinating from the micro-mechanics he was using. The system notification appeared since he hadn't received any damage, yet his current combo accumulation was 3d659. As the right time arrived, he rushed toward the monster using Jet Rush, a bolting attack utilizing the user's extreme grasp of body movements and agility with a body like water, speed as fast as lighting. It deals with the player's agility damage and weapon damage based on the protection rate of the skill and costs 90 mana. As the Molotov reaches its body, the protagonist cuts the bottle and activates the Jet Rush Starfire's Inferno, which causes an explosion on the monster's body, due to which it growls. The protagonist reached above the monster's head to attack, so that he could end this matter, and he broke the Molotov bottle. Jet Rush has ended the combo. A total of 3660 attacks have been stacked, after which he gave it the final strike. The special attack Starfire Inferno effect has been triggered, which causes five times the total damage. Zio Lan was shocked as the notification appeared that her party had defeated the boss Mud Dragon. She remembered that Ling Si once asked her if she had learned novice healing, and she affirmed. So he decided to give her the novice debuff disperse skill book so she could understand it and so he could leave the rest to her. Everyone shouted at Zio Lan to disperse and heal quickly, so she affirmed and activated all these skills, which were helping the main lead to heal the burn damage that happened to him. Soon, the 30-second fire immunity ended, and he was pleased as she dispersed and healing was on time. This was a life and death fighting style that was still very hard for him to pull off with his current condition. Meanwhile, outside the dungeon, everyone wondered if they were not coming out as it had been so long and what they were doing in there and decided to go as it was a waste of time. They wanted to leave because they didn't need the information anymore because it took too long. So they assumed that a group of solo players must have gotten obliterated so there would be no information to get from them. There was no probability. Wolf Fang Guild members assumed that a group of solo players knew how to take their time but they didn't want to be impatient as they would have to come out eventually. Their mission was to have them confirm the insanity difficulty. Soon, the Global Notice congratulated the party whose information was hidden for clearing the Dungeon Dark Forest at the insanity difficulty. This notification shocked everyone as they couldn't believe it was real, and another Global Notice appeared as they had become the first clearer of the Dungeon Dark Forest at insanity difficulty. They were shocked as the first clearer notice appeared and amazed as they cleared it. They wondered who they were, and if they were from the number one guild. 
The other guild member was also shocked as some solo players needed help clearing the dungeon and getting the first clear record. Nebulous guild members were also shocked and wondered how they did that while Tiana rushed toward the portal. She wanted to know about this party and its captain, who was commanding the team, and she wanted to meet him. Soon, they came out of the dungeon, and players informed others as they wanted to know about those solo players who cleared the Insanity dungeon and were shocked. They asked him what guild they were from as they were amazing. Even the people from Celestial weren't able to clear the upper difficulty. Everyone was gossiping about the equipment they held and couldn't see their information because it was hidden. They couldn't believe they had become famous just like that as so many people gathered there. They gathered around them and asked for any secrets they could share to clear the insanity difficulty. After they questioned them, they realized why they were all surrounding them. They were amazed to see Zio Lan and remarked that she was awesome, but she laughed and uttered that she was just a healer. She never thought this would happen to her, attracting the attention of everyone felt so good. Jay Run smirked as they praised him, but he explained that he was following the boss's command and had nothing to be amazed about. As the protagonist predicted, they were all surroundings, so he was glad he asked them to hide their information. He instructed them to leave as it wasn't convenient to talk there as he still needed to explain the reward split for being the first to clean the dungeon and the plan after this. Jay Run affirmed his command, but Zio Lan got irritated, still wanting to show off a little bit more as she was having fun. While they were leaving, a member of the Wolf Fang's guild appeared and asked them if they were in the guild yet. Other players were amazed to see them, and the man remarked that except for that Starfire equipment set, there was nothing special about them. He introduced himself as the vice captain of the third division of the Wolf Fang's guild, which ranked third among the five major guilds. The protagonist furiously stared at them as the Wolf Fang members still had the same arrogant attitude. In his previous life, Wolf Fangs were also the third biggest guild but their cockiness was even worse than the number one guild, and they used their guild's name to hog monster respawn points everywhere. They targeted the solo players who didn't submit to them in PvP, and all they could do was suffer in silence. He had suffered quite a bit by their hands in his previous life as well. Anti-Mainstream was amazed as they were one of the five major guilds and wondered if they were about to be recruited by them. His friend affirmed but knew they didn't even have the skill to join any of those major guilds, he approached them and assumed they were probably not members of any of the five major fuels because their information was hidden. They have some skill, so he wondered who their captain was, and everyone pointed toward the Ling Si. The vice captain reached out to him and was amazed to know he was the captain, as he had never thought a thief would lead the team. He asked if he had joined a guild yet. The protagonist ignored him and instructed them that they had two hours left before the server closed, so they should go. He gets furious as the protagonist ignores him and tells him he is talking to him. Anti-Mainstream touched his shoulder to pinpoint that the division vice captain of Wolf Fangs was talking to him. The other member of Wolf Fangs gets furious and remarks that even if he is a member of the number one guild, he does not need to be this arrogant. Their guild was still a top three guild, so he should respond and tell them whether he was already in a guild. The protagonist was calm but the other players got worried and got furious at him. He said that if they hadn't joined one, they should be honored to be asked to join. If they haven't joined, he, as the third division vice captain, will be given special treatment and could enter their first sub-guild. The main lead passed him and asked who he was, as he didn't know about him and wasn't interested in his offer, which shocked them. His group members were also shocked as he rejected his offer. The vice captain was furious and accursed him as he had had enough of him. He asked him if he thought he was so good that they should have a duel right now and wanted him to accept his request. Everyone gets scared as that divisional vice captain has lost his temper, so they should keep their distance from them and watch the show from there so they won't get dragged into it. Anti-Mainstream was worried as this duel wasn't good because the main lead opponent was a member of the Wolf Fangs, but he was trying to persuade him to accept the duel. The system notification appeared, asking him if he wanted to accept the instant one versus one request from the stranger. His team members decided to move back to be careful and wondered if that thief had a grudge against Wolf's Fang Guild. The protagonist refuses to have the duel because he doesn't have the time for this because he can't accept it. The vice captain utters that he doesn't care, even if he gets a red name, no one can do anything to him. 
he attacked him with his exploding fireball and the system notification appeared that a player had attacked him so he could defend himself. Killing the attacker while defending himself will not give him a red name. He dodged the fireball attack, rushed toward the vice captain, and attacked him. He rushed back and was amazed by his reaction speed as he dodged his exploding fireball with minimal movement. Tiana appeared at the scene and cast the spell of intercepting thorny vines, due to which huge vines appeared between both parties. They get furious at the interruption from the nebulous guild member. She stares at him, and her instinct tells her that he might be the thief Dira was talking about. Wolf Fang member gets furious and curses her. She inquires why she is stepping in, and she explains that the thief is a friend of Nebulous. She wondered if they could plan to represent their Wolf Fang guild to stir up a conflict between them. They smirked as it Nebulous again, their fated enemy, and warned her that she should stop stepping into their matters, or they would get rid of her too. Her weapon appeared as if she was ready to attack her, but her vice captain instructed her to put away her weapon, which startled her, but she affirmed. They asked her if that meant she would protect that person on behalf of the Nebulous Guild. She found this matter interesting and challenged her that they would fight till their last breath in the next week's monthly guild war, they would fight till their last breath. She promised to meet again in the guild war, so he turned and left, which startled his companion as they were going just like that. She wondered why they didn't get rid of them. The vice captain thought she was an idiot as there would have been no problem doing it if that thief was not one of the other four major guilds. But now that Nebulus is protecting him, he asks her if she thinks she can bear the consequences of starting the war between both guilds. If the superiors hear of this, even he wouldn't be able to get away with it. He rambled her name and wanted her to wait until they met at the guild war as he would have a good time with her. The protagonist thanked her for helping him and his team members gathered around him and inquired if he was all right and were sacred as they almost started fighting, but he was all right. Tiana asked if they weren't in a guild yet because being the first to clear the insanity difficulty dungeon. There was no way they wouldn't have shown off their guild since it's one of the many ways to help their guild gain fame. Furthermore, no normal guild would dare to provoke people from wolf fangs as he has guts. She advised him that even if he became a pro as a solo player, there wouldn't be any good outcomes if he made himself an enemy of the five major guilds. She was sure that if she hadn't helped him on time, it would have become difficult for him to get away with it, so he owed her quite a favor. The protagonist agrees with her as despite how strong one can be, it's still nothing compared to a guild and asks for her intentions. Zio Lan was furious as an opponent had appeared. She never thought she had come and tried to steal her strong boy. Tiana smirked and uttered that she wanted him to help her with something. She wanted him to join their guild briefly and participate in the upcoming monthly guild war. She was willing to pay him considerable rewards or give him any equipment or material she could get and ask for his opinion. She knew that his skill was worth looking into so she could use him in the future. She needed to get him to join Nebulous first, then try to make him stay later. He refused her offer, which broke her hope, and she uttered that he did not need to reject her so straightforwardly. Ling Si clarified that he doesn't plan on joining a guild so soon, even if it's temporary. The restriction of joining a guild will remove a lot of his freedom. Since she was worried about the restriction problem, she, as a division vice captain, said she would try to grant him as few restrictions as possible. She just needed him to help her to a certain extent in the monthly guild wars and asked what he thought about her offer now. He was startled as it didn't look like her guild needed his help. Besides, he was just a level 5 thief. She denies it as they need his skill. Nebulous and Wolf Fangs have always been enemies due to their fight in the early game for gaining benefits. At first, it was normal. Any guild in its growing stage will have at least some conflicts with others. But as the guild grew, these conflicts became bigger and bigger, and as he saw now, they met some of the most troubled members of that guild. Moreover, they will probably target her in the next monthly guild wars because they protect him now. So she begged him if he could protect her from getting killed and dropping levels in the next monthly guild war, and she wanted to make him stay. The protagonist suggested she shouldn't participate, but they couldn't. She was startled by his cold response and was amazed as he didn't move at all at what she said to him. She explained that participating in the monthly guild war was a way to get many guild honor points, so she needed help. She was startled as she received a friend request sent by a stranger. 
He wanted to add each other as a friend first and would think about her proposal later. He knew that she probably helped him because she wanted to gain some profit from him, but she did get into more trouble herself while doing so. He promised her to give his response before the Guild War, and she gladly said okay as she succeeded in her first step. While he was leaving, she requested him to give her a response as soon as possible because even though it was she who would recommend him, he still had to go through the normal process and was sure that the entrance examination would be a piece of cake for him. The protagonist sighed as this was so troublesome and wanted to talk about it when the time came. She was happily willing to wait for his positive response, accepted his friend request, and opened player character information. She was amazed that he was 17 years old and 6 years younger than her. But before she could scroll down to look at more details, a notification appeared about the restriction of information to the public, which amazed her as he was so fast. He even blocked his information from his friend and remarked that he is an uncute little brother. Bai Lai witnessed all this incident and gets jealous and furious at him. After setting his information to private, he returned to his teammates waiting for him, and he didn't want to reveal his information from that moment onward. His teammates were glad to see him back and inquired what he and that nebulous beauty were discussing. They wondered if there was something that he could tell them, and if it could be that she fell for their cold little puppy. Zio Lan gets furious upon hearing all this. The protagonist warned them to stop spouting such nonsense, or he wouldn't be distributing the equipment to them, and they laughed and uttered that they were joking. He looked at the equipment distribution chart and was amazed because, just the insanity and difficulty of the dark forest, he could drop the equipment he needed. The drop rate of the dungeons is high just when it opens, and they are lucky this time and decide to keep the cheap assassin's equipment, set up arm guards, and instruct them to share the rest of the coins and items equally. The cheap assassin equipment set has the highest agility stat bonus for the high class players below level 10, which makes his life easier for some time. But it was only equipable after reaching level 6, so he needed to hurry and get the rest of the set. Other players were glad to see so much material and were delighted as they were rich now, surprisingly inquired if he was giving them the rest. Besides the coins, the items also had quite some value, so we proposed to distribute them equally, but he was okay and didn't need the rest. Furthermore, he adjusted the experience share by lowering his proportion to level 5, so they might have leveled up. Zio Lan was glad as she reached level 2, Long Face and Anti-Mainstream reached level 4, and Jay Run reached level 3. Before he reaches level 6, they still need to sweep the dungeon several times until he gets all the equipment from the set. He was logging off and instructed them to meet there tomorrow, and they were glad and excited to clear the dungeon again with him. He could still learn assassin skills and tricks from the boss. Others thought if they kept getting carried, he could be rich so that he would accept this gift, so he agreed to wait for him tomorrow and wanted him to be on time. The next day, he woke up at 7 o'clock and was glad because his life was going smoothly. Heavenland's scientific helmet could give players enough rest while playing the game without affecting their real life or game process. He went down and saw the man cleaning, so he suggested helping him with cleaning, and the old man was glad to see him wake up early. During the following three days, they challenged the insanity and difficulty of the dark forest non-stop. Finally, on the third day, he collected the rest of the cheap assassin's equipment set, armor, leggings, boots and headwear before logging out. He later parted ways with the noisy four-person group, and they bid their farewell to him. Zio Lan was crying about how he could abandon them like this. But he promised to meet them again and bid farewell, so he could continue to his next objective. Later, at the Castle of the Singing Moon level 10 map, he assumed that things should still be there and searched it around but carefully without being noticed by level 10 corpse seeking evil spirits as they had a four-level gap. Although he could take care of one, it would be challenging if he were to attract a horde of them. He anticipated that with the bonus agility and perception stats from the cheap assassin set, he could avoid using the terrain. His purpose there was not to challenge the level 10 boss of the castle of the singing moon, as he didn't have the strength to do that yet. What's important is the skill book at the waterfall, which is evil spirit invisibility. He went down, and his foot struck with the corpses. He wondered why these ate the evil spirit's remains, and if a level 10 player was already there. That game slacks off a bit, and countless people will start catching up. After searching around, he finally reached where the chest was present. 
as he expected, it was still in the same place. The cursed chest doesn't have a lock. He was aware that there would be a debuff after opening it. Soon, his system notification appeared that he had discovered the cursed chest, but it seemed like this old chest wasn't locked. But the person who would open the chest would be punished with the curse, so he inquired if he wanted to open the chest. It was worth it compared to the kill he acquired, so he opened the chest, and the system opened it. He would receive a 60% debuff that applies to all his stats, the curse would last 6 hours, and the effect would be activated immediately. As the chest opened, all of his stats lowered, and the time for the curse to end initiated, but in the end, he got the skill book that he wanted. The skill takes quite a bit of time to earn, so he has to find a safe place, but he is strangled as he hears someone's voice from behind. The person already predicted that there would be an idiot who would open the chest, and as he looked back, he saw three higher level players. The player was praising their captain as he was a genius to have some idiot open the curse and bear it so that they could save it from them. They had been waiting for a blockhead like him for a few days, the captain instructed him to let him see what was inside the chest for it to have the price of having such a strong debuff. The protagonist was careless as he didn't think anyone would set a trap on this kind of map, now that he had the evil spirit invisibility. He was confident going against those three if he wasn't cursed, but his attributes have been reduced by 60%. This was troublesome because his opponents were two level 10 and a level 11, which reduced the probability of him winning against them. The man remarked that he must be quite skilled to come to this map at level 6. He was originally prepared to have a team fight, but he didn't think it had to be just one person. He instructed him to be a good boy and hand over the item. The protagonist wondered if he had to hand over the skill book to ensure his life as they were the people from Wolf Fang's guild again. With the personality of their guild members that he has seen so far, he was sure that even if he gave them the skill book, he would probably still get killed by them. The protagonist remarked that he never thought the mighty Wolf Fang would steal things from the solo players and wondered what they would do if he didn't want to give them. He restored his item in his bag, and they were amazed, as they had never thought he would be so stubborn, even after knowing they were members of Wolf Fang. He aimed an arrow toward him to attack, but he used the backstab skill, so the system notification appeared that he had shot a player, so the player could now justifiably defend themselves. The protagonist was aware that the first to strike got the advantage, so he attacked their captain, but he smirked and easily blocked the attack using Dauntless Block. His stats were too low, and even his skill speed had become slow. His opponent was amazed as he had the hidden balls to think he had attacked them first. He struck him, which reduced his strength, and then attacked him using a locked-on shot skill. He evaded the attack and realized they were cornering him, he calmed down to think more clearly. He wondered if any items could help him, but soon, he could think of a way to get attacked by his opponent. The captain remarked that he would have had a quicker death if he had added over the item but now he should die and drop the item. He gave him a strong strike using greatsword punishment and decided to silence him with a vein cutter. That way, he wouldn't be able to fight back. He didn't want to let them hit him with a silencing skill. While they were attacking him, he activated his skill of jet rushing and approached his opponent. He was amazed as he was coming to him to make himself an easier target and was courting his death, and he released his arrow. The protagonist dodges his attack and uses a backstab to attack him, which shocks him. The player couldn't believe he could fight like this after having all his stats reduced by 60% and wondered if he was cursed. They were amazed as he had been using the instances when his skills acted to dodge their skill and attacks. Precise micro-movements, he would have failed if he were late to avoid them by even a millisecond, as even he couldn't do that and wondered who that person was. Their captain gets furious and asks him why he is standing there as he should go and attack him, and he affirms his command. He commanded them to surround him and not to let him get away. The last thing that Ling Si could use in his current situation was the basic war smoke bomb. The notification appeared as the basic war smoke had been activated, so all players within range would temporarily lose sight and would not be targetable. Its duration was 3 seconds. They could not see him because of the smoke that appeared, which made use of AO Disperse, which made the smoke disperse. The protagonist used a single-used item grappling hook, which alarmed them as he was trying to escape, so he commanded them to shoot him, and they attacked him with his locked-on shot technique. He got struck by the locked-on shot, lost his grip, and fell into the water. 
he was furious at Wolf Fang's guild and promised to remember them. They saw him falling into the water and were furious as they didn't even get the item and cursed him. Falling from that height, they were sure that he would die with his remaining health. He was convinced that they would meet again if they had the chance, but was convinced that he wouldn't be so lucky next time. After some time ashore, his hand appeared from the water and came alive. Luckily, before coming out with that, he spent money on an instant recovery potion. Otherwise, he would have died after falling into the waterfall with that health. The protagonist was furious at them. He didn't want anything to do with them. But it was their fault for angering him first. Meanwhile, Chana was working at her office and received a call from her friend since his data was hidden. She inquired who the person was calling. She was shocked as the protagonist uttered his name. She was glad he finally contacted her as she had been waiting for him for several days. The protagonist told her to help him arrange the entrance examination as he would accept her offer. She was delighted and enthusiastically asked him when he was free as she would arrange his examination immediately, and he told her he wanted to give an examination right now. Later, in the nebulous examination area, everyone was gathered and was shocked as they heard about an entrance exam. They were stunned as the annual exams ended not too long ago, but they heard that the vice division Captain Tana specially arranged it for just one person. They came there after seeing the message in the guild channel. What was more shocking was that the exam was held for just one person, and I wondered if it was a powerful, rich kid. They were unsure about it, but Vice Division Captain Tiana wasn't the kind of person who treated rich people differently. Finally, they reached it, and Ling Si wondered why so many people were gathered there. Tiana explained that he was the first person to take the exam alone, so all of them were very curious about him. They were amazed to see that the player and even thought it would be him as he didn't look special. The protagonist was uncomfortable and wondered why these people were there as they should go level up. He sighed and was so annoyed to see the crowd again. Compared to when he cleared insanity difficulty, this was quite small, so Tiana wanted him to get used to it anyway. As Tiana expected, her guess was right, as Dira confirmed he was the thief she was talking about. She was shocked as she never thought he was also the first to clear the insanity and difficulty of the Dark Forest. Dira wondered how she got him to join because she invited him last time but got rejected. He was one of that kind, but now that he was willing to participate in the M's, she wanted Tiana to make him stay in the guild. Dira was right, having such a talent by her side would help her achieve her final goal. Other nebulous guild members were waiting for him, and they finally arrived there. Tiana was sure that the exam this time should be a piece of cake for him. Bai Lai and Wasabi Kun introduced themselves, he inquired if he was the thief Tiana had been blabbing on about non-stop. They found him interesting as he was the one who cleared the insanity difficulty and was the first to clear it. Tiana uttered that Bai Lai is their third division captain, so the exam's content is that the third division members standing behind the captain are in charge of the nebulous entrance exam. He just needed to last ten minutes against the member responsible for passing the exam so he should choose one to be his opponent. One of the men behind raised his hand as he wanted to be determined by him for the test, but before he could select the captain stopped her. He suggested that he should be the opponent for the exam this time, which shocked her because there was no need fr him to fight as it's just a normal exam. Since Tiana strongly recommended him and even specially arranged that exam for him so, he as the division captain also had to take responsibility. He thought if he had the guts to accept it, then he would humiliate him as he dared to make his Tiana talk non-stop about him. Tiana was worried as they were at a level gap, so she didn't think this was a good idea, however, she was shocked when Ling Si agreed as he had no problem with it. He doesn't care if it's him or anyone else as he quickly wants to start the examination and end this formality. Tiana said he was the division captain and was three levels higher than him, so why did he accept it? but this wasn't a big deal as long as he could end this boring exam fast. Bai Lai was furious to see them whispering and inquired what they were whispering and standing so close to and if he wanted to start the exam, he should follow him. He was so jealous and wanted to humiliate him thoroughly in front of Tiana and everyone. They informed them that the exam field was in the other corner and Tiana gave the bracelet to him. He wondered what this so she elucidated that it was an evaluation device that every guild has. The evaluation device will give an initial score according to his current level, stats, equipment, and how he played in the past. 
In addition, it also constantly updates his score during the examination, making it easier to evaluate a person's skill. After wearing it, they will be able to see his score. The rules of Nebulous are that scores lower than 100 will be a part of the third division, 100 to 150 will be in the second division, and scores higher than 50 will be in the first. She was telling his score based on his stats and was startled. So the protagonist told her that all of his stats had been lowered by 60% due to a curse and was sure that would probably affect it. She was so shocked to know that his stats had been reduced by 60% and wondered how he would fight and how long it would last. The protagonist uttered that this curse would last about 10 minutes, but he was okay as there shouldn't be any problems since it was just an exam. He instructed her to let go as he wanted to finish the exam to grind levels quickly. She was worried because Captain Bai Lai's score was 92 back then, and she prayed for him. Soon, the announcement about the commencement of the exam was made, and everyone was amazed as Captain Bai Lai was going to fight so the match would be interesting. The captain explained that the time limit was 10 minutes and that, to be fair to everyone, he wouldn't show mercy, so he invited him and wanted him to accept it. The protagonist remarked that it would be better to use his full power since he is a thief and his opponent is an archer. Their classes counter each other. He accepted the guild entrance examination invite and Bai Lai smirked and asked if he was taking him as a normal archer class. He wanted to make him pay for telling such jokes, and his spirit Frostbow appeared before him. The protagonist realizes he is an agility-type archer with a Frostbow that causes slowness. For a player somewhere around his level, he would be quite an annoying opponent. The captain attached him using rapid fire, which was such a fierce attack right from the start, which stunned Ling Si, and he was evading all his attacks. Captain Bai Lai smirked and remarked that if all he could do were block, he wouldn't let him pass the exams. The captain attacked him using the detonating icicle to pierce through his body, but he retrieved his dagger and tried to stop it. But soon after the explosion, he realized that it was an explosion-type ice attack, which managed to reduce his strength. The audience were cheering the captain as he was so fierce and figured out that the thief might have gone to suffer a bit. His companion assumed he wouldn't be a new guy as he didn't think he would be joining the guild anymore. Tenno was worried and wanted Ling Yi to last 10 minutes. She checked his points, which were 85 and was shocked. His current score was that much even though he told her he has the curse that lowers 60% of all his stats. She never thought he would score this high in his current condition and knew he might have less than minutes left until the curse wore off. She wondered how high he could score in perfect condition. The protagonist smirked and rushed to attack the captain. The protagonist was progressing toward him while evading all the captain's attacks. The captain laughed as he tried to get close with those sloppy skills, but he was still lacking, so he turned him into a beehive. The protagonist wonders what's wrong with him as his hostility is written all over his face, and then he rushes behind him and attacks him using backstab. This debuff bothers the protagonist because even backstab's skill casting speed is slowed. While trying to attack him, Bai Lai dodged it and remarked that he had been waiting for him to use backstab. He used blinding counter skills. The system informed him that the blinding counter renders all his attacks ineffective within the net for two seconds and reduces our vision range to one meter. Ling Si was shocked as he used blinding skills, and soon he couldn't see anything other than this fog. The captain aimed the arrow at him. He was sure he wouldn't be able to dodge the arrow this time. He got attacked by it, and his points were deducted for that frost crystal detonation. Everyone praised the captain as he rocked, and his combo was amazing. Tiano was worried as she instructed him that he shouldn't have accepted the challenge. Wasabi-kun asked Tiana if the thief was currently a debuff, and she was shocked and wondered how he knew that. He explained that it shouldn't have taken that long for Backstab to cast in normal circumstances. This was the least he should know since he was also a thief. She affirmed that he was right, he currently has an all stats 0% low curse which amazed him as he fought while having a debuff. At the same time, the captain asked him if he would surrender because there were still 7 minutes till the exam was over and remarked that his performance wasn't that great. The protagonist asks if it is an exam as it seems like he is venting his anger on him, but he wonders what nonsense he is talking about and why he would vent his anger at him. The protagonist wanted to drag this out a bit more and was sure he could last seven minutes, so he rushed toward the forest. Bai Lai wondered where he was going amidst their match and followed him. 
he asked if he thought hiding in the forest would help him and suggested that he shouldn't even try to run. The audience was shocked, wondering if they would fight in the forest and if that thief thought he could win by fighting in a different terrain. They were worried as they wouldn't be able to see anything if they fought in the forest. Tiana and Wasabi-kun headed over there to observe it closely, and he inquired if she knew how long that thief debuff would last. She informed him that his cure would be over soon, which worried him as Bai Lei might be in danger. The captain was rushing around looking for him and telling him to stop hiding as he already told him not to treat him as a normal archer as he could still defeat him even in the forest. The protagonist clarifies that he has no reason to lure him here other than to save him from looking like a fool in front of all his guild members. As he conversed, he figured out his location, so he rushed there and finally found him. He asked if he was not going to run anymore. There was only one minute left till the end of the exam, and they would see who would be the fool. Then, they suggested that he should beg him to consider letting him pass. The curse on the protagonist ended, so all stats 60% reduction debuff has been removed, and he looked at him and smirked as he was done running. One minute was enough for him to make him reevaluate whether he was qualified to join his guild. Bai Lai laughed and wanted to tell him honestly that he looked pretty cool right now, but this wouldn't happen. As they reached them, the guild evaluation device responded, and she was shocked as Ling C numbers were still skyrocketing. His points went 140 and were still rising, and soon she saw them fighting. Using Jet Rush, he gave him a critical hit, and he was thrown back. The captain was shocked by the sudden change in his mechanics and controls, which differed from earlier. Tiana and Wasabi reached there and were surprised to see them. The captain cursed him, thinking he was putting on a show outside and inquired if he was looking down on him. He got furious and instructed him not to blame him for killing him accidentally, but before he could attack, the exam mode was cancelled as the duration was over. Tina was worried and tried to stop the captain, but he attempted, which the main lead evaded and ran behind him to use a backstab. His captain smirked as he dared to try that trick again and asked if he hadn't learned that skill doesn't work on him. He used the blinding counter again, but this time, the captain was slow and he attacked him, which caused an interruption of his skill casting. The captain wondered how he managed to do that. It was as if his speed multiplied, but he was three levels higher than him. He gazed furiously at him, but Ling Si kicked him, threw him afar, and asked what he was saying earlier. He pointed his dagger at him and asked who would kill who now. Before he could take any extreme step, Wasabi threw his dagger at him, which startled him. Wasabi-kun instructed him to move his dagger away because killing him wouldn't improve his exam score. The protagonist uttered that if that was the case, why shouldn't he take on both? Wasabi-kun inquired if he meant that he wanted to challenge both of them at the same time. Bai Lei cursed and wanted him to stop acting all cocky as he could take him on himself. Wasabi-kun knew the captain had been beaten badly and was curious about that thief's skill. So he agreed as he wanted to see if he had the skill to do so, but the captain got furious at him, asking if he didn't hear him as he could handle him alone. Wasabi-kun showed him the reality because he was a thief. He could feel it, so he wanted him to stop as he could beat him. With his imposing aura and judging by how he isn't flustered at all currently, he could tell that he hasn't gone all out yet. Tiana tried to calm them down as she thought it would be enough for the examination, but Wasabi remarked that they would know when to stop. Bai's lie was disconcerted because the most important thing to him was that he had him in front of Tiana, so he wanted to have him under his feet and agreed with Wasabi so that he would know when to stop. He voraciously told Wasabi to go as he tried to use that skill. Wasabi thought he was an idiot as he lost all of his sense just to keep his reputation. He went above and smiled wickedly as he would attack exclusively archers who could damage his enemies and allies. It forms an arrow array after 1-5 seconds, dealing the damage of the ice arrow to every player inside it, whose range is 9 meters and lasts for 180 seconds. Tiana was concerned about seeing his skill because Ling Si would be in trouble once the array was formed. The captain instructed Wasabi Ono to let him get out of there for one second. He wanted to make him sleep now and not give him any chances. Wasabi went near him to stop him and wanted that little thief to show him what he would do when he was up against two opponents that were higher level than him. He used lethargy backstab to attack the main lead and apologized to him. Tiana worried as one of the people in charge, he was the best thief in the third division. 
His movements and skills are even better than most of the second division's thieves, and she figured out that in the end, he was too arrogant. Bai Lai was glad as this was the hit by him, so he instructed him to hurry and leave the range of the array, but he did not feel right. He feels like he is stabbed into cotton, so something is wrong, and his fear skill is activated as the Ling Si clone looks back at him and realizes he was fooled. He fell into the fear condition and lost control of his body for two seconds. They were worried as his array was about to be formed. It was too late for him because the ice was covering his body and he couldn't move. He got trapped inside the array, which was causing damage to his health. His captain wondered where he had disappeared, and he was startled as he heard his voice from behind. The protagonist is glad he learned that skill before coming there and instructed him to remember that if he used a skill like an absolute zero arrow array next time, he should fix his opponent into one place before casting it. He was shocked, wondering when he came behind him, but he asked if that was his duty to tell him. When they were about to attack him for safety, he used the invisibility of evil spirits just in case the one they shot was the evil spirit he created as a substitute. Evil spirit invisibility makes a player an evil spirit, giving his real body invisibility. Enemies approach, it will fall on the condition of fear for two seconds, and his real body will be invisible for three seconds. Its special effect was that the next attack after invincibility would deal 300% critical damage, including the skills. Tiana wondered what skill he used that was amazing, and she rushed toward them, telling him to let go of the captain and wanted the captain that he should pass the exam after seeing his skill. After the absolute zero arrow array skill ended, they heard Wasabi Kun saying that his examination hadn't finished yet and were shocked to see him wearing the belt he got from the dungeon. He planned on using this in the arena to increase his ranking, but he never thought he would be more worthy of being challenged. He wanted to fight him for 15 seconds using the single-use item power breakthrough device, which increased all his stars by 90%. He challenged him to show his true strength, after which the protagonist realized he was quite interested in him. He hit the campaign using the back of his dagger, which gave him a critical hit of 300%, and he went unconscious, which worried Tiana, and she rushed toward him. He assured her not to worry as he had just knocked him out using the skill's critical hit and instructed her to take him to the side. His attitude of giving his all to prove he is better, he missed this feeling so much, and in his previous life, he was also like this, endlessly falling and getting back up and gradually becoming stronger. Tiana took the captain to the side and was healing his wound using his magic. She was shocked as she saw his points, which were increasing and reaching 300. She assumed something was wrong with the measuring device, which was why this happened to score. But his score went above 300, and she wondered what was happening there, and he agreed to give him 15 seconds as he wished. In his previous life, his past had struggled, but he still held on in a place full of strength, putting all of his faith and honor into these battles, fighting for glory. Fighting with everything on the line to prove who was the strongest, he felt that continued to push him forward. At this moment, the opponent in front of him reminded him of that feeling. His indescribable and hot-blooded emotions had been awakened once again, and it seemed that it might be arousing something else as well. Tenna was shocked, and Wasabi was more certain after seeing those eyes on him that using the power breakthrough device was the right choice, so he instructed him not to bold back and let him use his full power. The protagonist points his sword at him and assures him that he will do that as he hasn't felt pumped up in a long time. The time of 15 seconds of their duel initiated, so they rushed at each other to finish it quickly and attacked each other. The protagonist attacked him, but he evaded, and when he shot him, the protagonist also dodged it, and he realized that his opponent was this fast. Ten seconds had left, and he rushed back to use the backstab, but got caught by him. He was shocked as he was faster than he expected and punched him, which his backstab skill interrupted. He was surprised as he had gone mad charging into him like that with such a close distance. There was no way he could reach in time, and he used his backstab. Meanwhile, the group of those four players missed the time when little brother Ling Si took them to level up. Xiao Lan remarked that they could sell all their materials and gain much money. If they did, he would have been able to have his banquet full of food bonuses, but her companion gets furious and remarks ha, huh, he also levels up quickly even without him. Xiao Lan doesn't agree, they could level up quickly by themselves because he let them go from the dungeon. Annie Mainstream looked at Jay Run, who was looking at something and smiling, 
and he wondered what he had been looking at all this time. He told them that these were the notes he wrote down when they were traveling with Boss Ling Si, just some things he had learned from him. Xiao Lan wondered if I could make him as strong as him, and he hoped he would be like that. He inquired if they remembered when they defeated that mud dragon in the insanity level dungeon, the movement of Ling Si, he was very sure at that time. But now that he has compared him to much information he found, he was certain that his gaming mechanics, controls and movements were in time state. Xiolan was amazed as the name of it sound like is full of philosophy. Long Face wondered what he had thought as he also heard rumors about the top time. The word top time refers to when a player reaches a state of total immersion with their game character. Once a person manages to reach that state, they can pilot extraordinarily fast micro-mechanics and reaction speed. The term top time originates from old online games and is still used today. Its realm or feeling that all pros seek after is not an exaggeration to say that it could only be discovered, not desired, but only a rumor. Long face doms believe this is right. If Ling Si is a power and somehow manages to master top time, he will be able to accomplish impossible feats. Conversely, the protagonist attacked Wasabi Kun and interrupted his backstabbing skills. He fell and was shocked as he couldn't react that quickly. He even increased his stats with the power breakthrough device. But in front of him, it's like he didn't raise his stress and can't believe all this. He rushed and used clone execution to attack him but got punched by him, and his skill got interrupted. He was shocked, wondering why his reaction speed was so quick. He had a fast attack and interruption speed. In front of him, it's as if all of his movements were reduced, and he got a vital stab, which interrupted his skill again, and two seconds were left. He grabbed his dagger and assumed he would be nothing with his weapon. He wanted to make him pay with his weapon. Before he could do anything, he pulled out his dagger and blocked his attack. Then he turned him and put his foot on his back as his exam was over. His notification appeared that he had been disarmed, and he was shocked because disarmed meant his weapons had been broken or taken away during a battle, so any attack and skill would lose the weapon damage bonuses. Tiana was shocked as Wasabi Kun accepted that he had lost and Ling Si had won and was strong. He remarked that Tiana was right about him and had passed the exam. Since he has completed the examination, he decided to leave, and he will return the day after tomorrow. Iana instructed him no to forge Ha, the monthly guild's war is in two days, so he must come to the gathering and be glad as she finally got him. Wasabi Kun inquired her about Bai Lai. She explained that it looked like he had quite impacted his time, so he left earlier without a word. Wasabi thought it was fine and should rest for a bit because his current self must have lost all of his senses. He remembered his mark, so he asked for Ling Si's final rating. She looked at the screen and said he was 86. He was surprised and laughed as Bai Lai's final rating was 92 points and he was 90 points, but Ling Si was 86 points and he found this very interesting. He praised her for her hard work and instructed her to head back while she was confused about his rating. Wasabi Kun reminded her that they would still need to discuss the arrangements of the monthly guild wars and she followed him. She still didn't know whether there was something wrong with the device or if she recruited a monster because his final rating was 993. Later, he was in the boundless desert of the level 7 map and was surrounded by the fox. After the boss wolf roared, all the other wolves attacked him. The protagonist said the throat slasher and beheads the monster, and soon he is done with all the other mobsters and just the boss is left who is approaching him. Using Shadow Flash Blink, he reached above its head and attacked the monster, which startled him. After the attack, he faints when Ling Si uses the flow of the Bone Breaker to defeat the monster. He spent much time just testing out the new skills and only leveled up once after grinding for two days. The efficiency of grinding these kinds of tasks alone is not good enough as expected. He still needs to build a group. He received the message of completing the task of Wolf Slaughter. He realized that the higher the level, the harder it is for him to level up. The current efficiency rate wouldn't do in the end. There is still a limit on how much one can do alone. He was still pondering when he received a call from his friend and attended the call. Tiana got furious at him, inquiring where he was and why he didn't reply to her message. The monthly guild war was about to start, so he hurriedly reached there so that he could prepare for it. He informed her that he was doing a task, so he couldn't see the messages she sent. She furiously commanded him to be there soon because he was the only person they were missing. 
and he understood her concern, so he immediately headed there. Soon, he reached there where everyone was waiting for him and waved at him so that he could easily find them. Dira greeted him and welcomed him to Nebulous Guild and was glad to see him, and he greeted him too. Tiana instructed him that it was Dira and reminded him that they had already met before. He asked another group member if he took care of his staff properly, and he affirmed that he could even equip it now. Tiana uttered that Dira and her group are all the people that she trusts very much, they are also their group members for the Guild War this time. There is a limit on how many people can join the monthly Guild War, but he is allowed to freely form groups with whoever wants to go against the other guilds. Dira assured Tiana not to worry because this time she wouldn't let anyone hurt her and she was glad and decided to be in her care so that both of them could try their best. The protagonist looks at them and can't believe that she can seduce both men and women. This was his first time taking part in a monthly guild war, so he inquired if there was anything he should be aware of. She gets attentive toward him as he almost forgot about it, so she starts explaining the rules of the monthly guild war to him. The monthly guild war is a monthly competition for guilds to compete against each other. Every guild will send out a certain number of members, and their glory score will depend on the number of people they kill. In simple words, between the time that the door opens and closes, the more kills the guild has, the higher the rank that guild will be. The guild with a higher score will be able to increase its ranking, so a monthly guild war is an important way for a guild to show its strength. The protagonist wondered then if it wouldn't be a win for the guilds that are already stronger, for example, the big five guilds. But they can't do anything about it since the five big guilds have already shown their strength, but there is still a way that the players call the way of survival. Normally, the other guild wouldn't take the initiative to provoke the big five guild as they would go against the guild that is on the same level as them or weaker. That's how they maintain and increase their guild ranking, but the big five guilds wouldn't be so cowardly as to pick on people weaker than them. The protagonist understands that the way of survival is just how the weak live, he has something that he wants to talk to Tiana about in private, so he instructs her to follow him to the corner. Dira was shocked, wondering what secret they had that they couldn't talk about there in front of them. Their fellow remarked that Dira had a powerful rival. She was shocked when she found out that he wanted to create a group by himself afterward. The protagonist assures her that the group will still belong to Nebulus, but it won't belong to any division, and she will be the person in charge of the group. He wanted to choose the members himself, and they could take the examination after they joined and asked her for her opinion. She thought that it meant she would be playing the role of a manager, and was reluctant as this never happened before. She asked him if he had already decided on the members and if he had already had someone in his mind. She realized that he wanted to create a strong group and if she were the person in charge of it, she might be able to bring unexpected results. The protagonist just thought about this idea that day and about the members. Even though there are a lot of talented people in the game, it would be easy to get them to join. She was sure that as long as he could join the guild, she would try her best to cooperate with him. That's the promise that they had. As the third division vice captain, she promised that she would help him with this idea of his, but he must promise he can't betray her. He laughed and assured her not to worry as he wasn't the kind of person who betrayed her and he was startled as he heard someone's voice. Little Ruko was requesting them to let him join their group as he wouldn't be a hindrance for them. He begged them and promised to do his best and assure them that he would be the one who would tank the most damage. The player tried to persuade him and uttered that they should be the ones begging him to leave. The other groups have already rejected him so he is not supposed to join the monthly guild war with his current skill. They are sure other players will abuse him. Ruko was crying as he tried hard for a chance to join this month's guild war, so he requested them to let him join them. If he can't join a team, he will lose his qualification to join the monthly guild war, so he requests them to let him in. The protagonist is amazed that Nebulus also recruits a little kid. Tiana explains that he is the one with dreams of becoming a great tank warrior. He took the guild examination about a dozen times. She later saw that he had much perseverance, so she let him join the guild to help him gain some experience. She remembered his name, Ruko Zong, and his name shocked him, so he asked her for his name again. She again tells him his name and wonders why he is excited. He remembers this name because he was one of the six divine shields in his previous life with the name Sacred Mountain Ruko. 
He was shocked and wondered if this little beast man was the sacred mountain Ruko of his past life. The players tried to make him leave and uttered that it was not like he didn't want to help him, but it was just that his existence dragged the whole team down. All of the groups that he joined in the previous guild events were in the last place, so he didn't want to let him in, and his fellow instructed him to let him leave as the guild war was about to start. There was no more time for them to lose, so they decided to ignore him because not all regrets can be filled just by hard work. Ruko was crying, and they remarked that he should have realized the skill difference between him and others by now, so they requested him to stop dragging them down anymore. He stopped crying when he heard the protagonist's voice, who remarked that he had no opinion on what they said just now. He thinks that hard work would make everything more interesting and asks Ruko if he is right. They were shocked as he was the guy who was newly recruited and wondered when he was allowed to put his nose into their matters. He moved his hand toward him and asked if he would like to join his group, which shocked him. Ling Si realized it, but the invitation today was the beginning of the highly respected legendary group of Heavenland Shadow. Soon, the horn was rung, and the door opened, which was when the Guild War commenced. Limitless sacred ruins were an enormous battlefield where the Guild Wars held a dimension that reeked of blood. It's a place where each guild could fight each other with no rules, kills, glory score, or guild reputation. Rank is the only thing that matters there, when all the doors have opened, the fighters of every guild will arrive, waiting for the signal of the battle drum, and the guild war commences after that. Everyone rushed and spread throughout the map after the drum signal was sent. Ruko alerted others that, this time, the terrain of the limitless sacred ruin was a canyon. The members of the other guilds have already spread through the maw. Dara instructed her teammates that they need to keep up and avoid getting caught up in fights, and they understood. The protagonist realized that the strategy of most people is to find a safe area first, so she instructed her to be careless as they will also go and look for a safe zone first. Tiana hoped that she would be right for letting Ling see their group leader even though she wanted to have him protect her. She also liked to see more possibilities from him. Meanwhile, Wasabi-kun and Bai Lei were together and Wasabi attacked the player and uttered that the last one had been dealt with. Their team members were glad because, as they expected, everything had gone without a hitch since they had been with them. They assumed that these three guys were unlucky to cross past them, and Bai Lai affirmed as he agreed with them. Wasabi Kun figured out that Bai Lai still hadn't woken up from that state yet. If he was still troubled by that fight against Ling Si, his skills might stop improving. For him, he was looking forward to fighting against Ling Si again as he will be able to improve himself a bit more. Their teammates wondered why the captain would insist on coming to this location as they thought he would arrange a place for them and the three groups together. Wasabi was startled because the player was right, and he didn't know that he had a plan but wondered why he insisted on going to this location. He looked at him, who was smiling voraciously, and figured out that something was wrong. Abruptly, the magic surrounded them, due to which he could move, and he wondered if they were being ambushed. He was startled as he heard someone laughing at them and looked up and found a wolf fang member smiling at them. They affirmed that he was right, they got ambushed and were trapped inside by his binding skill and he praised Bai Lai as his performance wasn't bad. He remarked that by sacrificing three teammates, he had passed the examination. Wasabi inquired what this meant and the opponents got down to attack them. They killed a nebulous guild member, and the Wolf Fang's guild captain instructed him to provide them with the location of that woman, and he would be able to join their guild. He had no problem with that, which startled Wasabi as he was planning to betray their guild, but he was threatened to keep his mouth shut. The Wolf Fang's team member rushed toward him and put her sword at his neck because this was his turn to die. Bai Lai stopped her because he was his friend, and he wanted him to join the Wolf Fang guild too. The guild leader was stunned as he didn't tell them that he was going to bring another person, but he was fine with it, so he agreed to spare his life. He requested Wasabi not to blame him because he just couldn't let that matter go like that, and he wanted to make Tiana and Ling Si pay for what they had done. Wasabi couldn't believe that he had betrayed them, and even told them the location of Tiana in exchange for going to their guild. Wasabi cursed him, but he didn't regret what he had done and uttered furiously that if he couldn't get it, then no one could and wanted that cheating couple to die together. Bai Lai knew that Wasabi would understand him, so he wanted him to join Wolf Fang and get stronger, which would be great for them. He found them interesting people, 
and they received a voice call from their other members. The vice captain wondered how it was going, and if they were able to find them through the location that she sent, and they informed them that they found them. She was glad and instructed them to hurry and torture them all as they would chase down her after she responds and has no mercy on them. The captain of Wolf Fang Guild assures Bia Lai not to worry as he sent five agility-type thieves from the third division of Wolf Fangs. He was sure they would be enough to deal with her, which was all thanks to his help. He provided them with their location so that they would be able to find Tiana's position. The vice captain says he has betrayed Nebulus and even told them the location of Tiana in exchange for joining Wolf's Fang. He shouts at him and calls him a piece of trash, and Bao Lei says if he can't get it, then no one can, and that cheating couple can just die together. He calls Wasabi, says he knows he must understand him, and asks him to join Wolf's Fang and get stronger. Wasabi laughs and says this is an exciting farce. Suddenly, they receive a system notification that they have been invited to a voice call, and one of the teammates calls the captain and says they have found them. She gets happy and asks everyone to hurry, and they will go and torture them all, and they will chase down Tiana after she responds, and they will have no mercy on them. The vice captain puts his hand on Bai Lai's shoulders and asks him not to worry and says he sent out five agility-type thieves from the third division of Wolf's Fang, and it will be enough to deal with that woman. He exclaims it is all thanks to Baal Lai for providing them with their location, and they will be able to find the position of Tiana. But soon, they are shocked at receiving a voice message that the situation is not good, and the person asks him why he didn't tell them that the mage Chana would have a guard. The vice captain asks him what he is saying, and he replies that he is hiding while on a voice call with him right now. He informs him about a thief with white hair and says he is too terrifying, and the vice captain asks him why he needs to hide to voice call them. The guard feels someone's presence there and says four members of their group have been killed in just three minutes, and they were all killed by that one thief, and now it's just his left. Bao Lei thinks it must be Ling Si, and he remembers when he said he would leave Chana's safety to him. The guard cries, tells the vice captain that his teammates have not responded to you, and asks him permission to retreat. But Ling Si finds him and asks him to speak with his vice captain. Ten minutes ago, they were all moving to a particular place, and a teammate asked Ruko why he was running so far away and if there was a specific location he wanted to go. He replies if someone comes, then he will be in front, taking all the damage so that they guys in the back can attack. She gets angry at him and asks him to stop with the bluff, and if his equipment is that weak, he should just hide behind them if that moment comes. Ling Si asks Tiana why they asked little Ruko to join their group, and she counter-questions him if he has a plan. He replies that he just wants to shake off some bugs, and she is surprised that they are being followed. He comes forward and puts Ruko behind them, and their teammate asks them why they have suddenly stopped. Ling Si exclaims those people are like sticky gum, and he just can't get rid of them no matter how hard he tries. Tiana asks everyone to prepare for battle because they have enemies nearby. At the same time, the five-man assassin group comes out of the water at the Wolf's Fang, 3rd Division, and they never expected to notice their presence. One of them says someone in their group must be very wise. However, they are underwater with instant conceal and probably haven't discovered their location. They think with the tracker the vice captain gave them, they won't be able to lose them as long as they don't know where they are, and they won't be able to do anything to them. Meanwhile, a teammate asks Ling Si if there are really enemies because he can't see anyone, and Tiana replies they must have used a concealing skill. Ling Si uses the skill of Great Eagle Eye, which can increase his eyesight as sharp as an eagle's and can detect all hidden units within a certain range. Soon, he finds them and says the enemies are in the water, while a guard informs his mates that they have been discovered and that the thief has a visual skill that lets him see through concealing skills. He observes that their overall levels are not high, and they will deal with the lower levels first. They get out of the water and jump upon them to attack, and Ling Si comes forward, asking others to stay on guard in case of more ambushes. The guard laughs and says a level 7 thief is going to fight them alone. He asks one of his teammates to come with him. He orders the rest to go and slit the throat of their mage. One of them recognizes them and says they are Wolf's Fang's 3rd Division Assassin Group, and they are assassins specialized in high DPS attacks. Ruko uses his shield and asks everyone not to be scared of them, 
and if that's the case, they will have to get past him first. The assassin uses the skills of backstab and faint attack at a time, while Ling Si uses the evil spirit's invincibility and passes by them speedily. They are feared of his skill and start crying. His teammates are shocked and wonder what is happening to the boss, but Ling Si appears from behind and says they should keep their eyes focused on their battle. He attacked him from behind and also injured two others at a time. He then attacks them one after the other and reduces their points gradually. Ruko is surprised to see his power and calls him an amazing fighter. They are all down to one-third of their health and Ling Si calls others to help him clean up. The teammates are happy to see him and call him a DPS killer. After a while, he removes the skill of fear and an assassin asks others not to stand there and they will need to work together to get rid of the thief. But Ling Si approaches them with so much speed and attack power and it's too quick for them to react. He then uses the skill of Shadow Flash Blink and hits one of them reducing 36 points of his health. After that, he uses his Bonebreaker skill and kills him on the spot using multiple attacks. Now one of them has left and he thinks they are not even on the same level and all he can do now is to escape. He now contacts the Vice Captain and asks him permission to retreat. But Ling Si reaches him and asks him to have a word with his Vice Captain. He then calls Wolf's Fang 3rd Division, Vice Captain, and asks him to listen to him carefully. He asks him to clean his neck and wait for them to come, they will be there in a minute. He calls Bao Lei and asks who this guy really is. Bao Lei tells him that he is the thief who cleared the insanity level of Dark Forest last time, and he remembers him. He laughs and says that as long as they are enemies, they are fated to meet again, and he doesn't think Nebulus would really recruit him into the guild. Bao Lai says this was Tana's idea and it was nothing to do with him, and the vice captain says he threatens him means he is tired of living. The teammates ask the vice captain what they should do to this guy, and he calls Bao Lei and says it seems like his friend there doesn't have the same opinion as him. Wasabi grabs the dagger and says there is no need for them to worry about him, and he grabs Bao Lei by his neck and says as his longtime partner, he feels so shameful. He exclaims the other teammates will probably spread the word about their betrayal after the response, and he will withdraw from this month's guild war. From now on, their problems will have nothing to do with him, and they will be enemies the next time they meet. A system prompt appears there saying he is currently not in battle and asks his permission if he wants to withdraw from the monthly guild war. He calls Wasabi but replies that he is on his own from now on. The vice captain smiles and says he doesn't know what is good for him and he gave him a chance to join Wolf's Fang but he threw it away like that. He asks his teammates to head to the other areas and they should stop wasting their time there. Meanwhile, Bao Lei is notified that his friend Tiana has removed him from her friends list. He thinks it seems like everything that happened there has already been exposed. From now on, the vice captain says he will be an enemy of Nebulus, and betraying a guild naturally means that he will get pursued by them, and good thing he latched onto them, Wolf's Fang. But Bao Lei seems furious and thinks he will get his revenge. The vice captain says they don't need Tiana's coordinates anymore, and Ling Si already said they would come to look for them so that they will be waiting for them. On the other side, Ling Si asks the guards to tell him the coordinates of his vice captain, but he asks him not to even think about getting the coordinates of the vice captain from him. As a member of Wolf's Fang, he will die and be a ghost of Wolf's Fang and never betray his guild. Ling Si smiles and says he is quite a virtuous man, and he bets he has killed several people on his way there since he currently has a red name. Moreover, he will probably drop one or two pieces of equipment if he kills him now and he will probably lose some of the examples he worked so hard for. The guard gets afraid of him and says the vice captain's coordinates are in the west, and they are currently heading to the east. Ling Si thanks him and says he will gently send him off from the guild wars now. He asks Ling Si if he didn't say he would let him off, but he replies that it's normal for deception to happen in wars. He then attacks him and kills him on the spot. Meanwhile, Tiana thinks she never thought Bao Lai would betray them and the fight would be the cause of all of this. She wonders how the situation is with Wasabi Kun and they must be rearranged with the betrayal of Bao Lai 3rd Division. In the meantime, a teammate appears from behind and asks if she has seen the guild's message and she replies that she has received the message about Bao Lai's betrayal. She asks them to talk about this later and about Ling Si, 
and Ruko replies that he is on the other side. When they go to him after a while, Ling Si says they have come at the right time, and he just got their vice captain's coordinates not too long ago by kindly asking him. After a while, Jana says according to the coordinates Ling Si received that if they are really heading to the east, that means they will be meeting up with the other groups of Wolf's Fang. As far as she knows, most of the groups from Wolf's Fang are in the east and only a few of them are in the southwest. They will make it easier to increase their glory score at the last moment by using an attack from all sides. Ruko is surprised by her and says Sister Tiana even knows about the plan of the other guild, and the teammate says it's not like the members of the big guilds that have scattered around the map are a secret during the guild war. Moreover, he will be able to guess the general idea of where they are if he uses his brain. It is stated that the only thing that matters during the guild war is kills, they will need to kill to gain a higher glory score, thereby increasing their score. It is such a simple strategy for them to increase their scores at the last moment. Ruko smiles and says he already knows about this and wants to increase the group's morale. In the meantime, Ling Si asks Tiana if she has any plans, and she replies if they are able to pass through the fighting in the center area and cut them off halfway. The central area is a place that is connected with the teleporters of all four sides, and the guilds there are very chaotic and often fight each other, making it easier for them to mess up their plan. Even if there are reinforcements, they will need more time to assist them. Ling Si says chaotic guilds and fights often occur, and he recalls that she can hide their guild's information during the guild war. But Tiana says if she does this, then all the kills she got would not be counted into the result. Ling Si exclaims he just thought of an interesting plan and decides to use the item Hidden Mask, unlike the player's information with the system's settings. He asks his teammates to follow him, and one of them asks where they are going, and he replies that they are going to the center area. On the other side, the center area of the Guild Wars is the center of the battlefield, where dust rages through the area. Like the raging dust there, it's also the area where the most intense fights happen. Their team leader asks everyone to pay attention, and says they are their mortal enemies, and the vice captain asks them to remember that they slaughtered half of their guys in the last Guild War. Both parties rush toward each other to attack when suddenly, they feel someone's presence there. A man calls his captain and says there is someone there, and he asks him if the enemies are launching a sneak attack from behind them. But he doesn't look like he is one of their people because he's wearing a mask. They think he may be a clown, and he jumps upon their captain and attacks him with his sword. The captain falls to the ground, while their opponents are also shocked at who this man is. Ling Si comes forward and attacks their captain too, and makes him fall to the ground. They ask Ling Si which guild he belongs to and why they interfere with their fight. Ling Si says he is a member of Wolf's Fang and calls them a bunch of scum. The captain is shocked at Wolf's Fang and asks if he is from the Big Five guilds and why he is interfering with the fights of other guilds. They ask him to be a man and show them his identity, while Ling Si asks them if they are in a position to ask for information about Wolf's Fang. He exclaims that he will be given 30 seconds to run because Wolf's Fang will be coming there to wipe out everyone, and asks them not to blame him for not warning them. Suddenly, he disappears from their sight, and the captain says he can't do as he is wearing that mask, and they wonder why he told them about their plan. The other captain says the reputation of the Wolf's gang has always been bad, and they ask each other if they have seen where he disappeared. One says he ran away, giving him a thousand years of death, and the other says he launched an attack on him. They are all determined to make Wolf's Fang pay for what they did. At the same time, Tiana and her teammates are watching them from a distance, and they are happy to see that in such a short time, they united to go against Wolf's Fang. Ruko says their boss, Ling Si, is fantastic, and he was able to fool so many people. Tana is also impressed by him and thinks she never thought he would use these kinds of tricks, but only he would have the technique to escape safely after provoking so many people. Twenty minutes ago, the center area was full of players, and Ling Si said they would be out on a show for them guys. When the people of Wolf's Fang arrive, they will surprise them and ask everyone to sit back and enjoy the show. She is surprised that he did all this just by himself and wonders what kind of surprises he will give them in the future. After some time, the people of Wolf's Fang reached there, and as expected, there were a lot of players in the center area. The people think they must look down on them, and the vice captain wonders why so many people are welcoming their arrival. 
They feel something odd about them, and the vice captain introduces himself, but they are not ready to listen to them. Suddenly, one of them uses multiple flame bursts to attack one of their men, and the vice captain wonders why they are attacking them. He can feel someone approaching them behind the people and has a bad feeling about them. He feels like the fear of being targeted by an unknown monster in the darkness. In the meantime, Ling Si appears from behind and kills one of their teammates using the backstab skill. He has killed one of them, and the vice captain instructs them to be on guard. A girl asks him if he is that thief, Ling Si, and says he is attacking the low health teammates. He replies he didn't see his face and only saw a clown mask. He then asks his mates to calm down and uses the technique of gravitational pressure, which will create a gravitational field of a 3 meter radius. The enemies that enter it will receive three times the gravitational force, decreasing their movement and skill speeds by half. He then calls Ling Si to come inside and says he won't be able to do anything to them now that they are in the circle. His teammates also exclaim that they will make him pay the consequences of going against them. But she is shocked because Ling Si appears from behind and takes his second target in front of them. His speed was so high that they still couldn't see him, and they were shocked at how he could still be that fast even after his speed had decreased by half. On the other side, some people are rushing towards the center area, saying the fights there with the people of Wolf's Fang are quite heated, and they will get their revenge by joining the fight. In the meantime, Tiana and her team avoid the crowd and reach the borderline area of the center line, and she asks them to find the coordinates somewhere around there. Ling Si said he wanted to give her a gift, they think it's somewhere there. Kyuko says no one is there, not even boss Ling Si, but Tiana is sure they are in the right location and thinks to message Ling Si. There is a huge sandstorm in front of them, and they feel someone's presence there, so she asks everyone to prepare for a battle. But they are surprised to see Ling Si there, and he has grabbed one of Wolf's Fang's members on his shoulder. Tiana asks if she is the gift he was talking about while resisting and asks him to let her go if she knows what is good for him. Ling Si throws her to the ground and says he recalls that this lady provoked her while she was shouting at Tiana. He asks how she dares to use such a method. Tiana is shocked and says she never knew he could kidnap someone, and asks him to untie her first. The girl smirked and said she was scared of her, and if she set her free, she would promise her that in this guild war, Wolf's Fang would not kill off her guys like in the last guild war. Tiana asks her not to misunderstand her, and she is not scared of her, but is thinking about which skill she should use to deal with such a stupid woman like her. The girl rushes toward her to attack, but Tiana uses her magic skill and ties her to many branches of trees. She says since she still wants to fight, she won't show any mercy against her opponent and kills her a painful death. She then thanks Ling Si and says she owes him a favor, while Ryuko is happy and says boss Ling Si and sister Tiana are so powerful. Ling Si says before going back to the center area, he will need to borrow someone there. Tiana asks him whom he needs help from, and it will be dangerous for him to return to the center area. Ling Si replies it won't be dangerous as long as he receives help from that person, and everyone thinks he is talking about him. They start to show off their powers, but they are shocked when Ling Si says he wants Ruko's help. His eyes fill with tears of happiness, and he asks Ling Si to leave all of them to him. At the same time, the people of Wolf's Fang are looking for him, and a man tells the vice captain about their teammate that she has been killed. He orders him to gather all the groups quickly, and they can't give that thief any more chances. He is shocked and asks why they are gathering all the groups just for one man, and the third division is going to be a laughing stock. The vice captain says he doesn't care and asks them to bring them there and have them surround the whole area, and they will find that thief. He thinks Ling Si dares to touch his woman, and he will definitely make him die a violent death, and his man says they have just got attacked and don't have much health left. Bao Lai is listening to their conversation and thinks he is looking forward to the moment their throat gets slashed. The vice captain uses the skill of flying shield, a skill dedicated only to warriors, and attacks with a sturdy shield, stopping the enemy's movement for a split second. Someone attacks him, and the vice captain thinks they are the annoying people from the earlier group, but Kuko attacks him. In the meantime, Ling Si takes advantage of the situation and kills one of his teammates. With this, he kills his third target and says the vice captain is his next target. 
the captain exclaims he is so naive because the other groups of wolf's fang will be arriving in a few minutes, and since he came to him by himself, it will save the trouble of going to look for him. He uses the technique of raging flame dance and says he will burn him into ashes. He asks Ling Si to taste his strongest fire spell. He exclaims this is revenge for his woman, and Ling Si asks him if this is what a man in a relationship looks like. As a mage, he didn't think he would be stupid enough to cast spells in front of a thief who was far quicker than him, and he reached the captain, saying he should go and join his woman. His health is deteriorating rapidly due to Ling Si's multiple attacks, and he then uses the Bone Breaker skill for his last attack. After a while, Kuko tells him that they have won. But he says they have not won yet because the Wolf's Fang will definitely send out a huge group to chase after him. He then asks Ruko to follow him because he wants to verify something. When he is left, Bao Lei comes to the vice captain and asks if he knows the feeling of his woman getting away from him. He then says they must not lose this guild war, and as the ex-captain of Nebulus's third division, he is very experienced with guild wars. He asks him to put him temporarily in charge of all of their troops, and the vice captain says since he has the capability, he needs to show home what he can do. He asks him to contact the other group and tell them to kill that thief and his group, and he receives a system prompt that he has been promoted to Wolf's Fang's third decision's temporary vice captain. After a while, Kuko runs toward others and informs them that another squad of Wolf's Fang is approaching them. They are feeling helpless because their vice captain has gone. Kuko brags that his and Boss Ling see his teamwork is flawless, and they are like a sword and shield. He exclaims that he is feeling great seeing all those people with low health getting killed with no time for them to react. Ling Xia's skill flow looks so cool, and he asks him to teach him that swish swish thing he did in the dust. It would be cool if he learned it, used his shield, and asked about his mask and how he picked it up. Ling Xi thinks he is so much talkative, and he guesses that he doesn't have to worry about feeling lonely on the way. However, the reason he brought him there is to verify something. A few months back, before the guild was started, Kuko was shocked because Ling Si asked him to join their group. He was confused and asked why he let him join their group and thought he might have evil intentions and asked if there was anything he needed to do to join the group. He exclaimed that all the groups he joined previously weren't compatible and their temp didn't match his. Ling Si asked him to relax and listen to him. He said he had heard he wanted to be the strongest shield warrior. He got happy and said, standing in front of all his teammates with his head high and chest out, that and wanted to charge in and take all the damage for his team. He asked him if he had ever seen the shield warrior in the top one guild that was nicknamed Heavenland's number one shield, and Ling Si sighed as he started again. Ling Si asked him if he had unique attributes or skills and thought this little fellow had the same name as the so-called Sacred Mountain Ruko, one of Heavenland's six divine shields, in his previous life. If he really is Sacred Mountain Ruko, he should have some unique attributes or skills, but he replies that he doesn't. Ling Si wonders if he comes too early or maybe he hasn't developed his unique attributes or skills yet. He then replies he has an ability, but he isn't sure if it counts and Ling Si asks him what the name of his skill is. He exclaims that he has a blessing called bravery, and Ling Si thinks the legend he heard in his previous life was true. It is revealed that the game Heavenland contains countless unknown special skills, equipment, and additional attributes. Any player can receive a mysterious reward from a task in the game by adventuring that place. He wonders if the blessing that little Ruko is talking about is really one of them. Then he could be Sacred Mountain Ruko. He states he received a strange thing when he was level 3, and after completing it, he received it called Bravery, but he doesn't know how to use it. Ling Si asks him about the description of the blessing, and Ruko tells him the description, which is to be fearless and stand tall, like a mountain cutting through clouds. Suddenly, he calls him and reveals that there are a lot of people in front of them. They are from the Wolf's Fang, and their captain is impressed by his bravery and says he used petty tricks to tarnish their Wolf's Fang and even kill the vice captain. Ling Si recognizes them and thinks he never expected them to be there. Bai Lei also appears from the side and asks if he remembers him. He is surprised that he is the temporary vice captain there, and Bao Lei says he once told him he would have his revenge. Little Kuko asks him what they should do because there are a lot of them, and he asks him if he feels even better than just now. 
Ruko says he feels better, but there are too many of them. Ling Si asks him to calm down because he is already prepared for a fierce battle with them. He wants to confirm the use of that blessing he got, and if they somehow succeed, then it will be worth it, even if they die afterward. Diana gives them a message that she will be there in a minute while other groups are retreating because they know that they can't win against the people of Wolf's Fang. Ling Si asks them where they are, and she replies that they are not far behind them, and soon she reaches there with other group members. Ling Si asks them why they came, and she replies that she received a message that a large group of Wolf's Fang was gathering towards the center area, and she thought that they got surrounded by them. Ling Si tries to stop them, but she interrupts him and says he is the captain of their guild war. She asks him if he wants them to ignore their teammates' lives, and he is surprised at this because he leveled up alone in his previous life. He has long forgotten the warm feeling of this word. However, he smiles and asks everyone to be prepared because it will be a hard battle. Suddenly, she hears someone ask her if she is still protecting this thief. Bao Lei calls her and says in the end, they still have no choice but to become enemies, and she angrily asks him why he betrayed Nebulus. The people of Wolf's Fang rush toward them and say they don't let Nebulus look down on them. Tiana also asks everyone to prepare for battle, and they will face everyone bravely. The fight has started, and one of their teammates asks Tiana to pay attention to their back, and he will hold them off at the front. She asks him to use the cast and magical shield on himself, while the Wolf's Fang people ask the girls to surrender peacefully, and they don't want others saying that they don't show mercy to women. They rush towards them to attack but Tiana uses a shield that prevents them from attacking. Dila comes forward and makes their fun, saying they wanted to instackle her, and uses the great sword technique, saying they are nothing in front of her. The wolf's fang guys observe that she is an attack-type warrior. Tiana appreciates her and says she will handle this side, and magic attacks won't be able to hit them for the time being. However, they appeared from behind and asked her if she had forgotten the thrive attacks from them. One of them tries to attack her from behind using the backstab technique, but Tuko blocks his attack and asks him not to dare to harm his teammate. He tries to kill him, but Ling Si appears there and says it is rude to bully a lady and a kid. He attacks three men at a time and kills them all. Dila is happy to see him there and says there are too many enemies there, and she can't hold all of them off for much longer. Tiana tells Ling Si that they can keep going, but their attacks are too fierce, and many of them have used their recovery potions. Tiana asks everyone to gather and uses Vine Cage's skill to produce a shield around them. Kuko is happy to see that she knows mid-rank spells, and Dila tells him that she even knows high-rank destructive spells, but she cannot cast them during this situation. They are relieved now because they can catch their breath without worrying about any magical attacks. Moreover, with Ling Si by their side, they will be able to boast about it for a lifetime if they somehow manage to succeed in escaping. Suddenly, a sharp arrow appears from a side and breaking through Tiana's shield, it stabs one of their teammates' chests. She shouts at them and asks them to heal her, but it's been too late. Bao Lei was the one who attacked just now, and his companions appreciated him, saying they never expected that joint attacks him would be able to dish out such an explosive attack. He replies that he is very familiar with that magic shield cast by that mage called Tiana, and it will take a while for normal spells to break it. But with his shield breaker arrow, along with the strong shot of another teammate, they could crush it easily. He furiously thinks that he will make sure Ling Si and Tiana will die there, and he will know when alive. Tiana's teammates are stressed because the enemies are approaching them, but she asks them not to panic and stay in formation. Their magic shield has been broken, and their skills are probably still in cooldown. They will seize this opportunity and attack it. Ruko also shouts that the enemies are coming, and Ling Si calls him and says he needs him to do something. He is going to kill someone and request them to stay there and protect their teammates. But Kyuko is scared because there are too many enemies, and Ling Si says if he wants to become the strongest shield he has always dreamt of, he will need to be brave and stand in front of his teammates. He asks him to show them his bravery and leaves them there. They wonder if he is charging into the enemies by himself, and he left little Ruko to protect them seems like a joke even when they are about to die. Kuoko wonders how he can show his bravery because he considers himself a coward who only knows how to cry when scared. 
he hears a voice saying the enemies are using arrow rain and ranged magic attacks, and he wonders where he can get that bravery Ling Si was talking about. There are too many attacks, and the enemies plan to exhaust them with a ranged attack. They are trying to block them and ask Ruko to go and hide at the back. He thinks that even though he is still scared, he doesn't want to lose his teammates. Tiana tries to contact Ling Si and informs him that ranged attacks are attacking them and can't hold on for any longer. A system prompt appears in front of Ruko and asks him to be fearless and stand tall, like a mountain cutting through clouds. His blessing and bravery have been awakened, becoming a giant monster. The Wolf's Fang's men ask everyone to switch the target, ignore the other nebulous members, and target that giant beast that came out of nowhere. Ling Si is happy to see him and thinks his judgment was correct as expected, and he had to drive him up to a dead end to awaken Blessing. He believes he hit the jackpot this time because little Ruko is really one of the six divine shields in his previous life, Sacred Mountain, Ruko Zong. The others are shocked to see him and wonder what that thing is and if he is a player, they are shocked that the boss-looking thing is a member of that group Nebulous. The captain asks Bao Lei about the thing and he never tells them about him. Bao Lai is also shocked to see him and says he has never seen that person in Nebulous before. His team members are also shocked to see little Ruko becoming a huge Ruko. He then uses the skill of destructive field and attacks the wolf's fang while they ask each other to run away. The formation that was formed has been broken, and the think to retreat because that monster is too fierce. Bao Lei asks them not to panic and forget all the bosses they have fought who are more significant than him. He asks them why they are scared just because he is a little larger than regular players. The captain also invites everyone to listen to him carefully and says that Thing probably is a member of the enemies that has a particular skill or something. He asks them to keep attacking, and the others will support them with ranged attacks. No matter his size, he will still die there today. In the meantime, Tianan observes another range of attacks, and they don't have much mana left, so the healers can't use their group healing spell. Suddenly, Ruko blocks their attack, and they receive a notification that their magical and physical defenses have increased by 50%. Ruko grabs a large piece of ground using the meteorite grenade skill and throws it toward the wolf's fang guys. The captain shouts and asks them to dodge it, but it hits them, and they all fall to the ground at a distance. They are shocked at what that thing is, that it out an area attack on them alone. Bao Lei wonders what that thing is because his plans were ruined because of him. Suddenly, he feels someone's presence there and thinks it is familiar. Suddenly, Ling Si appears from the side and stabs his dagger in his chest. The captain calls him and asks him to reorganize the formation, and they should have one ranger attacker and three shield warriors in every group. But he is shocked to see that Bao Lei has been attacked and hits him by the forced attack of Ling Si. Ling Si attacks three of them and wishes they have a nice time in hell. After a while, the division captain is looking for them and wonders why the formation has not been formed yet. Suddenly, Ling Si appears from the side and tells him they are all dead now. The captain says he must be looking forward to his death since he is trying to attack him from behind like that, and attacks him with his full might to push him away. Ling uses the skill of evil spirit's invisibility and asks him if he doesn't remember him yet. He asks him to remember the skill book he took and the skill he got from him and called evil spirit's invisibility. The captain surprisingly asks him if he is the thief who cursed, and Ling Si uses the shadow flash blink and says he will let him enjoy the fear of this skill. After a while, he receives a message from Tiana, and she asks him where he is because a lot of people from Wolf's Fang are coming quickly. He agrees to retreat and says he will join them soon. With the protection of little Ruko, they could retreat from their enemy's attacks. During that time, with little Ruko's protection and the help of others, Tiana had enough time to finish casting the high rank spell, Sky Piercer, helping the group to retreat to a safe place successfully. The fights in the monthly guild war and that mysterious huge bodied figure have become hot topics for everyone once the monthly guild war ends. Even though Nebulaud is still ranked number 5 in the guild rankings on the scoreboard, their group has ranked first, beating second place with twice the amount of scores. However, right after the exciting monthly guild war ended, every player in the game received a message from the system at the same time, and there was a server notice congratulating them for becoming the first ever player to successfully change jobs, with a high 99% awakening rate becoming the first awakened. 
After a few days, they are celebrating their win, and Tiana asks Dira to drink slower, and she should remember that there's a drunk system in the game. Dira asks Ruko not to drink because he is still a kid, and he replies that is just a power juice. Tiana thanks everyone for participating in this monthly guild war, and if it weren't for them guys, they would have never won. She especially thanks little Ruko because he contributed a lot when protecting everyone during their retreat. The others also thank him and say that if it weren't for his protection at the front, they wouldn't have been able to retreat successfully. Kyuko feels embarrassed because they claim Ruko has been hiding a transformation skill and he is really quite something. He gets up and asks them to stop, and Dara thanks Tiana for constantly giving them shields and that high rank spell in the end too. She replies that she is just doing what a maid should do, but still, the one who contributed the most is definitely Ling Si. Dara also admits that the guy is very cool and even knows what orders to give in such a tight situation. The best part was in the end when he killed those enemies, especially after getting shot. Then he just went crazy after that, seeking revenge for himself. Tiana also thinks Ling Si is really a mysterious person, and she is not sure how he knows about the power of little Ruko, but she is sure he has a method. Because of this, this unnoticeable group was able to come first in the Guild War and has completely surpassed his expectations. She wonders if she can be daring enough to set her goals even higher than before. Little Ruko calls her and asks if Boss Ling Si will not celebrate with them, and he says that he needs to do some stuff and leaves right after the Guild War ends. She asks him if this is because of that the first ever player to change jobs or the first awakened announcement successfully. However, she is unsure about this either, and that announcement has become quite a hot topic in Heavenland. On the other side, Ling Si is on the riverbank and watching something in the water. He has defeated some monsters behind him. Suddenly, he gets angry and splashes in the water, thinking dark lines are too fast. He didn't think he would reach level 15 so fast, and he's again the first player to become awakened with a high awakening rate of 99% in this life too. He thinks he sure lives up to his reputation as Heavenland's top player, but he can't relax any longer. His level shouldn't be too far behind since the pros from his previous life must have also started grinding. In this world, levels and skills are all that matter, and he thinks he needs to form a strong group. For now, the only member he has in the group is little Ruko. Clearing dungeons higher than himself and breaking records with the group is the fastest way to level up. He then sighs and thinks he must calm down and not rush and mess up his rhythm just because of the dark lines. For now, he will need to train Ryoko while increasing the speed of leveling up, and he will also have to find another member for the group. Suddenly, he feels someone's presence there and thinks someone appears there right when he is about to log out. He decides to go and look and soon finds the track of that person. He would have probably lost that person's track if it weren't for his high awareness. It seems like their level is pretty good, and judging from the footsteps, there is probably only one person. This is a rural area, and he wonders what they are doing there, and soon he finds that person. He was right because there was only one person, and there was also a chest there. No wonder that guy came to such a remote area, which means he was there for the chest. He was so curious that he followed that person there, but now thinks he shouldn't interrupt him. But he is shocked to see that person is Dark Lines, Heavenland's top player, the untouchable Dark Lines, and he never thought he would meet him there. He was someone he could only dream of seeing in his previous life, but in this life, he won't lose to anyone. He is curious about how big their gap would be if he were to fight him with his full strength, and he has found a rare opportunity and will need to battle him. He thinks of going after him and asking him for a duel, but is surprised to see that he disappears within a second. He got distracted for a few seconds and now he's gone. Suddenly, he appears behind and asks if he is a pervert and why he is peeping on him in this cave. Ling Si stares at him and he says he is showing some killing intent means he is planning on challenging him. Ling Si apologizes to him and says he misunderstood him and he was curious, so he followed him in there and until just now, he didn't know that he is Dark Lines. He smiles and says he thought another person was planning to sneak attack him again. Ling Si introduces him as a level 7 thief, but he interrupts him and says he is uninterested in his introduction. He exclaims that too many people are challenging him daily, and it's starting to hurt his head, and asks him to forget if he wants to challenge him. 
He then gets up and asks him to leave since he has no bad intentions and will open his chest. He calls him from behind, says he still plans on challenging him, and says that despite an eight-level gap between them, he hopes he doesn't underestimate him. Dark Line stares at him and then accepts his challenge. After a while, they face each other and are ready to fight, while Dark Line says he will have only one fight. Ling Si agrees and thinks it will be possible even though he is eight levels lower than him, with the method he used when killing the Mud Dragon, Lord of the Swamps, combo accumulation. If he can't match him with his stats and power, then he will just have to use his skills. Since his profession is a warrior, he will have to be on guard for taunting skills like War Cry. The Dark Lions asks him to start, and he thinks he will need to get used to his attack patterns by using the flexibility of a thief. He needs to find his weak spot and rushes toward him to attack more quickly. The Dark Lion seems to lose his guards, and Ling Si tries to use the moment to his advantage and appears from behind to attack him. He thinks he has got him, but he reacts on time and grabs him by his neck. He uses the technique of sealing strike and hits him to the ground badly. Ling Si gets injured, and Dark Lions appreciates his skills and asks if he is a top-time player. He says Ling Si is still too weak, and within all of his challengers, many more people are more potent than him. He calls him the same as before and also calls him a waste of time. Ling Si is shocked and disappointed that he lost to him. The Dark Lion sighs and wonders why people are challenging him daily, and he can't avoid them no matter how hard he tries. It seems like he will have to hide all his information entirely. He then turns back, saying the winner has been decided, and asks him to stop bothering him anymore. Ling Si is shocked at his level of strength. He is furious at Dark Lions, called him the same as others and a waste of time. He hates getting looked down on him by others and gets up, gathering his power. The Dark Lions turns back and is surprised to see his power, while Ling Si says the fight is not over. He moves quickly and reaches the Dark Lions in the blink of his eye, but he grabs him again and asks if he has that thing. They look toward each other in shocked expressions for a while, and he surprisingly and then laughingly says he is just a candidate and hasn't awakened yet. Ling Si asks him if he is talking about dust-laden proof of the glorious. He asks him how he knows about dust-laden's proof of the glorious and wonders if that is also because he received that task. But it can be impossible because it's a unique mission. The Dark Line smiles and says he is not the only one on this mission and since he is still a candidate, he should explore it by himself. He calls his name and says he will remember him while he asks him about their fight. Still, he replies there's no reason to continue because he won't have any chance of winning. They will probably meet again once he grows strong enough, and hopefully, the next time they meet, he won't let down his expectations. Ling Si thinks whenever they meet next time, he will definitely win. However, the dark lines are string as he expected, but in this life, he has the confidence to become stronger than himself. He is determined to take the title of Heavenland's top player from him. After going offline he has been thinking of a plan and thinks he must strictly plan his leveling and the group he is building. These two are currently his important tasks. He is so lost in his thoughts that he leaves the grocery store without paying the bills. He plans to start sweeping some dungeons with little Ruko in the early games but he still needs some time to investigate something. The thing is, the dust-laden is proof of the glorious and even dark lines. He was surprised when he found out about it. He thinks he needs to look into it a bit more, and during his thought, he doesn't realize that he has filled a pan with rice. The old man asks him to stop, but he doesn't listen to him. Ling Si thinks there is no more time to slack off and must increase his leveling speed. It's time to start his full equipment plan. He logs in and reaches the Casfado main city, and little Ruko calls him from behind and says he met the teammates who refused to let him join their team last time. He didn't expect them to know that their group got the highest score in the monthly guild war, and they didn't believe him when he told them that the giant was him. He is so mad because they also say they don't know who Ling Si is and tell him that members of the guild have never seen his face or heard his name. He continuously speaks and Ling Si thinks it's hard not to listen to him. He then asks him where they are going, if they will level up, or if he is teaching him something new. Ling Si replies they are waiting for one more person, and little Ruko asks if she is Sister Tiana, but he replies it's not her and he will know it once he's there. He thinks he will maintain a partnership with Tiana's side for now. 
After some time, they reach a banquet, and the man there tells them it has already ended. Ling Si replies he is not used to those kinds of occasions. The person in front of him is Tiana, and she says she hasn't properly thanked him about the month's guild war. He tells her that he has found a teammate because of it, and they took what they needed, so there's no need to thank him, and he wants to discuss something about the guild with her. Tiana asks him if he is thinking about leaving the guild, and she knows they promise to have him temporarily join the guild, but she promises to give him a more lax condition, plus the group he is planning to form is baseless. Ling Si interrupts him and says he will need the efficient resources of the guild so that he won't leave Nebulous for now. So he will be in her care from now on and has his own plans. Tiana asks him to leave it to her, and the result of this month's guild war will definitely catch the eye of the higher-ups, but she will settle it for him. She asks him about the plans after this, and he asks her if she has that red-skinned thief's contact. At present, Wasabi has come to see him and calls little Ruko a shrimp. Ruko tells Ling Si that he remembers this third and says he is one of the people responsible for the third division, and he also whispers, saying before they find any stronger teammates, they will have to step over the line bit. Moreover, he is now the vice captain of the third division, and he needs his status to help him with some stuff. Wasabi asks him not to act dumb, and with his skills, it will be very easy for him to take over as the vice captain of the division. Ling Si replies that he is not interested in it, and now that Bao Lai is gone, it is a good opportunity for Chana to get promoted to the division's captain. However, he was very busy when he saw her, so he came to him instead, and Wasabi says if it weren't for Tiana, then he wouldn't ever do those things even if he dies. He talks about other people and that they are almost there, and Ruko asks him if there are other people too, and Ling Si replies they are the teammates for the dungeon they are challenging this time. There is no one suitable in the third division for the dungeon the guys plan on challenging, so Ling Si asks him to get help from some members of the second division. Ling Si contacted him last night, so he had to keep contacting his friends even after going offline, and it took him forever to find the people who suited his request. But he warns his first that he is not responsible for their attitude because the members of the second division are people with a lot of pride, so it's normal for them to look down on the members from the third division. It wasn't because of their status as the vice-captain, then it would be impossible for him to have them accept his request. Also, the members that suited his request were all the top members in the second division, and he had to slip some money in there to have them accept it. Ling Si apologizes for bothering him and says he will transfer the money back to him. He asks him to think of a way to deal with them first, and they are shocked to see the other teammates they were talking about are those two guys. They again call little Ruko Shrimp and ask if they need to bring him. A ninth level girl says the dungeon is not something a member of the third division can clear, and Ling Si asks him not to say anything in reply. He thanks them all and says he is the group's captain and will lead them all from now on. They make his fun and say it must be a joke that he is their captain, and they shout at Wasabi and ask if his friend is dumb. They exclaim that a level 7 thief can't be their captain. The girl also asks Wasabi to give them a captain who knows how to give proper orders and how they can sweep the dungeon with this team. Wasabi asks them not to complain to him, and if they have any problems, they can tell Ling Si about this. The girl exclaims the three of them were able to clear the upper difficulty of the dungeon Broken Buddha with the help of the others of the second division. However, as for the third division, she remembers they could only clear the intermediate difficulty of the dungeon. As the group's captain, she recommends level 10, Dark Cliff, which is much safer, and his partners also agree with her, saying that among the people there, there's no better option to be their captain than Dark Cliff. Dark Cliff brags and says he will try his best, but Ling Si says if he can carry them in the insanity difficulty of the dungeon, then he won't have any problem with him as the captain. They are shocked to hear about insanity, and Wasabi asks him if he is sure because he is trying to waste money, and the difficulty of this dungeon is not the same as the Dungeon Dark Forest, which is a level 10 dungeon. He thought he planned on challenging the upper difficulty, and insanity is a little bit for them. Dark Cliff laughs and says he was wondering what gives him the confidence to be the group captain, and he doesn't even have general knowledge of this game. The girl reveals that the insanity difficulty of this dungeon is something that even the first division has difficulty clearing, while the Dark Cliff calls him a clueless thief. Hammer calls him from behind, and he is surprised to see him and asks what he is doing there. 
he replies that he is just helping some friends sweep the dungeon. Little Ruko is impressed to see his whole body covered by golden armor, and he envies him so much. Ling Si also thinks his level is not that high, but his golden armor is quite good, and Wasabi tells him that he is the guild's hammer from the first division. He heard that the relations between Celestial and Nebulous are pretty good, and he tells him as the fourth best guild in the game, Celestial has always maintained neutral relations with the other guilds. Wasabi tells him about the warrior hammer, that even though he is not the strongest in the first division of Celestial, due to his outgoing personality, he's well connected with others and has friends from some of the big guilds. He heard that even the guild master of Celestial's unrivaled Blue Cloud had a good relationship with him. If he looks at it differently, he's pretty incredible. Ling Si thinks having a significant connection is also a strength, and he went through all those hardships by himself in his previous life, and now that he looks back at it, he doesn't know how he did that. Hammer is also shocked to hear about insanity and asks Ling Si if he is planning on sweeping the insanity difficulty of the level 10 dungeon. He asks him if he has some particular method for doing it. Ling Si introduces himself and is about to tell him his method, but he interrupts him and asks shockingly if he is Ling Si from Nebulous in this month's Guild War. Dark Cliff asks him if he knows this guy, and he is surprised that they don't remember Ling Si from their guild, and tells them that he is the group's captain who ranked first in this month's Guild War. Dark Cliff says they didn't participate in the Guild War, so they are unclear about that. Hammer is so excited to see him and tells them that not only did their group rank first in the Guild War, but he even heard that he led his teammates and killed the 3rd Division's Vice Captain of Wolf's Fang. Moreover, they even successfully retreated after being surrounded by the enemies. Ruko likes this man and says he has good eyes and should know how impressive Ling Si is. He is about to say something more, but Ling Si puts his hand on his mouth and says he was lucky. Hammer says he must be confident in clearing the insanity difficulty of this dungeon and asks him to count him in and he can even help them tank some of the damage. He asks him to give him a chance and Ling Si agrees since that will help them clear the dungeon faster. Dark Cliff and the girl wonder if he really is that strong and if he is reliable as he said earlier then the group will be much safer with him as captain. They all agree to make him their captain and Ling Si says they should save time. He opens up a red teleportation gate, and a system prompt appears there saying his group has entered the dungeon, Broken Buddha having an insanity difficulty level. He thinks if they clear the insanity difficulty of the dungeon and achieve a specific condition, it will drop the petrification ring. After a while, the Dark Cliff asks him if the petrification ring really exists, and Ling Si replies he only needs that from the dungeon, and they can split the other rewards among themselves. Dark Cliff asks him to stop listening to fake rumors because the whole group might get eliminated. Ling Si says they will know it once he sees it, but for now they need to be on guard because there are many monsters in this area. Soon there were many blind and deaf monks and it is said that there was not much difference between them and they were from the upper difficulty level. They ask each other to be careful because their AI and presence are different and Ling Si asks them to be quiet because there are more of them there. They are surprised to see their elite monster there, and Ruko says the monsters there are all so scary and asks him to change to another dungeon, and he doesn't want to have nightmares. Ling Si says they are not as hard to face as they think, and there is also an essential part for him to play. He gives him a single grappling hook, and others ask him what this is for. They are all excited and wonder if the show is about to start. Little Ruko exclaims he is not scared at all, and was just worried earlier, but now he won't have any problems with it. The girl asks him to see what is beside him, and he shouts loudly to find a monk. Dark Cliff asks him what they are going to do next. The monsters of insanity have very high stats, and if they get hit, then they won't be able to last long. Ling Si says they will use a different method called the grouping method. After some time, the other player asks Dark Cliff if he really trusts that Ling Si guy, and he replies that Hammer chose to trust him so that they would follow his decisions. He just asked the other guild members about Ling Si, and it seems like he stood out in this month's guild war. Since the rumors are true, he probably isn't too bad, and they hope for him to be good because they don't want to waste their time, and if they lose their experience because of him, he won't be forgiven. The girl says she is curious why he put them in such a weird spot, and they have a hook to get there. They wonder what he is planning. 
He puts Hammer and little Ruko as the blocking squad, and Hammer exclaims he is so excited and wonders what kind of plan Ling Si has in mind. Ruko thinks his golden shield looks so cool and says he can handle them all by himself, so he better not drag him down. He thinks his golden pieces of equipment are making him weak in front of Boss Ling Si, and he is to be the one to protect Boss Ling Si from the monsters. Hammer calls him and asks him to work together and make an unforgettable memory, but he gets angry with him and says he is not a kid. He asks him never to call him a kid again and calls him a warrior, while Wasabi thinks he is just a cute little boy. He thinks the teammate Ling Si chose is quite exciting and looks forward to seeing his plan. After a while, Ling Si asks them to wait for him to return to where he assigned them all, and he will share the coordinates with them. He forbids them from going anywhere unless it's by his orders and Wasabi asks him what he will do. He replies that he will lure the monsters and they will just wait until he returns. Hammer is surprised and asks if he lures the monsters alone and doesn't need a warrior's help. He asks him when they will use the hook and how they will be helping him at their assigned spots and he asks him about the strategy. Dark Cliff says his weird grouping method is too simple and will not work. Ling Si replies it will be no fun if he tells them the strategy now and asks them to wait until he returns. Wasabi thinks they are too dispersed now and will be wiped out instantly if they were to fight a large group of monsters. This is a newly formed group and there is no chemistry between the teammates. After a while, he asks everyone to prepare themselves because the monsters are coming. There are many blind and deaf monks and they are all rushing toward them. Ruko says there are too many of them and asks Hammer to better not to drag him down, while Hammer says it's so exciting. The girl calls Squad D and asks them to prepare to cast a slowness spell or any other control spell in advance, and the Dark Cliff is also shocked at how he lured so many monsters and wonders if he plans to wipe them out. They ask Squad C to place their shield where he pinged and blocked the exit off, and Hammer replies he is already prepared. They call Wasabi and ask him to ready his crossbow, and they are shocked that Ling Si how lured such a big group of monsters by himself. The main question is how he came back unharmed after luring so many monsters and how even a tiny mistake would result in getting hit by the monsters. The Dark Cliff says he probably was just lucky, and Ling Si asks Squad D to cast a spell that has a 3 second cast time. Dark Cliff goes first and casts a spell on them, tying all the monks with it. He has created a magic circle and asks others to keep it going because he has finished casting his spell. Ling Si says their timing is perfect and asks Squad B to shoot the monsters at the front to avoid them losing their hostility towards them. Wasabi asks him if he is sure it won't cause the monsters to spread and if he is to attract them to his side, but he asks him to do what he said. He orders them to start shooting and Wasabi starts attacking them individually. Ling Si asks him to lure them back into the magic circle when others are attacking them, and Ling Si makes sure that they all stay in the magic circle. Hammer says the thieves are so strong, with excellent movements and skills. Using the territory's advantage to gather the monsters, and with a strategy of attack, defend, and pull from the slowness spell. They lured many monsters and stuck them in the pile, making it harder for them to use their attacks. Hammer is surprised by his movements and thinks not only that his movements are incredibly agile, but at the same time, he can find some space to precisely lure back all the monsters attracted by the other thief while dodging all of the attacks. However, he can still give orders to the other teammates, and he wonders how to do so much at once. Even the thieves in the first division are not that perfect because, according to him, it's impossible to do so many things simultaneously, and he will have to record it. He then calls Squad C and orders them to use their shield to block them off. If they see one of them without hostility approaching the place below the Squad D, they have to block them off and push them back to the circle. Ruko and Hammer listen to his instructions and attack the monk, saying they can't even dare to break through their defense. He then calls Squad D and says once they finish casting the slowness spell, they immediately cast an elimination type spell, but the girl says her mana is almost depleted. Dark Cliff is shocked to see the hammer in the corner, texts him, and asks him to record Ling Si. He tells him that he wants to let the guild master, Blue Cloud, see this, so he starts recording him. All of them fight and hit the monsters while Ling Si watches them all dying in front of him. The players are excited and say this is the first time he has hit so many monsters with a single skill, 
while the girl says it's her turn because he has finished recovering her mana. Ling Si says the monsters are not attracted to the mages, and he asks Eskod Si if there is any problem on their side. Hammer says there is no problem and urges Ruko not to give up because if they break through them, the mages on top will be attacked. Ruko says he knows about this and doesn't hold himself back. However, there are so many monsters, and if they come at them all at once, then we'll all die. Suddenly, Ling Si uses the skill of Air Slice and Throat Slasher and tears them all through his technique. He asks Squad D to keep casting elimination-type spells while the mages try to throw and finish their spells. They have used the Flame Field technique and have burnt them all. Wasabi thinks he underestimated his skills while appropriately pulling the monsters and using the smallest gap to go through the crowd. He's even attacking and giving out orders at the same time. Hammer asks Kuko to go and rest for a bit, and he will hold them guys. The other three mages are cooperating and attacking the monsters individually. Ling Si's reliable skills are constantly helping him gain the trust of his teammates, and because of Ling Si, everything is going smoothly in this newly formed group. They had never thought that an insanity difficulty dungeon would become so easy, and the first wave ends with this. Ling Si says there are two more waves, and he will lure the monsters, and the mages can recover their mana for now. He exclaims that they will continue with the same strategy. On the other side at the dungeon, the Colosseum difficulty, Celestial's first division is fighting with the monsters, and they use depriving arrows to attack them. Through their skills and equipment, if the monster has been removed, they can kill him. The guild master says the skills range is still not extensive enough, and he didn't remove the cape. The vice guild master comes to him and asks what kind of weird skill he used this time. He replies that he was just testing the range of his skill and asks him if he is done on his side. He replies this is nothing for the members of the first division, but time is still needed to clear it. There's probably still a huge gap between them and the two top guilds. He then asks if there are any movements on Wolf's Fang and Nebulus's sides. He replies that they are the same and have constant conflicts between them. In the meantime, the monster appears from behind and rushes to attack, while the vice captain says it seems like the higher-ups of both sides are about to take action. He then jumps upon the monster, puts the sword in his eyes, and injures him. He uses the skill of iteration pierce and kills him with his last attack. He then exclaims that he heard that both of the guilds were quite lively in this month's guild war. He never thought that one seven-man group from Nebulus would destroy almost everyone from Wolf's Fang's group in the Guild War. He bets that Wolf's Fang won't let this slide, and every member of Wolf's Fang, including their guild master, only has evil intentions in their mind. He bets that within a month, there will be another significant conflict between Nebulus and Wolf's Fang, and when that time comes, both sides will be asking them to choose sides again. By saying this, he uses the skill of Annihilation Arrow and blows away the monsters. The vice captain admires him, and he is an expert at avoiding this kind of stuff. In the meantime, he receives a notification from Hammer and wonders why this social beautiful sends him a message at this time. Still, he is shocked to see the insanity level dungeon with Nebulous Thief. Suddenly, a man informs him about the next wave of gladiators, which have been released. Still, he is shockingly seeing Ling Sia's video in which he went against the elite monster of insanity by himself. A few minutes ago, when Ling Si faces the elite monster, he receives a notification that he has gained the attention of Silent Monk Elite. He jumps upon him to attack, but Monk gets up and dodges his attack. Others are shocked to see this and wonder how they have never heard about the name Ling Si. With those skills, joining the top guild would be a walk in the park for him while Hammer in the corner is recording him fighting with the monk. Kuko exclaims and asks where the elite monster is, and he is coming for him. Others ask Wasabi if they can use the method they used just now against him. They still have some grappling hooks left and wonder where they should go. The silent monk is of level 10, and Ling Si says the field of vision of an elite is different from normal monsters, so there won't be any safe place for them to attack. Kuko asks him permission to transform himself, and the other player thinks this kid must have watched too much. Ling Si says there is no need to do it, and he will defeat the monster by himself, and they won't be able to keep up with his speed. He thinks with his current attack damage, it won't take long for him to kill the silent monk. He exclaims it will probably take about 10 minutes, and they shockingly ask him if this is even possible. 
the girl says last time they challenged this dungeon, the mage's attack did not affect it. Ultimately, the melee attackers took about 20 minutes to kill it and even lost a tank. Moreover, the difficulty this time is insanity. Ling Si says this is because they were fighting it wrong, and he asks them to see the beads on the neck of the silent monk. Once they destroy them, the magic attacks will work on it, and they surprisingly ask him how he knew about such a thing. Ling Si says he read about it at Heavenland's library, plus he has the skill combo accumulation, so there is no need to worry about the lack of damage. He thinks he can't tell them that this was discovered by a pro player from his previous life. Wasabi asks him to be careful even though he is confident in beating it. He then jumps away and attacks the monk by using the technique backstab and hits him from behind. The monk reacts and is ready to face him by pushing him away. The memories of its attack pattern from his previous life are becoming clearer, so he follows his path and breaks one of the beads by attacking the monk. After sweeping this dungeon a hundred times in his previous life, his body is starting to move independently and dodge all its attacks. He feels like he can even beat it with his eyes closed, and Wasabi says he is using the blind spot of the monster to carry out his attacks. He moves around the monk like flowing water, and Dark Cliff thinks he is the most agile thief he has ever seen. From his agile movements and speed, it feels like a giant poisonous snake has wrapped itself around the monk. Wasabi tells him about his speed, it's called Top Time, and he thinks it seems Ling Si is also one of the players who has mastered Top Time, which explains those micro-movements of his. Kyuko is happy to see this and says boss Ling Si is very strong and thinks he will always stand by his side and be his strongest shield. He then calls Squad D to use an elimination-type spell and help him with his final attack. Kuko asks them to react soon because the beads have been destroyed. They use the skills of Flame Wheel and Earth's Spike at once and surround the elite monk from all sides. Ling Si is locking the silent monk onto a single spot with his attacks and movements. After that, he uses the skill of Evil Spirit's Invisibility and attacks the monk. He uses his Shadow Skill and kills the monk with ultimate skill damage by increasing it three times. He then receives a system prompt that the silent monk has been killed and everyone is shocked to see his power level. Suddenly, the boss Broken Buddha appeared, and this is the level 10 dungeon's boss. While at the Dungeon Colosseum difficulty upper dungeon resting area, he was surprised to discover that he could destroy the beads of the Silent Monk to get rid of the ineffective magic attacks setting on it. He mumbled that this Ling Sea Thief seemed to know a lot and wanted to ask Whale a question about something. He inquired if it would be him if he would be able to fight and give orders at the same time in an insane, difficult dungeon. Whale explained that the Theory Guild's first division was only able to clear the special difficulty of Broken Buddha, but that took them almost an hour to do so. For the elite monster Silent Monk, they had to rely on a few tanks to hold it off from the physical attackers and kill it slowly. At that time, they were only challenging the special difficulty of the dungeon, and he didn't want to talk about how that thief knew about the bead thing. Even if that was known to everyone, it was still impossible for him to be a solo Silent Monk. If there were any mistake in his movements, he would be instantly killed by the elite monster. He wondered after saying all this what his answer was, and he refused as he couldn't do both simultaneously, and he agreed with him. Even though one of the reasons is his class skills, the main reason is top time. He was amazed as he noticed that Ling Si had also mastered top time because the people who mastered this were usually well known. Regardless of whether he manages to clear the dungeon or not, he suggests they should try getting close to him because it would be best if they could get him on their side. Wales wondered with his skills why he was still only in the third division and wondered what she was planning. He wondered what he was planning. He instructed him that next time he should have Hammer invite him to join them in challenging the new dungeon. He asked for his opinion, wondering what he thought about it. Meanwhile, the protagonist and his team are fighting the boss, which reduces its power by more than half. The broken Buddhas uttered that a hard life would lead to a broken life. Only in a person's imagination would they find a life that is full of happiness. He banged his weapon on the ground, whose pressure pushed the players back, and the Buddha uttered if life is so hard, then why don't they worship him and forget about everything? They wondered what was going on and why their magic attacks were ineffective against him which is completely different from the upper-class difficulty. They inquired if it was a new attribute, especially for insanity, but there was just one-third of its health remaining. 
the broken Buddha had become stronger than they thought, and they wondered what they should do now. The protagonist told them not to worry because it's not like there is no solution to it, and they wondered what type of solution they wanted to know quickly. He pointed toward those four hands on its back, because its main attacking skills are from those four hands. If they cut them off, they will also cut off its main attacking skill. The player was shocked as he was talking about breaking it. He can't believe that he is planning on breaking specific parts of a boss of insanity because being able to kill it slowly was already good enough for them. He wondered if he forgot that this was insanity level, so being able to clear the insanity difficulty was already amazing for them. The protagonist told him that he already had the mages aim directly at those four arms, so now it's his turn. He rushed toward the broken Buddha, instructing Ruko to follow him as he needed his help. He commanded mages to keep attacking it, and they should worry about attracting its attention as he would hold the boss back for them. Ruko gets enthusiastic and follows him because his boss, Ling Si, puts so much trust in him that he wants to make sure that he doesn't disappoint him. He instructs Wasabi that he needs to keep it in place, and he agrees and reminds him that the boss is in its strengthened state so he should be careful. Wasabi-kun was shocked because this was the insanity and difficulty Buddha they were dealing with, and no one had ever seen what its skills were. While in that state, he was attacking him in proximity. Everyone was shocked as the Buddha was using the four seals and couldn't believe that the broken Buddha of insanity could use four skills at the same time. The broken Buddha remarked they were foolish as he was going against him alone and attacked him with all those four seals that pierced his fake body and dispersed it. This turns into an evil spirit, causing an evil spirit invincibility spell, but it makes the barrier casting the spell for the evil spirit to be gone. The broken Buddha was amazed by such a foolish action without realizing that he had already reached behind him. But as soon as he realized, he grabbed Ling Si and smirked because the distance was enough, so it was time for him to do his things. Using a throat slasher, he cut one of the Buddha's hands and instructed Ruko to go now and show him his power. He understood his assignment and rushed toward the monster, which worried his other teammates. They wondered why he was sending a kid to die and what he was thinking as the broken Buddha would instantly kill that kid. Ruko was punching the boss monster, which shocked Wasabi, and he wondered if it could be that the little kid also had some secrets that had yet to be told. He was there to help his boss, Ling Si, and the broken Buddha got furious as that arrogant kid dared to compete against his strength. He punched him head-on, which emitted such a huge amount of energy, which shocked everyone to wonder what kind of skill it was because he had grown into an adult. Broken Buddha was amazed at the terrifying strength he had, and he made Buddha knelt. The protagonist instructed little Ruko to lure the Buddha to the location that he shared with him, and he affirmed. Their teammate was amazed as they never thought he would be able to push the broken Buddha of insanity back with our strength alone. Ruko used a protective lion heart shield and created powerful waves to push back the Buddha. This was an exclusive skill of the blessing of bravery, which transformed the user's vigor and bravery into reinforced shoulder shields. That era is able to inflict impact damage to enemies in the area, causing them to be stunned for 0.5 seconds. Ruko gazed at the boss monster and attacked him, which created a huge explosion that stunned Wasabi. He realized that's little Ruko's secret, which was why Ling Si wanted to bring him into the dungeon. He was a terrifying person. The broken Buddha gets furious at this arrogant brat for attacking him, so he punches him, but he protects himself with his shield. The Buddha attacked him again, so he made a fearless lion heart shield, which led to a huge blast and caused damage to Buddha. Taking advantage of the smoke, Ruko attacked the Buddha, threw him away, and informed Ling Si that the boss monster was coming to that location. The protagonist rushes toward the cliff to initiate his plan, and the Buddha is thrown in that location. This shocked everyone as they couldn't let the broken Buddha fall off the cliff before defeating it. Otherwise, it would leave the battle and respawn again, and they wondered if their teamwork had failed. The broken Buddha was approaching the cliff as the protagonist planned, and he attacked him using the backstab. He remarked that if he isn't the one going to hell, then who will, and hoped he would enjoy himself in the abyss. His attack caused critical damage to him, killed the boss monster, and used the single-use grappling hook to go up. He informed others that they were done, and there was no need to waste time cleaning up the body. While going up, the protagonist was startled as he heard the broken Buddha laughing and remarked that he was no different from him as they both have broken souls and are falling into an endless pit. 
the protagonist was still thinking about what the broken Buddha said that both of them are with broken souls and wondered what he meant. Soon, the system notifications appeared congratulating them because the team he was in had successfully killed the boss monsters. They cleared the insanity difficulty of the dungeon, so a new record was set for the dungeon. They came out of the dungeon and were glad as this was unbelievable and so exciting for them. The player thought there was a miscalculation when he saw the boss falling off the cliff, but he didn't think it was all according to his plan, but this was all luck for the protagonist. Other teams were amazed to know that they were the team that cleared the insanity and difficulty of Broken Buddha. They were amazed as the new record was formed and wondered if they were from the number one guild as they were so strong. These are the strategies of the pros in his previous life, but the only difference is that little Ruko alone has played the role of quite a few tanks. Even though the boss of this dungeon doesn't drop anything, the rewards for clearing the dungeon are quite generous. Except for the purification ring, he instructed them to slit the rest of the rewards amongst themselves. Wasabi-kun was glad as he and little Ruko even got to level up, but on account of the generous reward, he decided to forgive them. The protagonist explained that the system distributes the experience points to each member based on their contribution to the dungeon. So it's natural that little Ruko would receive many more experience points than them. Ruko was sad because there wasn't even a single item that was suitable for him. He looked back and was jealous as one of his teammates was glad to have a sorrowful staff with more than 12 magic damage with an additional skill. The protagonist assured him not to worry as he was going to help him level up late, so there would be loads of equipment for him then. He was shocked and pleased, so he decided to get at least a golden one to something much cooler than the hammer. He also thinks that he understands how to activate the transformation, so he will show him when he brings him to level up. He was sure that his boss Ling Si would let him go against the boss in that dungeon, as he wasn't scared at all, not even one bit. The moment the boss's fist hit him, he already knew that he would win and wondered if he saw his fearless Lionheart shield at the end. That was an exclusive skill after transformation, and he wasn't even sure if there were any other skills and kept rambling. While they were talking, the members of the Celestial Guild called him and informed him that their guild master, unrivaled Blue Cloud, wanted to meet him and wondered if he would accept the invitation for his sake. Later, he was at the Celestial Guild headquarters, following the player to meet the guild master. On his way, the two pairs were gossiping as they wanted to sell the equipment that he had just got yesterday. His companion informed him there was no need because all he had to do is when he going against an archer, he should get as close as he could to him. He thought that if they prepared some more potions, then they would have more supplies than any other team in the present day group event, and remarked that their guild has one of the liveliest headquarters in the game. Ling Si never thought he would be visiting Celestial Headquarters even before ever stepping foot into Nebulous Headquarters. But Hammer thought he might be kidding because, with his skill, the Headquarters should be assigning tasks to him daily. The protagonist clarified that he was just a thief from the Third Division so that the Headquarters wouldn't pay him much attention. He thought he was being modest and was trying to keep a low profile on purpose, and he wanted to thank him for accepting his request. He uttered that if he need his help in the future, then all he need to do is ask, and he will be right there for him. The protagonist has no problem with his offer, because the more friends he has, the more help he will get, especially if it's a person with the status of Celestial Guild Master. The player liked him as he was a straightforward person and didn't hide what he needed. The protagonist never thought he would take the initiative to meet him now and was amazed as the world is predictable as the people there were once unreachable to him, but have now become so much closer than before. The protagonist was startled as he smelled some potion that some people were selling around to replenish mana and health. The protagonist inquired if they had started training alchemists, but he refused as to who would do something like that as they were letting the mages hawk some good. The protagonist clearly remembers that in his previous life, the alchemist only became useful half a year after the game was launched. It's a class that mages could specialize in. There wouldn't be anyone who would have discovered it from now. This startled him, and he wondered how he could have forgotten about that, as some alchemists created potions with amazing effects. This potion became very popular in the market, and they earned a fortune because of it. He decided to start training his alchemist. If he remembers correctly, the alchemist who dominated almost the entire market in Heavenland was called Emperor Van Kaffes, who is currently a newbie. 
Hammer called him and wondered what was wrong with him as he was smiling ravenously. He was thinking that if he could try him properly to become his alchemist, he wouldn't have to worry about the money in the future anymore. He decided to commence with that idea right after he was done there so that he could make money. The vice guild master Falling Whale appeared and remarked that Ling Si seemed in a good mood today and wondered what his impression of Celestial was. Hammer wondered why his boss Whale would have come and introduced him to Ling Si. The protagonist greeted him, and other members of the Celestial Guild also greeted their master. Whale commanded Hammer that he would guide him from there, thanked him for his hard work, and wanted him to go and take a break. He agreed but knew that it would be troubling Boss Whale and wanted to grab a drink with Ling Si after he was free from there. He took him to a main building and welcomed him to the Celestial Guild. The Guild Master, Unrivaled Blue Cloud, also welcomed him. Ling Si thanked him for the invitation but wanted to know what the Guild Master wanted to speak to him about, and he knew that he was a strength base archer. The Guild Master praised him since he was incredible to be able to control the battle all by himself in a dungeon in insanity mode. He gets straight to the point as he wishes to become friends with him and wants to challenge a dungeon together. The protagonist was astonished as the aura he was emitting felt completely different from others, which was expected from the Guild Master of Heavenland's fourth best guild. Unrivaled Blue Cloud assumed that he must have heard about the new level 15 dungeon Disastrous Graveyard. He affirmed that since he had heard about it and the current best record of that dungeon was at the upper difficulty. He remembered that the clearing time was about two hours. Whale corrected him because it was one hour, 56 minutes and 39 seconds, which was set by the number one guild. Since then, there have been no records of anyone beating the dungeon in a higher difficulty because it was a new dungeon. They wondered if Ling Si had the confidence to clear the dungeon at the insanity difficulty. Whale was startled because the insanity mode of the disastrous graveyard is a lot more difficult than the insanity mode of the broken Buddha. He wondered if Boss Blue Cloud intended to use this chance to figure out that thief's capabilities or if he thought that he had his true abilities based on his performance in Broken Buddha. The protagonist inquired if the guild master wanted to be the first to clear this dungeon insanity mode and asked if he was right. He agreed since he had no problem with this proposal, but informed them that it wouldn't be cheap. The guild master laughed to see how direct he was, and as he expected, he was a straightforward fellow. He assured him that the team formation, the classes needed, and the items and equipment would all be up to him. He wants him to be the team leader, and he and Whale will also be joining, so if they clear it successfully, he could decide on the distribution of the rewards. They made the deal, and he already had the plan, but the dungeon has a level requirement, and he is not at the required level, so he needs a few more days. He had no problem with that, and requested him to add him as a friend, so he could message him once they were done. Whale can't believe that it's already settled just like that. He needed something to trouble Guild Master Blue Cloud with, and he wondered what he needed. The protagonist explained that he needed some skill books, and that he would have to spend much time if he were to search for them himself and was willing to buy them from him at a reasonable price. He wondered what skill books he needed as he wanted to give them to him as a present. Ling Si clarified that he wouldn't hold back then and told him that he needed quick stab which is a skill for thieves, berserk slice, and a skill for removing debuffs, disaster gift. Whale rambled that the first two books wouldn't be hard for them to get, but disaster gift will take some time to get since its rarity is higher, so its drop rate will naturally be lower. He assured him that he would order their guild members to search for it so there wouldn't be any issue, and if everything went as planned, it would probably take three days. He would deliver those skill books to him via someone once they had gathered them all. The guild master was as glad as he expected from Whale as he was still capable of settling it in such a short time, but this was nothing for him. The protagonist thanked them, but he still had another question for both of them. They stared at him as if they couldn't believe he still had something to say and requested him to ask. Both of them were already at level 15, so he wondered why heaven they became awakened because, with their skill, becoming awakened should be a piece of cake. The guild master assumed that he might not know this, even though it wasn't difficult for them, but the specialization trail will also asses the level of one's awakening rate. For example, the Dark Lines guy who was able to awaken with an awakening of 99% successfully is one of the very few terrifying people in the game. 
Not only does one awakening rate increase one's chances of becoming awakened, but it will also decide how strong one would be after awakening. So, they were currently investigating and observing whether or not there are methods to increase their awakening rate. The job specialization task was a test to determine the player's awakening rate, and he was aware that the awakening rate would also decide the player's strength after awakening. He didn't think that there would be people who would search for ways to increase their awakening rates. It was not impossible to deserve something if someone like the guild master of a major guild used their power. He was amazed as this was why so many strong awakened players had slowly surfaced in his previous life. Since he gets all the answers and help that he needs, he decides not to keep the holding up because he also has things to attend to and promises to contact them after he is done. Blue Cloud was amazed, he was a strong fellow, giving off an aura unique to the strong. It's like he is certain that he will succeed and will always keep advancing. The whale was also looking forward to their next meeting, which wasn't because he was curious about how he would lead the team in the dungeon, but because he also liked to have a match with him after he was done leveling up. At Grey Fall Street, customers were gathered at different stalls. Some of the layers were shocked since the potion cost one silver coin and assumed that the seller might also be robbing them. He heard from his friend that there was an idiot who was selling expensive potions there, and he thought it was a lie, but he never thought it would be true. Ben Caffis, a level 3 alchemist, was showing them the potion and requested them to leave if they didn't want to buy it. The player remarked that she might probably be an old man in real life since she had a weird and old-fashioned name than Kafis. The potions that she created are also expensive, and she wonders if she came to Heavenland, it would be a clown. She gets furious and remarks that he is an old man and his whole family is an old man. She goes back to her stall as she still has business to do. She found him an annoying man who complained jur when he hadn't even tried it before. He wondered what she meant that he had tried it before as his friend bought her potion, a few days ago for it cost one silver coin. He thought it must be something incredible. But in the end it was just the same as a normal potion but with a random attribute which might even be debuff. So he assumed that she was digging a hole for people to jump into and his fellows laughed at her. She uttered that meant that it still worked so she didn't lie to them which made him furious and he called her a scammer. He went there to help avenge his friend and was going to destroy her shop, but she wasn't scared of his threats, so they should do whatever they wanted. She pointed at his back, showing them the guard because the customers who tried to do that in the past were all taken away by the guard. They were terrified to see the silver patrol guard behind them, and his fellow stopped him as she was right, they should forget about it. If they destroy something intentionally, they will be taken away by the guards in the city and placed in confinement, so they restrain themselves from avenging and turn to leave. But he has a way for them to avoid getting away from the guards, and his friend wonders what that is. He whispered that as long as they didn't do it intentionally but accidentally, there would be no problem, so his friend instructed him to push him toward the shop immediately. His friend pushed him to the shop, which flipped the table, and they apologized to her as they accidentally fell. Most of her potions were broken, which made her sad, and they left, apologizing to her, saying that they didn't do it on purpose. Other players witnessing everything were glad to see the scammer's shop destroyed. They were pleased because they thought she was trying to cheat them of their money and couldn't believe how terrible players are these days. She was startled as the protagonist suddenly appeared next to her and expressed how amazed he was to know about the potion that randomly give out an attribute. The protagonist remarked that if that jerk had gotten a buff from it, then his attitude would have been a lot different. However, selling it for one silver coin a bottle was indeed a little too expensive, and he handed her the potion bottle. She explained that the price was set so high because it took her a lot of energy and time to create this potion and the production cost was also a lot higher than normal potions. She uttered with sorrow that, for some reason, the success rate for her to crest a normal potion was zero. She doesn't like fighting and only knows how to create potions, so she has no other choice. He had never seen the alchemist Emperor Van Caffes in person in his past life and thought this person might be an old man just by listening to her name. With that success rate of creating a normal potion, which is zero, he becomes sure that she is the alchemist emperor from his previous life, because the potions she created all come with powerful additional attributes. She obtained this nickname, resulting in all the guilds in Heavenland clamoring to invite her to be their guild super alchemist. 
While handing her the potions bottle, he inquired if she had joined a guild yet, but she wondered who would want a mage who couldn't even be sure of the effects of the potions she made. She thanked him for his help and told him to put the potion bottle there on the table. The protagonist asked that if he is not wrong, then she probably has some special skill or attribute, which is a skill that a normal player doesn't have. She was shocked to hear it and conjectured how did he know that she had a special attribute. Meanwhile, Tiana went to the sweet shop with little Ruko, who gladly explained the incident that happened in the dungeon. He rambled how, with his one punch, that old monk went flying back, and then he chased the monk and started praising Ling Si as he was cool as always, standing at a super cool spot. The shopkeeper informed them that their dessert was ready, and she was delighted to eat it since it was delicious. She uttered that she had already heard about it and remarked that he was still as strong as ever, and he affirmed and promised her that he would become even stronger in the future. They reached a location and waited there for Ling Si because he told them to wait for him and wondered what was going on. Ruko found his location nearby and soon arrived there. He was startled as he wasn't alone. Tiana was confused and wondered who that little girl was, so he introduced her to a mage, Van Kephis, and she greeted them. Ruko went to her and remarked that his name was so weird that it sounded like an old guy which made her furious, she uttered that he was an old guy and that she had a reason for using this name. Tiana whispered and asked him if the new teammate he spoke of in the message was her, and he affirmed. She wondered why the teammate found all the little kids. She knew that Ruko had a transformation skill so that she could understand that. She wondered if that girl also had a transformation skill, but what concerned her the most was that she was level 3. She wondered if he had fetish for children and was going to call the cops, which stunned him, and he wondered what is she talking about. He called her there because he wanted her to help him bring her to level 5. After she reached that level, he would help her level herself up himself, so he wanted to trouble her with this. Ruko asked her what was in the big sack that she was carrying, but instead of answering him, she mimicked him. The protagonist appeared while they were still arguing and informed her that her current level was too low which would be a hindrance to her effectiveness in creating potions, so she would need to increase her level first. Ruko agreed because before she leveled up, Boss Ling Si should take him along to level up. Since everything was decided, he left her under Tiana's guidance and thanked her for help. She couldn't believe him but agreed to contact each other again if anything came up. Before they could leave, she grabbed his cape and asked him if what he said was true, if it could happen, and if she could become the best alchemist of Heavenland. He assures her that she will surely become the best alchemist in heaven, so she should trust him. The teleporter activated for them to leave, and Ruko asked him if that girl carrying a big sack was strong. He affirmed and uttered that she is really strong, even though her speciality is not in her strength or combat skill. She is the same as him, and she tells him that she is also a person with a blessing called Pithy Blessing, which is a kind of powerful blessing for creating potions. Even though he can't understand it, as long as his boss can get some help, he is fine with it and inquires where they are going to level up. The protagonist uttered that they would be going to the mage's capital, the magical city, the metropolis of Heridians. They would be staying there for a few days and level up to level 12. The Heridians metropolis is a city that's filled with the colors red and white, which is a paradise for fire and ice type mages. There, they would be able to see mages wearing robes of various colors soaring through the air on their magic staves. Staff gliding technique is a mage-specific movement skill that is only available in this city, which is why it is a sight unique to the city. In this magical city, mages are divided into two camps, one of the fire element and the other of the ice element. They don magical robes of either red or white, respectively. The mission, Song of Fire and Ice, is a team mission that normally only mages would accept, and it is now their key to speed leveling. Ruko informed him that they would need at least a mage on the team to carry them non-mages in this mission. The protagonist is aware that the Song of Fire and Ice is also known as a mage-exclusive mission. Players could form teams and choose which camp they wanted to join, either the fire element or the ice element. Once the numbers of the players on both sides are equal, the players could attack the opposing camp based on the side they have chosen to join. Experience and rewards would be received after the opposition is wiped out, but both combos are mainly made up of NPCs, so they are just taking part in a battle between them. Ruko uttered that his friend, who is a high level, had taken on this mission before. 
after forming a team and selecting a side to join, they would still need to wait for the system to match them with an opposing group that has the same number of players before the mission begins. But there were only two of them right now, and they are also in different groups, so it will take forever to wait for the other players. The protagonist wondered who told him that they would be waiting for other players because the mission has no requirement for the minimum number of players needed. As far as he knows, there has yet to be a player who has tried to join the mission alone, so if they were accepting themselves while being on opposite sides, what does he think would happen? Ruko thought they would get chased by a lot of NPC mages, but that wasn't right because the requirement is for both sides to have the same number of players. The system will put him and Ruko, who are all alone, into the same match, and with that, they would be able to execute an almost illegal plan. Ruko was amazed to know about an illegal plan and pondered that the unparalleled confidence that his boss exudes was too cool. He wondered if it was the secret to becoming strong. He doesn't get what he means, but it sounds like he's going to be sick, so he wants to initiate the mission as he can't wait anymore. Since they have already selected their camp, they will have to go there and accept the mission, and then he will explain the details to him later. The protagonist asked him if he had the tools that he gave him with him, and he affirmed that he had them and that he got hit by someone. He gets furious to see the girl's strange expression after being bumped into him as she ignores him and goes on her way. The protagonist stared at her, and he seemed to have met her somewhere before, but he couldn't remember her. Ruko was still furious at her, asking if her parents hadn't taught her the basic manners. Ling Si instructed her to forget it because she probably didn't see him. She looked at him and got furious at how foul-mouthed kid he was. She grabbed her weapon and was casting magic. The protagonist instructed him to be careful, and he wondered what she was doing, but soon, a wall was created between them. Ruko gets attacked by her, and he is allowed to fight back to defend himself. She inquired him, who he said didn't have manners and wanted to teach a lesson to a foul-mouthed brat like him to discipline him with violence. Ruko started transforming, which startled her, and she wondered what was happening to him because his body had become bigger. She wondered if it was a special ability and was pondering when Ling Si reached behind her, aiming his dagger at her back. He was amazed as she was a battle mage staff, which was quite rare and tried to calm her down as he didn't mean to offend him. Furthermore, that blow she gave just N was also enough of a punishment. She was amazed by his movement and wondered when he appeared behind her. The protagonist also calms down Ruko, so he soon transforms back to his original self. The protagonist inquired if she wanted to be blacklisted as she attacked someone in the city, so the guards were about to come. She didn't care about it since she was already planning on leaving Herdian soon, and he glared at her and tried to remember anyone who was a short-haired female battle mage. Ruko was furious at her and wondered how she could attack someone like that because if he said something wrong, she should talk back to him as her attack hurt, and she stared at him. Soon, NPC Silver Patrol guards reached there, and they were instructed not to think of escaping. She got on her weapon, passed the guard, and informed them that she would be going now. Ruko was still furious at her and asked if she thought she was great because she could use the staff gliding technique and challenge her to come down, and he didn't care if she was level 12. The protagonist finally remembered her as a well-known pro in his previous life, but she didn't have a good ending, and he pitied her. He grabbed Ruko, who was so mad at her, and remarked that a loose tongue could bring trouble, so they should go and level up. The mission Song of Fire and Ice has begun to help their allies attack the opponent camp within the stipulated time, and he was instructed to kill as many enemies as possible to receive more rewards. The protagonist entered the area, and the system notification popped up as the number of participants on both sides was two players. They were requested to wait for the gate to open at their camp gathering point, and the time limit was 30 minutes, so the battle commenced. This was the classic invading type map mission Magical Canyon, which was originally a mission exclusively for mage players to fight each other. But because of the number of participants, they have now been replaced by NPCs, but the number of NPC mages was still quite large, and they were all mages whose levels weren't low. The protagonist instructed him that they don't need to destroy the enemies as all they have to do is touch them, which is known as recall. Ruko didn't know there would be such a way to do that mission as he would need to enjoy this while he still had the chance. He was glad about how amazing his boss was, and he looked at him, who was fighting. 
In this mission, as long as the NPCs that they have attacked before ideas, they will be able to get experience and all the NPCs that could only be killed by magical spells from mages. They will be able to give them even more experience because the more participants, the less their share of experience will be. But this frenemy cooperation that he and little Ruko were doing will help them turn the battlefield into a field of experience. They rushed to their required location with NPCs, crossed each other, and reminded him what he told him. If anything untoward happened, he should drink the potion. Soon, they were at the bridge where both sides met and instructed him to jump as they would change places, so they should keep pulling the NPCs. Using the single grasping hook, they changed their location, and Ruko requested that he let him have the experience and level up. Normally, players who participate in this mission would invade the opposition camp. But with this method, they were simultaneously luring NPCs into the opposition camp. This way, they would get more rewards by extinguishing as many as possible, and he was glad since he told now that no one had yet discovered this method of his. He heard about this method from an old player in his previous life. After a few more days, they will patch this mission and add a minimum requirement of players. He was aware that once this was dispatched, it would no longer be feasible even though it was surely going against the rules. He wanted to use this chance to level up wildly before it got patched, even though he was aware that was surely going against the rules. Using the throat slasher technique, he killed two mage NPCs, due to which he attracted the hatred of an ice mage, and he fiercely attacked the mages using the backstab skill. Because this is a team mission, the health and attacks of the NPCs are very high, but because they are all mages, it takes longer for them to execute their attacks. He could use this time to put some distance between them. It wasn't that difficult for him to move amongst the large numbers of NPC mages, but the only problem was that they could cast long-range spells. He got attacked by the mages and used evil spirits invisibility, as he could still use this skill to dodge the attacks. There were still 10 minutes left, and this much should be enough for him. He attracted a large amount of hatred because of his continuous attacks at them. He wondered how many mages little Ruko had managed to lure, and he just had to wait for him there at the center of the bridge. Meanwhile, Ruko was worried as he couldn't hold on for much longer. He had already used up all his speed and health potion and was still almost killed by them. The protagonist was glad as he prepared enough potion for him as expected. If it weren't for blessing, he would have already died. The protagonist instructed him to maintain his speed and charge into his camp, and all they have to do next is sit back and watch the show. They will take advantage of this moment and bring the NPCs they had lured to the place where they will cross paths, and then they will jump into the crowd of NPCs of their chosen side. Because of this, the hatred for them will immediately be transferred to the opposition non-player characters, after which a chaotic battle between the mages will break out. As the magical spells cash, thousands of rays of light made out of magical particles cover the entire sky like fireworks. Currently, an unprecedented and exciting battle between mages is taking place on this bridge. Numerous ages are disappearing in the fierce exchange of spells being reduced to experience equipment or tools. With this, they gain a large amount of experience from flowing into his body from the battlefield like a little galaxy star. In this plan that is based around exploiting the bug in the game's mission, a cheat like leveling speed is becoming real right at this moment. Their time duration of mission was up, and they were instructed that the Song of Fire and Ice would be started once again next time. Score tabulation was displayed, and the free type mages became the winners of the mission because they killed more ice type mages and were rewarded 10 silver coins. The protagonist inquired if they were done, but he wasn't done yet as there was too much stuff. He was happy that he leveled up, but cleaning the battlefield was so tiresome. They each killed more than 100 NPC mages, so there was much loot. Their inventory slots are limited, so he instructed him to try to pick the ones that could be sold for a good price. Even though this mission could be only done once a day, leveling up once a day is okay. The protagonist uttered that if they want to level up once a day, they will need to lure more and more NPCs in the day to come. Ruko gets worried because this means they will need a whole lot more potions to stay alive. He reminded him not to forget that it's very difficult to level up in this game, so the higher his level is, the harder it is to level up, as the experience needed will also be much more than before. He received three items from the falling whale, and he was inquired if he would like to accept them. He accepted because those were the skills book that he demanded. 
he was astonished because the people of Celestial were quite efficient. And with this, he was one step closer to reaching level 15 and completing his preparations for the awakening mission. He instructed Ruko to go as they would sell the equipment that they had just gotten from the loot and was looking forward to seeing how much his awakening rate could be in this life. Three days later, in the City of Magic, the Song of the Fire and Ice mission exit point, all of the players were gathered. One of the players was worried as there was suddenly a minimum number of participants required for the strange mission. His friend also thought it was strange when he first saw it and wondered who would enter the camp solo as it's a weird patch. Going against the opposition camp all alone, which was a joke, and wondering who would get themselves killed, he assumed that the game probably wanted to make the rules clearer. Ling Si and Ruko came out of the exit and had already leveled up. Two girls were shocked to see them and whispered that they were the strange pair she had told her about. She uttered that while doing her mission there these past few days, she recognized them. A blacklisted player even attacked them before starting on the mission, and her friend found him handsome. What truly startled her was that these two would always come out at the same time. But it's always only the two of them, as the player from both camps would usually come out from there after the mission ends. She wondered if it would be that they each joined one camp on their own, but that was impossible as they would get ganged up by the NPCs. They were shocked as they saw their level, and she remembered that they weren't at levels 11 and 12 when they entered. The protagonist remarked that Ruko just needed a little more experience to reach level 12, which contented him because, after that, he would be at the same level as his boss, Ling Si. The protagonist winked his eyes and instructed him that after selling his equipment, he should return to the guild first and help Van Kaffes level up. He wondered if he would get to level 12 while doing so. Ruko was startled and inquired if he was busy with other stuff, and he affirmed that he still needed to meet someone. They have finally finished leveling up and even obtained so much good equipment that will make them rich. Ruko was getting bored with the thought that he had to help that level 3 Van Kaffes level up, which would take so long. The protagonist instructed him not to think about spending the money they earn and to save it, and he should be a good boy and help Tiana with Van Kaffes. He laughed and assured him that he wouldn't spend his money and help them immediately. He was astonished as he saw through him. While leaving, he requested him to remember to call him if there was any fun mission, and he left. The protagonist waved to him and was relaxed because their speed leveling for these few days had finally come to an end, which was quite boring for them. But he was contented as he was able to get the entire plow protection set through all that grinding. Just in time for the level 15 disastrous graveyard dungeon he will be doing with the people from Celestial level 12 was the minimum level required to challenge that dungeon. Next, he will need to change his weapon. One of the famous sayings in Heavenland was that all the equipment that he had before awakening was trash, but there was still a good place where he could get a decent weapon. He went to the PvP player's arena, where the ticket seller handed him the ticket and instructed him that a single-use ticket would be for one silver coin. PvP player's arena was a huge arena with tons of battlegrounds where all sorts of players of different classes battle each other, and the arena will stream the battles live for the audience. Players can battle each other either via matching or invitation, and the winner will receive class-specific equipment. In his previous life, many pros made use of this arena to become rich with the rewards they won. The reward from the arena usually has attributes that are better than those sold outside, and if he wants to get a level dagger, he will have to win against a level 12 player six times in a row. He must get the highest ranking at every battle, which is S. If he gets any other rating lower than S, the reward will be randomized. He reached the teleporter, which would teleport him to the arena battleground, but before that, he would have first to select his opponent. He was startled as he heard a girl asking him why he was there, and she asked him if he was planning to get revenge for his foul-mouthed brother. The protagonist was also shocked to see her there as he wasn't expecting her there and wondered what she was doing there. Tilly's explained that she is a frequent visitor there, and her information appeared on the screen as she was a level 12 mage with the option to initiate a challenge. He became sure about her frequent visits to the arena as her name was listed in the arena name list. Tilly's remarked that even though he had hidden his information, she remembered him as he was quite good then, and she wanted to play around with him. Soon, the announcement about the match was made, which was initiated in Battleground 9 between Tilly's and the player information hidden. 
they were informed that the battle would last till one party fell, surrendered, or fell off the stage. Everyone was amazed as a new guy challenged Tilly's, and he seemed like he took the initiative to issue the challenge. Judging from his appearance, they figured out he might be a thief, and he even hid his information, so they wondered if he was trying to seem mysterious. They assumed that something might be wrong with his eyes because Tilly's had been an arena level 12 dark horse lately. They thought he might be thinking that he has an advantage since she is a mage, but he probably doesn't know that she is a battle mage. A battle mage's attacks are just as aggressive as a warrior's. They also have high attack and defense stats, so they were sure he would be dead soon. The robot informed her that 97% of the viewers were supporting her, and the protagonist realized that she had quite a lot of fans. Tilly's was aware that she should be careful of this thief's movements because she wanted to end this quickly. As the battle commenced, she rushed toward him, and the audience was cheering for her to annihilate him in one go. They were contented because the battle mages were all about their movements and skill, and her beginning stance was awesome. Using the flame serpent dance, she rushed to attack, but he rushed away, trying to escape and planning something. He stopped at the end of the stage, and the audience was making fun of him, calling him a weakling because the battle had just begun, and he was already running away. They were sure that when she gained the initiative, it would be her victory from there on. She reached near him and was amazed, she had forced him to the edge just like that, and then there was no escape for him anymore. She jumped up, lifting her weapon fully prepared to attack him, and attacked him using the battle staff thrust. Other players were glad as they were sure he would be dead because getting hit by this skill resulted in the stun status. She was aware that it wouldn't be that easy for her to win, and soon the evil spirit's invisibility skills tried to terrify her. She figured out that he might be behind her and saw him at her back, and using the seal dispel, she dispelled the fear stats effect caused by his skill. She immediately attacked him and wanted him to have a taste of her attack, and he was amazed as her reflexes were pretty good. He dodged her attack and quickly rushed back, using a back backstab to subjugate her, which startled her as his micro skill as he was able to pull off such a response in that split second. The protagonist remarked that the battle mage is still a mage, and some of these mage attack skills take longer to finish. Using his quick stab skill, he attacked her and was sure that she wouldn't be able to block this. This was a thief exclusive skill, which is an evolved version of backstabbing in which the player turns into a shadow, then teleports behind the enemy and attacks instantly. She gets blinded by his skill for some seconds, and everyone is shocked wondering what has happened as it hasn't even been two seconds, and the match ends. She fell off the stage, and he remarked that it didn't matter if she was a battle mage, and the announcement about her being knocked off the battleground was made. They couldn't believe that she had been defeated in such a short time, but the man remarked that she wasn't defeated as she had lost, because she had been knocked off the battlefield. He wondered how his Tillies could make such a big mistake, but another player sighed as he knew he was a big Dan of her but he didn't have to be so defensive of her. She was stunned as she lost, but he kept changing his position, making it hard for her to judge his position. With his terrifying speed, he was able to push her off the battleground, and she couldn't believe that she was so careless. The protagonist was watching her from the battleground, comprehended that it was his win, and hoped to meet her again. He was given an S rating, and the robot announced the winner of the battle that had concluded. Before he could leave the battleground, she stopped him, and the robot was startled as she sent out another battle invitation. He was amazed as she requested another battle, and the audience supported her. They assumed that she was just careless last time, but were certain she would be able to beat that arrogant thief this time. She admitted that round was her loss, but she refused to take this lying down, so she wanted to have a battle with him again. Even though she was stubborn and spoke curtly, he liked the expression in her eyes, so he accepted the match. Once again, the battle began using backstabs. He rushed behind her, but she spotted him before he could attack her. She could let him lure her to the edge of the stage again, and she knew that she was no match for him in terms of agility. She had to find his weaknesses because this time, it was her turn to restrict his movement, and she slammed down her weapon and used rippling body restriction arts. This is a battle-type restriction skill. Enemies that came in contact with the ripples will be forcefully held in position, causing the restrict effect for one second. He was affected by the restricted status effect, and she was sure he wouldn't have enough time to dodge it, even if he dispelled the effect immediately. 
She rushed to attack him and was stunned as she couldn't do anything to him because the restricted spell affected him and she didn't know he had the disaster gift. A disaster gift returns the effect to the opponent while removing the effect from the user if he receives any controlling effect. After activating in the next 12 seconds, the control skill used on the user will be reflected to the opponent. He rushed back and kicked her away. Soon, the restriction effect ended on her and she was calming herself when he appeared near her, reminding her that she was back at the edge of the stage again. He pushed her down the stage, which startled the host robot, and he announced that contestant Tilly's had been knocked off the battleground. The wonder has been decided, and the battle concluded, so Ling Si was given an S rating. Everyone was shocked because she lost again and was forced to the edge of the stage with just a basic kick. She got pushed away from the stage and was amazed because that thief was too strong. She gets furious as she can't believe that she lost again, so wanted to battle with him again, and he agrees. She requested another battle, and soon she lost, and he became the winner, so she was given another S rating, but she was still unwilling to accept her defeat and repeatedly wanted to battle with him again. Half an hour later everyone was shocked as this was their sixth consecutive match, and that thief won every single one of them. They had to admit that he was really strong because they thought Tilly's was unbeatable amongst the level 12 players. After those few matches, her posture and reaction speed became a lot better. She was constantly improving through every match, even her micro-movement. He rushed at her back for a quick stab, and she warned him not to even think about blinding her. Ling Si has started to see a little bit of top time in her micro-movement, and he is startled as her Orphinx clone attacks him. She wanted to end him with her skill, Raging Gandal, and attacked him, but she was stunned as he again reached behind her. He was astonished as her casting speed was quite fast, but she forgot to restrict his skill, and he cast an evil spirit invisibility spell at her. She admitted her defeat as she was unable to defeat him right now, so he cancelled the evil spirit's invisibility. The winner was decided, but because one side had surrendered, he was given an A rating. He came out of the battleground and was irritated to have an A rating, because if he had gotten an S rating there, it would have been his sixth S rating in a row, and he could have gotten his dagger. Tilly's came out of the teleporting machine and remarked that he should dream if he were planning on getting six consecutive S ratings against her. He has also cut off her S rating win streak, so she will have to win another match with an S rating to get the reward she wanted. Since this was the case, the protagonist wishes for the best for both of them, which pissed her off as he was acting like this had nothing to do with him. He went to her and suggested adding each other as friends, which startled him because this was an abrupt request. So that he wouldn't misunderstand her, she clarified that she was only adding him to her friend list so that it would be easier for them to battle again next time. He understood and never thought he would be associated with her in this life and doesn't want to mention anything about what will happen to her in the future. Even if he did tell her now, she would probably think that he was crazy and maybe she wasn't meant to go through all that stuff. While leaving, she hoped that they would meet again someday and that day she would certainly defeat him. He hoped that she would become stronger than she was in his previous life and wondered how he could be concerned about others' fate when he was still not strong enough himself. After that, for the sake of obtaining the weapon reward, he began to fight another six matches. Because of the battles that he had with Tilly's, he became a popular level 12 contestant, which attracted many pros to come and challenge him. He easily defeated them, winning six matches with an S rating without any issues, and in the end, he even ended up with a horrifying 39 win streak. This was all because of the passionate players, thus inevitably, he became a hot discussion topic in the Heavenland Forum. Later, at the Nebulous Third Division meeting room, Tiana was furious as that combat strategy was very efficient, but it was too dangerous, and they wondered what Ling Si had taught him. She was worried to hear that they were charging into a heap of monsters alone, because it could be dangerous if an accident happened. Even though it's a low-level dungeon, they still have to be pie-killer about teamwork. He gets terrified by her anger and explains that he wants to be as brave and confident as his boss. Wasabi agreed with her as Ruko needed to be more obedient, which made him furious because he was the one who told him to copy Lin Si's fighting style. She gets furious at Wasabi, but he doesn't know what she means because he has always been at the back, attacking the monsters from a far distance. Van Kaffis tried to calm her down because they only did so for the sake of helping her to level up quickly, so they requested that she not get mad at them. 
It was all because of them that she was able to reach level 5, because such leveling speed was something she never dared to even dream of. Ling Si handed them over to her, so she would have to take responsibility for them all, and if they were to get wiped out and lose their experience, she was worried about how she would explain it to her. They were such a headache for them, and she was still worried when she heard Ling Si, who was amazed at how quiet it was there. He inquired what they all were doing there, she was relaxed because he was finally back, and he had no idea how tired she had been for the past few days. The protagonist praised her leveling up speed, which was pretty good as she had already reached level 5 so quickly. Ruko enthusiastically inquired him if there was any fun mission for him to do, but he instructed him to calm down. Van Kaffes wondered when she could start making the potion as she was ready for it. He smiled and answered that he had come there for this reason. He looked at her and laughed because she was already at level 5, they could now start with their plan. He asked her if she would like to help him create a business empire. His question startled everyone, and she was also confused. Later, at Casfato Commercial Leasing Street, she was amazed to see the place and inquired if that belonged to her now. He affirmed that he spent some money to lease it for three months, which stunned her, and she wondered how much it cost. She was worried because he had leased a place for her on such an expensive leasing street, but he instructed her to take a look inside at her new workshop. She was amazed to see the place, while he informed her that the place was still a bit messy and still needed to be cleaned, and that she should try and make do with how it was now. The place was full of alchemy books, and it even had a complete set of alchemist tools, so it was the perfect place for her, not messy. The protagonist uttered that this would be her potion-making shop, and the reason he wanted her to reach level 5 first was that he wanted her to meet the level required to take more types of potion. He gave her some potion recipe scrolls, which is one of the more popular basic potions on the market. He had already sent them to her, so she should learn them first, and her task was to make 10 potions with additional positive effects every day successfully. While he was instructing her, he was startled as she wasn't listening to him, but was amazed to look at different tools that she had never seen before. She was excited to see the place and items that were installed in it, and he requested that she calm down first. She was afraid that she would waste much material because her potion-making success rates were low. He doesn't want her to worry about that. He wants her to do her best and focus on creating the potion, as he has already prepared 30 potions of materials needed for each potion. She was amazed as he trusted her that much and was counting the money that he spent because the material that is needed for a normal potion is at least 90 copper coins. One copper coin is equal to 100 silver coins, and each of these coins is equal to 100 copper coins, which means he spent a total of 3 gold coins on material alone. She gets worried as he spends 3 gold coins on her, and she has never even seen so much money in her life. She wonders if he is not afraid of losing everything. The protagonist assures her not to worry because he is already aware of the situation, and she should know that her pithy blessing is worth far more than this. Their target is to monopolize the market in the future. With her at the core, they will create a huge business empire. They will let her train more alchemists and build a chain store in every corner of heaven, and then they will become the richest people in heaven. He even decided the name for their stores, which they would call Alchemia Realm, and she promised not to let him down. She assured him to come and check in after some time as she would make sure to finish the task, and he wished her good luck and left. Since he finished all the sweet talk, he will need to come to check on the result after some time. He has spent almost all of his money on her this time and is currently left with less than three gold coins, so he hoped she could succeed. Otherwise, he would have invested so much for nothing. He received a message from his friend, who was from Unrivaled Blue Cloud, asking him if everything was ready, and he affirmed that and was ready to leave tomorrow. He was amazed at how timely he received their message and wanted to use this chance to gain some profit from the people of the Celestial Guild. Later, he reached the Celestial Headquarters, where the guard welcomed him and took him inside to their boss. Everyone was amazed to see him as he was the thief from Nebulus, and they heard that Boss Blue Cloud was going to let him be the commander of the group in this expedition. They can't believe it and think the rumors might be fake, because how can a mere member of Rune Nebulous command Boss Blue Cloud and the others? The man brought him to the Blue's Cloud and he welcomed him and was glad to see him back. He instructed the guard to leave and took him inside to talk. 
Blue Cloud didn't think that Ling Si would get to level 12 in one go in just a few days and was amazed by his leveling speed, as he might be as fast as some of the big names from other guilds. The protagonist explained that he spent a few days on level ground with a friend by relying on an unorthodox battle strategy, which was quite tiring. He laughed on hearing about unorthodox strategy and remarked that he is indeed modest to have leveled up so quickly with unorthodox means which impressed him. On his way there, he found out that a large number of his guild members had a strong opinion about him. Blue Cloud uttered that they are all core members of the First Division, so it's natural for them to worry when they learn that he would be commanding the group. He requested him not to take their compliment to heart because, with his skill, there was nothing to worry about. The protagonist knew he might have purposely leaked the information so he would be pressured right after entering this place. If he were not confident in his skills, he would have given himself away as he was rough from the outside but deliberate and meticulous on the inside. The guild master of celestial unrivaled Blue Cloud was the man who is also known as the number one brute archer as he expected he is no ordinary man. On their way, the guild master remembered that he almost forgot to tell him that Whale insisted on having a battle with him, even though he tried his best to stop him, but he won't listen to him. The protagonist was aware that he was testing him, and while discussing, they reached the room where Whale was waiting for them. The guild master called him and informed him about Ling Si's arrival. He had been waiting for him to have a battle with him, so he brought him there and welcomed him. Whale remarked that he had exaggerated his word as there was no need to go as far as to battle. He just wanted to get to know more about Ling Si so it would be easier for them to cooperate later. The protagonist understood what he meant, but he wondered how he would like to do so. Whale wondered if he knew about the monster battling simulator. He heard about a monster battling simulator, which was a simulator that allowed players to fight with all kinds of monsters. This is usually used for practicing strategy or to understand a boss attack pattern because it is expensive. It's a luxury that only guilds can afford. He took to the place and informed him that behind this door was their guild monster battling stimulator. He wanted both of them to circle a little monster for 10 minutes, after which he would be able to get a better understanding based on his performance. Ling Si wondered which kind of monster it was at which they had to circle for 10 minutes. Whale explained it was a level 15 war mammoth. The protagonist sighed as war mammoth was a little monster and agreed, after which he opened the door. The door opened and he bid his farewell to the guild master as they were starting now, and Blue Cloud instructed them to go ahead. Everyone was shocked as that thief accepted it like it was nothing and was sure he would surely have an enjoyable time there. After they entered, the door closed, and then, nine minutes later, they were still inside, and the guild members wondered how the whale was planning to test that thief. His companion instructed him to be silent and explained to him that it was not a test as he was trying to get to know him better. He was amazed as she didn't hear what he said. A level 15 war mammoth has much health as well as several area of effect skills. He was sure that their boss whale might have asked that thief to circle the monster because he wanted to see how well he would fare against such an enormous and troublesome monster. There could be the reason that in addition to observing that thief, he might also be wanting to compare himself against him. He has heard that the thief once led a group and cleared the insanity difficulty of the Broken Buddha dungeon. The female member wondered what was great about that even though Whale was a warrior by class, so he was playing as a swordsman. Although swordsman's health was not as much as a warrior's, they had higher attacks and agility stats along with magnificent micro-movement, she wondered how that nebulous thief could be compared with their boss. He laughed and agreed as she was right. Their boss must have thought too highly of Ling Si and was sure that he would be better than that thief. They wondered if it could be that the thief overestimated himself while the guild master was quietly listening to their conversation. Ten minutes duration was completed, so the door started opening, and they came out of it. They were pleased because Whale was still in his full health, so the winner was clear to them. Other members agreed as there was no way that their boss would lose, but they wondered how the situation was inside. The war mammoth had already lost half of its health, so they were amazed as they were expecting their boss Whale to be able to come out unharmed after facing that monster. The man was startled to look at the strength of the protagonist, who was also unharmed. Others were also astonished as they didn't think that he had also come outside unscathed, they were stunned as the monster that he faced didn't even lose the drop of health. 
Suppose that the thief must have been too afraid to approach it. No matter how they saw it, the winner was their boss and praised their vice guild master because he was so cool. The man asked him what he thought as their boss was amazing, but he also praised him because he was also not bad to be able to come out unharmed. Whale passed the guild master and he realized that he had lost, which shocked everyone and they wondered why and how he lost. When facing the war mammoth, he used his longsword to knock the monster back, interrupting its attack, then dodge its area of effect damage with his skill. Because he was too focused on attacking, he accidentally let its teeth rip the edge of his cape. In the process, he also observes Ling Si from the beginning till the end, he even takes out his weapon. He was able to dodge all the mammoth's attacks just by moving around and using the mammoth's blind spot to evade its area of effect skill. He was constantly circling the mammoth with only the slightest gap between them, and his monster was so badly toyed with that it didn't even have time and space to use its skill. He was certain that he was top time without a doubt and praised him as he was really strong. Unrivaled Blue Cloud was glad, as he expected from Ling Si, so he didn't want to waste any more time. So he informed him that they would be troubling him to be the leader of their team and immediately wanted to prepare for disastrous graveyard insanity. Later, they reached the Disastrous Graveyard Dungeon Preparation Area. The players were agitated as the Disastrous Graveyard Dungeon was too difficult. There were three floors in total and they needed help to clear the second and the last floors. His fellow wondered if they were going to have to give up like this, so he asked if he had any other suggestions. The difficulty of this new dungeon was indeed very high. Even the number one guild was only able to clear it at a special difficulty. It just happened not long ago and he decided to see if anyone has recently shared better strategies to handle it on the forum. However, the problem was not about which strategy to use, rather, the dungeon design needed to be better. There were three floors of graveyard in Disastrous Graveyard, which is the so-called Turn of Tides effect, which refers to how the monsters that were killed would be revived after a fixed time. From the instant the first monster is killed, they will have to go all out and slaughter all the monsters in the shortest time possible. The player agreed, including this attempt. They have been overwhelmed by the waves of corpses five times already. They can't hold out against them at all, which shows that only large guilds will be able to clear this dungeon for the time being. The players were startled to see the Celestial Guild Master, Unrivaled Blue Cloud, and Vice Guild Master, Whale, arrive there. They were shocked, wondering if this guild was planning to set a new record, because their Guild Master and Vice Master both had come. They quickly decided to take photos and post them on the forum with the subject title Celestial Guild Master Vice Masters have come personally to take on Disastrous Graveyard and were sure it would become a hot topic. The player was shocked, wondering who the thief was that was marked as the tea leader and if he was the thief from Celestial. He was stunned to know that he could actually give commands to the Guild Master and Vice Guild Master and wondered what his background was as he had never even seen him before. Some of the players recognized him as the person who was leading the team from Nebulous Guild. The people from Nebulous were shocked to see Ling Si and wondered why he was staying in a dungeon with the Celestial Guild. What was more surprising was that it was with the Celestial Guild Master and Ice Guild Master, and he wondered if he received the invitation after the Broken Buddha dungeon from the last time. They decided to inform the management about this as there was a need for them to know about that matter. Blue Cloud looked at him and remarked that he had attracted much attention, but Whale instructed him not to mind him as he was fond of playing pranks. The protagonist uttered that it was the guild master who insisted that he should be the team leader, so he must have guessed this would happen. The protagonist was aware that he was clearly pushing him into the spotlight as there were bound to be people from Nebulous there. It's most likely that he intended to let the news of their collaboration get out and then observe the attitude regarding his relationship with Nebulous. However, this would not affect him much because there was no violation of the Nebulous Guild interest, so they can't really say anything to him. He informed Ling Si that the maximum number of participants for this dungeon was nine players and inquired him if he is sure that there will be no issues with the class composition of their team. The protagonist explained that the 3x3 strategy guaranteed their tank and DPS position, and the guild master and vice guild master were naturally very strong DPS positions, so there was going to be no problem. Whale was aware that Ling Si was the only thief in their team, and incited if he was familiar with the disastrous graveyard dungeon. He affirmed that he was aware of this dungeon very well, 
and that only the thief needed to clear it. Blue Cloud excitedly slapped his back very hard on hearing this and remarked that he was so overpowering and he liked making fries with people like him. Since that was the case, he decided to leave it to him then, and it hurt Ling Si a lot, and he wondered if he did that on purpose. He asked them if they were ready so that he could activate the teleporter, and the guild master laughed and affirmed that they were fully prepared. Everyone was shocked as they activated the red teleporter, which was the insanity difficulty, and they wondered if it was the people from the Celestial Guild. The number one guild only cleared the special difficulty, and they wondered why the Celestial had the confidence to dare attempt the insanity. The system notification appeared inquiring them if they wanted to enter the dungeon because they accepted the disastrous graveyard. After he accepted and they entered the dungeon, the disastrous graveyard began, whose current difficulty was insanity, and no record was set. They were instructed to beware of the waves of the corpse and were wished good luck. Blue Cloud found the air refreshing. They were currently on the first floor of the graveyard and their mission was to annihilate all skeletal soldiers as they began attacking in 10 seconds. Because of the turn of tide's effect, the skeleton would revive after 9 seconds and the completion condition was to keep the graveyard free of skeletal soldiers for 6 seconds to unlock the teleporter for the next floor. After receiving the notification and reading all the guidelines, the skeletons started emerging from their graves and the remaining time was 5 seconds. The revival time for low difficulty was 30 seconds, intermediate was 25 seconds, upper was 20 seconds, and special was 15 seconds. They didn't expect that insanity would be 9 seconds and inquired Blue Cloud how they were positioning themselves as the skeletal soldiers were increasing in numbers. His guild master instructed him not to ask him as he should ask their team leader, Ling Si, and he looked around to find where he was and was shocked as he had already gone ahead. The remaining time was zero seconds, so he rushed toward the monster and immediately attacked it. His team members wondered what he was trying to do and what they were supposed to do. But Ling Si's intentions were already clear because the revival time was nine seconds, and they had to keep the floor clear of enemies for six seconds, so he was killing them. He was using the rush attack, which was the strategy with the highest success rate for the first floor, so a disastrous graveyard was to perform a rush attack. In addition, he has to attract the enemies in the shortest time possible and gather the scattered skeletal soldiers together. Although it was a rush attack, there were quite a lot of skeletal soldiers. Even when gathered, the area they covered was not small. Going by their current team class allocation, if there are too many duplicate skills overlapping within the area during rush, there is bound to be an overkill. That will result in a few of the skeletal soldiers remaining alive, and the rush will lose its impact. Blue Cloud wanted to see how the protagonist could execute this rush by himself. He used the evil skill of invisibility because attacking the enemy immediately after going invisible, rather than hiding himself, could also get rid of the hatred attracted. In the meantime, before the clone gets attacked and disappears, control its movement to form a pattern within the restrictions of the map and attack even more monsters. The team member was surprised and instructed others to see the position of the thief on the map because most of the monsters had been attracted by him. The protagonist appeared and instructed mages to cast a restriction spell and make sure it covered the wave of the skeleton. After the restriction spell was cast, it restricted their movements as it was the time to attack. He instructed them to split into three teams of equivalent damage output and the team that was lacking in DPS could join him in this wave. Blue Cloud instructed the six of them to split into two teams of equivalent damage each of them would handle in a wave, and they affirmed and instructed Whale to join him to cooperate with Ling Si Wave. He comprehended that first, he made use of the thief's micro-movements to divert the first wave of monsters before using the clone skill to draw a point to two other waves split the huge numbers of skeletal soldiers into three equal portions and then coordinate with them to attack at the same time, thus pulling off the rush attack. He was amazed and could imagine how he had perfectly avoided the possibility of failure and praised him as he played well. The protagonist instructed them to unleash their skill using Mob Lash and he killed the skeletons. They completed the condition as the graveyard had been free of skeleton soldiers for seconds, so they were congratulated, which led to the activation of the teleporter of the second floor. Meanwhile, outside the disastrous graveyard dungeon preparation area, the player was aware that the record of 1 hour and 56 minutes was set by the number 1 guild at special difficulty. 
they were sure that no one should have the means to beat the record for some time. But all of them were gathered there for the sake of seeing the team from Celestial that had just entered the Insanity Dungeon. Since the Celestial Guild Mater Unrivaled Blue has personally participated, they assumed that they might have already figured out some method. Unwittingly, it has already attracted great attention on the Heavenland Forum, as people are constantly posting updates about this. If they could really clear the dungeon, they would be setting the very first record for the insanity difficulty, which would surely cause a huge sensation. Inside the dungeon, they reached the second floor, were welcomed there, and were informed that they would soon face the terrifying defenses of the Twelve Palace Witches. Due to the effect of the disaster, any one of the witches will revive all slain witches' companions within six seconds, and they will summon a colossal skeletal soldier every other minute. Their mission was to eradicate the Twelve Palace Witches and keep the graveyard free of any undead beings for nine seconds to unlock the teleporter or the next floor. Even though those witches have nice figures, Blue Cloud could feel like they are going to be very troublesome. They would revive in six seconds, and any of the witches would be able to revive all the slain witches. He was amazed because the insanity and difficulty were really aping the challenging factor to the maximum. Since they have to keep the floor clear of any undead beings for nine seconds, they can only annihilate everything within three seconds of revival time. After the mission started, he pulled out his dagger and informed them that witches couldn't leave the sacrificial altar, nor could they revive the skeletal soldiers. He instructed the guild master and vice guild master to clear that skeletal soldier together to warm up. They were excited as they wanted to compete to see who could kill more skeletal soldiers as there was nothing else for them to do. So the skeleton started appearing, and he instructed the three of the tanks to protect the three mages and cause as much damage to the skeletal soldier as they could. He paid attention to the hatred distance, and they all affirmed. Twenty minutes later, Blue Cloud used the piercing rainstorm, a torrential arrow shower, and they praised him because that one arrow shower took out a large swath. The player was amazed to see Whale getting rid of those skeletons in a single strike using savage sword breath. He pointed his sword at them and remarked how there could be rain without wind, so using the wave of wind, he annihilated most of the skeleton. Abruptly, he got attacked by one of the witches and he went down, and his weapon was 46% deteriorated. He was annoyed because the insanity and difficulty executing attacks had the effects of wearing down a weapon's durability. All the witches simultaneously started attacking them, and the guild master remarked that they had to spend many materials to repair their weapons after leaving this dungeon. Their teammates, who were attacking the skeletons and blocking their entrance, praised them as they were truly incredibly strong. They were not the only ones who were strong, and he pointed toward the main lead that not only had he evaded all of the witches' attacks, but he even cleared the remaining skeletal soldier. Even though thieves are more advantaged in terms of speed, his attack power was not weak at all. This shocked them as he had terrifying efficiency. The skeletal soldiers behind them have all been wiped out, and the guild master, Blue Cloud, whose physical damage will be more suitable for later on. So they had to annihilate everything within three seconds, and he inquired if they were sure they had enough physical damage skill. The protagonist uttered that if there is not enough, the three mages should prepare to spam their skill. Even though witches have high magical defense, this will still be enough to make up for the last bit of damage needed. They have no problem, but without skeletal soldiers, the witch's attack will become even more violent, so he inquires how he plans to wear them down. The protagonist could finally put to use the earned set of equipment that he collected while grinding the Song of Fire and Ice dungeon with Ruko. Although the active skill of this equipment set could only be used once, it's worth using it for this dungeon. He activated the Big Dipper protection set one off, whose active effect was magic immunity, and his costume changed. The players wondered if he was courting death, and wondered if he didn't know that after all the skeletal soldiers had been wiped out. So the twelve witches' magical attacks will power up in terms of both frequency and power, but he rushes in just like that. It would be strange if he didn't get obliterated into pieces. The whale was stunned as he was wearing the Big Dipper's protection set which is a superior grade magical immunity set that is only dropped in the mage exclusive song of fire and ice dungeon. He was amazed as he came prepared for this dungeon, and it looked like every move was a part of his calculation. He rushed there as his next target was the witches and was aware that the twelve palaces witches attack frequency and power were now boosted. Apart from him, the other players have no way of getting closer. 
and the damage caused by the mage's attacks was almost entirely negligible. This floor was designed with the intention to vex players, but currently they have the physical attacks of guild masters who are terrifying brute archers. None of this was a problem for them, and he attacked the witches using his skill backstab, mob slashes and throat slasher. He was aware that the magical attacks couldn't cause much damage to them, but the physical attacks were just what the glass cannons feared the most. The damage dealing is all taken care of, so it's time to bring their HP down, for which he used his skill Shadow Flash Blink and attacked the Twelfth Palace Witch. Three seconds were left for his magic immunity to end, and he instructed the Guild Master to attack. Blue Cloud was fully prepared because he had been waiting for his command for a long time and attacked them using the Death Grafter. Death Grafter was an archer exclusive superior grade skill which inflict extremely high pierce damage and is able to pierce through all enemies. If the attack kills the enemy, the player's bow and arrow will automatically graft the attack onto the next nearest enemy. If the attack is unable to kill the enemy, the grafting attack will automatically cease. His attack kills all the witches one by one, and other players are astonished to see the lightning created by his skill. The protagonist looked at this and was shocked because, with just one blow, he managed to wipe out one-third of an insanity level witch's HP. He was amazed to know the true power of the unrivaled Blue Cloud, nicknamed the number one brute archer in his previous life. After the witches were killed, they were congratulated because the graveyard had been free of any undead beings for nine seconds, and the condition was completed. The teleporter to the third floor had been activated, and the last wave of corpse and terror was about to come. Meanwhile, outside the dungeon at the preparatory area, they wondered how long the tea from the Celestia had been in there. She answered them that it's about 45 minutes or so, and at the insanity difficulty, they would probably still be going at it on the first floor. It's the insanity difficulty after all. Even though both the Guild Master and Vice Guild Master of Celestial are participating, it was definitely not going to be easy for them. There were so many people who had come there solely to spectate since the dungeon opening. There have never even been so many people around there. The player affirmed that that was surely the case, some of them had come specifically to see the Celestial Guild Master and Vice Guild Master. The player heard that they have quite a lot of fans, but there were some people who came for the sake of obtaining first-hand news. No matter whether the Celestial could successfully clear the dungeon or not, these people could also ask them about the situation when they come out after all. Celestial Guild challenging the disastrous graveyard at the insanity difficulty has long since become a hot topic, so all that was left was to see if they could emerge victorious. At the same time, they entered the third floor of the dungeon, and were alerted that they would soon face the terrible anger of the boss, Wailing Ghoul. Due to the effect of the disaster, the dead skeletal soldier will revive after 12 seconds every time Wailing Ghoul HP decreases by 30%. It will summon an elite necromancer to the battlefield, and it can revive all dead skeletal soldiers within a 5 meter radius every 10 seconds. The protagonist was checking all the requirements and gazed at the area down the spiral stair inside the basement where the boss monster was waiting. The system notification appeared informing that when Wailing Ghoul has only 30% of his HP left, all the undead of floors 1 and 2 will revive and re-enter the battlefield via the teleporters. The mission completing condition was to give it their all and vanquish the boss, Wailing Ghoul, and bring an end to this terrifying disaster. The horrifying breeze was spreading out from the inside. Blue Cloud could sense the presence of the dungeon boss who was right underneath. He promised that they were going to meet again, but this time he had to hold up against those skeleton monsters' attack as they cleared the way and made their descent. The revived skeletal soldier they kill will also continuously advance wave upon wave. When they were challenging the superior difficulty last time, they pushed through to the boss after much difficulty but had to deal with both the revived soldiers behind them and the boss's frightening magical damage concurrently in the end. Wales uttered that, then unexpectedly, after going through great pains to polish off 30% of the boss HP, his first summon triggered. They didn't expect that the elite necromancer would keep summoning undead skeletons by then. They weren't able to even touch a corner of the boss's clothes. Their teammates got terrified on hearing their story of special difficulty level and were worried because this was way too difficult. Whale remembered that there was only the overwhelming sense of powerlessness from being drowned by the waves of corpses. 
he was startled as the protagonist instructed them to let him be the one to lure away the skeletal soldiers along the way this time. They were shocked to know that he alone wanted to handle all those soldiers, Blue Cloud laughed as he was waiting for him to say that. The guild master uttered that if he could sue his top time moves and draw all the skeletal soldiers down by himself, then he would act in step with him to lure the boss up. This way, they will separate the boss and the mob and will have a greater chance of success. The protagonist was amazed because the way he was talking about now was the strategy for that dungeon in his previous life. He figured out that he had this plan right from the beginning and realized that he underestimated him and uttered that was what he had in his mind as well. However, coordination is of utmost importance, so if he lures all the skeletal soldiers to the bottommost area where the boss is and something goes wrong with their coordination, they will be drowned by the corpse wave in less than three seconds. The guild master inquired if he was doubting his capabilities. The protagonist denied it because, naturally, the guild master Blue Cloud's strength was beyond question so that he couldn't doubt him. Then, without further wasting their time, he rushed to lure the skeleton soldier down, and other players were shocked as he disappeared and really went ahead by himself. Whale asked the guild master if Ling Si would be fine by himself because the number of skeletal soldiers on this spiral staircase was no joke, and he wondered if he should assist him. Blue Cloud remarked that there was no need and reminded him as he seemed to have forgotten the recording that Social Butterfly Hammer showed them of his performance when they cleared Broken Buddha. Besides, based on their cooperation up to now, he thought his actual strength was far more than this, so he wanted to watch his performance. The protagonist rushes down, jumping on the head of the skeletal soldier, dragging them down the staircase and attacking them. He can't stop progressing because with the number of this skeleton, once he stops, it's over, so he has to find space for his next step in advance, where to strike next, and also the best route. The players outside were stunned as his micro-movements and physical moves flowed as smoothly as water. It was simply beyond comprehension as he really managed to lure away all the monsters on this path by himself. Unrivaled Blue Cloud inquired the Vice Guild Master if he had noticed it too. Ling Xi's moves were continually evolving. The protagonist was shocked as it was so quiet that he could hear his heartbeat and wondered if he had gotten used to it. Those skeleton soldier movements seemed to be a lot slower than previously and his top time was a lot stronger than before. Soon, all of the staircase was empty as he lured the skeleton to the upper portion, for the stairs had all been drawn downward to them. This was surely a textbook example of how to lure the monster away. Fallen Whale was dumbfounded as the number one guild posted videos of how they cleared the superior difficulty dungeon for the same strategizing he had watched many times. The clearing of this floor was solely dependent on terrifying damage output and defense. Presently, they were the only players with that kind of damage output. Blue Cloud wondered, so what that doesn't mean the insanity difficulty has to be fought the same way. They had to be ahead of everyone else to set the record for insanity difficulty this time. Finally, he reached the lowest level and ultimately met the Wailing Ghoul, who was casting spells. The protagonist gives the sign to the guild master, Blue Cloud, and he attacks the boss monster. Meanwhile, Tana was shocked to know that Ling Si and the Celestial Guild Master went to clear the dungeon and inquired if they were sure as there could be a mistake somewhere. Wasabi Kunside, as a captain of the 3rd Division, she was becoming increasingly oblivious to the outside world. It was already the hottest topic on the Heavenland Forum, as even the Celestial Vice's Guild Master was participating. It was obvious that their goal was to set the record for the disastrous graveyard insanity difficulty. Tiana wondered how Ling Si got acquainted with unrivaled Blue Cloud, because he wasn't the guild master of some small or muddle-sized guild. Unrivaled Blue Cloud was the guild master of Heavenland No. 4 Guild Celestial, who is an important figure whose mere sneeze could shake the Heavenland. Even their nebulous guild's guild master has to show him courtesy. The relations between the big five guilds are sensitive now, and the situation is tense. If word gets out about Ling Xia's close association with the Celestial Guild Master, she is afraid that it might incur misunderstanding. Ruko uttered that's his boss, Ling Xi, after all, so he naturally has his reason for doing this. They can't try to fathom him with regular logic, and if they ask him, being with people of that level is where he should belong. Wasabi agreed with what Ruko said, as that makes sense because Ling Xia's actions have always been unfathomable, so she should sit down and rest for a while. 
he inked his eyes and asked her if she still thought that he was the same as a regular player. She also agreed that since the first time they met, his actions could never be understood with conventional logic. She wondered if he thought that he could clear it and set the record for the disastrous graveyard insanity, which was difficult because this was the latest dungeon in the city. Ruko tried to calm her down and wanted her to relax because he was sure there wouldn't be a problem as Ling Si was there, so he would surely clear the dungeon. They just needed to wait for the system-wide notification. At the same time inside the dungeon, Blue Cloud attacked the Wailing Ghoul, which interrupted his spell casting. The boss monster stared at him, and he attracted the hatred of the Wailing Ghoul toward himself, so it rushed up. This makes the protagonist glad, and he praises Blue Cloud as he has drawn away the boss's hatred. The next thing he has to do is to keep the skeleton soldier there at the lowest level. The boss almost reached up, so he instructed everyone to get ready as the boss was there. Whale instructed them to put up their shield and protect the mages, and instructed them that before Ling Si gets there, the mages' damage shouldn't embarrass their celestial guild, and they affirmed. All the mages started attacking the boss monster, which made it furious, and it cast the terror whale. Whale rushed at him to attack him, but before he could reach it, the monster pushed him back using the mournful spirit's howl. Because of this skill, he has been afflicted with fear, which stunned him as this was an area-wide fear effect and he realized that Insanity Difficulty Wailing Ghoul has more skills. Using the Sacred Aura, he cleansed himself from the negative status effect and instructed everyone to attack because the boss's skills were on cooldown. So they all started attacking the Wailing Ghoul simultaneously. Blue Cloud instructed them that they had to interrupt its first summoning after the boss lost 30% of his HP and they understood his instruction. He asked Ling Si about the situation down there, which was still good for him, and he instructed them to wait for him to come up. He rushed up and decided to use Backstab to head directly up toward the second floor, and he had to keep these skeleton soldiers' hatred toward himself. He attacked the skeleton monster using the skill Shadow Flash Blink and decided to gather them together. After all those skeletal monsters gathered, this was the right time for him to commence his plan, and he, using the quick stab, attacked one monster and then, with evil spirit invisibility, to the other side. Then he used blind, and this way, he could get to the third level in the shortest time. This will transfer the hatred toward him to the clone. He got rid of the skeletal soldier's hatred, and he smirked as the only thing that was left for them was fear. The other players informed their boss, Blue Cloud, that they were about to hit the 30% marker, as the boss was going to begin summoning. Whale went toward the monster to attack him, but the guild master instructed him to back off because of the corrosive air around it. Whale was stunned as he didn't think the first summon of insanity would come with a pre-attack like corrosive air. He inhaled the corrosive air, due to which he was corroded, and a deadly poison ravaged his body, so he needed to detoxify the poison with an antidote potion. The first summon initiated by the Wailing Ghoul is the Necromancer Summons. Whale detoxified himself of the poison and rushed toward the boss monster. He remarked that they had miscalculated and were afraid that they wouldn't be able to make it. The guild master was startled as he saw the protagonist coming up and disagreed with what he said as he was sure they would make it. Everyone was shocked as they saw the summoning of the Wailing Ghoul, which was interrupted because of his attack. The guild master laughed and remarked that if he had been any slower, then he wouldn't have spared him. The protagonist requested them to attack it and help him draw away the hatred from him, and he uttered that this was their turn to hunt the Wailing Ghoul. He rushed up, and Whale instructed the mages to continue to deal damage and pay attention to the distance between him and the boss. He instructed the tanks to protect the mages and pay attention to the Wailing Ghoul skills, and they affirmed. He rushed toward the boss monster and instructed the two of the teammates to surround and kite him. The guild master, Blue Cloud, understood what he meant and instructed two melee players to be careful, as even a casual bump was going to hurt a lot. Whale requested the guild master that his damage should keep up with theirs, and he attacked the boss monster using the Wheel of the Light, which struck at its chest. The protagonist simultaneously attacks the shoulder of the boss monster, and the vice guild master wonders if he is completely unaffected by their attack, or if he is coordinating with them as they attack. He was amazed as Ling Si's movements were even stronger than when he competed with him. His top time has improved again during this period in the dungeon, and this speed of advancement was a little scary. 
Someone who could show such an expression can't be an ordinary man. He clearly has the qualifications to be the main support of the first division to pave new ground. Yet he was only staying in Nebulus's third division, so he wondered if he could be planning something else. The guild master was also amazed as Ling Si was coordinating very well with them, and he affirmed. Whale inquired his boss, Blue Cloud, if he didn't think that with his capabilities, staying in Nebulus's third division was very strange. The guild master laughed as everyone had their secret, and he wasn't interested in why he was staying in the third division and was only interested in him as a person. He was sure that if he joined their guild, then along with Whale and Blue Cloud, they would be like a tear that's grown wings. After attacking it for some time, only the 605 HP was left, so the second summoning was about to commence. The protagonist rushed to interrupt its second summon and was startled to hear that the guild master and vice guild master also wanted to interrupt it along with him. The monster was about to initiate the summon and he explained that there would be fewer monsters with the second summoning so he wanted to leave it to the guild master. While he and vice guild master whale would be responsible for interrupting him, he also has to pay attention to the boss sonic attack that's to come as it could cause a mental shock negative buff. As the boss monster started its sonic attack, he pushed the guild master back and he was thrilled. He wondered if he had played this dungeon before because he was so clear about the details of the dungeon. The protagonist explained that his friend heard firm a friend who is in the number one guild talk about it and he spent a little money to request him to help all around. Unrivaled Blue Cloud was amazed to know his network was really wide but thought it such a handy excuse that his friend of a friend. Soon, the skeletal soldier appeared, so he attacked them, but the guild master instructed him to leave them to him and help Whale interrupt the summon. He was stunned as, in an instant, the newly summoned wave of skeletons had all arrived and was amazed by the guild master's ferocious strength, which was why he was the number one brute archer. Wailing Ghoul was summoning the skeletal soldier while blocking the attack of the vice guild master's glorious light. He instructed Ling Si that it had been restrained and that he should attack, so he rushed toward it to use the backstab. He used the bling technique which afflicted the boss monster and the summoning skill was interrupted. He instructed the mages to increase the damage, due to which one third of its strength was remaining, and it started growling. The disaster strike begins as the Wailing Ghoul has only 30% of his HP left, so all of the undead of floors 1 and 2 will revive and re-enter the battlefield via the teleporters. The revived enemies from the first and second floors were coming toward them, which worried the players as they had worked hard to get the boss monster's HP down to that extent. They wondered how they were supposed to break past them, as the mana potion had all been used up. They have heard that even the number one guild took quite a beating there as the wave of corpses was like a flood, which was impossible to deal with. The guild master asked him how he planned to handle these revived skeletal soldiers and witches, but there was no way to deal with them. This worried him, and he uttered that it was not the time to be joking, but he wasn't joking with him because they didn't need to be dealt with. He wondered what he meant by that, so the protagonist explained that he had the stacked attacks ability. Since entering the third floor now, his attacks have never been interrupted. He used the stacked attacks, and the guild master understood what he meant. He instructed everyone to do their best and coordinate with Ling Si, and instructed the warrior tanks to go all out to block the corpse waves and protect the mages behind them as they attacked. The mages were instructed to use the last of their mana and chant their most powerful spells, breaking through the Wailing Ghoul magic shield. They simultaneously attacked the boss monster and were counting on Ling Si for the final strike. The protagonist rushed toward the Wailing Ghoul to let it taste the damage of nearly 3,000 stacked attacks. Meanwhile, outside the dungeon, the players wondered how long it had been, so they were informed that someone had been keeping track of the time. It had been 1 hour and 33 minutes so far, but they were still not out after so long, and they wondered if it could be that they had cleared the dungeon. If they had cleared it, they would have broken the number one guild record. What's more, it's an insanity record that greatly surpasses number one guilds, which was at superior difficulty. They assumed that the Celestial Guild must have made this move to demonstrate their power because both their guild master and vice guild master had gone into action. Still, the record for the disastrous graveyard has to be updated and everyone was amazed because they challenged the insanity difficulty. This has already attracted the attention of many players, so if they succeed, it will become successful publicity for Celestial.
Inside the dungeon, the protagonist has defeated the Wailing Ghoul, which causes changes in the dungeon's record and a public announcement is made. Everyone was stunned as the team from Celestial was congratulated and the team members Ling Si, Unrivaled Blue Cloud, Falling Whale, and all other team members were congratulated. They cleared the dungeon disastrous graveyard at insanity difficulty, setting the first record for clearing insanity. Because this run was under the Celestial Guild name, the record belongs to Celestial, and there is no way to keep his name hidden. Even though the remuneration is quite ample, Ma'am Fear fames after the news gets out that it was inevitable that trouble will come knocking again. The guild master laughed and praised him as he did well, and the insanity record belonged to them. If it weren't for him luring the monsters down there by himself, interrupting all three summonings, and especially that last knockout strike, there was no way they could have cleared the insanity challenge this time. The protagonist remarked that this is the result of everyone's effort, but Whale said that he doesn't have to be modest. Other players also agreed because Ling Si's performance this time was utterly astonishing. His movements were amazing, and he commented that he could stream instruction videos already. Ling Si knew that it was also because of the superb coordination from all of them that he was able to accomplish it. Unrivaled Blue Cloud was content that the dungeon rewards were out, and as he had expected, there was much equipment, out of which Ling Si was getting the largest share. The protagonist thought that the money they could get from the dungeon was a little to look forward to. At most, one could only get 50 silver. One of the mages wanted to make equipment that she saw, but her fellow reminded him that there were three mages in the team, so she should roll for it. The protagonist thought that if, on the other hand, his experience is doled out according to contribution, he should be able to get quite a lot. He was startled as suddenly he could feel some changes and realized that he had gone up one and a half levels, which was not bad. Everyone was amazed as he leveled up, but this was what they expected because his contribution points were very high. They guessed the news of this must have spread everywhere by now, so they instructed others to let go back to the guild headquarters. The guild master laughed as this was a big harvest and called Ling Si to let him return, and he should come with them too. Later, they returned to the headquarters of the Celestial Guild. The guild master wanted to thank him with no more words for the dungeon record this time. Falling Whale sent him three gold, which was the remuneration they had agreed earlier, and he thanked them. The guild master asked him what he planned to do next, and he replied that he would return to Nebulus as he still had to continue leveling up. He was pleased to receive three gold and was aware that only the top five guilds could come up with his kind of money. He was aware that it should be fine, even if he asked them for double this amount next time. Blue Cloud and Falling Whale gazed at each other after hearing that he would return to Nebulus and asked him as he wondered what he thought about their guild. The protagonist remarked that their guild ranked fourth amongst the top five guilds, so naturally, the guild was very strong. He didn't even want to mention the strength of the guild master and vice guild master besides being number four. He wondered if they were thinking of requesting him to join. Fallen Whale was very happy that he had such a high opinion of Celestial, and their collaboration this time has also been an immense pleasure. If they hadn't had such an excellent thief like him, this mission wouldn't have been successful. He didn't want to beat around the bush as he admired his talent and strength very much and wondered if Ling Si was willing to join their guild. As he expected, they offered him to join their guild, but he apologized to them and reminded them that, as he had said earlier, this was a one-time collaboration. He had no intention of changing the guild at the moment, either. Whale was startled and uttered that even though their guild was not ranked first, they also had strict requirements for recruitment. He was extremely sincere in inviting him to join their guild as he could enjoy the greatest privileges. The protagonist expressed his gratitude for his sincere invitation, but as he said earlier, he had no intention of changing guild for the time being and apologized to him. Whale offered him the vice guild master position if he was willing to join them and asked him what he thought about this. If this were his previous life with such conditions, he would have agreed without even a thought, but in this life, his goal was much more than this so he won't allow himself to be shackled by such things either, and he apologized to the vice guild master as that wasn't what he wanted now. Unrivaled Blue Cloud stopped Whale as that was enough because they couldn't force him anymore. The protagonist thanked him for his understanding and left. The guild master apologized as he wouldn't be seeing him off, and the protagonist bid his farewell, saying it was his pleasure to work with the Celestial Guild.
After he left, Fallen Whale told his boss, Blue Cloud, that if this person had become one of the celestial owners, then he had to do something about him. The guild master laughed and said that he wasn't meant to be a part of their guild. He asked what he should do about Wolf Fang's guild request for an alliance. Blue Cloud permitted him to decide about such things himself as there was no need to ask him. Fallen Whale thought that the next time he met Ling Si, it would be as enemies, not as allies. Nebulous Guild Master Heart Stillwater was amazed to know that there was actually a person like that in their guild. Nebulous Vice Guild Master Coco Lai also received the news from the First Division's captain. He has also helped Celestial Unrivaled Blue Cloud to clinch disastrous graveyards in Sanity and the first ever record. This thief named Ling Si seems to have also achieved outstanding results in last month's Guild War. The Guild Master was amazed and asked her if he was the thief from the Third Division. She affirmed that as he was the new Third Division captain, Tiana's subordinate, he instructed her to tell them both to come and meet him. Meanwhile, everyone recognized him as the thief that they saw going in the disastrous graveyard dungeon. They heard that he collaborated with unrivaled Blue Cloud and wondered what his background is exactly. What was more shocking for them was that he was the captain, and they had never thought that a person like that was actually from their third division. Little Ruko excitedly told the protagonists that he is super famous now because, on his way there, he kept hearing others talk about him. However, he made a big mistake by not bringing him along this time and told him that he had become even stronger again. These days when challenging dungeons with Sister Chana, he could tank all the damage on his own. He has a deeper understanding of his transformation now as there was something called one that became recognized after some days apart, and he asked him if he knew about it. The protagonist was listening to his non-stop conversation and affirmed that he was aware of it. He was startled as he suddenly heard Tiana. He had caused such a huge wave this time and didn't even think to hide his name. She sighed as she was aware that he couldn't have hidden it anyway and pointed outside so that he could look at the situation. There were so many guild members trying to catch a glimpse of the action and inquired if this didn't bother him. The protagonist uttered that the result of the dungeon has to be credited to the guild and names can't be hidden. There was nothing he could do about that besides this deal being very worthwhile, and he still plans to increase the fee next time. He assured her that those busybodies would go away after a while, so she shouldn't worry. She gets furious on hearing don't worry and scolds him as he is just shirking away from his responsibility. He wasn't aware of how many private messages she got today, and they were all asking her things like that Ling Si guy was from her third division. The people were requesting her to introduce them to that thief called Ling Si, and they sent a message as they had liked to ask something regarding him. This all was super annoying for her, but on the other hand, he had it so easy, as he could mute the messages and everything. The protagonist smiled and agreed with her as he understood what she meant. After she vented her anger at him, she remembered something. She questioned how he got acquainted with Celestial Guild Master Unrivaled Blue Cloud. She reminded him that he needs to remember that once he gets involved with people of such standing, trouble is bound to follow. He was about to explain how he met them, but she stopped him as she received a message in the management chat group and wondered what it could be at a time like this. She was about to open the group chat, but was startled when Wasabi-kun suddenly appeared and asked her if she had seen the message in the Nebulous Management chat group. He told her that their guild master, Hart Stillwater, wanted to meet her and Ling Si right now, which left her speechless. Later, they were at the Nebulous headquarters heading to meet the guild master. She was worried as they were doomed. On the other hand, the protagonist was astonished as, unexpectedly, their guild headquarters was pretty good and was a little more exquisite than Celestial. He instructed her to calm down, even if they wanted to find fault with them over certain matters. He was willing to bear all the responsibility, so it had nothing to do with her, but this was nonsense to her. As the member of her third division, she must be responsible for him. Furthermore, she did indeed give him free reign to do as he wanted, and now things have blown up so she can't push all the responsibility onto him. She uttered that he might know this. To be able to establish a guild of a certain scale in Heavenlands is an amazing thing. Even for small guilds, gaining a standing in Heavenland is not an easy thing to accomplish due to the immense competition. Moreover, when guilds grow bigger, their economic backing also grows stronger and relationships based on benefits become increasingly complicated. He could imagine that to be able to become one of Heavenland's top five guilds, 
How strong would the backing behind each guild master be? With the power of they wanted to investigate a player's real-life identity and background, it can be done very easily. So if they provoked them, squashing them would be a piece of cake. She knocked at the door and got permission to enter, and they entered the building. She informed the guild master that they were there. The protagonist thought that for Chana to be so apprehensive, she probably had some family business back in real life and was worried that it would be affected. Ling Si realizes he hasn't taken this into account as he might have caused her trouble because that was the case, he wanted to make things clear himself. The vice guild master, Nebulus, instructed them that the guild master was up there, so they went up. Coco Lai informed them that they had called them there because they had something to ask them. She asked Tiana, the captain of the third division, if there was anything that she wanted to say. Tiana told the guild master and vice guild master that the person next to her was Ling Si and was explaining what he did during this period. The protagonist talked before she could complete what she was saying. He wanted to cut to the chase because the person they wanted to question was him, so he thought there was no need to drag Chana into this. The guild master was staring at him, and the vice guild master was amazed to see how daring he was. The protagonist remarked that he was aware this was about the collaboration with Celestial on the Insanity Dungeon. Tiana tried to stop him, but he didn't listen to her. He explained to them that he needed money and just happened to have some ideas regarding this dungeon, so he helped them clear the dungeon in exchange for a fee. Coco Lai inquired if he was aware that the person he collaborated with was the guild master of Celestial, Unrivaled Blue Cloud. He uttered that he would be of service to whoever pays him, even if the number one guild's guild master would have accepted it. It's not like their guild has any rule that prohibits members from taking on jobs. She questioned how he got acquainted with Unrivaled Blue Cloud and how he knew how to clear the insanity difficulty. He clarified that a friend introduced them for the insanity difficulty. It was all based on information he had collected. She gets furious and asks why he has to hide his personal information, but this is to protect his privacy, which is his habit. She furiously slammed the table, put his conversation into simple words, and asked him, as a member of Nebulous, how he could have offered a record like this. This record concerns a guild's reputation, but he willingly helps others for the sake of money. The guild master, Heart Stillwater, wondered what was wrong with that and tried to calm her down. She was shocked, and he explained that since ancient times, those who were capable received more, so there was no ground for criticism. It wasn't hard to tell that Ling Si was a qualified person, so he called him this time to gain an understanding. They didn't need to discuss this matter anymore, and there was nothing else that he wanted to say to him. He instructed Tiana to stay behind as he had something else to consult with her and instructed Ling Si to leave. Tiana understood what he said but got worried as she heard that the protagonist had one request and would leave after saying it. The guild master permitted him to state his request. The protagonist uttered that he could achieve great things for the guild, so he wants special permission as he wishes to form an official independent team. The protagonist thought that even though he needed the guild's support in terms of resources, he didn't want to implicate Tiana. The guild master agreed, but he wanted to see the result in one month and asked him if it was fine with him. The protagonist asks the guild master that he must have a requirement in his right, since he wants it to be done in one month. Herat Stillwater affirmed and explained that if, within one month, the team he formed could rank amongst the top ten on the team leaderboard once. Then, he will allow his independent team to become permanent, which worried Tiana because it's pretty challenging. Coco Lai liked the idea and asked if he knew what the team leaderboard was. He affirmed, turned back, and promised to meet again in a month. Tiana was concerned about him because the team leaderboard had a scoreboard that refreshed weekly and was occupied mainly by pros. Any team can enter the leaderboard by submitting an application, and the system will decide the team ranking according to the dungeon they completed within that week. Each dungeon completed that week would be given a grade, which is affected by the dungeon's difficulty and completion rank. He will be facing countless other teams in the team leaderboard. Furthermore, the five big guilds have always occupied the top ten positions. To think that the guild master wanted Ling Si's independent team to ensure the top ten ranking in the leaderboard was almost impossible. Ling Si should also know how tough that is and the guild master is making things difficult for him. Coco Lai wondered if he knew what the team leaderboard was because his reaction and relaxation showed he wasn't unaware. Donna clarified that he didn't mean to talk back to him, so he requested to forgive. 
she was startled when the guild master asked her if he had heard that Ling Si was specially recruited into the guild by her. She affirmed that was right because at that time she wanted to recruit him into the guild, so she did that. The guild master was amazed because that meant that she was the one who approached him first and not the other way around. She was confused and affirmed that she had come to him. After hearing her answer, he instructed her to leave. The third division was an important source of new blood for the guild, so he was counting on him in the future. She agreed and asked for his permission to leave. Coco Lai inquired if the reason for him asking that question was because he was probably to ascertain whether Ling Si was a spy or not, he couldn't deny that fact. If he were to have approached Tiana first, he might be harboring some other motives. She was amazed as she hadn't expected him to accept his demand so quickly, but he was confident that a guy like him would accept his demand. The gold master was curious about who he would recruit in his independent team. Later, the protagonist reached the third division office where Ruko was waiting for him and inquired if they did make things difficult for him. He was fine, which astonished Wasabi, and he assumed that the guild master probably wanted to know more about his background. The protagonist affirmed and explained that he also allowed him to create a team, and if he could enter the top 10 on the team leaderboard within a month, he would make his team permanent. Wasabi was surprised to know the condition for becoming the permanent team which was to be on the top 10 of the team leaderboard. Ruko suggested they shouldn't waste any more time and fight their way into the top 10. Wasabi wanted to help him by doing everything he could to help because Ling Si wanted to create a team. He can't deny that Ling Si recently gave him so many shocks and assumed that a person like him, who could make the impossible possible, constantly aspires to become stronger. He was more worthy of his pursuit. If necessary, he agreed to let go of his vice-captain position to help him. Soon, Tiana arrived there, and Ruko was pleased to see her back, and told her they already heard everything from his boss. The protagonist inquired her if the guild master held her back because he wanted to ask her about him. She called Ling Si and wanted to ask him about something. She inquired if going independent was better for him. The protagonist uttered that he is different from her as he doesn't have any burdens unlike her. He wanted to come out independent because he was afraid that his laid-back nature would burden her, causing her unnecessary problems and responsibilities. She can't deny that she was afraid of the guild's influence, but she achieved what she has today because of his help, so if he ever needs her, she will be by his side. Ruko smirked on hearing this and said they should go independent and achieve big things. He calmed her down as they needed at least four team members to apply for the team leaderboard, so they still had to look for more teammates. Wasabi uttered that when the time comes, they could clear all the insanity dungeons they have completed before, which will help them a lot with the team grades. They could also farm a set of high damage equipment first, and this will also help increase their dungeon records by quite a lot. Ruko agreed, as there were still many dungeons with unbroken records that were much easier than the insanity difficulty ones they had cleared. Wasabi was startled as the protagonist told him he couldn't join the team because his skills didn't meet the standard. Wasabi laughed and thought it might be because of his level. He promised to grin some levels with little Ruko for a few more days. The protagonist denied it because it wasn't about his level but his skills, which are incompatible. Even little Rugo should be able to win against him, which they can't have. Furthermore, there is already a thief in the team so that they wouldn't need two of the same class. Wasabi sadly sits on the sofa and understands what he means, so he decides to leave. The protagonist hopes he will understand this as this has nothing to do with their friendship. Tiana was worried because he was a little disrespectful. Before leaving, Wasabi uttered that after finding the members he needed, he wished to have a duel with them. He just needed one chance, that was all he wanted from him, and he left. They were sad for him, Tiana inquired where he would go next. The protagonist said he should be setting off because there wasn't much time to find an archer to join the team. After some time, a few players were in the dungeon running from someone and decided to split up first. The other player wondered if he was able to find his location, but he was able to find it. Because he plans on going against the Dark Wolf's workshop, he wants to make sure he won't be lonely. While rushing away to hide, one of the players got shot by him and fell. Other players were looking at him and startled, but suddenly, another player got shot in the head. The last player rushed away to hide in the bushes and assumed he wouldn't be able to find him for some time. 
he decided to wait until the workshop's reinforcement arrived and wondered where that player was attacking him. The bird flew and chirped from the point the player aimed at him. He was startled, so he looked behind, wondering if it was the bird, and was shocked but soon shot by them. The player Pure Dark Feather got down after killing him. When he went outside, some people recognized him and were thrilled to see a hot weapon type player. He was an archer profession but with hot weapons, which were indeed rare. Not only was their damage higher, but their equipment was also challenging to obtain. They were astonished to see the heavy sniper on his back, as this was a celestial falcon whose drop rate was meager. It could only be got in a specific upper difficulty dungeon, and they were lucky to see it in person. He went to the bar, ordered the receptionist for dark beer, and sat on the char. After some time, his dark beer arrived. He was busy playing with the coin, so he didn't realize it, but the receptionist informed him about his soda, so he stopped playing and expressed his gratitude for the drink. The protagonist saw him and matched the get that he was told that a person with the Celestial Falcon Heavy Sniper, Black Hood, tall and skinny, and likes to draw dark berries. If it wasn't because of his friend seeing him entering this var, he was afraid that he wouldn't even be able to find his silhouette. He gazed at him, and the protagonist called his name, Pure Dark Feather, to gain his attention, but he didn't respond. Just like what he has heard from the rumors that he is a reclusive lone wolf, the only taunt he gives to his opponent is GG, and he doesn't spare a second glance. He apologized to him for the interruption and explained that he just wanted to discuss working together with him. The protagonist clearly remembered that it was this antisocial guy who became Heavenland's number one long-range hot weapon in his previous life. He was an excellent sniper, and he even became ranked one in the professional assassinate leaderboard later in time. Because his enemy was unable to find his location during the battles, the ones who knew already got their head blasted. The protagonist sits next to him, and while drinking, he clearly utters the reason he met him, which is that he wishes to invite him to his team and take part in the team leaderboard and is also going to give him an offer. He was startled as the archer shot his glass and furiously told him to leave because he wasn't interested in his offer. The protagonist figures out that he doesn't really like this form of communication and throws the pieces of glass away. He doesn't want him to misunderstand because he is not one of those superstar seekers, but he thinks that he is suitable to be his teammate. If he was willing to discuss it with him, he invited him to come to meet him at the Ancient Machinery Cave Dungeon tomorrow afternoon. While leaving, he uttered that he believed that he would change his mind after coming, and assured him that if he wanted to get a weapon upgrade, they could help him get the Shadow Killer Heavy Sniper for him. In his previous life, everyone knew that Pure Dark Feather was a huge fan of hot weapons, so he didn't want him to think that he came unprepared. The Shadow Killer Heavy Sniper was currently one of the top heavy snipers in the game, so he was sure that he would reject his offer. He quietly gazed at him and was looking forward to seeing him tomorrow at the dungeon. The protagonist woke up and logged out of the game and sighed as there was always that tearing kind of pain every time he came out from the game. He saw the breakfast and a letter on the table and opened it and was amazed as this was the school admission letter. He didn't think that the old man was serious about what he said while eating. The old man instructed him that he was still required to receive compulsory education at his current age and would need to go to school to be knowledgeable, so he helped him apply for a school free. He sighed as school started the next month, and he was afraid that he would disappoint the old man if he didn't go and wondered where he was currently. He was startled as he suddenly heard noises from outside. The man was asking him if he knew how much his son owed them. He understands that his son is dead, but inquires what is going to happen to the money that he owes them. The old man apologized, but he didn't know what to do. The man showed him the paper that his son had signed and asked if he understood the situation now. The protagonist rushed there and wondered what was happening. He requested him to let the old man go. He wondered who was to talk to him like this, and if he was that old man's grandson. He affirmed that he was his grandfather. Since that was the case, he wondered if this grandson was there to help his precious grandpa pay off his debts. He denied that was not true and that he wasn't his grandson, so this had nothing to do with him. But the man doesn't care if he is his grandson or not as he was going to pay them the one million that his son owes them today. If he can't pay them, then he would be going with them, and he wondered how much parts of an old man are worth to sell. The protagonist gets furious at him, but his grandfather comes in front of him and kneels before that man. 
he realized that he had to keep calm because he was not in the game right now, so they could kill him off easily. If he were awakened right now, then the situation would be different, so he could explain to them that even if they will them, they don't have one million currently. If he could give them some more time, they might still be able to scrape it together. The man thinks for a while and agrees. He was aware that it wouldn't do them any good if they couldn't get the money, so he gave them two months. This should be enough for them to get the money, but it increased the debt to one five million, not a penny less. The old man was worried, wondering why it had become one five million, but he explained that he was giving them two months to get the money. This was why he would have to charge interest, which is fair as he was a very reasonable man. He doesn't want to argue with them further on this topic because he still has two more customers to visit. So he would see them again in two months and warn them not to even think about moving away because they would be able to find them whenever they wanted. The protagonist puts his hand on his shoulder and asks if he is all right and if he wants to check for injuries in the hospital. The old man was worried because they couldn't gather one five million in two months. The protagonist was also worried because one million was not a small sum and asked him if he knew what his son spent that one million he borrowed. He didn't know because he had never told him about it before, so he instructed him to head inside first and leave the issue of the money to him. The old man was shocked and inquired if he had the solution to arrange that huge sum of money, and he affirmed. It's the real world, after all, there are always many unexpected problems that crop up suddenly. He realized that he really has to pick up the pace for two months. Only the level 15 players that had successfully awakened could activate the function of connecting the currency between both worlds. He just had two months to bring the plan forward. The next day, he again logged in and was aware that having a fixed team was immensely important to him. Not only did it ensure that he would be able to level up quickly, but it also played an important role in the fulfillment of his plans for the future. So first, he had to build up the team, take one step at a time, and keep getting stronger. They were at the ancient machinery cave dungeon lobby. Ruko was glad to see his boss, Ling Si, and was excited when he received his message yesterday as he could finally challenge a dungeon together with him again. Ruko was furious as he really had an unlucky day. He saw a devil the moment he arrived and asked him to guess who he had met. The protagonist realized that they might have already met and introduced Tilly's, who was a battle mage since they had met before, and she was joining them in this dungeon. Tilly's wondered why he was so late as she only came because he said she could spar with a pro. She can't remember that she said she was going to join them in a dungeon. Ruko was also stunned to know she was joining them. The protagonist assured her that he didn't lie to her. It was just that the person had not yet arrived and asked if she could help them out with the dungeon. She was fine with the dungeon as long as she got to spar with someone skillful, which made little Ruko anxious, and he wondered why she would agree. Soon, the pure dark feather arrived and figured out that these two might be his teammates. The protagonist was glad to see him there and affirmed that they were his teammates. Ruko was startled and wondered when the person came. He clarified that he was only interested in the Shadow Killer sniper rifles and hoped that he would be a man of his own words. The protagonist uttered that the Shadow Killer sniper rifle could only be dropped when certain conditions were met. As for clearing the dungeon, he was very confident in their abilities, but if he had any doubt, he allowed him to test their abilities himself. Tilly's furiously gazed at them, wondering why he would test their abilities, but they were startled as he pointed toward the little Ruko. He laughed and remarked that he had good judgment as he should know that he was very strong. This made her furious and she wondered why he would choose a stupid kid over her and wondered if he was looking down on her. Pure Dark Feather clarified that how much water a wooden bucket is able to hold depends on the length of its shortest piece of wood. She laughed and agreed, but Ruko wasn't able to understand a single word and inquired what he meant by bucket and why they would need water. Since there was no one else there, they decided to have a small duel between them. Ruko inquired if he was going to use that sniper rifle, as it was rare to see a firearms wielder. He remembers this equipment is very hard to obtain, so very few people choose to use it, but it really looks cool. He rambled that when he carried it on his back, then wouldn't it hit the ground when he squatted down and rambled several other questions, which made him furious. He covered himself with the shield and was ready for the duel. He wanted to have a go against the sniper rifle. Pure Dark Feather switched his weapon and replied that he wouldn't need to use it, which startled him. 
So he looked at him, who was holding the gun instead of a rifle, and commanded to begin the duel. The protagonist didn't think he had to use the dual pistol because all he knew was that he was the best with heavy sniper rifles. However, he must say that the dual pistol will be more agile than a heavy sniper rifle in this kind of short-range combat. Tilius was astonished and wanted to have a battle with the firearm guy as it would be a good experience for her. Ruko laughed at seeing a dual pistol as he thought he would have to use that heavy sniper rifle of his. Using the flying shield, he threw it toward him, but he dodged that attack, which amazed little Ruko, and he remarked that he had quite a strong lower back. Dark Feher was shooting at him when he jumped at his shield, evading all the attacks he was contented as he didn't hit him. Tilly's didn't expect that kid would be so agile. Ling Si agreed as he indeed improved, and he didn't even notice. He used a shield to bash at him, but he dodged the attack, so she uttered that compared to that guy, Ruko's agility was still not enough. The protagonist agreed, but that wasn't a big problem. Dark Feather shot at him while he was blocking it with his shield. As he reached close to attack, Ruko jumped with his shield and attacked him as he wanted him to enjoy the shield bash into his face. But he got the chance. Using the metallic dance, he kicked his shield without giving him time to prepare. He shot at him which he couldn't attack and fell and cursed him because his attacks were tightly packed. He kicked him again in his face which led to massive destruction and he remarked to Gigi while leaving that he thought he defeated him. Tilly's remarked that the kid's strength might be on par with the gun guy but it's a pity his flaws were exposed after getting attacked by him. She assumed that the battle was over but the protagonist didn't agree with her as there was still something left. Dark Feather was returning but was startled as he saw him appearing from massive dust with a huge size approaching him. He was startled, wondering what it was, and started shooting him to stop him, but his bullets weren't working at him. Soon he was able to grip him, which restricted his movement, so he advised him to take out his heavy sniper rifle, otherwise he wouldn't be able to win against him. The protagonist thought that even though Dark Feather would become Heavenland's number one long-range firearms wielder in the future and have unmeasurable power, he shouldn't underestimate Ruko's tremendous potential. The protagonist thought that the standing in front of him was the one who was and would become one of the six divine shields in the future sacred mountain Ruko. Tilly's was shocked to see his strength and wanted to fight him too, as his strength was beyond what she was expecting. The protagonist approached them and inquired if he would like to have a match with his heavy sniper rifles. Dark Feather denied it as there was no need for that. He didn't want to verify further, so they should start with the dungeon. The protagonist suggested that they should then add each other as friends and he will add him as a temporary team member. Their goal for this dungeon is as simple as getting the Shadow Killer sniper rifles and breaking the record for the special difficulty of Ancient Machinery Cave. He explained to them that the minimum number of players required for this dungeon is exactly four people, but that would be fine because all they have to do is follow his plan. Ruko wondered why they were going into special instead of insanity difficulty, which was because the rewards were different. Suppose they were to clear the insanity level difficulty of Ancient Machinery Cave with all of their members having over half of their health. The reward would be Brass Shadow Killer Claymore which is for warriors, not the Brass Shadow Killer Sniper Rifle. For them to obtain this sniper, they require time to clear the special difficulty of the dungeon within 45 minutes to obtain it. Tilly's wondered if it would be possible to fear the dungeon within 45 minutes because the current record for a special difficulty was 1 hour and 27 minutes. So they need to be 42 minutes faster than the current record, which is almost half the total time of the current record. He assured them that three wouldn't be any problem, so they should get ready to enter the dungeon. Dark Feather inquired him how much longer it would take to clear the dungeon according to his plan and was shocked as he answered 20 minutes. Later, inside the ancient machinery cave, Ruko was playing with the little spider and found it to be an agile little creature as it rushed away. Tilly's thought that 20 minutes would be too exaggerated, but he denied it because they would be using a different method. They reach a location, and from there on, they will be using a completely different strategy than the typical players do. He assumed that they might be aware that inside the dungeon, there were three mini-maps they would have to clear. Each mini-map is on the floor of the cave, which will only lead them to the last floor of the ancient humble Great Bridge, where they will need to defeat the mechanic Griffin Kayla. Dark Feather affirmed as he teamed up with others before in the hope of obtaining the Shadow Killer's sniper rifle. 
In his opinion, their speed was already fast, but as the mechanical enemies had huge resistance to physical damage, they were very time-consuming to deal with. In the end, it took them two hours to clear the dungeon, which was a huge difference from the 45-minute requirement. Tilly's questioned how he planned on clearing this route, whether he would use a rush attack or whether he had other ideas. The protagonist clarified that even a rush attack would take too much time, so the method he would be using is pretty crafty, as they will be using the map to their advantage. There would be no need to kill a single enemy according to his plan, which shocked her, and this was why he said they would be using the map to their advantage. The map of the ancient machinery cave was different from the maps of other dungeons because the map of this dungeon was fully preloaded. In other words, there was no need to pass through things like gates that required them to wait for the map to load when entering the next floor. Ruko thought that he meant it was a seamless map. They could roam around the whole map freely without having to wait for parts of the map to load. The protagonist affirmed that Heavenland has long been able to make the entire game a seamless open world. In order to create different gaming experiences, some maps are seamless, while some have to be loaded. Dark Feather had no idea what they were talking about, so he wanted them to tell him what they had to do and stop wasting time. The protagonist decides to give a simple explanation of the rationale, so they all will have a better understanding of what is happening when they act. He didn't expect that a pro like Dark Feather would have absolutely no knowledge about the game mechanism. He pointed toward the holes and wanted them to look around to create a sense of mystery for this map, as there were many holes in the floor, walls, and ceiling. These holes make Tilly's feel uncomfortable, but Ruko isn't uncomfortable at all. The protagonist instructed her that she had to overcome this uncomfortable feeling because they would be entering these holes, which startled them. This sounded fun to Ruko, and he asked him if they were using the gates to avoid the enemies and wondered if that was the case, then how they would enter the next floor. He uttered that they might not know that the thousands of holes there are all connected like threads of a spider web. They will never know where they lead. There could be a mechanical enemy hiding in the darkness at the end of it, or it could be a dead end, or it might lead to the entrance of another route as no one knows where the holes will go. But that excluded him because he knew that within these 10,000 holes, there was a certain route that would bring them directly to the bottom floor. He took them through a specific route and stopped in front of a certain hole. He remembered that it took the exploration of countless players to figure out this shortcut in his previous life. In the end, it became this dungeon's cheat because everyone was able to avoid all the mobs with this shortcut and the dungeon lost its purpose. The shortcut was patched after a version was updated, but in this life, he was the only one who knew about it. Suppose he were to sell this information to others, he would probably be able to earn much money. But it's better not to let such a cheat-like shortcut be known to the world as soon as it loses its worth. Dillies was astonished to discover a dark, narrow cave that hid unknown wiggly beings deep inside it and was worried that she would die. She looked at one of the tiny holes and saw a few eyes, so out of fear she shouted, which startled him, and he wondered what happened. Ruko calmed her down as it was just a little mole that they could find anywhere, which embarrassed her. The protagonist stared at him, and he never thought that the usually calm and cool Tillies would also have such a frantic side. The mole gets on her body, which terrifies her, and Ruko starts laughing at her condition, which makes her furious. The protagonist was amazed to have Tilly's and Kaki looking dark feather trailing behind them and thought it was an interesting day of his life. There were three forks on the road, and he instructed them that they had to go to the left, so they should hurry up. While passing through that track, he instructed them to use hand gestures to be quiet. After some time, they reached the place, and he instructed them to jump in as it was below this tunnel. Ruko wanted to jump first, so he hurried and jumped and was excited. After him, Ling Si and Tilly's jumped in. The protagonist knows he is excited that they are there, but instructs him to be careful and calm down as it's dangerous. Lastly, Dark Feather jumped in, and Raiko was thrilled that they were finally there. Tilly's took a peaceful rest when they finally got out of that narrow space. Ling Si agreed that they had finally arrived, but he wanted her to get off him first before complaining. She got off him and wondered where they were as she was so confused after all those tunnels. Dark Feather uttered that they moved horizontally 16 times, but changed their position vertically 12 times, so they assumed it might be the bottom floor. Not only was this the bottom floor, but he didn't expect they would come straight to the final boss. 
as he expected from him, he has a terrifying spatial awareness as he never thought he would be able to make out their location even after going through all those tunnels. He recognized that underground river, which is a humble river located on the bottom floor of the dungeon. He didn't expect that he had actually known of a shortcut that could take them directly to the lowest floor. Judging from the structure, he assumed that above them should be the habitat of the boss, humble mechanical guardian subterraneous Kayla of the ancient humble Great Bridge. Little Ruko was looking at the monster while hiding and informed them that it was not looking good at all. Humble mechanical guardian subterraneous Kayla was sleeping, and Ruko informed his boss Ling Si that this monster was just too strong, which seemed ridiculously tough and impenetrable. Tilly's reminded him that it had already been 12 minutes, which was just 8 minutes away from the 20 minutes that he was talking about. The protagonist assures them that they don't need to confront that boss monster head-on. She urged him to stop wasting time and tell them his plan as she was ready to commence, but got furious as he told him that there was no need for her help yet. He explained that only Dark Feather could perfectly execute the first stage of the plan, and she wondered why he was the only one who could do it. Since he brought them there, he wondered if he was not wrong that his target was that monster subterraneous Kayla's tail over there. He was correct, so Ling Si explained that only heavy sniper rifles have enough range to do it, so he should use the heavy sniper rifle to shoot from a safe distance. Once shot, the boss will become hostile and turn aggressive in them. However, as it wouldn't be able to attack them, it would be forced to turn back. Dark Feather doesn't know how he thought this, but he agreed to go test it out and see if it actually works. The protagonist wants them to trust him, gets in position, and reminds him to use single attack skills as much as possible. Because the tail of the monster was a weak point, the higher the damage, the better the result. He aimed at the tail of Kayla and switched his weapon into an explosive bomb. Ruko wondered then what about the three of them and if they were really there to stand and do nothing. He affirmed that they were just there to fulfill the number requirement, but they shouldn't worry as they all had important roles in the dungeon to come, and Tilly's thought it was a waste of her time. After aiming at the tail, he inquired for his permission to shoot, and after he allowed, Drac Fidat shot at the tail, and the boss monster mourned. The protagonist uttered that it had been shot so it would come flying straight at them now and ground it flying above their head. He smirked because that lion eagle monster wouldn't have a target to attack as they were hiding under a bridge, it would soon return to where it was before. Dark Feather was saying something, so Ling Si asked if there was something wrong, and he shot again at the monster. He wanted to take advantage of the time when it was returning to deal more damage, but he pitied it because the swift ammunition didn't deal much damage. Ruko suddenly felt bad for the boss monster, and the protagonist was amazed as he grasped the subterraneous Kayla's rhythm so quickly. Tilly's thinks he is an ignorant little kid, which frustrates him, and he wonders who she is calling a little kid. Tilly's asked Ling Si if he had done that dungeon before because this was usually a nightmare for ranged glass cannons like mages and archers, and he never expected that his tactics would work. He laughed because that was true, as the subterraneous Kayla was particularly hostile toward ranged attacks, yet specialized in locking on to the players from afar and casting sonic wave attacks. Generally, the mages and archers can't deal serious damage at all under these circumstances because once the player is locked on, they wouldn't even have time to escape. A player with a weapon like Dark Feather's heavy sniper rifle would be locked on even before they finished preparing. Dark Feather was astonished because the last time he cleared the dungeon, he didn't even have a chance to take out his heavy sniper rifle and had to deal damage with a dual pistol instead. They had to depend on melee's attacks to chip away at the boss's health little by little and never would have thought of a strategy like this to utilize the terrain to force the boss to move. So that he could steadily deal with ranged damage, he never thought that Ling Si could come up with this method, so he found himself an interesting guy. The protagonist looked at the monster and thought that his calculation was correct. Dark Feather had been firing four times per minute and he also dealt some extra damage after grasping Kayla's rhythm. Ruko laughed as it turned its back again because the monster couldn't find them no matter how many times he searched the area to find them. The heavy sniper rifle damage was extremely high to begin with, so taking into consideration that the tail is its weak point and has a high damage bonus, there shouldn't be any problem. The protagonist was startled as he heard him saying that's the point, and with shock, he inquired what so he was doing. He explained that he was saving time and through his new position, he attacked again at its tail. 
He explained that it was nothing much while dealing with extra damage. He noticed that the time taken by the boss to turn around and leave the bridge again on its way back was enough for him to fire another shot. So he thought he could take another shot and fire twice in one go to save some time. Ruko was impressed by his strategy. The protagonist was amazed as he was able to take advantage of the few seconds it took for Kayla to leave the bridge to shoot again. The protagonist was impressed by his amazing judgment as he was able to figure this out and execute it perfectly after just one shot. He has never heard of anything like this, not even in his past life, as it's always been one shot at a time. He didn't expect that he would be able to use focused shot in the short gap after firing swift ammunition and was overwhelmed by his amazing control of timing and keen sense of perception. Afterward, Dark Feather figured out that he was about to fire two times in one go, so the estimated time of 20 minutes was shortened by about four minutes. In the end, they cleared the special difficulty of the ancient machinery cave and they defeated the monster in just 16 minutes. Dark Feather was also able to obtain the equipment he wanted, and Ling Si thought that beating the clear time of the special difficulty wouldn't attract much attention, so their cooperation would end peacefully. But even he had not expected that their near monstrous dungeon clear time would ignite a terrifying discussion on the Heavenland Forum. Everyone was searching for them and about the team who made that new record, so they became a hot discussion topic. What was even more outrageous is that soon after, countless teams from all levels began to issue challenges to their little four-person team. Later, Dark Feather inquired why he would have to keep his heavy sniper rifle away. Ling Si explained it was due to its being too attention-grabbing. Ruko remarked that if someone looked at his sniper, and if he was discerning enough, he would know at one glance that the hotly debated 16-minute team was them. But this shadow killer rifle, so he was reluctant to hide Ling Si, explained that he has a habit of concealing his information. All of them on the team must conceal their information from outsiders in their operations from now on. He was aware that revealing their information would only bring them endless trouble, so he wanted to try to be as low profile as possible because it's always better to be safe than sorry. Tilly's was fine with that, but as per what he promised, she only joined because it sounded interesting and challenging. So if she finds it boring, she can leave any time she wishes, and he will permit her to do whatever she wants if she gets bored. He was sure that as long as there was a challenge, he should be able to keep her along, but he didn't expect to keep Dark Feather so easily with him. He remembered his condition, as he was a solo player, so he didn't join the team permanently, but to repay him for the rifle he agreed to join them for some time. He clarified that if he should leave the team suddenly someday, they shouldn't be shocked because he had his plans. Whatever the case was, the current team was in accordance with what he had hoped for, so it's a good start for them. On their way, Ruko saw many teams who were already there and fully equipped, so he asked his boss Ling Si about them. He explained this was because this was the road that led to the team leaderboard registration lobby. So, the team without a certain level of ability wouldn't apply for permission to compete in the team leaderboard. Tillys knew that almost all of the teams came from guilds or workshops of considerable standing, which was why the Ream leaderboard was also nicknamed the signboard. To be ranked on the leaderboard was a direct display of their guild or workshop strength, so the higher the ranking, the stronger their guild or workshop is. That's why this has become an important method of advertisement. Now Ruko realized that when he was looking at this leaderboard previously, the top 10 teams were basically all from big guilds. He didn't know there was such fierce competition for this kind of free advertisement. Tilly's reminded him that his goal of becoming the top 10 in the team leaderboard does have a certain level of difficulty as he will be competing with the big 5 guilds. The protagonist told them not to worry because with them around, there would be no difficulty in accomplishing this goal. They finally reached the registration lobby of the team leaderboard and were heading in when Ruko asked him if he had thought of a name for their team. He had not thought about this before, so he wanted to go with some random name because this didn't matter to him. Ruko doesn't agree with him and assumes he might not know about the saying that with a good name, he will be a winner for life. He wanted to give his team a grand name and has thought about it all the time because their team always concealed their information. They could be as mysterious as a shadow. Other people only know that they existed, but they don't know who exactly they are, so they wanted to name their team Shadow. Shadow sounds a little dumb to Tilly's, which makes him sad, but the protagonist smirks and agrees to go with this name. 
Because it's simple, clean, and also retains the meaning that he wants to express, this makes little Ruko happy, and they head inside. After applying for permission to join the team leaderboard, the forum began to create new records in the dungeon that would benefit them. Even when it was really impossible to speed clear some insanity difficulty dungeons due to limitations in their lineup. They also tried their best to speed clear those at the special difficulty and set new records, such as the secret treasure of the solitary cliff dungeon. Clearing the dungeon themselves wasn't difficult. What they paid attention to was to clear them at top speed so as to save time. While giving themselves enough space to follow up, they also made calculations because the team leaderboard was refreshed once every week. They only had four chances to get into the top 10. They wanted to make sure that they could safely squeeze into the top 10 at least once, and as time went on, Shadow began to make numerous new records. As they set their detailed information as private, players only knew that there was a team called Shadow that was setting new records one after another at an alarming rate. Even though they have yet to squeeze into the top 10, it is an undisputed fact that they have left their imprint on the best record of one dungeon after another. Once again, something else that Ling Si didn't expect happened, as this type of special glory became something ill-intentioned people began to fight over. Tilly's was shocked to learn from little Ruko that someone was impersonating them, and he also heard about it from Tiana from their guild. Since they were famous now, he guessed, which is why the man impersonators had emerged and cursed them as they were a bunch of guys with nothing else better to do. The protagonist appeared there and informed him that he was paying attention to the wrong thing because all the hustle and bustle in the world were for profit and beneficial. Dark Feather figured out they might be trying to steal the record they have set. The protagonist gives it some thought as a popular team that's anonymous has considerable commercial value. No matter what kind of collaborations are made, once the imposters strike a deal with their victims, they wonder if they wouldn't be able to reap all sorts of benefits. Since they killed the last monster, they started distributing the clearance rewards and preparing for the next dungeon. They were congratulated on completing and setting the insanity difficulty new record of 24 minutes for the annoying mountain ape dungeon. They were excited to head into the next dungeon and were a bit relaxed as it was relatively easier than this, so they wanted to head straight in. The protagonist stopped them as he wanted to turn in the dungeon mission first and was startled as he heard someone rushing there. He was astonished because they looked like them, as the team lineup was also exactly like them. Another team with the same outfit as they appeared, and those fake players remarked that they weren't expecting that right after chasing away a bunch of fakes, more would come. Ruko was dumbfounded to see a thief, a battle mage, a sniper archer, and a warrior who had the same shield as him. The fake warriors calling themselves real wanted to teach all the imposters a lesson. The fake team, without any fear, uttered that right before they came, they chased away another team that was impersonating them and got furious even though they knew they were famous, but impersonating them was going too far. The protagonist heard the people behind them gossiping and wondered if the team that had just come in was also a bunch of shadow imposters. But their professions and equipment are all the same, so they were puzzled, and because Shadow has been standing out a lot lately because they have always kept their information hidden, many people have started to pretend to be them. The people saw this team recently, which is led by the Beast Man Thief, suddenly appear and announce that they are real Shadow and have launched an offense against many imposters. They have watched the Beast Man Thief team through all their fights. Whenever they saw anyone who claimed to be Shadow, they would go up against them. So many people acknowledged that they were the real. Fake thief judged by their professions and equipment, and there was no need for any more explanation because they were the imposters. Seeing how grave they looked, he assumed that they must be feeling anxious after being exposed. The fake thief was amazed to see them as they had such nice expressions and were so professional. He supposed that they were really taking themselves to be the real deal, and decided to practice their facial expression after returning. The protagonist sighed and decided to ignore them, so he instructed his teammates that there was no need to waste their time with that lowlife, so they should head inside, which made the fake thief furious, and he aggressively called him. Tilly's was irritated because this was new, and it was her first time meeting someone impersonating her. Dark Feather was more furious than her and wondered why she was the one impersonating him like a pig. The protagonist saw them losing their temperament and instructed them to let it go because there was no need for them to attract unnecessary attention. The fake thief asked them what they were mumbling as they were not only trying to leave quietly but were also provoking them. 
since they were all doing the same thing, their acting skills had to be better than their opponents because he thought they were the real deal that specialized in beating the imposter. The protagonist asks them if they are saying that they are the real shadow, which amazes the fake thief, and he inquires if he is blind. He wondered if there was even a need to ask because everyone there knew about them. He threatened to beat them as if they were their imposter. Ling Si wondered if that was the case and how they were planning to beat those who were fake. The fake thief has the same rule as usual, a 1v1 between the two teams, so if they would be real shadow, they must have some skill. He informed him, thinking he should know that they had yet to be defeated after fighting teams of fakes like them, and the protagonist agreed to the duel. The fake thief was stunned, wondering why he was being so cooperative, but because they agreed, the warrior decided to go first. He explained that in 1v1, whoever is stronger wins, and the overall winner will be the side that wins the best of three rounds. He inquired who they would send for the first round, and Ruko volunteered because it has to be a duel between the same profession, and this would be interesting that way. He agreed to have a duel between the same profession and draw the circle and explained the simple rules. They could only fight within the circle, and the winner would be decided after five minutes. If he gets knocked out of the circle, then it will be considered a loss, and Ruko had no problem with it, so he entered the circle. The protagonist doesn't demand anything because all he needs to do is beat that guy, but Dark Feather wants to see him dead instead, and he instructs them to watch him transform and flatten him. The protagonist instructed him not to transform because little Ruko's 1v1 skill was quite decent now. If he transformed, there would be no contest, and his transformed appearance was way too attention-grabbing. Ruko thought the match would be boring without it, and his opponent informed him that the match started soon after the sign was given. Before attacking him, the fake warrior wants advice from him even though it's a duel. Ruko was excited and uttered that he was now a lot stronger than he was in the past, but was startled as his opponent wanted to shake hands with him as a sign of respect for each other. He agreed because it was his first time meeting someone who wanted to shake hands during a duel. As soon as he shook his hand with him, he used the shield bash and threw him out of the circle. Tillys cursed him as he cheated and Ruko got furious because he tracked him and the fake warrior informed him that he lost because he was outside the circle. Ruko gets furious because he is despicable as he wants to shake his hands and when his guards are down, he throws him away. The fake warrior laughed and remarked that it is expected from a fake as they don't use their head because everything is fair in the war. He was the winner of the first match, so the rules are the rules, and he inquired if he was planning to deny that he lost in front of so many people. Tillys decides to go next, so he wants him to forget about it, but he wants her to avenge his defeat, and they move to the next match between the battle mages. Dark Feather was amazed as she was one step quicker than him. The people watching them were stunned as she looked quite familiar to them. During the battle make of the opponent agreed to step forward and didn't know that a girl would be impersonating him, so he decided to have mercy on her. They took their position for the duel, and she furiously stared at him and instructed him to save his word for himself. Everyone can believe this as his opponent was Tilly's from the arena. Another man thought he was also mistaken, but she is genuinely Tilly's. They thought she would never team up with anyone and they even heard the gossip that she was a member of a bid workshop, but weren't sure if that was real. They ignored it and enjoyed the show as they heard she was fighting for Shadow, a scorching topic of discussion lately. The protagonist was irritated as, in the end, they attracted the attention of so many people, although he was avoiding it. However, this impersonation incident happens to be a good cover for their identities. The fake mage wondered why she was so pissed off as she shouldn't be so serious, so he decided to treat her to some desserts at the commercial street after his after their duel. But she continued staring at him, which irritated him, and he wondered if she thought she was the real deal. He had already given her a chance to save herself from embarrassment, but now he was going to beat her till she cried for his mercy. The battle began and they rushed toward each other. The fake mage didn't want her to blame him for not holding back, as he didn't want to hit a woman either. He doesn't want her to be shocked by his magic skill because his skill would be beyond his imagination as he was a member of the shadow. He used his magic and wanted her to feel his passionate, thorny hug. With this skill, the throne appeared from the ground, which surrounded her. He was sure she couldn't move now because his thorns surrounded her. Little Ruko was worried and wondered why she let herself get wrapped up in that thorn. He was worried about her, 
so he wondered if she was all right. The protagonist smirked as he knew she had significantly improved compared to when he and Tilly's dueled. Instead of attacking recklessly like she used to, she has learned to observe her opponent's attacks. The fake mage thought she was a dumbass, so he wanted her to continue to be cocky for a few more seconds. He laughed and wanted her to die. Everyone was shocked and wondered if it was over as she was Tilly's from the arena. They didn't know she was that noob, and the fake mage wanted her to surrender and give up. One of the men gossiped as he informed his friend how Tilly's could randomly team up with other people and show him because she isn't that mage, but her appearance looks similar. They were shocked as they saw the smoke coming out from the top of the thorns surrounding her, and soon there was a massive explosion. This shocked her opponent as she broke his skill, and the fire dragon emerged from that fire, ready to engulf him. He couldn't believe this because it was impossible. He covered his face with his arm to avoid direct damage, but got attacked by her fire magic, which reduced half of his HP. Tilly's appeared from that throne and uttered as if someone had told her that a battle mage is still a mage. She inquired if he had forgotten about the strengths and weaknesses of the various magic elements. The man between the audience was shocked as he understood what she meant because wood is weak against fire. He was astonished as she used this elemental weakness and instantly broke free from the enemy's skill. Furthermore, her attack was smooth and clean. She gave him multiple hits using her fire element magic and his HP further dropped down and he coughed out blood and fell. He looked at her furiously and couldn't believe himself as he was too careless. He didn't think she would have such a move, so he genuinely made a fool out of himself this time. He rushed to attack her as he wanted to regain his dignity in the next attack, but she saw him attacking her and dodged his attack. He was shocked, but without his glasses, he couldn't keep up with her speed. He was in his world when the thief from his team called him Dumbass as he was spacing out. He told him to look above him as she attacked him, using her fiery dance rising phoenix skill and defeating him, so the duel winner was decided, and the duel ended. After the duel, everyone was certain she was truly the Tillies from the arena because fire type attacks are her specialty. Even though she hid her information, they were way too similar that they could tell that she was the real one, and they praised her as her moves were amazing. She went back and uttered that it was their turn for the next match. Ling Si applauded her because her skills were good, but she thought her last attack was a little showy. Little Ruko enjoyed her performance as she did amazing work, but he liked her previous attack. She didn't care about this since it was now 1-1 and both sides were equal. There was still one last match, so she wanted them not to be careless and lose. The fake thief was shocked to see his fellow in such a condition, and he didn't expect they would go up against such a tough one. There was still one more match to decide who would be the winner, so he wanted to win that match at any cost. Everyone thought they might be imposters too. They used to think they were the real shadow members, but with such tricks and this ability level, it doesn't look like it. They decided to watch the last match first before deciding who the real shadow team was. The fake thief was concerned as he was the only one who could participate in the last match because he couldn't leave it to that chubby player as they randomly pulled in to fill the role of the firearm archer. He had to finish this match as soon as possible and leave this place as long as he could win this. He was sure they could reclaim their identity again. He knew dragging this situation out further would only cast more doubt on them, so he stepped forward for the next match. He remarked they were as interesting as he never thought they would take advantage of their teammates' carelessness and win the match. Since it was 1-1 now and there was one last match to go so, he pointed toward the protagonist as he was talking to the person who had been too afraid to speak all this time and instructed him to get back in the ground. Later, the J-Run informed the others about the protagonist and they inquired if he was sure about it, but he was sure as he saw the recording his friend had sent him. They can't believe it and wonder if this is for real as he heard that the popular shadow was currently fighting imposters there. They were trying to squeeze in to get in front, which irritated his friend, and he furiously instructed him to stop squeezing in. Jay Run was contented as he saw him and informed others that the thief was his boss, Ling Si. Zio Lan was pleased and inquired if that handsome-looking guy was Ling Si. They had seen each other after a long time, so she wondered if he would still remember them but the anti-mainstream remarked that such a godly person couldn't remember them. The fake thief came to him and commented that he had been paying attention to him as he was the first who wanted to escape when they asked to battle. He uttered that he dared to impersonate them when he didn't even have the skills to defeat them, 
which was a lame joke to him. He assured him not to worry as this was just an immediate solo, so even if he got killed during the battle, he would be able to respawn immediately, so he shouldn't be scared. The fake thief assumed he might be the weakest team member because he wouldn't be so afraid to fight if he had the skills. He wanted to win this last match with his style as he didn't want to notch the mission given to him by his workshop. They took their mission and the match began, so he instructed the protagonist to attack him first. He was startled as he didn't even make the move, and the audience wondered if he was too scared or something that he was not even moving. The fake thief laughed as he thought he might be so frightened that he couldn't move and inquired if he knew how to play as a thief. He retrieved the smoke bomb and threw it at him as if to teach him to be a thief, he smirked. Soon they were covered with smoke, obstructing the audience's vision, and they recognized the smoke. Little Ruko was worried they wouldn't be able to see anything, but he wanted to see how Ling Si would beat that thief. Other people were also worried as they couldn't see anything and wondered what was strong between them. One of them remarked that from his observation of that group, till now they had battled more than a dozen imposters. That beast man thief had not lost a match, so he was solid, and judging by his dagger, he was playing as a dominant thief. He has high attack stats too, so compared to the human thief, he has more of an advantage. Their conversation concerned Jay Run, and he wondered if Boss Ling Si could handle his opponent's attack, but all of their discussion was empty as they couldn't see anything because of the smoke. Meanwhile, inside the smoke, the beast man thief was using shadow substitution. He thought by using this the second smoke to confuse his enemy. He could use shadow substitution to find the location of the enemy and then seize the victory with a heavy backstab. He was so sure because this technique never failed him. Shadow substitution was a thief exclusive skill with which the user's body could be further hidden in a smoke environment while being able to sense his enemy's location in the smoke. The beast man thief was amazed as the protagonist was still in the same place and wondered if he was a stupid thief. He wanted to give him the fatal blow before the smoke dispersed, so he decided to go around him from the side. He rushed behind him to backstab and called him a dumbass and wondered if he was still daydreaming. Then he should prepare to die, so he attacked him. He was shocked as the protagonist appeared behind him, called him, and remarked that he already knew where he was long before he found him. He used the great eagle eye, which is as sharp as an eagle, and the user could detect all hidden units within a certain range. This skill increases awareness for 5 seconds, giving the user a higher chance of seeing through the enemy's move. The beast man thief was shocked as the person he attacked was a substitute, and it turned into an evil spirit. Zio Lan wondered what happened inside there. Jay Run requested her to calm down as the smoke bomb skill would only last for about 10 seconds. He was shocked as the notification appeared that the winner had been decided for the match they were currently speculating, so the duel ended. The spectators were shocked as that was the fast ending and wondered who won the match. The fake Shadow Team Warrior laughed as he was sure it must be their win because their thief had never once been lost when using that combo. As the smoke disappeared, he looked there to see the actual winner and was shocked as the Beast Man Thief was severely injured, lying unconscious. He wondered how that was possible and how they could be the ones who lost the match. The spectators wondered what happened and were amazed as they discovered how strong the protagonist was. Little Ruko was glad as the final result was a two-for-one win and they were the ones who won. The protagonist instructs him to stop as there are too many people and he decides to go to another dungeon, to which Ruko agrees. The bystander didn't believe that the claiming to be the real captain of the shadow team didn't even last for ten seconds. Little Ruko wanted to see how he defeated him and inquired if he could avenge him by beating that thief up badly. The protagonist affirmed as he did avenge him, but Dark Feather was still pissed off to see his chubby imposter. Xio Lan was contended by Ling Xia's performance, so when Jay Run suggested going and meeting Ling Xi, she immediately agreed and wanted to request him to carry them along too. Their team leader disagreed as he thought he did not need to carry them because they had been doing K-leveling alone. The audience was gossiping that they were imposters too and wondered if the team who defeated them was real Shadow. They can't believe that they are so shameless that they have pretended to be the real ones and fought imposters. The warrior of the fake team tried to wake his fellow up and inquired what happened inside the smoke that made him so brutally defeated. The beast man thief uttered that his opponent thief was ridiculously strong, everything was within his calculations and he didn't even see his dagger. 
Just like that, he was beaten up like crazy and couldn't even strike back. Their archer heard that the battle mage from their team was Tilly's, who was the one that made quite a name for herself in the arena previously. He wondered if they could be a real shadow, and they looked at his face and were dumbfounded. The thief gets furious at him and wonders why he said it now, because he could have saved them from being a clown if he had told him about this earlier. But he also heard about it now, so how could he tell them about this? The warrior thought he had to inform the people there about this matter. Zio Lan was excited and wanted the others to hurry up and meet up with Ling Si immediately. Meanwhile, in Wolf Fang's headquarters, the player reached the Vice Guild Master's office to make him aware of an urgent matter, and he wondered what the matter was. The player uttered that one contacted them with something to report among the workshops they had been in before. The Vice Guild Master wondered what he was talking about and what happened at the workshop that they liaised with. The man explained that it was about the strategy for dealing with the recently popular Shadow and inquired if he remembered. He recalled the Shadow team rushing the team leaderboard and getting everyone's attention. He uttered that because they had been madly setting new records, many of the Wolf Fang's records had been overwritten. So if they let them do what they are doing, this team that has appeared out of nowhere would threaten their position on the team leaderboard. By bribing several workshops and having them pretend to be the shadows to spoil their name and put them in a bad place, they slowly worn down and eliminated them. There were countless examples of this, so it was nothing strange to him. He instructed this man to continue with his report, and he uttered that their workshop reported that the battle mage in shadow is most likely a player whose ID is Tilly's. Vice Guild Master thought that knowing her ID would make everything much easier for them if that was the case. Vice Guild Master Depraved Squirrel instructed him to rely on his instructions and have the thieves in the guild who are at assassination hide their guild information, target that player's team, and make them become level zero again. Meanwhile, in the nebulous conference room, the Guild Master, Hart Stillwater, suggested that they should have the members of the First Division quickly seize the first records of the few new dungeons. The Vice Guild Master, Coco Lai, affirmed his command and uttered that she would relay the order immediately, but she sighed and thought about the problem in her mind. He noticed this and told her to leave, but he wondered what was wrong with her on seeing her that concerned as she looked quite distracted. He wondered who made the cheerful Vice Guild Master Coco lie like this, it made her blush and she reminded him of the bet that he had made. He wondered what bet she was talking about as he had made many big and small bets with many people. She reminded him about his bet with that thief Ling Si as he challenged him to enter the top 10 on the team leaderboard within a month. He recalled the bet with him and wondered what was wrong with it. He remembered that quite a few days had passed since he had made that bet. She informed him their team named Shadow, a four-person team that suddenly appeared on the team leaderboard. She had already confirmed it with Tiana and has been paying attention to them. She found out that Shadow has become quite popular and there are a lot of posts about them on the forum. She didn't like Ling Si when she met him because of his arrogance, but she guessed he had some skills. The guild master wondered what their result was right now. She said that the first week's result had been calculated, but the records they had set recently were very shocking. She sent him the records of the recently cleared dungeon and he was impressed by his performance. He assumed that his understanding of heaven and land must be out of the ordinary to achieve such a result. However, with these results, they have unconsciously threatened the benefits of some of the big names. She wondered if he meant some guilds would be going after him and his friend and inquired if they should send someone to protect them. The guild master Stillwater uttered that a tall tree naturally attracted the wind and refused to send help as they wouldn't need to do anything. She wondered why he was refusing because no matter what the reason might be, he was still a member of Nebulus. Besides, if they let such a skillful member get killed, it would be their loss. The guild master refused precisely because he had exceeded his expectations, so he wanted to see how far Ling Si could go by himself. On the contrary, Zio Lan chased him and called him. The protagonist wasn't expecting that he would encounter them there. She gladly looked at him and thought it might be fate that they had met again. Her behavior irritated him, but he asked if they could level up smoothly. She explained that leveling up had become so slow without him. Jay Run was also glad to see him, and as he expected, Ling Si was one of the shadow members, but Ling Si requested him not to be so loud. When Jay Run saw Shadow Dungeon's record someone posted on the forum, he wondered if it was faked, but now that he knows that it's his team, he is sure it might be true. 
The protagonists didn't think it was as amazing as they thought, because they just used some special strategies, and his teammates were also very impressive, so without them, he wouldn't have been able to do it alone. Xiao Lan applauded him as he was still so modest, just like before, and wondered why he deleted them from his friend list right after they split ways. The protagonist apologized as this was his bad habit, and remarked that they hadn't changed either. She wondered if he could help them level up because they had been leveling up slowly recently and couldn't beat Fishman Tied Dungeon. Her team leader gets furious as he asks for his help because he has been trying his best to find a guide for it. From the dungeon, she mentions that Ling Si remembered something and inquires if they are stuck in the last underwear battle because of the lack of oxygen. They wondered how he knew. He explained it was the dungeon's hardest part, its last wave. He uttered that they could go to the fisherman village. First, there was a hidden shop that sold bronchia grass, and he assured them of sending its location to them. They were amazed that he was awesome because he always knew everything, while their group leader was annoyed by their behavior. The protagonist recommended the battle strategy, but their captain thanked him for the tip, but refused the rest as they didn't need it and would figure it out themselves. Xiao Lan wanted to know the strategies, as it would be easier if they knew that, but he refused as Ling Si had already helped them a lot so they can't have him to help them with everything and instruct everyone to go to the location. The captain called Xiao Lan a dumb girl because that tip was enough to make her furious as he was scolding her without any solid reason. Anti-mainstream thought they had to leave, so they hoped they would meet him again, and Jay Run said as they rarely had the chance to meet Ling Si, they were still leaving so quickly. Their captain instructed him to stop whining and start going because that hidden shop would be closed if they were late. The protagonist looked at them as if these fours would never change. Xiao Lan bid his farewell to him as if they were going first. Jay Run looked back and waved at him, hoping to meet him again the next time. He promised he would try his best to play as a thief, but knew his boss would always be the strongest. The protagonist doesn't think he is the strongest yet, as he is still far from the strongest. At least he was still not that man's opponent. This reminded him that times were running out, so he had to pick up the place. He needs to reach level 15 as soon as possible and awaken, which will be his new beginning and the only way to resolve the old man's 1-5 million debt. After one week, the team Shadow, under the attention of countless people, entered the top 20 for the first time on the team leaderboard. The leaderboard top 20 has always been occupied by prominent figures from either big workshops or big guilds. This has once again attracted the attention and alarm of big workshops and guilds and even created a new wave of competition in for the position on the leaderboard. Two weeks later, it entered the 15th place and became a hot discussion topic known to all. In addition, as no one stepped in to confirm Shadow's identity, Shadow was given a sense of mystery. In an instant, the topic of whether the Shadow could enter the team leaderboard top became a hot topic of discussion among the players and on the forum. In the third week, Shadow lived up to the expectations and broke through to the top 10 on the leaderboard. With a short dungeon clear time, they set records everywhere with Ling Si's experience from his previous life. The big guilds were utterly helpless against this team, which appeared out of nowhere, and the team's total score was 16,058. This has ignited the flames in the players' expectations even more, and Shadow has become the mysterious idol of some players. But just as the four continued to rush to the top, the hidden danger that had been lying in wait for them finally appeared. The protagonist was holding the dagger, and as he had already told them, they had taken a share of other people's place, so this was its consequence. Little Ruko figured out it might be people from a big guild who had come prepared to attack them, and he assumed they might have no fighter's morale. The assassinators were glad they had finally found Shadow, so they decided to report their location to their superiors and prepare to attack. Tilly's has been so bored with clearing dungeons lately. This was nice since she could get moving again. Since there were quite a large number of them, she thought she would call for more people if things got bad later. The protagonist was planning how to get rid of them as there were roughly 20 thieves, but most of them were at level 10, so he didn't waste too much time there as they had to finish this fast. The assassinators were worried as they were the dark horses that emerged recently, and there were no traces of them anywhere previously. But they had finally managed to trap them there. Even their boss, Squirrel, told them to be extra careful. A week ago, Wolf Fang, Vice Guild Master Depraved Squirrel, was amazed to see the Team Shadow at the top 15. 
He assumed that these four from Shadow were skilled ones because they had managed to avoid so many of their traps and didn't let anything stop them from making the new dungeon records. He even commanded his assassin to make them become level zero again back then and realized that he might have underestimated them. His man apologized to him as it was their fault for being so useless and promised to increase the scale of their traps. The vice guild master knew it had nothing to do with how worthless he was, it was just that they were stronger than them. He remarked that if they ever met them, they could not do anything to them, so if they found them, he wanted them to stall their team as much time as possible because he wanted to meet these four people himself. Since their boss Squirrel had already put it that way, they would have to stall for time, so they divided five people per team, took on one person each, and dragged this fight out as long as possible. Then they all rushed to them to attack, so Ling Si instructed his team that they would fight them separately, and they affirmed. One team attacked little Ruko using arrows that he blocked with his tank, and the team's thief rushed at him to attack him using a backstab. Little Ruko told him it was useless against him, and he transformed into a giant and attacked them, which shocked them, and they wondered how he became bigger. He wanted to give them a taste of pure strength, so he grabbed one of the assassinators and lifted him. Meanwhile, Tilly's attacked her opponent using the Flaming Snake Dragon Lock, a fire-type crowd control skill that surrounded all of them. She was sure that would be enough to deal with the few of them, so they should play with her for a while. Dark Feather attacked with her magic cripple at the leg of one of the assassinators. With this, a certain part of the body has been subjected to a destructive attack, causing the temporary loss of the ability of that part to move. His fellow instructed the man not to distance himself from Dark Feather, which would be too advantageous for his firearms. Dark Feather attacks all the other team members, chasing him, and the only one instructing the others is left. He shoots him in the end. They informed their team leader that these people were a lot more difficult than they had expected as their fighting methods were too unfamiliar. The team leader was worried that these four from Shadow were much stronger than they would have thought and became sure they were not their match. He cursed himself and regretted the moment when he took the mission because if he had known about this, he wouldn't have taken it. All the strong thieves in the guild were unwilling to take on this thankless task, so he wondered if he was still too green. He discovers that those cunning thieves must have known from the start that Shadow is tough, so they reject the mission. These people had hidden their true equipment and levels, so they were truly unfathomable, especially the thief on their team. The thief from Shadow managed to flatten four of their people with just a few moves, so he didn't even manage to see what moves he used. He would have been subjugated if he hadn't seized the opportunity to escape quickly. While he was staring at them from the bushes and thinking, the protagonist appeared behind him, wondering why he was short of one person. The man started trembling, and the protagonist remarked that he was very naughty as he had gone into hiding. He lifted his dagger to attack him so that he could accompany his teammates underground, but before he could attack him, his attack was stopped by someone, which shocked the assassin. The Wolf Fang Vice Guild Master remarked that he is very violent, Ling Si was shocked as his speed was undetectable to him, and he hadn't even noticed when he arrived. Squirrel inquired if they were the true shadow, and his assassins were contented as their boss finally arrived to save them. Dark Feather shoots him with his gun, which he blocks with another dagger, which shocks Ling Si, and realizes that he is already in Awakena as he can use dual wielding. Squirrel looked at him and remarked that he was very impatient. The protagonist figured out he might be the vice guild master of the Wolf Fang's guild, as the assassin called him his boss. The protagonist uttered that, seeing from how he could dual wield, he might have successfully awakened. Deprived Squirrel smirked as if he was an experienced one, but he was awakened as he wondered if they had fought and awakened before. Tilly's and Dark Feather's eyes spread out in shock when they heard he was awakened, which means he was far beyond them. Little Ruko, who doesn't even know the difference between an Awakena and a normal player, doesn't care about the fact that he is awakened. He only knew he was their enemy. He smiled confidently and approached him as he didn't want to bother by listening to his nonsense and wanted to be the first to attack. The protagonist rushed to stop him, calling him an idiot and saying he didn't need to be too rash because his opponent wasn't ordinary. Ruko transformed and was confident as he knew it was just a job change, but he was too optimistic as the four of them were already at level 15, so he assumed they wouldn't lose if they worked together. The protagonist is amazed at his stupidity as he still doesn't know what being awakened means. 
the Awakened are on a completely different level from ordinary players, furthermore, they haven't had their job change yet. The protagonist decides to go after little Ruko, so he instructs his comrades that he will be counting on them for their follow-up support. They affirmed and were concerned about little Ruko as they thought he might not be aware of what Awakenas mean. The protagonist knew that though Depraved Squirrel was not as strong as Dynamic Darkness, he was one of the top ten thieves in his past life. He wanted to withdraw from this battle as soon as possible, but they couldn't get involved with him while they were still red-listed. On the contrary, little Ruko was excitedly prepared to drop a punch on his face and remarked that they had met stronger players during this period to improve and the people they fought now weren't worth mentioning. He was punching Squirrel while he wasn't even dodging his attack and the protagonist appeared behind him. He reminded him that they were currently red-listed, so they had to withdraw as soon as possible. Deprived Squirrel rushed away and remarked that they are all brawn and no brains, which is the most likely statement created for people like him. Using his skill Tiger Subduing Dragon Clamp Act 1, he threw a dagger that crossed Ruko's neck, reached the protagonist so his dagger was dropped. This was an awakened skill. When faced with many attackers, this skill can effectively counterattack. The extent of the counterattack is based on the number of attackers. Little Ruko was shocked as he was too fast, even faster than Ling Si, and his skill restrained him, so he could not move before the opponent made a move. Deprived Squirrel remarked that those who kill in the overworld will be red-listed, but their red-listed status was glaring, so he inquired for his opinion on whether he should kill him and just be equipped. The protagonist knew he could kill him instantly before using his skill, which is the gap between awakened and ordinary players. He attacked him with his dagger, but depraved Squirrel wasn't impressed by his talent as he heard that he was the strongest in shadow but was a thief who couldn't even hold his dagger steady. Tilly's attacked him with Flame Dance Flight of the Phoenix, but he used his skill Tiger Subduing Dragon Clamp Act 2 to block it, which led to an explosion. He rushed away and was amazed to see a female battle mage, which was rare, but he was startled as Dark Feather shot him. Little Ruko smirked and applauded Dark Feather. This was a nice shot, but Ling Si was startled and instructed Dark Feather to look behind him. Deprived Squirrel had already reached behind him, and he looked at the person whom he shot just a second ago and was stunned as if it was just a clone. The Vice Guild Master was also amazed to see firearms wielded by him, but he knew that he would be useless in close combat. Dark Feather was stunned to find him so close and astounded by his terrifying speed because he didn't even notice that he came behind. Squirrel commented that he hates characters who attack from the dark the most like him and put his dagger on his throat. The protagonist jumped from the tree branch, kicked his opponent, and instructed his teammate to run. Squirrel was amazed by Ling Si's top time, but as he was trying to be a hero, he decided to kill and stab him first. The protagonist notices his hand appearing next to him, so he gets down and evades the attack, shocking the vice guild master as that was the top time. He kicked him and pushed him back, and now he figured out that his top time might be why he could bulldoze regular players. He retrieved the smoke bomb, instructed others to split up and retrieve it, and threw it away to disperse the smoke. Squirrel realized they had escaped when his assassin found him, which surprised him as they had been revived so early. The assassin uttered that they ran over from the graveyard immediately after reviving and wondered where are those damned shadows. He uttered they had escaped but there was no need for them to pursue them as he wanted to let them run. They were merely players who hadn't even had their jobs changed. The vice guild master of Wolf Fang was mortified as he thought they would be some high-level awakened players. Meanwhile, in the nebulous third division captain's meeting room, Tiana received a message from Ling Si, who was quite angry, so it worried her. He wanted her help to let the guild master know that they had accomplished what he requested. They could have tried for the number one spot, but there were unforeseen circumstances so they stopped there. All the members in Shadow have something important to do now as they are going through a job change which shocked her. The protagonist is frustrated by the arrogance that deprived Squirrel of being awakened, so wanted him to wait for him. Later, outside the game, in the real world, the old man was contented as Ling Si's appetite was pretty good that day, which was beneficial for him because he was still growing, so if he ate more, he would have more strength. The protagonist takes a bit and utters because it's not an overstatement to say that what he will do next will decide his entire future. So he wanted to be in the best condition in the real world and the game. 
The old man wondered if it was important that he could help him in any way, but he refused as it was fine because this was something he would have to manage on his own. Later, he logged into the game and was pleased that the most important moment in his life had finally arrived because his job change would commence. His enthusiasm and excitement were unsuccessful when he saw so many players in the job change lobby. The protagonist has been underestimating Heaven Land players' leveling speed and so many people have already come to receive their job change mission. He heard two people conversing. One hoped everything would go smoothly and he could get an easy mission and succeed in this job change. Then he could successfully become an awakened, but there were different difficulty levels for the job change mission. That is what he had heard from his friend who had already done it. Every profession has three missions at different difficulties, A, B, and C, but the objectives and requirements for every mission differed. Furthermore, to ensure fairness, the objectives of each mission will be adjusted based on the player's attributes and past stats to prevent players from preparing in advance. After hearing their discussion, the protagonist thinks about it as he can remember the despair of his past life. In his past life, even though he succeeded in the job change mission, he failed to awaken because his awakening rate was only 12% after the job change mission. Only a small part of what decides a player's awakening rate is the system's AI evaluation of the player's overall performance. This still largely depends on the level of completion of the job change mission. In his past life, he was met with difficulties during the job change mission, which caused his awakening rate to be extremely low. He wonders if this is all arranged by fate or if he's being toyed with by his fate because, in his previous life, he went to the thief's mission C in which he had to battle a version of himself with double stats. His version, which was AI created, was familiar with all of his data and had an accurate grasp of his attack and defense tempos. His clone doubled his stats even after being at such a significant disadvantage. Although he headed out until the time was up and barely completed the mission, the awakening rate was extremely low. As a result, with only a super low rate of 12% in the end, he failed to awaken, but he heard that other players who received missions he only had to battle with a dungeon boss. The boss attributes would even be adjusted to be something reasonable based on the player attribute. After that, he went to the forum to ask, and no one had ever received a mission in which they had to battle themselves. His luck in his previous life was cursed, and he hoped that in this life, a mission like this wouldn't appear, at the very least, because his stats were completely different. No matter what kind of mission he will get this time, he has absolute confidence to smash it. He must get an excellent awakening rate and become awake. He didn't want to allow any failure in his current life as he had to fulfill his goal. Meanwhile, a female player reached the Elder Stone throne that allotted the grade of mission specific to each player's stats and she was concerned about what level of the mission she would get. Other players were cheering her as she could do it and assuring her that everything would go well. She sits on the Elder Stone throne, its hand wrapped around her, and the chair welcomes that human archer. The Elder Stone throne analyzed her stats and data to show her a perfect mission for her level. The Elder Stone throne rambled that she is an archer who is pretty good at positioning herself. So according to her stats and past performance, as he expected, the most suitable for her is Mission B. It released her, and after she left the chair, Elder Stone Throne burped and instructed the next player to come. The other players were cheering her as she could do it and assured her that they would be waiting for her outside and wanted her to succeed. Every time the protagonist sees this scene, he can't help but find it somewhat strange, and he gets to the stage. He sits on the Elder Stone throne, whose arms are wrapped around him, and it is found out that he is a human thief, so he wants to find an excellent all-rounder, according to his stats and past performance. As expected, the most suitable mission for him was Mission A, which pleased Ling Si as this was Mission A. The thieves with Mission A were all about map exploration, which was his great luck, and he was confident that he would be able to get an excellent result and the best record ever. The badge of glorious hidden inside his jacket shone while he was leaving, so the machine instructed him to wait, which startled him. This was the first time the Elder Stone Throne encountered such a situation, which was very strange for him. The protagonist wondered what was wrong, so the mission allotter was confused and uttered that he had the same aura as them. He wondered what it meant by the same aura and was confused as he had never heard of anything like this, so he wondered what happened. What shocked him more was that the Elder Stone Throne allotted him an S-grade mission, and he was thrown into the mission location. 
The player wondered if they saw it wrongly now and why it was multicolored because the teleportation wraps were all white. They asked about that situation and why the Elder Stone Throne announced so many missions. They couldn't understand what that throne rambled at the end as it said's mission, and they wondered why there was an S mission as it should be A, B, or C. Other players thought he must have misheard because it was Mission A, as there was no such thing as a Mission S. Meanwhile, the protagonist enters the location of the thief's job change mission. It is raining at the location, and he finds the environment a bit strange. He was notified that he had been assigned a Mission S, and he cursed his fate. He wondered if it was purposely making things difficult for him, and wondered why it was playing such a joke on him. He wondered if his fortune wanted to throw him into despair in this life too because there were three this time. His mission objective was he had to defeat his mirror selves, and their attributes and stats were double compared to him, and the mission completion time was unlimited. In his past life, during his job change mission, he had no option but to hide, so he hid in one of the streets of the map and cursed this mission, as he couldn't understand why there was a mission like this. He had done so much research, yet he had never come across a mission like this, and wondered why don't he found a single trace of this mission. He doesn't want to fail as he wants to change his current way of life, so he must become awakened, so failure isn't an option for him. All the attributes of his mirror self were double that of him, so he couldn't take him head on, so he decided to continue circling him around and would keep circling to drag things out until the time was up. But soon, his mirror self found him and attacked him, so he fell. He was concerned as this wasn't part of his plan. In the present moment, the protagonist wonders why he has to recall that shameful past now of all the times. He didn't want to get stuck in his head now, so he tried to calm down because things were different in this life. Soon, the notification appeared as there were still 10 seconds to go before the mission began, but neither party was allowed to use skills for that duration of the mission. In his past life, it was a battle of foundation techniques, but this time there was no time limit for the mission, which meant the stalling strategy wouldn't work. In any case, he decides to leave the area first to avoid being besieged by all three of them later. He had to think this thoroughly and had enough time to think, so he wanted to calm down. After the time was up, his job change mission started, and he was wished good luck, and all of these mirror selves rushed at him simultaneously. But he rushed away and hid inside one of the buildings because there were three mirror selves this time, so he was sure they would split up to find him quickly. This means that once he is discovered, he has a short period to fight them one on one. If things drag on until the other two arrive, he will be dead for sure, so he can't afford to be careless to avoid dying during a job change mission. The three mirror selves' attributes were double his, and he has tried to make out his attributes as much as possible in this life. He could safely say that within the case rank, as long as they are a thief, he was confident that he wouldn't lose to anyone. Either, in terms of attack, defense, or habitual actions, mirror selves, such as those who could be said to be flawless, so he wondered what he should do. Besides, if he wanted to increase his awakening rate, he tried to attain as high a mission completion rate as possible, so he wondered how to maximize his completion rate. The protagonist was still devising a plan to increase his awakening rate when his mirror selves appeared outside, which startled him, and he was dragged out. He was shocked as he found him outside, and it kicked him, but he rushed away to the building top while being chased by him. He blocked his attack instantly, but it was so forceful that it pushed him back. He knew that if he had thought for a moment longer, he would probably have been stabbed in the heart as his mirror self has a terrifying speed. Double of his attributes were truly frightening, but he calmed down himself as his opponent was his reflection. His opponent stared at him while he was thinking what he would think now, but before that, his mirror self rushed to attack him and threw him away. He was too fast as he had been attacked before he could finish his thoughts and wondered what he could do now. However, being able to use skills was already putting him at a great disadvantage, so using just foundation techniques to deal with mirror selves who have doubled his attributes would give him no chance at all. His reflection again attacked him, and he cursed him as this was utterly unreasonable, and he was thrown down. He was severely injured and was concerned as there wasn't even a second for him to catch a break, so he tried to attack him, but he was afflicted with a defense break. He can't find any weaknesses after many attempts and wonders what he should do, but before he can strategize anything, he is against being attacked by his mirror self and thrown back. He wondered if, in the end, this life was also going to be the same as his previous life. 
He coughed out blood and refused to accept such fate. All three of his opponents rushed down and gathered around him, and he thought things might be even worse in this life. He wondered how much his fate would toy with him. This mission seemed impossible, so he closed his eyes and decided to forget. He wanted to end everything but was startled as he suddenly remembered when his mirror self was chasing him. He retrieved his dagger as he understood now what he had to do to complete this mission and stand against them as there was still hope. He grabbed one of his mirror self hands and stopped the attack of the other with the sword. The third one was staring at him from above while he was blocking and evading the attacks of the other two. He stared at them, and as he thought this was the solution he jumped up, but the third one attacked him, which he evaded using his reflexes. He rushed back and thanked him for that assault on the rooftop earlier because that gave him the hint he needed. His dagger strike was twice as fast as his, yet he managed to block it before he had time to think about the key to solving this puzzle. To win, he should act before having time to think, although their attributes were all twice that of his, it was just numbers. In the end, even if they could predict his habitual actions with data, he was sure they couldn't have any way of knowing something that he had not consciously realized. Those are his conditioned reflexes, which is also the so-called top time. He had trust in his senses, and trust is conditioning from the signal received by the body. The anxiety that he felt just now as a result of his fear was the real reason for the failure in his past life as well. Top time is a talent exclusive to humans, and he wondered how he could have forgotten about it because of the nervousness caused by his memories. But there was nothing for him to fear in this life, so he rushed toward his mirror self and jumped between them while jolting one of them and smirking. His strength was impressive. He rushed and attacked one of his opponents and remarked that although they had twice the strength of his stats, some things could never be changed, such as the hot recovery time after being attacked. Certain types of attacks, such as inflicting a status ailment on an opponent, will render an opponent unable to act for some time due to the hit recovery effect. The higher the stagger generation, the shorter the duration, which doesn't affect the time to cast skills, receive blows, fall and get up from the ground. The protagonist attacks it from behind and utters that even his attributes are a hundred times that of his, but these fixed mechanics cannot be changed. He was confident because they all had no chance of defeating him, and he subjugated one of his opponents, but only two remained. He inquired if the two would come at him one at a time or together, and they rushed at him simultaneously. He was amazed as they were fast, but it was nothing in the face of his top time. He could feel that his top time, which was only at the beginning level, had improved. Top time is divided into three levels, beginner, honed, and intuitive. When one who has grasped top time crosses swords with another who hasn't, it is akin to a trained martial artist fighting an ordinary person. His top time has already reached the honed level, so as long as he's unable to stimulate a reflexive state like this, there is nothing he can do, no matter how fast he is. One of his mirror self rushed at him to attack, and as soon as it reached and he figured out the correct time, he punched and killed him. Now, the one was left, and he looked at him and smirked because the roles of the hunters and hunted had finally been swapped in this life. Meanwhile, at the Nebulous Guild Master's office, Tiana informed the Guild Master that Ling Si had applied for the job change, which surprised him. Tiana informed him that Ling Si seemed to have his plans, but he had already fulfilled his requirement to enter the top ten on the team leaderboard. Hart Stillwater knew that because it would be hard for him not to know how famous Shadow has gotten these days. Coco Lai remarked that getting the job change is a good thing. While he was rushing the team leaderboard, countless players were grinding their levels. This is all for getting a job change as soon as possible and becoming awakened. With how unyielding and headstrong Ling Si is, she was sure he wouldn't be content with being left behind. The other guild organized a few mass job change teams a while ago, and several must be awakened out there now. Tiana agreed that was indeed the case, he had heard that the influence of the awakened in the real world has gradually become more obvious in the real world recently. She was certain the protagonist might rush to become more influential and awakened. The guild master knew he was a pro player, so there should be no problem he would have. He instructed her to inform him to meet him after he returned from awakening. She affirmed that because it was Ling Si, she became sure that he would be all right and would successfully be awakened with the highest percentage. On the other hand, the protagonist receives a notification congratulating him on clearing the job change mission. 
The protagonist was concerned and wondered why this happened and what went wrong this time. The notification appeared, informing him he would be awarded an all-new job system for the thief class. More exciting ways to play awaited him to discover. He furiously clenched his wrist as he had done his best so he should have been awakened. Then, why was it still like this? He read his next notification that after evaluation, his awakening rate for the S mission was determined to be 12%. Unfortunately, he failed to become awakened. He couldn't believe that his awakening rate was 12% and failed again. So he received two options, exit or next. He wondered what went wrong, what went wrong with this, and why his awakening rate was still 12%. There was no way, but it shouldn't be 12%, but it can't be as he performed way better than his past life. He knelt with sorrow and requested it not to be like this. He didn't want his previous life to be repeated all over again. He didn't want to face all this again, and he wondered what he should do to reverse this fate. Being referred to as awakened means receiving special currents from the gaming headsets, activating specific parts of one brain. This allows one to use the skills obtained in the game in real life. The government developed heaven land this game was made to awaken humans latent hidden potential for unknown reasons those who have successfully awakened especially those with a high awakening rate proceed to achieve spectacular feasts in many fields as a result it becomes even more powerful in the real world thus the powerful awakened would be given preferential treatment by the government they become a specially appointed warrior of the country and are given official posts within the government even lower-class citizens from the slums have the possibility to rise to the top overnight and have their lives changed forever. In this era, the status of awakened is the decisive status of one's standing, depending on the awakeness rate. Ling Si, who failed to awaken in his previous life, became a member of the lower caste and the vast majority. Due to his status as an orphan, be it in games or real life, he has always been looked down on and bullied. The life in which he could only barely survive by desperately taking on small odd jobs, the life in which he had no dignity and pride to speak of, and the life in which he was treated as garbage. He had no sense of presence and hope because his previous life was dyed grey to him, but he didn't want to experience that again. He wondered if he would have to live like garbage again in this life. Then he noticed another option besides the exit and wondered why there were two options. He was too hung up on the failure notification and hadn't noticed these options, as he remembered that after a job change mission was needed, only the exit option was available. After selecting the exit option, he will be returned to the lobby, but he never heard of anything like the next option. There was no way there would be an option like this, and he wondered if he was supposed to choose one of these options. He wondered if there may be a right and wrong answer there. He didn't even know what the next option would be. Now that he thinks about it, this job change mission has been unusual. Even in his past life, he has never heard of an S-rank mission. Even the contents of this mission were bizarre. Although he failed to awaken, his job change was considered successful. He was worried that if picking the next option would affect the result of his job change, it would make things worse for him. If it causes him to fail his job change mission as well, he believes that he will have to wait another month before he can take on a new job change mission again. He was so confused and didn't even know what to choose, so he decided to play it safe because it would be one disaster after another if the result of his job change mission were affected. Suddenly, he remembered his past life when he was tied upside down to the tree and was being bullied by other boys. So he decided not to back down and made an unchangeable decision that he would never back down in his current life. He cursed the exit option to go to hell and clicked on the next option. He was notified that he had chosen to proceed to the second phase of the job change mission. The second notification informed him that the second phase would commence quickly and that his result from the first phase had been saved. This stunned him as he couldn't figure out if there would be a second phase in a job change mission. What was more shocking to him was that his result from the previous mission was saved. He was informed that his final score would be determined when he exited the job change mission and was notified that the awakening rate from different phases would be stacked. He was surprised that his awakening rates could be stacked and wondered if he had heard it right. The second phase of his job change mission was about to start, so he was instructed to prepare. He was glad that his final awakening rate wouldn't be 12% and that he still could become awake. The Phase 2 mission objective was displayed on his screen, according to which he had to defeat his mirror selves, but the number of enemies this time was 6. 
Their attributes were double in that neither of the parties was allowed to use skills, and he had to defeat them without it. Time was again unlimited. He was fully prepared to face them and was certain to defeat them no matter what the phase two enemies would be like. The second phase was soon going to commence. Six mirror selves, which were twice the number of the previous one, but he wasn't concerned about it. He was notified that his acquired awakening rate may be staked with the awakening rate from the first phase upon completion of the second phase. He wanted to hear that his result could be stacked, and he was willing to take on as many as they wanted and wanted to see how he would end up in this life. His dagger started appearing in his hand and the countdown began, and he was wished good luck for his next round. Meanwhile, Coco Lai still inquired if Ling Si hadn't come out yet and Tiana affirmed. His standstills say they cannot be contacted and she was guessing that he is probably still on the job change mission. Coco Lai wondered what he was up to as it had been more than half a day. Based on his capabilities, he shouldn't be spending so much time on this job change mission. She wondered if he would have gone on a date somewhere and then intentionally set his status as do not disturb. Guildmaster Stillwater and Vice Guildmaster Coco Lai only took half an hour to clear their job change mission so she wondered why he would need more than half a day. Tana justified as he was not that type of irresponsible person and was sure he must have run into something troublesome. Tana remembered that little Ruko came out soon after completing his job-changing mission and was successfully awakened. He rambled that his awakening rate was 83%, which was super cool, and decided to tell her the mission that he got, which was interesting. His mission was to assess his damage potential within a limited time, which was good, but they would have never expected that he would transform. He transformed immediately, dealt like mad without even thinking, and thought he was invincible and a god of the war. He uttered that it was his first time getting to damage things in such a satisfying manner, and he didn't become silent until he told her his complete story. She gets worried as she remembers all this because Ruko went on his job change mission simultaneously with Ling Si, but he came out in less than an hour. She was indulged deeply in her thoughts when the Vice Guild's master recalled that she heard that Shadow was ambushed by Wolf Fang's thieves around the forest area a while ago. The person who personally led the assault was their Vice Guild master, Deprived Squirrel, who appears to have completed his job change. She was amazed as Deprived Squirrel targeted Shadow, yet Ling Si didn't make a report. She can't believe he didn't report and uttered that Guildmaster Stillwater believes the opponent doesn't know Shadow as actually part of their Guild Nebulous because they would know they wouldn't dare to act so recklessly. Tana was shocked as this was new to her because Ling Si hadn't informed her about this either. She wondered if it might be because he told her his entire team was going for the job change mission. She knew he was a prideful person, so he probably didn't want to let it go, so he decided to be awakened as well. Coco Lai remarked that the Wolf Fang Guild has been getting increasingly arrogant recently and has been picking fights with their guild teams quite a lot. On their side, they have been paying no heed to their members' behavior without taking any strict action against them. She figured out they might be lying in wait to pounce, but she was sure they would deal with that sooner or later because they were ready to take them on at any time. Kiana was concerned because a full-on war would be inevitable if the clashes between the Nebulous Guild and Wolf Fang's Guild became more heated, so she hoped that everything went well with Ling Si as she was looking forward to seeing their shadow grow more. Meanwhile, the protagonist was busy defeating his mirror self with double attributes and increased numbers. After some time at Nebulous's third division headquarters lounge, the players arrived and were glad as they completed the mission, and it went so smoothly. He was thanking Ruko as he was truly a reliable leader. This was possible because of his guidance. Little Ruko, who has reached level 25 after awakening, has become more confident and reliable to others. Another team surrounded him and requested him to help them too, as they wanted him to be engaged in their dungeon clearing mission in an hour. They were short of one powerful tank on their team, so they requested his help. Ruko agreed but instructed him to drop a private message when it was time. The tank was a subclass of warriors, essentially a meat shield, defined by their high HP and high defensive stats. Their role is to absorb damage for the team and to attack the attention of dangerous boss-level enemies so that a team can have a primary and secondary tank. They thanked little Ruko for agreeing to help them and felt great to have him around to help out the third division. They assured him that they would notify him when it was time. 
The other player thought he should let Ruko catch a break too, as he just finished helping the previous team. The player was sure that if their guild captain Tiena heard about his hectic and burdening routine, they would surely get a thrashing. Ruko was fine as he had nothing else to do anyway, so he could level up when helping them with the dungeon. He waved at them and returned as he had to prepare for the next dungeon clearance. The guild members were impressed by him. It was hard to imagine high defense stats that he is the same person who used to be called Little Ruko back then. He was a newbie nobody wanted to be involved with. The players still remember the monthly guild war when no one wanted to team up with him, and they all fled on sight. The other players recalled that incident, but now no one dares to look down and call him Little Ruko ever again, as it's only Ruko Zong and Brother Zong that they used to call him. They were thankful to Tiana because he came over there to help them, as he was no longer affiliated with the third division and was instead a member of Shadow. Otherwise, with his current abilities, he was sure that Ruko could even perform the primary tank from the second or even first division in the guild. Speaking about this, the player remembered and inquired if he heard about the rumors about the leader of Shadow. That thief about whom everyone was making fuss previously seems to have gone on a mission. His companion grabbed him and whispered to instruct that he should keep it down as it concerns their guild's reputation and he also heard news from his buddies. He uttered that the thief seemed to have been steamed rolled by the vice guild master of wolf fangs and had been missing for an entire month. He didn't know the truth behind this but guessed he might be too ashamed to show his face again. Ruko was listening to this gossip and was concerned about him. It's been a whole month since he hadn't been able to contact his brother Ling Si. He wondered where he was as he had grown much stronger and so had Shadow and he received a message from his teammate Tilly's. She inquired if he still had any news from him, and he replied no, but Ruko trusted him and was certain that Ling Si would surely contact them. Tilly's was furious and wondered where he was going and what he was up to as the job change mission takes a day at the very most. But it's already been an entire month and she truly wanted to smack him in the face when she met him next time. Dark Feather also kept asking her about him and she was concerned that if he didn't appear soon, then Shadow would be disbanded. This makes Ruko sadder, but he still replies that he trusts him, won't leave them, and will surely return. Tilly's, who reached level 27, already thought she would surely beat him when the protagonist appeared. He has been offline this whole time with no news and wondered if he abandoned his account. She looked at his level, which was still 15, and supposed that even if he did return now, it was probably too late for him to catch up on levels. Due to the number of job changes in the past month, it has become easier to level up, resulting in a wave of level grinding frenzy, but his level 15 puts him in the rank of the leveled players. While she was pondering this matter, a man appeared and instructed her to stop skiving off and hurry as she had to deal with the damage. The man named Quan informed her that her father requested him to look after her as she had previously been given too much free reign. She affirmed and assured her uncle Quan that she would be coming soon. She looked at the monster and was amazed, so she asked if they couldn't handle such an easy boss by themselves as there was no challenge. Quan yelled at her to stop talking nonsense and go there to deal the damage. She gets prepared to attack and thinks that if Ling Si doesn't appear soon, she will have to return to the workshop. On the contrary, at the Nebulous Guild Master Meeting Room, Coco Lai was infuriated with Wolf Fang, and what they did wasn't a matter of trespassing on their territory, but an act of clear provocation. Guild Master Stillwater inquired if she said they had invaded Station 3, and she affirmed. They had agreed on a 50-50 split over the guild-owned dungeon in that area, and there were a total of six checkpoints stationed, and they got three each. When the dungeons are fully released, they will compete fairly, but what they did wasn't what the guild agreed on. But their Station 4 invaded Station 3, which was the closest to them, so they might think their guild Nebulous was afraid of them if they didn't retaliate. The guild master wondered how much there was there till this dungeon was released, and she uttered that this dungeon was classified as a competition for guild resources, so there was approximately one week before its release. One week was enough for them to retaliate, but since they were the ones to make the first move, he wanted to do more than that. She wondered what he meant by this, and he instructed her to do the same to them as they did to Nebulus. The guild master calmly suggested they should invade and capture another one of the Wolf Fang checkpoint stations, which would also increase their gain from the dungeon in the future. Coco Lai was confused and uttered that the one closest to them was Station 4, 
which was right next to them, but it was likely to be heavily guarded. She was afraid they would face considerable losses if they forcibly invaded it. The one furthest away, Station 6, requires them to traverse the abyssal terrain to get there, so she thought they would have to exclude that option. The guild master remembered the protagonist and his team Shadow and inquired what had happened to them. It had been a month, but they hadn't received any word from them. She uttered that no one had heard from him since he entered the job change mission, and Tana was also getting anxious as she could not contact Ling Si at all. The guild master hoped that Ling Si wouldn't disappoint him because the success rate of their mission depended on Shadow to execute a surprise ambush. Meanwhile, back in the job change mission dungeon, the protagonist killed his opponent. Many of the corpses were hanging down from the rooftop of the building. The protagonist takes a peaceful breath as he completes the tenth phase of his job change mission and is surrounded by many of the corpses of his mirror self whom he killed. He couldn't believe it was a whole month, but finally it was over, and he was congratulated on completing his mission. By stacking all his awakening rates, he obtained an awakening rate of 100%, and he will receive a special reward for this. He was glad as this was the time for him to head back, so he stepped forward and looked at all the stacks of corpses of his mirror self, whom he had defeated. He was congratulated on completing the thief job change mission, and he was surprised as he unlocked the thief class's dual width ability, which amazed him as his reward was a weapon. He received his reward for completing the mission, which was the knife of the undead mercenary. This was way better than the agility 10 plus permanent reward he got in his previous life, and he wondered what this weapon grade was. He examined the rank of the weapon, which was the whiteboard, which made him furious, and he wondered why he had the lowest ranked whiteboard. All class-specific equipment obtained after a job change could be classified into seven grades, from the lowest to the highest grade. They were arranged as whiteboard, bronze, silver, gold, mithril, legendary, and mythical. There was nothing he could say for mythical equipment, as merely possessing one is enough to alter a player's fate drastically. The whiteboard has no special attributes and is pretty much just the most ordinary of existence. However, the job change reward is determined by the results of his performance during the mission, so he is sure that he deserves something better. Bone Knife of the Undead Mercenary was a ceremonial dagger that hails from the abyss. Although no one knows the specific origins of this dagger, it was found in one of the stalls on the streets of the undead. According to the stall owner, Face Eater, he saw the dagger by sheer chance at the riverbank of the vast, spider-lily-filled blooded river. Later, someone realized that the source of the blooded river was the mysterious creature with 60-plus attack attributes, and he was astonished by its description. He received another notification informing him that he triggered the mission dominion of the mercenary Phase 1. Using the bone knife of the undead mercenary, he had to defeat 300 elite enemies for multiple rewards. The weapon will be upgraded to bronze rank, which will change the weapon's attributes, and when equipped with it, he will be able to use the skill dominion of the mercenary. This kill summons three undead warriors to battle with him, and the summoned warrior's attribute will be deprived of the player's attribute. The protagonist was glad to know that his weapon could be upgraded, and it is at phase one, which means that it would be further advanced, and if he could get this to the mythical grade, he would be invincible. He looked at the corpses he defeated as they evaporated in the thin air. The protagonist smirked as, in the end, he even lost count of the number of the mirror selves he had defeated. After all those corpses had disappeared, he was sent back to the place where an AI appeared that congratulated him for being successfully awakened. He had never heard of such a scenario in his previous life and wondered if this was only happening because of his 100% awakening rate. AI uttered that he had completed the 10 phases and remained undefeated even when facing the joint attack of 1536 mirror selves at the last phase. He never even thought of giving up and was the first player to achieve an awakening rate of 100% and became a perfect awakener. The protagonist was surprised to hear the female electronic voice as he wasn't expecting this. AI was astonished as she saw him possessing other hidden powers. The protagonist wondered what hidden powers she was talking about as he don't even have anything like special attributes. Suddenly, the badge of glorious hidden inside his costume shines and emits tremendous light. He was holding it and wondered why it came out on its own, and AI realized this might be what she sensed. She informed him that Ling Si was one of the candidates to become the glorious one. The protagonist was stunned when he heard one of the candidates and asked if there were others who were like him. 
AI explained that, including him, there were a total of three candidates who were eligible to become the Glorious One. The protagonist realized it might not be a unique mission for him as there were three of them. Ever since he received this mission back at the Sunfall Peak, he has not been able to find the time to look for related clues. Now that Lang Si remembered that time, he assumed that based on what Immovable Dark Lines said, he wondered if it could be that he is so strong because he has something similar to this too. AI decided to reward him since he was perfectly awakened and had a 100% awakening rate. The protagonist was excited as the award for him being a perfect awakener was finally there. He was congratulated on becoming the ideal awakener, and his special reward was Bonus Sigil. Bonus Sigil bestows the player with the attributes of one additional class, and he is allowed to select any of the classes apart from his current class. After choosing the class, he will be allowed to learn the skills of the selected class from now on. The protagonist was stunned as this was the dual class, and then another system notification appeared requesting him to choose an additional class, which would be his Sigil class. He was informed that he wouldn't be able to change his selection and the sigil would take effect immediately. This means that any class-related reward that he will receive in the future will apply to his current thief class and the chosen class. If any unavoidable conflicts arise in the rewards, the system will prioritize the reward that applies to the thief class. He was reading those instructions when another notification appeared, informing him that the associated attribute of the chosen class would determine the damage to his class skills. He was requested to select his class, and he was given four classes to choose from, Warrior, Archer, Mage, and Cleric. The protagonist decided to calm down to decide on a perfect class for his dual class and wondered which one if this option he should go with. He wanted to determine after thinking carefully because this choice would alter his future path significantly. AI requested the protagonist to hurry up and make his choice. The protagonist started pondering it to make an accurate decision. As a thief, he knew cleric and warrior wouldn't suit his playstyle, which focused on maximizing pure damage and executing rapid-fire maneuvers. He has never had much interest in those two classes either, as the thief class already had the option of ranged attacks, so choosing archer would provide more variety to the number of ways he could strike afar. However, this doesn't match what he deems as the ideal change, so the only class left is the mage. The protagonist smirked and selected that option as it has overwhelming magic damage, unpredictable enchantment attributes, and terrifying summoned creatures, which was what he wanted for his second class. After he selected the option, the system prompt appeared, informing him that he selected his mage class so he would be granted the mage sigil. The protagonist's second class mark appeared on his forehead, and he smirked as if he would be the very first spell thief. He received his mage sigil, after which an immense energy emitted from his body, so AI informed him that he had awakened. The golden energy covered his whole body, congratulating him on becoming the perfect awakened. His eyes shone brightly after being awakened, and it was time for him to go, as he knew little Ruko and the others might be waiting anxiously. Later, in the job-changing lobby, he came out of the dungeon. He was sent for his job changing and was pleased to see the outside world as it had been a month since he last saw another living creature. The protagonist can't believe he feels a little emotional over this and still feels an itchy feeling lingering on his forehead. He was glad that at least the mage sigil had been concealed, which could be hidden like that, so he relaxed. Otherwise having something like that on his head would have attracted too much attention, which he hated the most. When he got online, he was notified that he had received a message from his friend. He supposed it might have been from Tiana as he had been away for a long time. He was shocked as so many messages appeared simultaneously on his screen, and it also attracted the attention of other players in the lobby. They gossiped that it was a crazy load of notifications and wondered if that person owed someone money and loan sharks had chased after him into heaven land. The protagonist went out of other players' sight and into the corner and opened his inbox, which shocked him as he received more than 400 messages from Ruko and many of the messages from Tilly's, Tiana and Dark Feather. He was stunned as he received more than 3,000 messages from Tiana and assumed she might have lost her temper. He read Ruko's messages about him being worried about him and was delighted as that little kid had already learned to worry about others. After reading Tilly's message, he realized she might be angry as she was throwing a fit for him being missing for such a long time.
He wasn't expecting any message from Dark Feather and was astonished as he thought Dark Feather had just said hello and inquired if he was all right. Next was Tiana's turn, as she had sent so many messages and he started reading her messages. After reading all the messages, he thought he had caught up with everything that had been going on outside during the month he had been gone. There was a lot of nagging between the news about what was happening there. The protagonist thought he might have fallen behind in levels as he learned about a wave of level-grinding frenzy. He came across one of Tana's messages in which she informed him that the people from Wolf Fangs have become increasingly arrogant. This relies on the fact that the number of post-promotion members is slightly higher than that of Nebulous. They have invaded their checkpoint station 3 of the guild-owned dungeon, and she informed him that the guildmaster was asking for assistance from Shadow. The protagonist is frustrated with the mischievous act of Wolf Fangs again and reads her next messages. She informed him that Celestial and Wolf Fang were now allied, which would explain their recent attitude. Since it has been so fuzzy there and she didn't even receive any reply from him, she asked Ling Si when he would be returning as it's already been a whole month. The protagonist is dumbfounded when he learns that Celestial and Wolf Fangs have become allies and he doesn't remember them ever working together like this in his previous life. He became sure that not everything would happen according to what happened in his previous life and knew that he had to pay attention to these changes. After reading the last few messages, the protagonist sighed and uttered that now he is back, so he will make sure to place everything on their order. Meanwhile, at Guild-owned Dungeon Station Number 3, the man shouted and instructed the soldier that they had to send those Wolf Fang intruders back to where they had come from. However, one of the soldiers was worried as their opponent had more manpower and resources, so he suggested to the captain that they should keep asking the headquarters for reinforcement. The captain gets furious as he hears the prompting words of the Wolf Fang's intruder team captain, who was challenging them to fight them, and inquires what they are doing and if they are getting cold feet out of fear. The Wolf Fang represents his band of 50 soldiers who can't wait any longer than this, and he mocks them. The Nebulous Soldier gets furious and utters they have already sent a message for help, so they are sure their comrades will be rushing there. Because teleportation was not allowed, they would take some time, and the reinforcement from the nearest station too was also on their way, so he instructed his fellows to hang in there. One of the nebulous men informed the captain that he had been fighting non-stop for nearly two hours straight, so they were running low on consumables too. Their opponent kept sending wave after wave at them, thus immediately swapping out for another group once they were drained, but nebulous was slowly reaching their limit. The captain yelled at them as he knew their enemy had planned for his long advance. Their opponent caught them unprepared, so they had to hang in until reinforcements arrived. The soldier was worried because it was not like they didn't want to hang in there, but rather they couldn't hold on any longer, and were sure they would all be sent to the graveyard at this rate. On the other hand, Wolf Fang's soldiers mocked them and questioned about the matter with them, and whether their teammates also didn't want to fight anymore. He wondered where their brotherhood was now and remarked that those nebulous folks were nothing compared to their guild. The nebulous captain cursed Wolf Fang's guild and commented that they had broken the treaty between their guilds and invaded their checkpoint station, but they still dared to say such things. Wolf Fang's captain wondered what kind of joke it was and questioned if they don't use their brains when gaming because this is called strategy. He instructed them to stop spouting this nonsense, hurry up and call for their reinforcement so they wouldn't claim later that Wolf Fang's was bullying them. Besides, he couldn't stand looking at their poor soldiers for any minute longer, so he wanted to end this matter immediately. Wolf Fang's team captain was startled as he suddenly heard someone who agreed with them from above and uttered that there was no need to waste time reasoning with the small fries from Wolf Fang's. He looked at the protagonist sitting on the tree branch and inquired who he would speak to while conversing. Ling Si uttered that since this was a deliberate assault, he was sure they must have some goal in mind. The nebulous captain asked his comrade if he was one of their guilds, and they wondered why they had only sent one guy as reinforcement. The protagonist gets down and rambles that wolf fangs were intentionally provoking them with words, but refraining from launching a direct attack, which is to whittle them down slowly. He knew they would play right into their hands if they got reinforcements from the other checkpoint station, because that would mean they were weakening those stations' re-combat power on their own accord. The protagonist knew that if that happened, Wolf Fangs would probably launch an all-out assault, which would cost Nebulous at least two checkpoint stations. 
he asked the captain if he was right, and the captain was confused, wondering who this thief was. Ling Si didn't seem like someone from the nearby station to the nebulous captain, and he asked if that thief was from headquarters. The captain agreed with what he just said, as that seemed very plausible because Wolf Fang's despicable people would do anything to win. The captain thought he had to report this to their comrades in the other station. But before leaving, he asked the protagonist about his level as he hadn't seen him around before. The captain could feel the completely different aura coming from the protagonist, and he reckoned he might be the pro sent by the guild. When Ling Si informed them that he was level 15 and had just been promoted, they were left speechless, as that wasn't what they had expected. The soldier gets furious on hearing his level and asks if he is courting his death as his current level is insufficient to compete with them. Another soldier who was crying uttered that all the people defending the checkpoint stations had all been promoted to at least level 23. They can't understand what a novice player just at level 15 like him would be doing there. Wolf Fang team captain mocked the Nebulous Guild and asked if there was something else instead of these sisses in their guild. He called Ling Si level 15 numbskull and inquired if he came to be a lucky mascot or something, and what does he think about himself that he dared to go there at such lowest level. His laughing face suddenly turned into a worried one as, within no time, Ling Si reached near him, put his dagger at his neck, and asked so what if he was just a level 15. The opponent captain was stunned as he was so fast that he didn't notice when he reached near him. The protagonist asked if there were 50 of them and thought it was a great opportunity for him as he would test his new weapon out on them. The nebulous soldiers were shocked to witness this and wondered when that level 15 thief charged over there. The nebulous captain wondered what that thief was even thinking of and if he hit his head as charging straight into such a large group of people was dangerous. The opponent captain wondered if he heard it right as the protagonist's level was only 15, but the way he moved didn't make it seem like that. He was level 25, so he decided to take out that brainless thief and use this chance to show off in front of his fellow brothers. The man from Wolf Fang remarked that they got a numbskull there and thought that nebulous peoples were just forcibly turning their guild into bullies. He wanted Ling Si not to cry about being ganged up on as he tried to take him on himself, and his comrade cheered him on to show his strength to their enemy. The protagonist wasn't frightened and nervous as he had become accustomed to fighting large groups after spending so much time fighting the mirror selves and he just dove in headfirst reflexively. The wolf fang captain pointed at him and wanted to get this battle over quickly, as he had no time to waste on a loser like him. After being on level 15 he smirked at how daring he was and just returned from the promotion, yet that thief thinks he is invincible. He wondered why are there always overconfident noobs like that thief running around, so he wanted him to experience the harshness of reality as an act of kindness to him. The opponent captain attacked him using the swift blade judge, and the protagonist figured out he was a warrior, so he knew he should be wary of his close-range skills. He lifted his sword to attack Ling Si, but before he could give any severe strike, the protagonist attacked him, and his sword slipped out of his hand. Wolf Fang's captain wondered how he could strike accurately between his fingers just as he unleashed his skill. Using such an extreme method to interrupt his skill, he wondered what sort of dexterity and split-second judgment it would require. The opponent captain knew that the slightest inaccuracy of his skill would have failed to interrupt him, so he wondered how that thief was so confident. In the next say 75 seconds, the protagonist strikes at his opponent's weak points multiple times, giving additional critical damage. Unable to tolerate all those assaults, the enemy's captain was subjugated, and he fell on the ground, which shocked his comrade as he got one shot at. The protagonist was amazed as his opponent was way too slow in every last one of his actions. His breathing was full of openings, which was no different from standing completely still. He guessed he had gotten used to the speed and frequency of the mirror selves. Their breathing was carefully calculated, and every attack and defensive move was perfectly executed. The protagonist knew he could have been one-shotted if his calls were off by a second. But compared to his mirror selves, whom he competed in his job change mission, the abilities of these normal players were a little lacking. He looked at all the other players and informed them that it was their turn, so they should get ready, and he thought that they had paled way too much compared to the mirror selves. The nebulous captain wondered what the situation was, and his soldier informed him that things seemed to escalate and assumed that the thief might have been done for. 
they could only see the dust scattered around their opponents and hear the voices of those instructing their archers and mages to scatter and take their positions. They were in an emergency, and some players needed shields to protect them, as the thief was too fast. The soldier from Nebulus decided to go there first and look at the situation as they kicked up a huge dust storm there. His comrades instructed him to be careful not to get besieged by them. As he reached them, he was shocked to see the protagonist alone was able to get rid of most of them and their opponents were trying hard to maintain their distance from him. He couldn't believe his eyes as this wasn't possible for a mere 15-level player to subdue the opponents of this huge number. Wolf Fang's soldier was instructed by their fellow not to be scared of him as he is just one person. The man wasn't afraid of him but couldn't lock on the protagonist and needed to lock on first before he could get him. They were astonished by the protagonist's speed, which was comparable to that of the top-level thieves of the Wolf Fang's guild. They even thought he might be equivalent to their vice guild master, Depraved Squirrel, and thought his level might be high and he would have lied to them. The protagonist hears their conversation, and while hitting one of them, he apologizes to them as he is just level 15 and is currently promoted. The atmosphere was filled with the screaming of nebulous opponents, and they decided to surround Ling Si, who had terrifying attacking skills and instructed their mages to prepare a magic shield. The protagonist suddenly recalled that after promoting his critical damage multipliers, they increased manifold, and he wondered if it was a form for being perfectly awakened. In addition, any attacks on weak points would cause damage dealt to double, so he knew his opponents were completely unprepared to defend. All their equipment was only at the silver grade at best, and even their meat shields couldn't hold out after taking a few hits from Ling Si. The protagonist knew that the main event would be when the guild-owned dungeon would be released to preserve strength, and he doubted Wolf Fang would have sent their pros there now. He was certain because no guild would send their top players on this low-level provocation mission. He rushed to attack them and wanted to use them to help him get used to this state, but his charge against them worried them. Wolf Fang soldiers still wanted to hang in against Ling Si as they had already asked for reinforcement, so their brother from the nearby checkpoint station number 4 would be rushing there. Nebulous soldiers can't believe that a mere level 15 thief has scattered their opponent. The Nebulous captain gets confident after the protagonist attacks and remarks that their opponent dared to underestimate their guild and he instructs his man to charge against them. They were startled as they saw Wolf Fang Checkpoint Station 4 Captain, Level 28 Berserker, personally arrive there. Berserker couldn't believe he had to come there to bail them out and inquired what they were doing, as their mission was to provoke them. Wolf Fang's soldiers were pleased to see their reinforcement arrival, and what was more thrilling was that their captain was there to help them. The player instructs their comrades to hang in there as the protagonist merely takes advantage of their poor formation so they decide to regroup with the captain and turn the situation in their favor, but Ling Si still doesn't care much about it. Nebulous soldier inquired their captain what they should do now, and if they should still be going in to fight. The captain instructed them to hold on as their opponent this time was Berserker, a special warrior subclass that may or may not appear during the promotion. This class gives players the Berserk mode, dual resistance, and immense attack power that exceeds that of a regular warrior. The nebulous captain was furious as he had no such luck after promotion and only landed as an ordinary armored warrior. While their in-game performance was worse than the berserkers, which outclassed him in every aspect, and he cursed his opponent. The protagonist headed toward them and uttered that berserker was out of their captain league, so he instructed him to stay out. The captain gets furious at him as he doesn't need to remind him, and the soldier worriedly informs the captain that an archer is coming there. The captain cursed the protagonist on seeing such a massive attack, as he was the one who brought that to them and instructed their mages to activate the magic shield. The mages were worried that their arrows were too relentless, so their remaining mana wouldn't be enough. Berserker was furious as he thought it was a waste for a talent like him to serve as the captain of a frontline station. He found this situation so boring that he wanted to get this over quickly and thought that, just like usual, he would have to break their formation with a couple of waves of ranged attacks. Then, he will lead the charge to mop them all up with his combat power as a berserker, which was a piece of cake for him. His man alarmed the captain to look behind him as he was being attacked by his opponent's colossal mountain pressure skill, but he didn't even notice it. The protagonist was pleased that little Ruko was there but he thought he would take longer than that. 
Little Ruko uttered that if it were a summon from his boss, Ling Si, he would have to be there in a flash. Their opponent attacked them using the magic arrow and didn't want that midget to escape from their grasp. Little Ruko rushed there when he received the protagonist's message, but he didn't have the time to reply. The protagonist now understands why there was no response, as he thought Ruko was in a dungeon. He was amazed that little Ruko had grown quite a bit, and his current equipment was silver grade. Ruko said it's a mixture and match from various sets, but he doesn't have many good options. Suddenly, he remembered, so he stopped him and inquired where he had been all this time as he had been missing for a whole month, which worried him as he disappeared without a word. The protagonist laughed and clarified that he ran into a little issue during the job change mission, but it was nothing to worry about as he was back. Ruko informed him that Tiana was also worried about him, so he should see her after this battle. Ling Si promised to meet her. The protagonist recalled Van Kaffis as he had to check on her because he had been busy lately and couldn't visit her. He gave her all the needed material on schedule, so he wondered how she was doing and if she had made any potion. Ruko remembered that the last time he saw her, she mentioned something about wanting to have him drop by when he had time. He thought she might have something she wanted to report to Ling Si, but he forgot about the rest and thought he would get yelled at later. The protagonist understood and promised to drop by to see her after he finished this matter. The captain saw them conversing, so gets furious and instructed them that instead of standing and chatting, they should hurry and help others. One of the soldiers recognized Ruko and asked his captain if that little warrior was him. The captain affirmed that he was a member of Shadow, so he wondered what he was doing there. The soldier heard that he has been especially active at the 3rd Division, and members from the 2nd Division have privately invited him to help out as well. It seems like he has become very strong after promotion, and even people from the 1st Division invited him to join their teams permanently, but he rejected them all. The soldier knew that Ruko was someone whose presence people dreamed of, yet he wondered what he was doing there. The captain heard Ruko calling that thief a brother just now and wondered if that thief was the head of the independent team Shadow. They asked if he was that person as they heard he quit the game and retired as he hadn't seen for a month. Wolf Fang's player informed their captain that nebulous people had been ignoring them. Berserker cursed them as if they were a bunch of fools who didn't even know that they were about to die, so he decided to use his dispelling of boredom on them. He instructed ranged DPS to attack from where they were and their targets were just glass cannons and instructed the remaining players to follow him. They affirmed, and the captain furiously emitted a surging battle intent aura as if he wanted to end them. Surging battle intent is an active skill that greatly increases damage output for a short duration. The user will gain battle intent from attacking, and when the gauge is full, raging smash will be unleashed. Meanwhile, the protagonist and others were also prepared to ambush, and he instructed them to leave the berserker to him. But Ruko volunteered to handle the berserker and leave the rest to him, which surprised Ling Si as he had grown up, and he had truly forgotten about it. In the protagonist's previous life, Ruko was the all-powerful sacred mountain Ruko Zong, so he trusted his skill. The player was worried as they went ahead like that and asked their captain what they should do now. The captain remarked they were idiots and instructed the rest to follow him. They can't let others say they only know how to observe from the sidelines as they are tough opponents and use vigorous brilliance skills to attack. This aura skill boosted both physical and magical defense while increasing movement speed. The more allies there are within the aura, the stronger the defensive buffs, but the same aura's effects cannot stack. They enthusiastically ambushed them and wanted to show wolf fangs they were not someone to mess with. The protagonist smirked and jumped to attack them. He remembered that he still hadn't asked if little Ruko was promoted into any special subclass after his job change mission and about the various changes of his attribute. He knew that Ruko's strongest card would naturally be that blessing, which is the blessing of courage. However, there was still a long way to go before Ruko could fully master the power of his blessing. The protagonist doesn't want him to take a beating from the Berserker and knows that in the early game, Berserker was a very strong warrior subclass, and he wants to see what Ruko is capable of. Ruko was attacking Berserker from multiple positions, and Berserker remarks that with his huge fanfare, he thought Ruko would be a pro player or something. Berserker was astonished as it turned out that he was just a level 25 midget. Being level 28, Berserkers wanted to teach him how to play as a warrior. Ruko praised him as level 28 wasn't bad, 
but he was still not qualified to teach him how to play, as the berserker didn't even know that Ruko might be the one giving him the lesson. He attacked him, but Berserk laughed. He thought it was a lame joke, as Ruko was just a kid whose hair was not even completely grown, so he wanted to educate him on his parents' behalf. He attacked him, but Ruko blocked his attack. Then Berserker decided to use his raging smash as he wanted to rearrange his face with this. He jumped and attacked him, but was shocked as Ruko took on his raging smash without even using any skills. Berserker could feel like he was getting stronger and stronger. The protagonist was watching this situation and was amazed as Ruko was holding an interesting shield. Berserker was stunned as Ruko's shield was so heavy and wondered how this little kid was lifting something this heavy. He was startled as suddenly Ruko's hand got gigantic to punch him, and with a single hit, he was thrown far away. Berserk was shocked as his single attack broke his weapon and he wondered if this was a joke when he saw his gigantic version. Ruko furiously stared at him, showing his punch to Berserker. He inquired who the little guy was now. Everyone from Wolf Fang's guild was shocked to see him transformed and wondered how he could do that. While Ruko was inquiring his opponent about who the kid was now, Berserker asked what sort of skill this was. He wondered if this was some special post-promotion subclass or a special warrior class. Ruko smirked and said he had not earned the right and wasn't eligible to see his subclass. He lifted his arm and punched the ground using Jai's output, pushing his opponent back and immobilizing him. The enemy players were shocked as the ground collapsed with his single punch and they recognized his skill, which was a dot skill. Being terrified, they decided to leave immediately. Before they could leave, the protagonist appeared behind them and affirmed that the ground had collapsed, so it was time to take out the laundry. Using a throat slasher, he attacked them, and with his single strike, he managed to decrease one-third of their HP. The protagonist realized that his early game low-level skills couldn't deal enough damage anymore, so he thought he couldn't finish them off like that. He guessed he had to switch out all the skills he had before the promotion with the new one. While he was pondering, Ruko appeared and volunteered to take care of the rest himself, so he jumped and punched the ground forcefully and threw the players away. Berserker also got hit by this and realized he was careless. As he underestimated them, his body started disappearing. Ruko was stunned to hear careless and uttered that if he felt bitter about this, he was always up for a rematch. The protagonist praised little Ruko as this was beautifully done. With this, all that was left was the small fries. Little Ruko transformed back into his original form, and he didn't want to lose face like this, especially when his brother Ling Si was around there. After they were done with all of them, they returned and wanted to leave the rest to the captain because they were heading off now. The captain was astonished by their horrifying stats and the skill of these two. He got them to wipe out these Wolf Fang members over there, even without their help. He requested them to stop and inquired if two of them were participating when the guild-owned dungeon opened in a week from now. The protagonist uttered that it depends as they didn't make any firm situation and decided to leave first. The soldier was sure their help would greatly boost their nebulous guild's chances of winning. The captain agreed, especially with that level 15 thief, because the way that thief plays feels like a level 50 plus pro. The captain instructed his comrade to mop up the rest of the wolf fang scraps as they had enough talk and urged them not to run. Meanwhile, they were near the lake and Ruko was washing his hands. He uttered that there was still quite some distance to the nearest teleporter out there. The protagonist recalled something and inquired about Ruko's post-promotion subclass. Ruko gladly looked at him and informed him that it was a little mouthful subclass as the warrior was the blessed beast man of the sacred mountain. The protagonist thinks for a while, and as he expected, because of his blessing from Ruko, he received the complimentary subclass after his promotion. He knew he would be the sacred mountain Ruko Zong of the future. He had never imagined being this close to such a legendary being in his previous life, yet they were comrades now. He knew that little Ruko's legendary emergence had just begun, and with time he would be the best in heaven land. Ruko laughed and rambled, saying there is little information about it as it is labeled a growth-type subclass. He wondered if it could be that it knows that he is only 12 this year and wondered how he is supposed to go about growing. The protagonist remarked that it's really good to be young. Ruko looked at him and uttered as if he were talking as if he were an old man himself. He asked if he had informed Sister Tiana about his return because she worried about him. 
The protagonist affirmed that he had sent her a message about his return, but assured Ruko that he would visit her later. Before going offline, he had to see Van Kaffes, so he instructed Ruko to head off first if he was busy. Recently, the government-funded Heaven Land Currency Exchange System has been released, according to which the player could bind their bank account directly to their in-game account. However, only gold coins could be exchanged, and the current exchange rate is one gold coin to $1,000 in real life. Other in-game equipment and resources have also been adjusted accordingly. The protagonist had already used up quite a bit of his money at Vancafa's potion shop previously and remembered that the shop's rental period was also coming to an end soon. In addition, were all those expenses one after another for furniture and equipment and so on. He didn't even have a gold coin on him now, so he hoped that Vancafa's had gotten the hang of things. It's when the protagonist drops by and checks on her, as he has almost forgotten because of his job-changing mission, but the deadline for the 1-5 million loans is also coming soon. He had to find a way to have that money in his hand as soon as possible before those gangsters came back knocking. Ling Si knew awakened players could take a lot of money in the outside world, but he had never been awakened in his past life, which was simply a financial crisis, so he had no experience. He was trying to sort things out when Ruko blushed and asked if he would visit Van Kaffes. He could also come along as he was not busy. The protagonist looks at him and agrees to take him along, which pleases Ruko, so they decide to leave. Later, at Casfato Commercial Leasing Street, players were queuing outside the Van Kaffes potion shop, and one of them was furious at the other and warned him to stop cutting the line. The other player thought he might have parts missing from his brain as he couldn't even see who was jumping the queue. While they were busy fighting, Van Kaffes informed them that the last ten bottles were left and reminded them that there was only one bottle per person as she had recorded their ID. She requested the customer to get his cash ready if it was his first time shopping her potions. She asked her employees the number of Type C potions they had left. Her employees replied there were six and three bottles of Type A and B potions. She instructed them to prioritize replenishing Taipa to 12 bottles as she would leave him all a 30% raise for that night's work and expressed her gratitude to them for their hard work. Her employees were pleased to hear her mouth-watering offer as she would raise their pay. She assured her there was no problem with it and thanked her. The protagonist gets to the counter and asks Van Kaffes if it's all right for him to skip the queue, which makes other customers unhappy. They wonder what he is doing and are amazed at how ill-bred he is. Van Kaffes refused without looking at him and instructed him to return. Ling Si called her boss Van Kaffes, which captured her attention. As soon as she saw him, she was so contented to see her boss return that she rushed at him without caring for her potions, and they slipped from her hands. She took him inside, and the protagonist was stunned to hear that she wanted to open a branch store, now as the shop had been open for less than three months so he wondered if she was sure about it. She assured him she was positive about it and uttered that the work was too much to handle alone, so she had taken it up herself to hire three alchemist assistants. She was acting on the principle that more labor yields more output. While productivity has improved, it is clear that they still need more manpower. Because she hasn't been able to contact Ling Si, she also decided to allocate a portion of profits to procure more ingredients. She also wanted to request for the store to be upgraded and expanded if possible, and they also needed to hire more experienced alchemists. Otherwise, it would be a waste if they could not keep up with their large customer traffic. The protagonist gets the gist of the matter, but before he devises any solution, he asks for an overview of the potion shop's business so far. She explained that after a period of trial and error, her alchemy success rate increased, but there wasn't much traffic in the beginning so she used some money to hire a few people to help her advertise. Unexpectedly, it worked surprisingly well, and more and more people came to buy the potion. Since there was still a long way to go before they realized their vision of a business empire, she decided to go all in and recruited three rookie alchemists to groom. Those rookie alchemists learned very quickly, and while the store's performance improved, she couldn't help feeling that Ling Si had been disappointed by this pace. As she knew he was the only one with the right to upgrade and expand the store, she was anxious to meet with him about this. She wanted to discuss this matter so she could expand the business, train the new hires, and be one step closer to their target. The protagonist is astonished to know her impressive business, Acumen, and is mortified as he thinks the Van Kaffes of his previous life only made a name for herself solely with her potion. 
He realized there was more to her than earning her the title of alchemist emperor, and he asked how much profit their store had made until now. Van Kaffes was about to get to that point and rambled that she even applied for the store's earnings to be bound to their player's ID, but that could only be done with Ling Xia's approval. She explained to him that every transaction has a record, so if they add up the earnings from the present day, it's 363 gold and 65 silver. The protagonist was dumbfounded to hear that amount, and Van Kaffes thought she had let him down because her goal was 600 gold. The protagonist smiled voraciously and thought she was amazing, as expected of the alchemist emperor. Her performance was not bad, and he instructed her to keep working hard. Little Ruko was also overwhelmed compared to the gold farmers, who fought tirelessly all day to earn a few silver coins. This result was truly impressive. The protagonist's eyes sparkled with greed, and he thought her demands for herself were beyond what he had imagined. He figured out that his potion investment would bring him explosive profits. So, if he could successfully open a branch store, he could make more investments when the virtual real estate is launched and become a rich landlord of heaven land. He cleared his throat and clarified that starting the next day, he wanted to sign an official employment contract with her, with her pay being 30% of the store's total profit. He had seen what she could do, had faith in her judgment, and informed her that 30% of the store's total earnings from all the future branches would be given to her. The protagonist promised to take care of all the expenses for store upgrades, recruitment and training, so she should keep doing what she is doing and notify him if she needs anything. She inquired if he was telling the truth as she couldn't believe it because 30% of the total profit was an amazing offer to her. After all, according to her calculation, this profit would be much more if they stacked 30% of their three or four branches. The protagonist affirmed and assured her that she would be a rich lady in the future, which pleased her as she thought that was too much. The protagonist stands and clarifies whether that could happen depending on her hard work and dedication. He reminded her that money is important, but her goal from the start was to prove her worth to the world, which also matters. She agreed as she understood what her boss meant and promised she wouldn't let herself be blinded by money. She wanted to become the alchemist emperor that he described and wanted to realize his vision of a business empire, and she wanted to live up to her potential and be the best she could be. After all, there was nothing more meaningful than achieving one's goals in life, so she wanted to make her life meaningful. The protagonist is glad she has made a firm decision and Ruko is amazed to see her piercing aura of aspiration. Since she accepted his condition, he decided to sign the contract with her and instructed her that the details of the terms and conditions were stated inside. He advised her that she didn't need to call him boss from now on, and she agreed. This was his first time going online after being promoted. Soon, he woke up, and his grandfather was glad to see him awake and invited him to have breakfast. He reminded him that after breakfast, he had to talk about Ling Si going to school, which startled him as he almost forgot about it. Suddenly, his eyes spread wide with shock as he felt the piercing pain in his body. He wondered what was happening to his body as his muscles and meridians were spamming violently. The nerves in his brain were also pulsating madly, and he was stunned when he realized he was awakening. He wonders if his body is evolving. The old man gets worried about seeing him in such a condition, and as the energy emerges out of his body, he inquires if he is all right. The protagonist knows that his brain is awakening, which is supposed to hurt so much, and he shouts as it hurts much more than he expected. Such tremendous energy emitted out of his body that it pushed the old man back, and it was so high that it almost touched the sky. The man wearing the hat, named Adolf, was holding a meter whose needles started moving with such fast speed on Ling Si awakening that startled him. He was amazed at witnessing such a scary awakening rate, which was even higher than the reading that he got from the guy last time. Adolf wondered if it was an awakening surge greater than the previous guy. It could be a perfect awakening. He looked at the location where the energy was surging out, which was from the slums, and he guessed that he would have to pay a visit. Meanwhile, his energy surge broke their roof. The old man was worried about him and inquired if he was all right and what was happening there. Suddenly, that gangster knocked at their door, kicked it, and broke in. The gangster asked what they were trying to do and if they were trying to destroy the place before running away. The man wondered what that loud noise was about and reminded them that it had already been two months, so their time was up. 
Those gangsters guarded the place outside for an entire day in case they tried to run away, but then they heard that noise and rushed in. He demanded the loan money, and while pointing at the old man, he called him a lowlife beggar. The old man was speechless, but was startled as he heard Ling Xia's voice, which was irritated by their noise. The protagonist inquired about whom they were calling low lives, and he challenged him to dare say that again. The cat outside their house was eating from waste, but got startled by the production of such a loud noise coming from their home. Inside the house, the protagonist fights them and inquires why they aren't talking anymore. The gangster was worried as his aura was completely different, and he wondered if he was awakened. But what bothered him was that his aura was more substantial than other awakened ones in their organization. He furiously clenched his teeth as, from the looks of it, he could tell that he would have awakened recently and wondered from all the days why he had to meet him on the day of his awakening. He figured out that day wasn't his lucky day as his performance rating for this month would be dropped because of this. The protagonist approaches him and wants him to speak while the gangster realizes that he has to get out of there himself. No matter how strong they were, there was no way that they, who were ordinary folks, could stand up to an awakening, so the most important thing to that gangster was to secure his life. He stood, said he would talk, and uttered that he was blinded as he dared to cause a stir. The gangster requested him to have mercy on the likes of him as they were just doing their job, so he requested him to calm down. While the protagonist is dealing with that gangster, the old man arrives and inquires about what he is doing. He assured his grandfather not to worry as he was fine, which made the old man feel easy as he was all right and asked about those gangsters. The gangster knelt before him, admitting they were wrong to disturb them during breakfast. He said they were anxious to complete their assigned task because too many people nowadays don't pay their loans. So this was a real headache on their end too. That's why they had no choice but to act that arrogantly. Moreover, if they could collect what they were supposed to, they would be skinned alive when they returned. With the ruthless nature of these gangster bosses, the debt collector was sure they would have also heard of it being from the slums. The protagonist wondered who their boss was as he didn't know about him, so he instructed him to take him along too. The debt collector didn't believe this and inquired if he was serious about it. Later, they were at their central gathering base, where a few other gangsters were gathered around their boss. Their boss asked if they were saying they got injured at such a critical moment. The dark race was about to start, so he wondered where he would find another suitable awakened participant. The gangster boss Chris, the Silver Viper of the East and one of the four heads of the slum's East District, furiously clarified that as he said, the dark race was most important to him currently. Then one of the awakened with a broken arm, whose awakening rate was 12% and his awakening class was Armor Warrior, apologized to his boss for being careless. The awakened lost his head after drinking with his brothers and insisted on driving and requested his boss to trust him as he would put his life online for this. The awakened was shocked as his boss shot the man behind him, and his boss furiously uttered that drunk driving, crashing the car, and getting his arm smashed. He was the one who created all this mess. Chris knew that his awakening rate was already lower than his opponent to begin with but now, with his current condition, he didn't even stand a chance against him. He uttered that if it wasn't for the fact that awakened like him, who would have willingly joined the dark race are hard to find, and he would have ended up an idiot like him earlier. Chris knew that he might be awakened, but was sure he would be scared of bullets. This terrified him, and he knelt before him, requesting that he would surely put his life at stake to win this for him, and thanked him for sparing his life. The other men were also shocked to see this as this was the East District boss, someone who could kill without the slightest hesitation and the one whom people call the Silver Viper of the East. The debt collector who went to the protagonist's home was worried as he thought they would be done for because the competition that the boss was looking forward to was ruined. He knew that his boss might be really in a bad mood, so he might be the one who would be taking the bullets next. The protagonist assumed that the dark race he mentioned was some underground competition in which only the awakened could participate. He thought that if that competition was indeed that important to the gangster's boss, he should do something, and he suggested that he compete for him. The man who brought Ling Si there looked at him worriedly and requested he not add fuel to the fire, and their boss stared at him. The awakened gangster wondered who had brought that newbie there as it wasn't the place for him to speak. The protagonist doesn't care about them and asks their boss if he would tell him the opponent awakened class and the winning condition. 
Chris lifted his gun to terrify him and asked if he was sure he was talking to him. The debt collector apologized to his boss as he was the one who brought the client there and explained that he brought him there to discuss his loan with him. He apologized to his boss and clarified that Ling Si jumped out on this his one and it has nothing to do with him. Silver Viper gets furious as he is surrounded by a bunch of idiots who shoot him, but before the bullet can pierce his body, the protagonist moves his hand toward it, which shocks everyone. The protagonist caught the bullet and was clarified that the man was correct as it had nothing to do with him. He asked Silver Viper didn't need to be awakened who was willing to participate in this dark race for him. He threw the bullet and was sure that the gangster boss would be satisfied with his abilities. Silver Viper was surprised to witness such terrifying abilities and instructed his men to leave for a while. The protagonist uttered that if he wins this, he must write off the 1-5 million loan and asked if he agreed to this condition. Silver Viper decided that if he won that match, he would be willing to write off even a $5 million loan, so what he demanded was much less than that. The boss explained that the dark race would be a significant gamble with the South District this time. So if he wins, the East District properties will increase by more than double, and they will gain other unimaginable benefits. Still, first, he wanted to know his awakening rate, in-game awakening level, and class. Even though he was a spell thief, the protagonist has yet to obtain a single spell, making him a regular thief in practice. The protagonist uttered that he is level 15 and has just awakened. His awakening rate was all right, and he is a thief. Silver Viper wondered if what he meant by his awakening rate was all right and inquired if he would be okay with his current level. He clarified first that if he lost the match, there would be a chance of death. Furthermore, each dark race was a massive deal for all of them, and he wouldn't allow anything to go wrong. The protagonist assured him not to worry as he has to live up to his word that the debt will be cleared when he wins. For a moment, Silver Viper wondered if that guy was his last option. He knew that the government had poached all the slightly better awakened. They were given generous terms and good treatment and even had high awakening rates. The government prohibited competitions like this dark race, so awakened would usually avoid having their records stained. So as not to hamper their future career, from what Silver Viper has heard, their opponent is an archer with an awakening rate of 28%. Judging from the protagonist's moves, he could tell that he is pretty agile so he doesn't know that he might be able to win this time. Silver Viper instructed him to let go, but the protagonist didn't understand where he was taking him. Silver Viper asked if he didn't want to compete in the dark race. The race was held that night, so if they left now, they would be there just in time. Later, he was in his car, and they were heading toward the arena. The protagonist didn't believe he could catch a bullet barehanded because he was awakened. He had merely acted on instinct back them, although his palm still hurt a little. The potential of being awakened continuously shocked him. While he had never been awakened in his previous life, he still heard much news about them in real life. Such as when awakened single-handedly crushed a sizable terrorist organization, or how two awakened destroyed half the city when they got into a fight. Back then, Ling Si always thought that such things were incomprehensible and unrealistic, aside from not having in-game equipment. An Awakened retains all of their in-game skills and strengths in the real world, and now he could feel himself, the infinite potential of an Awakened. He thought that if he could maximize his performance as a spell thief, he wondered what sort of heights he could reach in real life. He decided to swipe the title of Heavenland number one from the hand of immovable dark lines, not just in the game, but he wanted to become the number one Awakened in real life. In his current life, Ling Si wants to turn his life around to the extreme. Silver Viper is amazed as, despite knowing that the protagonist is about to participate in a death match, he doesn't look nervous. The protagonist was calm and composed as ever, which seemed very impressive to Silver Viper, and he was stunned as this was the mentality of someone who looked like he was in his twenties. Soon, they reached where the person at the entrance welcomed Silver Viper. Silver Viper pointed toward Ling Si and informed them that he was in his hand. After entering the building and going to the basement, the protagonist asked if his hand was some code word. Silver Viper affirmed that as this is the slum's secret dark battle arena, it's only open to members. Those who participate in the arena are either the filthy rich or people who rule over a district like him. Since it's the rule that they could only bring one awakened to be their right-hand man into the venue, they have shortened it to hand. 
the protagonist assumes that the bets at every match are related to unspeakable acts and asks if he is right. This made Silver Viper furious and he instructed him not to go, thinking that such bloody underground competition only existed in the slums. He uttered that what happened there was nothing compared to the dark match arena in the wealthy district. He remarked that Ling Si hadn't seen these for himself before because those with wealth and power are capable of much crazier things than them. While discussing this, they reached the entrance, and the security guards opened the gate for them. The dazzling lights from inside fell directly into his eyes, so he covered them. Silver Viper asked him about his opinion on the location as this was where he would hear the screams of the most oppressed voices in the slums and inquired if it didn't fire him up. The protagonist can't believe that such a large space exists underground. Silver Viper called him because he wanted to familiarize himself with the place and its people. But Ling Si had no desire to be familiar with such a place. While they were heading there, they were startled when someone behind them asked Silver Viper as he heard that he made a bet with Smiling Tiger for that night's match. Fu Anzang, also known as Pink Daddy, was one of the four heads of the slums West District and inquired why he didn't ask him to join in. Silver Viper introduced the man to Ling Si, as he is the head of Hanisho of the West District. He explained that the smiling tiger he spoke of was the South District boss and the one with whom he made a bet this time. Silver Viper replied to Fu Anzang that this was a matter between the East and the South, so there was no need for the West to stick their nose in there. Fu Anzang thought it was not out of the question if they sincerely wanted to collaborate. His attention suddenly diverts toward the protagonist, and he inquires if he is his hand for the match as he seems to remember that it is a big guy with a crew cut who was his hand. Silver Viper said that something came up with his man, so he had to switch him urgently with another Awakena. Fu Anzang instructed him to be careful as Smiling Tiger came prepared. This time, he heard he splashed out to hire an awakened warrior with a 36% awakening rate from the wealthy district. Their opponent was strong this time, having participated in seven dark battles with six wins and one loss. Silver Viper gets worried on hearing that he hired an awakened with an awakening rate of 36% and he never thought Smiling Tiger would manage to bring in an awakened of this level. He felt that if it were still that awakened archer with a 23% awakening rate, that kid could have used his speed to force a close combat. But if it's a warrior, he knew it would be tricky and wondered if he could count on this thief to win. Soon, the announcement was made about the commencement of the most awaited headliner of the night match. Everyone was excited and then the announcement was made from their boss, the Silver Viper of the East. This was the bet with the South's boss, Smiling Tiger. After briefly describing the match, the announcer called both the awakened contestants to the ring. On the one side of the ring, they have an awakened warrior known as Frankenstein, who has participated in seven battles with one loss. Opposite him, they have an awakened thief with no nicknames or previous battle experience. The spectator laughed at the protagonist and bet that Frankie would squish him dead with just two fingers. Silver Viper was tensed after hearing those spectators' conversations and he knew it would be tough. Smiling Tiger appeared and asked him if he didn't know his limits. He thought that Silver Viper would have taken this bet a lot more seriously, so as his senior, he was very disappointed in him. Silver Viper knew he was older than him, but that didn't mean that Smiling Tiger would be his senior, and they still didn't know who would emerge victorious. Like Kaiosi, who was also famous as Smiling Tiger, was very confident about Frankenstein as he was someone that he had hired by a wealthy district. Frankenstein was very much to his satisfaction, being it was his experience or power, so he mocked Silver Viper. Soon, the announcement was made that a battle with no restrictions, regardless of life or death, was starting so the participants were instructed to prepare their equipment, and the battle commenced. Frankenstein used an upheaval stomp on the ground to generate a force to make Ling Si fall. Judges thought he would not give his opponent the chance to be armed as expected from Frankenstein, who is very experienced, and wondered if backing away was the only option for the thief. The protagonist was confident as he didn't think he needed a weapon to deal with him because he could at least catch bullets with his current speed. He thought if he would be fast enough, he could still inflict massive damage even with his bare hands. Frankenstein mocked him and thought this little thief was ridiculous and wanted to take his life with his axe. Judges were amazed as he attacked, wondering if that thief could dodge this ferocious swing of Frankenstein. The warrior rushed to attack him and asked if he was really out of his depth as he wasn't moving and wondered if he was scared to think.
The protagonist thinks he has to think of only one thing he has to consider as his opponent is attacking him. He evades his attack, rushes behind him, and punches him. Everyone was shocked as with a single move, he defeated that warrior, and it was a ko. Meanwhile, the protagonist uttered that the one thing that he had to consider was how much strength to use so that he wouldn't accidentally kill that warrior. The warrior knelt before him, shocking everyone, and the protagonist realized that his opponent might not pump any stats points into defense. The protagonist knew that with the skills to back it up, focusing purely on DPS as a warrior was a good idea. Otherwise, things will be dangerous when facing a class with high burst damage after awakening. Smiling Tiger was shocked to witness his defeat in the match. Silver Viper also couldn't believe his eyes and wondered if he did not see things and if he had won. Soon, the announcement was made, and with the unparalleled strike of the protagonist, the awakened thief was victorious. The protagonist leaves the ring and looks at Silver Viper. Since the match is over, he suggests leaving as he has things to do. Silver Viper praised the protagonist as he did well, and supposed he had hit the jackpot this time. He tried to mock Smiling Tiger as he could see it was his win, so he wanted their agreement to take effect immediately. Silver Viper uttered that from today onward, and his East District men will be doing business in the designated areas in their South District. So Silver Viper was counting on Smiling Tiger to care. Listening to this shocked his opponent, and he cursed his fortune. Later, they left, and in the car, Silver Viper felt great after having such a victory and asked Ling Si if he saw his opponent's face in the end. His opponent seemed like he was choking on shit, and he bet that his opponent wouldn't be able to sleep well that night. The protagonist reminded him of their agreement, which said that one five million would be written off from his debt. Silver Viper wondered why he was still bringing up that petty change as it was all wiped clean, and he wanted to give him one million as a personal gift that he didn't need to return. Silver Viper knew that Ling Si might have just awakened, but judging from that frightening performance just now, that kid's future was beyond measure, so he wanted to be on good terms with him. The protagonist replied that although it's a pity, he can't become indebted to Silver Viper, so he can't accept such gifts that were given for no reason, but he guessed that asking for a favor is fine. The protagonist decides to accept his good intentions, but he wants Silver Viper to keep the one million. However, Silver Viper's bad-tempered lackeys have completely trashed his grandfather's house. Ling Si smirked as he remembered those gangsters' faces because if they had heard this, they would surely have said that Ling Si was the reason for creating such a mess. Silver Viper affirmed that he doesn't have to concern himself with that, he will handle it as it's his responsibility. He speedily drove his car while instructing his man to handle the apartment for the old man according to protocol. Soon, the call ended and Silver Viper assured Ling Si that he had ordered his men to take care of it as soon as possible. Since it was getting late, Silver Viper wanted to treat the protagonist that night and suggested taking him to relax and have a good time. He expressed gratitude for everything he did to help him win the bet and offered him a cigarette. The protagonist refused his offer because he didn't smoke and explained that this type of relaxation was not for him. The best way to relax was to go home and sleep well. Silver Viper was shocked to see how immaculate this young man was, as he was a tough customer. So he agreed that it was all good as long as he could rest up and instructed him that if he needed anything in the future, he should give him a holler as long as it was within his means so he would be happy to help. The protagonist thanked him in advance. Silver Viper was amazed because, from the beginning, Ling Si never showed the slightest fear of him, the East District Head. The protagonist requested that he drop him off at the alleyway because where he lived was narrow so that he could drop him off at the corner. He was standing in the street, but as soon as he reached his house, he was shocked to see the door of his home, which seemed a bit too far. He knocked at the door, and his grandfather's voice from inside came, he opened the door and was pleased to see Ling Si back. His grandfather inquired if he was all right, and if that gangster did anything to him. The protagonist wondered what they could do to him, and requested him not to worry as he just went to take care of their debt. Ling Si was speechless as he peeked inside the home, which was shining. It had been renovated with new and expensive things. His grandfather uttered that a bunch of burly men came by, and there were about ten or more of them, but they just barged in with their tools and got to work. The old man has no clue what they are up to, and he thinks he is about to die. They just fixed their house and left without a word. The protagonist remembered Silver Viper's words that he should sit back and leave it to him. 
He was stunned and guessed he could say those men were extremely efficient. The old man asked the protagonist how he had handled that one five million debt, and if those gangsters had forced him to do anything nasty. Ling Si assured him not to worry as they don't owe them money anymore and explained that he did a small favor and it was all good after that. His grandfather's eyes were filled with tears of joy and he thanked him and assured him he wouldn't ask him again. He also wanted to thank him on behalf of his dead son, but this was nothing big to the protagonist so he assured him not to worry. The protagonist uttered that if it weren't for his grandfather, he would have starved on the streets long ago. Besides, he has always treated him as his blood, so Ling Si thought he should be thanking him. The old man gives up after hearing this and instructs them that they shouldn't be so polite with each other since they are family. He remembered something and instructed Ling Si to report to the school as soon as he had settled the paperwork for him. The old man uttered that he took the liberty to put the protagonist down as his grandson and finally managed to secure a free spot at the third high school under their welfare scheme. He remarked that young kids like him should have a bit of ink in their bellies. The protagonist sighed as it was the third high school again and wondered if this was fate and if he was also going to the third high in this life. He was reluctant to go there as that place was filled with bitter and harsh memories. The old man remembered something and uttered that those gangsters had also exchanged for Ling Si, but he didn't understand what it meant, so he kept it away. He handed him the gaming headset, which pleased the protagonist as this was the second generation of the smart gaming headset. This was so great as all the new second generation headsets improved the realism of the in-game sensory experience. But there was also great improvement in terms of graphics and ease of control as well. In addition, while in the game, it releases more targeted neurocurrent to regulate the body's various functions. With better equipment, he could improve the precision of his movement. This headset was something that Ling Si hadn't ever dared to dream of in his previous life. He recalled correctly that it was sold for $120,000 on release and wanted to double his efforts in the game to give a better life to his grandfather. He wore the headset and informed his grandfather that he would be logging in to rest soon. His grandfather wished him to do his best. He entered the game and was amazed. As expected from the second generation headset, his tactile sensitivity was a lot more realistic than before. There was much keener perception feedback as well, which will surely help him in battles in the future, and he opened the door. Outside there, all of them were waiting for him, and Tilly's was amazed as he had disappeared for a month and now he was showing out of nowhere with this attitude. The protagonist looked at her and thought that since he had taken care of the problem in the real world, it was time to take care of the unfinished business in the game. His teammates stared at him while he was certain it was time for Shadow to regroup and rise to the highest position. Little Ruko was glad to see Ling Si there and rushed to hug him. Tilly's warned the protagonist to give her a good explanation as to why he had disappeared for an entire month. The protagonist's target was to rush up the leaderboard with his team, Shadow, within a week. Later, at the Nebulous Guild front garden, he was glad to see them all after a long time and was amazed that all of them had gotten near gear. Tilly's was furious and wanted him to cut the small talk. She was shocked when he got little Ruko to get them there. She thought he had quit and deleted his account. Dark Feather was also worried and inquired if he could get a very special to change the mission or something, which takes a whole month. The protagonist uttered that it was a long story because the mission had different phases, making him battle countless mirror selves. As the reward could be continuously stacked, he kept going until he was happy with his achievements. Tilly's was astonished that he had a strange job change mission and became sure that the system would assign different missions based on each player's differences. Tilly's mission was just an NPC rescue mission compared to that odd mission of Ling Si, where she guessed she was much better off. Dark Feather wondered why he gathered them there. Ling Si explained that the reason was that he hadn't seen them for quite a while. The second reason he gathered them there was to invite them all to do the next week's Guild-owned dungeon. They wondered why they would participate in Guild-owned dungeon as Tilly's and Dark Feather weren't part of Nebulous. The protagonist had the solution for this problem as they could join the Nebulous temporarily when the time came. After they were done with the dungeon, both could leave the guild whenever they wanted. Ling Si inquired for confirmation of whether any of them were currently in a guild. Dark Feather agreed to join them because as long as it's something interesting he is in, Tilly's refused. She was in a workshop, and there were workshop rules against them from joining the guild as they wished. 
the protagonist assured her not to worry as this was just for a day, and he believed that Wolf Fang's depraved squirrel would also be there. He suggested that she should come with him to pay him back for what happened last time. This helped him fire up Tilly's a bit, and she inquired if he was saying that Wretched Rat would also be there. She gets furious and wants to beat Depraved Squirrel so hard that he will be scrambling on the floor looking for his teeth, so she agrees to join them. The protagonist was pleased that he succeeded in his plan, and Ruko was also glad it had been a while since Shadow had gone on a mission together. The protagonist informed them that he had to spend the week on grinding levels so they could also level a bit. While talking he heard someone calling his name, looking around he saw Wasabi standing there. It has been two months since Wasabi saw him and finally he has found the protagonist. Wasabi was at level 23 and was sure that Ling Si would still remember his promise to challenge Shadow. Ruko was surprised to see Wasabi Kun as they had not seen him for a long time. He wondered where he had been and was amazed to see his high level. Tilly's wondered who that red-skinned guy was and Wasabi wanted Ling Si to accept his challenge because he had come prepared for it this time. Later, they went to Nebulous Guild backyard. Tilly's inquired if it was one verse one and wanted to handle him alone. Ruko was reluctant as he was a friend of their guild, but Wasabi was just a little resentful about being left out of the team. So, little Ruko wanted to leave it to Wasabi-kun to decide who he wanted to challenge. Wasabi-kun worked like crazy to level up in two months and was also successfully promoted. He knew that the members of Shadow were tough opponents, but for someone in the Gadget Thief subclass, he was confident he could fight. The protagonist inquired who he wanted to challenge from Shadow. Wasabi wanted to challenge two team members. The first was Little Ruko, and the other was Ling Si, which shocked them. Wasabi wanted to fight Little Ruko because he wanted to know how much he had improved. For Ling Si, he wanted to ascertain if there were any changes in the distance between them since their last spar. Little Ruko asked him if there were any rules he wanted to impose during their battle. He didn't want to take things too far as, no matter what, Wasabi-kun was his only friend in Nebulous. Wasabi-kun clarified that there are no rules and requested him not to hold back as he will give it his all. Otherwise, the match would be meaningless. The protagonist also instructs Ruko to do as Wasabi says and go all out. Ruko decides not to hold back since that is the case. Wasabi rushed to attack him, but Ruko blocked it using his shield, giving his best. He knew that Wasabi was a thief, so his specialty should be speed, so he had to pay attention to any sudden attacks. Ruko was paying close attention to his moves, and suddenly, he found him behind using a backstab, so he turned, lifted his shield, and attacked. Ruko was shocked as that was the clone that vanished after his attack, and he couldn't muster up any strength as it was a weakening mist. Suddenly, he found Wasabi behind so he wanted to hurry and get out of the weakening mist range because it decreased his visibility and slowed his movement. He was trying his best to get out of its range, but soon, Wasabi reached near him and uttered that this was where he wanted him, so Ruko had nowhere to go. As a gadget thief, he could augment his attacks with all sorts of items and cause all kinds of unexpected effects. As Ruko's arms enlarged, Wasabi was dumbfounded, and he lifted his shield to block his attack. He was amazed by that little kid's tenacity. He should have been paralyzed on the spot for at least one second, so he wondered what was happening. Ruko gave his all and jumped up to punch him using Shield Storm Assault, which startled Wasabi as he couldn't do it on time. Ruko was thrilled and said it was his turn to attack and defeat him. After seeing Wasabi in the grasp of Ruko, the protagonist watching this battle, he assumed it might be his turn. Dark Feather was certain that Wasabi would be clear about who the victor was. Wasabi was sure that if he made any reckless moves, the only fate that awaited him was to be crushed by this huge hand, so the duel against Ruko ended in his defeat. Ruko lost his grip on Wasabi and apologized for that because once he became serious, he ended up losing his temper. Wasabi was furious to hear this, and the protagonist reminded him that it was his turn to duel against him. Tilly's appreciated Ruko as his timing was perfect back there, as he had completely disrupted the opponent's plans. Little Ruko wasn't sure if that was appropriate as it might have seriously affected his morale. Tilly's wants him not to worry as she is certain Ling Si will go at it with him for quite a while and let him experience the joy of battle. Ruko agreed, thinking the protagonist would try to drag the fight for a long time. He was sure his kind and gentle brother Ling Si would use his actions to show Wasabi-kun that his efforts were not for naught. 
they were ready to face each other, and the protagonist jumped and rushed at him. So Wasabi was fully attentive toward him. But in the blink of an eye, the protagonist reached behind him and attacked him. Meanwhile, Ling Si's clone in front of him turned an evil spirit invisibility spell, and he lost as he got into a state of fear of his spell. All of them were shocked as Ling Si defeated Wasabi Kun more directly than Ruko did, and they thought he would be kind. Wasabi Kun knelt and was hopeless as all of his effort was for nothing. What was more hurting was that he was defeated in the same manner as in the past. Wasabi thought he could close the gap with his hard work, even for a bit, but he was lying to himself all this time. The protagonist doesn't think Wasabi had to be like this. Ruko also feels bad for him. Wasabi supposed he wouldn't understand the efforts of people like him because his effort was nothing in the face of people who were blessed by the system like him. He was crying as all his effort and hard work turned out worthless as he trained hard these two months and even read some skill books. The protagonist asked if he had visited Vankifus's recently opened potion shop, which was doing well. He explained that she still hasn't done her job change mission because she has been busy managing the shop and training new employees. He knew she would probably be one of the players who would level up the lowest. Wasabi wondered what he meant by this and how it concerned him. The protagonist uttered that he didn't have to be like his and didn't have to force himself to do things just to be closer to them. They all have their strength and passion, so if Van Kaffes gave up on her alchemy passions in pursuit of magic, then he feels like they will miss out on having an all-powerful alchemist emperor in the future. The protagonist doesn't know if combat is his strong suit, but he is sure it's not something Wasabi could enjoy. Wasabi thought he enjoyed gathering and learning about all sorts of intel, but wondered what that was good for. The protagonist uttered that he needs someone on his side who is good at gathering and trading intel, which is extremely important for a team operation. He asked if Wasabi would like to do that, and he was willing to find him and wanted his help to build an intelligence network. But things like personal and whatnot were all up to him, and that startled Wasabi. He inquired if the protagonist wanted to form an intelligence network within the game. The protagonist affirmed and explained whether it's about dungeons, loots, other guilds, or even the latest news about top players. He wanted all of them, which is vital to the team in the future, so having detailed intel in their hands will make doing anything much more efficient. Their nebulous guild will have a showdown with wolf fangs in the guild-owned dungeon in a week. Although the scale of the battle wasn't that big, they heard that depraved Squirrel, their opponent and vice guild master, would also be there. The protagonist inquired if he could help him collect intel on depraved Squirrel and his team, and the more detailed it would be, the better. Although Wasabi Kun enjoys doing such things, this is too sudden to ask. The protagonist uttered that the initial funds for the intelligence team would be 50 gold coins, so he is free to call the shots, and Wasabi's eyes sparkled with greed at this offer. He turned around, snatched the gold coin from Ling Xia's hand, agreed to work for him, and assured him to wait and see if he would discover the minor details about depraved squirrel. Wasabi Kun was certain he wouldn't find anyone better than him for this task of gathering information. Ling Si looked at him and smirked as if their intelligence network covered an entire heaven land in the future. Then, as the person in charge, Wasabi's profits would be something he couldn't even imagine. Little Ruko was glad and rushed toward them, and with this deal, Wasabi Kun was also one of them. The protagonist rambled, saying that Shadow only handles battling while Van Kuffa's shop is responsible for selling and supplying potions. Now that they have Wasabi Kun, they will leave the intel gathering to him. Ling Si instructed him to take what he enjoys and develop it to new and undiscovered heights. The protagonist wasn't planning on building an intelligence network this early, but Wasabi Kun seemed to be the right man for the job. He thought that if Wasabi could supply him with useful intel, it would be a nice bonus. Ruko asked Wasabi if he felt shy, but he refused as he wasn't wary. Tillys asks the protagonist if he is trying to form a guild, and Wasabi is startled and asks if what she is saying is true. Ling Si doesn't have any plans about it now, but he doesn't know if his plan will change in the future, as it's always better to be prepared. They were all excited, and Ruko approached Ling Si and inquired if he wanted to take him along since he said they would do some level grinding. He had so many questions in his mind, so he rambled if it was a dungeon if they should go now, and if one week would be enough time for him as he was currently at level 15. 
The protagonist uttered that it was all good as the place he was going was somewhere Ruko couldn't go to yet and assured him that one week was enough for him. Ruko wondered what place he couldn't go to. Tilly's wondered how many levels he thought of gaining in one week and if he had a plan. The protagonist wasn't sure how many levels he could gain in one week, but he planned on breaking into the top 10 on the level leaderboard. Later, he sat at the cliff checking something on his system. He received 200 gold from Bancafus, and the rest went to the store's management. Starting from that day until the opening of the guild-owned dungeon, he has exactly seven days, so he has to plan out his leveling for each day properly. The protagonist knows that he will be squeezing himself dry every day for the following days. He stands as the time for him to go in arrives. He was about to depart from the human race's territory Casfado and venture into the beast man's territory, which is the zone that belongs to those who are at level 40 and above. The giant portal was one of the Casfado many zones transporters, unlike the typical portal of this sort, could send one to the territory of other races. There was a territory for each race in Heavenland, and every territory spanned over an immense area, vast distances apart, which they could only access using these portals. However, there was no level restriction on the various territories aside from a few thrill-seeking players or treasure hunters seeking valuable loot. No player is daft enough to wander in territory where even the weakest mobs can one-shot them with their current level. The protagonist was in Beast Man territory Pav Barlow and thought he could do it because when it came to this area in his previous life, he remembered he was already level 70 and was there with a team. Ultimately, he became familiar enough to write guides about it and earn a small living because he was carried so many times. The secret merchant is the protagonist's reason for coming to Beast Man territory. That's the only place he could get the essential items needed for his level grinding plan. That secret merchant was hidden in an extremely hard to find cave up in the mountains. The secret merchant was only discovered by chance in his previous life by a player being chased by monsters and had nowhere to run. He then shared it on the forum, which attracted the attention of other players. The protagonist rushed to his target location while avoiding all those monsters and knew that he had first to secure a certain quest-related item before he located the secret merchant. While avoiding being noticed by all the monsters, he reached an abandoned house by the cliff and climbed the mountain to reach it. The giant fiendish bear, who was level 69, was sleeping quietly there. He saw that bear after a long time and was amazed as the bear's size was still as nerve-wracking as ever. What Ling Si needed was inside that dilapidated house behind the menacing bear. Based on the usual pattern, he knew the bear would wake once anyone got close and lash out at the intruder in a frenzy. The protagonist was glad as this finally allowed him to use that ring. He took out a petrifaction ring that he got from a broken Buddha and remembered that at that time he had done that dungeon precisely because of this item. He wore the ring and knew that this was a one-use item with such a powerful effect, and he approached the bear. He had the complete plan in his mind of what would be his next step, and he rushed toward the use that woke the bear up, and it was furious. This was the right time for him to use his ring against that bear, which petrified the bear in its place. This was an inescapable effect of the petrification ring, which causes creatures to petrify for three seconds on players. The effect could be shortened to one second, but boss-type creatures, dragons and spirit-type monsters were immune to the petrification. The protagonist rushed inside the house. He had only three seconds, so he wanted to be as fast as possible. He immediately kicked the door, entered the house, and reached the location where the thin he was searching was. He was worried as the effect of petrification was waning. He took out the pendant of the exiled beast man researcher, and as the bear was about to attack him, he jumped out using his rope. The bear attacked him with the scarlet breath, but he avoided his attack by somersaulting in the air and reaching the cliff. The protagonist had a peaceful breath and was glad as he knew the procedure like the back of his hand and reached the cave. He was notified that he had discovered the secret merchant of the exiled Beast Man researcher. Inside the cave, the Beast Man was stunned, as it was a rare sight, and he was the first human there. The protagonist was glad because not only did he bring that Beast Man something that he would need later, but his leveling plan would also officially begin now. The Beast Man has no interest in knowing how he got there, but wants to know what interest that human could have for an eccentric fella who has lost everything and been driven out by his people. The protagonist knew he couldn't trigger the event flag if his answer didn't include the keyword exile. 
The protagonist said he had heard it and wondered why his people would exile a learned scholar. The beast man explained that this was all because those stubborn fools refused to acknowledge his hard-earned discoveries. The protagonist was glad as he triggered it, and the monster rambled that as the only beast man researcher in his clan. After completing his studies outside, he returned, but the beast man clan worships only power and might. So they labeled him as an unorthodox heretic and a deviant, and then they exiled him and his wife from the village. He was completely disheartened and apologetic that his gentle wife had to suffer with him. However, he never expected that there would be radicals in his clan who would be determined to wipe them out. Under the cover of night, they surrounded that little cliffside house that a beast man and his wife built. Then they murdered his pitiful wife, but he jumped off the cliff amidst the chaos and managed to survive because thick tree branches broke his fall. So many years have passed, but he has yet to forgive himself, nor will he ever have it in him to forgive those people. The beast man doesn't even have a memento by which he can remember his wife. He knew the pendant he gave her back then should still be in that cliffside house, but he lacked the courage to go back there. With this, the protagonist activated a hidden quest, which was the exiled beast man researcher's regrets. The beast man researcher was buried in grief and rage, and his wife's favorite pendant was still in the dilapidated house by the cliff. He was instructed to retrieve and return the pendant to the beast man researcher, and Ling Si smirked. As the protagonist expected, he triggered the hidden quest. Usually, one would look for the pendant after the pursuit had been triggered, but he had already obtained it in advance. The protagonist assured the beast man that he had his sympathy for everything that had happened to him. He uttered that he just happened to come across a house on a cliff on his way there, showed him a pendant, and requested to have a look if this is the pendant that he was speaking of. The beast man was stunned to see that he found the last memento of his wife, and Ling Si affirmed. The protagonist was pleased as all he had to do now was to hand over the pendant, which was assured fast. He handed the pendant to the beast man, who expressed his deepest gratitude to that human thief. The beast man doesn't have much to offer, but has some magic bombs that he made himself, and is sure he will find them somewhat helpful. With this, the protagonist unlocked the exiled beast man researcher's hidden shop, and the beast man sincerely hoped that his creations would come in handy to him. The protagonist thanked him, was sure they would be of great help, and was contented as finally the hidden shop he had been waiting for opened. He chose one of the items from the hidden shop, the magical bomb of shattering shards. The magic bomb the exiled beast man researcher created was a special bomb that could tremendously damage the beast man race. Perhaps it's because they contain his deep hatred for his people for betraying and expelling him. The protagonist smirked as he depended on this neat little thing for this week's leveling up, but it was expensive. There were ten in a set, and each set cost gold, and was sure that even the guild master of those big guilds would not dare to splurge like this. The notification appeared about his purchase of fifteen sets of magical bombs of shattering shards for a total of one hundred and fifty golds, but he knew these were surely worth it. Later, the protagonist reached one of the villages of the Beast Man, which was his target for leveling up and looking at the crowd from above the mountain. He was amazed to see the village of level 40 Beast Man, he picked this location for its elite rank Beast Man spawn rate. After all, he had to kill 300 elite monsters to upgrade his bone knife of the undead mercenary, and the mission notification appeared for upgrading his weapon. After upgrading the weapon, he could summon the Dominion of Mercenaries and summon three, which was for dead warriors to battle with him. He was thrilled that a weapon could summon the undead and is looking forward to it. So he just had to clear out wave after wave, then rise and repeat, so he jumped and ran in front of them to attract their attention. His first step to bait them was in progress. As there was quite a significant level gap, he couldn't lure them from up close like before. However, he had prepared a solution by bringing some pebbles with him and throwing them at the heads of the monsters. He was hitting many of them and didn't want to miss a single one, which helped him make them furious, and they all started chasing him. Since all of these monsters were chasing him, it was time for him to attack, so he jumped up from the house, retrieved his magic bomb, turned and threw it at the crowd. He wanted them to take this furry bomb, and the bomb reduced the beast man's strength to one-third while he headed into the crowd, taking advantage of this situation and killing these monsters. The notification about him killing two elite monsters with bone knife of the undead mercenary appeared. The protagonist was thrilled to kill them, and after that he leveled up, 
which contented him as his leveling up speed was so satisfying. After killing several other monsters, he leveled up multiple times, and after clearing out this wave, he decided to respawn the area and decided to do this three times a day. He had enough magical bombs of shattering shards on his hands to get at least level 30, so he was sure he would be thoroughly transformed within these next few days. With this, Ling Si has been clearing wave after wave like a madman for the past few days, resulting in a hefty boost to his level. On the fifth day, he was from level 15 to level 32. He assumed that if other players learned of his leveling rate these past few days, they might suspect that he had cheated. From a certain point of view, he knew it wasn't far off from that, but this leveling method was so satisfying. But it's getting pretty dull as he feels like he was about to develop a frozen shoulder from all the repeated bomb-throwing motions these past few days. Finally, he obtained the Beast Men Sawing Knife, which pleased the protagonist after killing the last wave. Since he had set his leveling information private, he wouldn't appear on the level ranking board. Meanwhile, several pros have also chosen to hide their information and drop out of the board. So, for now, the highest level on the ranking board was level 41, but he was sure there were players at even higher levels. The protagonist is shocked as it is barely 10th place, and he realizes he can't catch a break. Leveling became much easier after being promoted, and there was quite a heated competition regarding player levels. The competition is only going to get even more heated from now on. In addition, as players upgrade their equipment along the way, leveling rates will only be increased even further. In the completion of his mission to get the Bone Knife of the Undead Mercenary, his mission progress was 272 out of 300. Since there weren't as many elite mobs as he had anticipated, he still needed a few more. Subsequently, there were two days left till the guild-owned dungeon competition would start, so he had to obtain his first weapon upgrade. He wanted to find somewhere else and come up with a way to clear more waves because he unlocked the exiled beast man's hidden shop. He could also bring Ruko and the others to level up later. Ling Si wanted to ensure that the members of the Shadow remained at the top in terms of levels and abilities. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to stand out amidst Heavenland's sea of pros. His team still lacked highly skilled players of other classes, so he had to spend some time hunting for those. Ling Si remembers when Tilly's asked him about forming his guild as this was one of his current goals, and he has never forgotten about it even once. But if he were too slow, those leveled players would be snapped up by the major guilds or workshops, so there was so much for him to do, but it was not time yet. Later, at the Nebulous Third Division meeting room, Chiena was shocked as Ling Si jumped from level 15 to 32 within five days. She wondered how he did that as there was no way it could happen, and not even a rocket was as fast as him. The protagonist explained that he merely used the experience bonus from hunting mobs way above his level to catch up, although the process was troublesome. Tiana decided to believe him, but that was still shocking for her, and she was amazed as this guy continued to make the impossible possible. The protagonist was looking at the books, recalled something she told him earlier, and asked if it was true. He asked if the guild master Stillwater truly wants Shadow to carry out a solo mission at the guild-owned dungeon that will be opening in two days. Tiana affirmed as he had just told her about it that day, and she didn't know the details, but the guild master wanted her to give Ling Si a heads up. She guessed it might have something to do with taking control of the checkpoint station, and he wondered what she meant by this. Tiana explained that to seize Wolf Fang's guild checkpoint stations and make the entire area theirs. The protagonist was amazed as Tiana's assessments were not undergrounded. He knew they had been quietly enduring all sorts of provocations from Wolf Fangs. But he was sure that deep down, no one was willing to let things slide just like that, and the same goes for the nebulous guild Master Heart Stillwater. The protagonist uttered that if it were the case, he would be quite different from the usual skirmishes, which would be outright hostility. He was amazed as things seemed to be going to get interesting, which made Tiana furious, and she wondered what was so interesting in this. With Celestial being allied with Wolf Fangs, she was afraid that things would be extremely disadvantageous for Nebulous if they got them to carry on. The protagonist assured her that even if the sky collapses, Guildmaster Stillwater will hold it up. He said there was no need for the puny Division Three captain to worry about these things. He looked down on her division, which frustrated her as he was too short-sighted. He closed the book he was reading and tried calming her down as he was kidding with her.
Ling Si instructed her to tell him about the details of the mission when she knew about it and to convey his message to the guild master that he accepted the mission. After all, he still had accounts to settle with someone during the upcoming guild-owned dungeon so he could do the mission along the way. This startled Tiana, and she inquired if he was considering going after Wolf Fang's vice guild master, Depraved Squirrel. Tiana instructed him not to be impulsive as Depraved Squirrel was a vice guild master. She admitted that Ling Si had also improved by leaps and bounds during this period. She knew he got one over the last time, but she wanted the protagonist to understand what people say about how revenge was a cold dish. The protagonist looked at her and uttered that he didn't have the time to wait to serve it cold. Besides, he has always been the type of person to give an eye for an eye. Ling Si no longer wants to swallow insults and humiliation silently as he did in his past life. Since he had enough conversation with her, he decided to leave, and she wondered what he was up to this time. He explained that because he had to complete a mysterious mission from the guild master on top of getting his revenge on a certain someone, he wanted to improve his abilities. He instructed her to leave a message for him if she needed anything, as he would read them when he was free. Tana sighed as she couldn't do anything about him. The following day, Ling Si searched for a few elite mob spawn locations based on his memory and went with the other three members of Shadow to clear mobs above their level with some special tactics. On the one hand, it was to level his team up a bit more, and on the other side, it was for Ling Si's weapon, the bone knife of the undead mercenary. Finally, after they were exhausted from clearing waves of mobs, the entire day, the protagonist's weapon, bone knife of the undead mercenary evolved. Not only were there the slightest changes to its appearance, but its grade improved from whiteboard to bronze. Apart from the improvements in its attributes, the skill he had been looking forward to, Dominion of the Mercenary, was also finally unlocked. With this weapon in Ling Xia's hand, his big plan began the day before the launch of the guild-owned dungeon. He was to look for the spell that suited him the most in his second class as a mage, so he reached the abandoned chapel of the Vile Serpent. The spell Ling Si was looking for was the Kiss of the Vile Serpent, which was within the horrifying creature surrounding the castle. The protagonist was wearing the mask to avoid the inhalation of the poisonous aura, and he knew that this particular spell was originally specially designed for battle mages as it provided a hefty boost to agility and damage output. He lifted his dagger to be prepared because now there was no better fit than this for the dual class him who was on the path of becoming a spell thief. The protagonist activated the skill dominion of the mercenary, due to which several mercenaries appeared from the ground, and with this, his spell thief journey started. The warrior that Ling Si summoned rushed toward the serpent to attack, and the serpent also descended, trying to attack them. But the warriors reached above its head and were continuously attacking it, which made it shout because of the pain. The protagonist was glad as his spectral warriors were immune to the vile serpent's venomous aura. The protagonist commanded them to heed his order, get into a triangular formation, and attack. Taking advantage of this, the protagonist rushed away and instructed his warriors to take the giant snake away. The warriors rushed away and the snake followed them, so Ling Si praised his warriors as they successfully lured them away, giving him a chance to sneak in. After they lured it quite afar, the protagonist decided to hurry as he knew the spectral warrior of that level couldn't last for long. He rushed inside the castle and saw a skill book that was his target and got down. As he got near the stage to get the book, the lights started emitting from the stage, which startled him, and he wondered what that mechanism was. The giant snake was hovering over his head and was furious. This surprised Ling Si, so he rushed to evade its attack. He can't understand how he managed to come back so quickly. This was beyond his expectations. He only managed to obtain this in his previous life with the help of a team, so he had never paid attention to these types of details. He lifted his weapon to summon spectral warriors and commanded them to protect him as he dealt the damage. There was no time for him to waste because if his summoned spectral warriors got wiped out, he wouldn't have another chance to get close. He rushed toward the book to snatch it, regardless of whether this would work, he wanted to try it. The giant snake was chasing him, but he got the book before he could get attacked by that monster. He commanded the spectral warrior to keep the vile serpent pinned down. He rushed away while his warriors stopped the snake. He hoped to see that big snake later and rushed far away. He knew that once news of this skill book got out, plenty of battle mages would risk their lives to get their hands on it. In his life, 
Ling Si thought he should be the first person to obtain this skill, and the system asked him if he would like to learn the kiss of the vile serpent skill. He smirked because for his first spell as a spell thief, there was no better fit than this skill, and he learned this skill. Kiss of the Vile Serpent was a mage-exclusive skill, so after locking down an enemy target, the soul of the Vile Serpent will constrict the target while dealing magic damage. After locking down on a target, the player's physical attacks will continuously generate stacks of Vile Flames. When the Vile Flames is activated, the Dragonic Serpent's Kiss will rise with the ground below and deal magic, burst damage equivalent to an attack of more than 150% to the target and the surrounding area. With getting the skill book Ling Si, this mission was done, so all left was to wait for the launch of the guild-owned dungeon the next day. But he seems to have forgotten one thing if it weren't for his grandfather's wake-up call. He would have probably forgotten about reporting to school that day, but the thought of returning to school was even more nerve-wracking than logging back into the game after his regression. He reached the school and stood outside, looking at the building with whom he had no fond memories of his previous life. In his previous life, he was being bullied, humiliated, and a target of violence by those who were stronger than him. He never thought he would be back as a transfer student at third high school. However, he knew things would be completely different this time, so he wanted to re-experience this wonderful school life. Later, the protagonist writes his name on the whiteboard, greets everyone in the class, and introduces himself. He thinks things have changed because, in his past life, he was in year one, class six, but this time, he is in a different class. When the protagonist first saw class three written on the notification, he thought he would have misread it. The homeroom and language teacher Zhu Ting uttered that from that day onward, and Ling Si would be part of class three. The semester had only begun, so they had plenty of time to get to know each other. The teacher was sure that they could all get along and requested everyone to give Ling Si a warm welcome. The protagonist has no strong impression of teacher Zhu Ting from his past memories. He had only seen her a couple of times, and from what he recalled, she was a young and hard-working homeroom teacher. He remembers that this is her first year as a homeroom teacher, and she doesn't seem very familiar with this role yet. He could understand her, as it was not easy for someone so young to handle a bunch of kids at the peak of puberty. Ling Si class fellow Tang Ki inquired if he would not introduce himself properly and if he would tell them his name. He also wanted to know why he had white hair as this kind of hair is against the school rules. He was continuously staring at him and asked if it could be that Ling Si would have gotten in there through connections. The teacher was startled and requested Tang Ki not make things difficult for his new classmate and explained that Ling Si had transferred to this school because of some family circumstances. The protagonist sighed as he knew this guy because he was one of the infamous students who gave that high school a lot of trouble. It seemed there would always be one or two of such characters in every class, so he had to bear with him. The protagonist rambled, saying he enjoys leading a solitary, quiet life and gaming like everyone else. He further explained that his hair color is natural and that the school boards should know this. He told them to feel free to speak up if anyone has any more questions. Tang Ki gets furious but utters that he has more questions, but he wants to ask them later when there is a chance. Since the introduction phase had ended, the teacher instructed Ling Si to take a seat because he was transferred, so suddenly, she hoped that a seat in the back would work for now. Ling Si looked at his seat and wondered if this was the so-called infamous protagonist seat. While heading there, one of his classmates gave a sign to Tang Ki, and the student moved out his leg, thinking this might trip Ling Si and that he would have a chance to make Ling Si. But he was shocked as the protagonist remarked this was a lame trick, and with his single strike of Ling Si's foot, that guy was thrown back. Everyone was shocked, and the teacher wondered what was wrong, but the student didn't complain and said nothing. The other student was stunned and wondered what was going on with this new student as he could exert so much force when his foot landed. The protagonist gets close to him and whispers that he should thank him for holding back. Otherwise, his lackey would have suffered a bone fracture. In order to avoid any suspicion, the protagonist loudly inquired the guy if he was all right and if he wasn't sitting properly and suggested to let him help. Hearing this, the teacher assumed that her student just accidentally fell because everything was all right so she decided to resume her lesson. Tang Ki furiously clenched his teeth and assumed that the new fellow seemed a tough one to him. After school, he went home, and his grandfather was pleased to see him back and asked about his first day of school. 
His grandfather was glad to hear that it was pretty normal, so he instructed the protagonist to go ahead and take a shower as the meal would be ready in a moment because he must be hungry. He instructed Ling Si to study hard from now on because having knowledge in his belly is more important than just filling it with food. He went to shower but felt awkward as he was still unused to this renovated house. He was relaxed because, in the end, those bullies didn't come to look for him even after school. Even blind people could tell the bullies' expressions when they looked at him contained little goodwill. He wondered if they had to play out that typical bully the transfer student scenario and assumed these people had nothing better to do. But now, Ling Si no longer minded what was happening to him, rather, his current self was looking forward to such things unfolding. In his previous life, even when he was dragged to the restroom to get beaten up, he had to swallow it all. Nothing would have changed because there was no one to talk to, even if he had spoken to the teachers. All those teachers would do is scold those bullies in the office or meet their parents. After all, he wasn't a top student so that they wouldn't have gone all out for him. On the contrary, he would only have been given a more severe beating if he had done this. The reason those bullies picked on him was very simple. It was because he had no parents. So naturally, there wasn't anyone to care about Ling Si. Even the neighbors mocked him as they saw the orphan kid next door being beaten up again. Furthermore, no one was willing to befriend someone who was such a special person and the center of attention for everyone. A person like the protagonist was the perfect target to bully, be it his classmates, teachers, or neighbors. No one ever cared about him. In his current life, he wants to stand up for the Ling Si in his previous life, whether in the game or real life. He doesn't want to let others bully him again. Finally, the day arrived when the guild-owned dungeon was finally opened, and all of them were waiting outside. Little Ruko informed Ling Si as he heard that they are a little on the losing end in terms of numbers this time, specifically concerning reinforcement. Suddenly, Wasabi-kun arrived and informed them that he had received almost everything the protagonist had requested. The protagonist assured him he had faith in his information, so he instructed him to go on. Wasabi-kun said the situation looked terrible as Wolf Fangs seemed to be seriously treating the guild-owned dungeon. They have mobilized their second division members for all their reinforcement slots for the reinforcement alone. Furthermore, as they already know, the one leading Wolf Fang at the time was their vice guild master, Depraved Squirrel. This was quite a rare phenomenon. Out of all the top five guilds, only Wolf Fang sent out someone at the guild master level to lead their team. The protagonist questioned if he could find out anything about Wolf Fang's vice guild master goals. Wasabi affirmed that while he can't precisely conform to the accuracy of the information, he thinks it should be accurate. From what he heard, Depraved Squirrel has had a sudden surge in power. In addition, he has secretly established a team called Black Hunt. The members of all the elites from their first division and his goal this time should be to seize the other three checkpoint stations owned by Nebulus in one fell swoop. Thus, to gain complete control over the dungeon resources, which shocked Jana, the protagonist wonders if this is a coincidence. One hour before the opening of the guild-owned dungeons, Jana called him, and he wondered what was the matter. But Tiana thought he was an idiot and worriedly requested him to come with her, and she led him somewhere. He inquired where they were going as he was not done with the delegations yet, and finally they reached the place. Nebulous Guild Master Hart Stillwater was waiting for him and was glad to see Ling Si there. He apologized for making him come there while he was still busy. The Guild Master requested him to have a seat, but he refused and was irritated as this was the type he was worst at dealing with. The Guild Master asked him about their chances of victory at the Guild-owned dungeon, this time which startled Ling Si. The protagonist wondered why he was asking him random questions like that out of the blue, as there was no way he would waste his time thinking about such lame things. The guild master knew Nebulus's outlook was not very good this time because their guild was still ranked dead last among the top five guilds. So he wanted to ask Ling Si, if he were the guild master, what he would think their chances of victory for this dungeon. The protagonist judged the situation by their current strength so he gave it a 4-6 probability between Nebulous and Wolf Fang. However, that was only under the ideal circumstances, as Wolf Fang's was currently ranked third. Since that was the case, the guildmaster asked for his opinion on what they should do in such a situation. The protagonist wondered why he would ask him such a question, but because that was the case, he suggested he would purposely avoid large-scale battles and focus on securing an advantage using their elite forces. 
He would gather their strength and avoid confrontation, which is something like what he would do. The guild master appreciated the protagonist as this was a pretty perceptive analysis, and now he had even higher expectations for Shadow. The protagonist thanked him for his appreciation, but the guild master uttered that his method would be straightforward if he had asked him. The guild master method would be never to compromise, never to retreat, and to keep fighting until the end. After all, they have yet to see the sight from the highest point, so he wanted to ask Ling Si for help. The guild master uttered that, just as they had said, their shadow was their elite team. He needs Ling Si to lead Shadow to seize Wolf Fang's outer checkpoint station for this dungeon. So he wanted Shadow to work with their comrade, who would be attacking from the inside to surround them, and take over the three checkpoint stations under Wolf Fang's control in one fell swoop. The protagonist wasn't that surprised as this was the same as what Tiana predicted, but leaving it to Shadow is something that wasn't quite right. The protagonist asked the guild master that from what he knew, he was sure Shadow was only one of the many elite teams at his disposal. So, leaving this up to an independent team like Ling Si wouldn't worry him, but he was shocked when he saw the guild master smiling. The protagonist figures out the reality behind all this and is amazed as guild master Stillwater is prudent. He understood everything and accepted the mission, so he decided to leave and wanted to talk about it later. Behind the wall, Coco Lai was standing and witnessing all the situation and remarked that Ling Si should have realized his intentions by now as he is brilliant. Ling Si gives the guild master a strange feeling, and he appears to be all-knowing, yet he throws himself into chaos. He wanted to use this opportunity to properly assess whether it concerned his competence or his loyalty to the guild and wanted to see if Ling Si deserved his trust. On their way, Tana was amazed that her guess was correct, but she wondered if Ling Si wasn't mad, as he said the guild master was trying to test his competence and loyalty. The protagonist wonders why he should be mad. He doesn't care about it because it doesn't interfere with his original plan. He had already stayed in Nebulous because of all the help Tiana had given him all along, so there was nothing insincere about him being there. Tiana was shocked to hear this, and the protagonist instructed her to follow him as the dungeon was about to open, so he didn't want to waste his time there. The notification appeared as the guild-owned dungeon. The battle for resources begins now. The protagonist leaves it to Tiana and her team to fight for the resources and instructs Shadow to follow him. Ling Si didn't expect that their mission would be the same as that of Depraved Squirrel and wanted to see who would be the one to seize all the checkpoint stations in the end. All the teams were heading inside the dungeon. Meanwhile, Shadow was observing them from afar. The protagonist knew that Wolf Fang's checkpoint station 4 was right ahead, so he instructed his team to follow him as they went directly to the back. The people that Wasabi Kun bribed will be waiting for them there, and they are on shift right now and will open the back door to enter the checkpoint station. Tilly's was surprised as she thought they would have to fight their way in and found the situation boring. After hearing what she said, the protagonist furiously stared at her and clarified that once the dungeon officially opened, every checkpoint station would have a total of high-level players. They are all on a completely different level than those they encountered in the previous skirmishes. With their current gear, Ling Si inquired if she was confident the four could take down about a hundred or more of such players. Still, she didn't understand him and rambled as she thought the players in the checkpoint stations would be rushing in to fight for resources. She had never participated in the guild-owned dungeon before, so she didn't know things would be like that. Little Ruko explained that these checkpoint stations outside the guild-owned dungeons serve two functions. They act as respawn points for players who die in the dungeon. Secondly, they serve as the landing point for the new arrivals who have been sent as reinforcement. The protagonist explained that the dungeon was a battleground for both sides, and the resources that had been successfully obtained could be exchanged for glory points for the guild. The higher the guild glory points, the richer their reward is, but they will not participate in the battle for the resources this time. Still, it sounds like a pain to Tilly's. Ruko uttered that while Brother Ling Si was still stuck in his job change mission, he had run a few smaller scaled guild-owned dungeons with other folks from the guild. The bigger the scale of the guild-owned dungeon, the more checkpoint stations will be there. But he wondered if Ling Si planned to reach their destination from within the Wilf Fang's grounds. The protagonist affirmed and said they could call it a shortcut from within the ground of their opponent guild's checkpoint station 4 they could get to the outskirts of the dungeon in the shortest possible time. 
The mission assigned to Shadow was to infiltrate Wolf Fang Checkpoint Station 1, which is on the outermost side. The main lead plan was to avoid confrontation and sneak in from the cliffs, which would have been very effective. Dark Feather found it interesting that seizing all the checkpoint stations was like declaring war between two guilds. The protagonist was also excited as he knew that Wolf Fangs would probably not be worried at all as they were the number third guild. They don't seem afraid to fight back if they lose their stations. If Nebulous does seize them, all Wolf Fangs will have more substantial grounds to declare war with them. Tilly's remarked that guilds are a pain and workshops are much more straightforward as they do whatever job is available. If there are no jobs, they grind dungeons for loot, so all these schemes are a headache to her. The other two were hearing her quietly, and the protagonist instructed them to be prepared as they would go down to Station 4 ground and try to stay hidden as much as possible. They jumped toward the entrance but were notified that the back door could not be opened for unaffiliated members. The protagonist pressed the code that Wasabi Kun and the other party agreed upon, and the door was unlocked. The warrior from inside asks if he is the comrade who had gotten the wrong door, but the protagonist refuses and utters that the warrior of love has come. The protagonist was furious at Wasabi Kun as he selected an idiotic secret code for this and assumed he might have done this on purpose. Tilly's laughed behind this strange secret code while Ruko and Dark Feather were speechless. The opponent player confirmed that it was the correct code, so he reached out to get the rest of what they had agreed on and gave him the passage. The protagonist handed him the pouch, and they rushed inside while the warrior instructed them to get in and keep hidden. After they rushed away, the player they bribed from Wolf Fang smirked wickedly. The protagonist was startled on his way when he heard someone wondering how many of them would be coming. They were surrounded by so many of the opponent warriors, and Tilly's assumed that Long Si Wasabi Kun got screwed over and was fooled by them, and he also thought the same way. The man who let them enter stood behind the opponent leader, laughing and calling them fools. He explained that he decided to play along with them when that guy approached him and remarked that they were just a bunch of idiots who were trying to mess with wolf fangs. Their leader pitied them as there were just four of them, and she couldn't believe the fifteen were waiting there just for these stupid. She was glad they didn't inform the others in their guild, as it would be such an embarrassment for them. Wolf Fang's soldiers wanted them to be grateful as they treated those four nebulous nobodies well, and all lifted their weapons as a warning sign. The protagonist stared at them ferociously and was pleased to know the good news that they didn't inform the others because things would get tricky if there were more of them. The female mage leader from Wolf Fang's gets furious, and one of the soldiers ponders as those four seem somewhat familiar. The Dark Feather informs the protagonist that he will seek a good vantage point for him, and Ling Si affirms and instructs him to take care of anyone who tries to escape. Dark Feather used the skill of Scattering Crow, a post-promotion skill of his. It was an archer's exclusive skill with which he could vanish into thin air for six seconds, just like a crow scattering in the air and disappearing, but when attacked, the skill's casting would be interrupted. Their opponent leader pointed at them, inquired what they were discussing, and asked if they were trying to let at least one teammate escape. She thought they were naive and instructed her comrades to pay attention to them and not let the one who turned invisible slip away. The Wolf Fangs member remembered them as those four were from that team that had made waves previously and wondered what that team was called. His leader wondered what he was talking about and what he was about making the waves. Tilly's thought it was only natural for them not to recognize them as they hadn't been showing their face after rushing the team leaderboard. The opponent's leader wondered who they were, and her teammate recalled now that Ling Si was the thief from Nebulous Team Shadow. The protagonist stared at him and rushed and attacked him in the blink of an eye, and they were shocked. The opponent leader was so shocked as he was so fast, and her teammates were worried that they were Nebulous Shadows, so they wanted to kill them immediately. The opponent leader was shocked wondering where the thief had vanished. Suddenly, she felt the bullet being shot at her, so she moved back and dodged it. They were worried as they saw Dark Feather high above at the corner of the wall and alerted others as they got ambushed by the archer who just vanished a moment ago. Dark Feather aimed at them and shot the players trying to escape. Tilly's attacked them using her flame attribute magic. They were instructed to make it quick and leave no one standing, so Tilly's and Ruko aimed at their target. The opponent leader was still shocked and wondered where that voice came from. So she instructed her teammates to find that thief immediately without knowing he was right behind her. 
the protagonist whispered in her ear that he was right close to her, which left her speechless. Soon, there was a massive explosion in that area due to Tilly's magic flames, and she remarked that they were all so slow. She commented that their casting speed wouldn't work. She was startled when she heard someone moaning. She looked behind where the protagonist was attacking the leader of their opponent's team. Some wolf fang soldiers appeared to protect their captain and instructed the cleric to hurry up and heal her. Half of her HP was reduced, and she furiously clenched her teeth while recovering her HP and using the energy barrier. Energy barrier was a mage skill that could be cast without staff, and the magical energy was gathered within the body and released at one go to repel all surrounding enemies, as well as create a high defensive magic shield that will last for 15 seconds and is an excellent life-saving skill. That protagonist was ashamed to know she was the captain as he couldn't one-shot her. The protagonist instructed her team members to refrain from using flashy skills lest they attract more people. The opponent captain was furious and cursed them as they dared to ambush them and instructed her comrades to surround them. One of her teammates rushed behind Ling Si and attacked him, but the protagonist sensed his presence. So, the protagonist turns and blocks his opponent's attack, giving him a critical hit and subjugating him. They decided to surround them and attack. But firstly, they wanted to focus on the thief as he was the most agile. Two of them surround the protagonist and want to kill him, but before they can attack him, they get electrocuted by someone and can't understand what's happening to them. The electro-binding skill of Dark Feather stops them, and the protagonist looks at him and is amazed that he has learned this skill. Wolf Feng team captain wondered what their archer was doing as they should hurry up and take down that gunner who was continuously aiming and attacking them. Her comrade informed her that the gunner range was too far away. His position was so high up, which was why they couldn't find a good position to attack from in such a short time. But she doesn't care about all those insubstantial excuses and instructs them to hurry up and find a way to take down that gunner. One of the archers found the spot from where they could reach him, so he retrieved his arrow and instructed her fellows to watch him shoot that gunner down. He was about to throw his arrow toward Dark Feather. But before this could happen, Ruko rushed at him and clarified that he wouldn't give him that chance. Using gravitational swirl phase one, he made a considerable tornado that revolves around a man and most of the material in the surroundings. Soon, Ruko transformed into his giant form, shocking his opponents, who wondered why that thing was growing. They were shocked to see a giant man and wondered if it was a monster, but soon, that man's body was captured by Ruko's gravitational swirl. The man was shocked as his body wasn't listening to him anymore, and he wondered what skill he used. On the other side, the opponent captain inquired if he thought she was the captain for nothing and instructed Ruko to let her people go. She jumped to attack him using her skill, the Song of Clean Song, which was a mage-exclusive skill. It summons a diamond-shaped barrier that can recover all the crowd control effects. The barrier will disappear after one second if any damage is taken during the procedure. The protagonist realizes that Wolf Fang's captain is trying to interrupt little Ruko, so he stops her. When he looked at the Dark Feather, he was already giving a sign to Tilly's and whispered that he would break her barrier, so the rest was up to her, and she understood it. The protagonist was glad to see them strategizing and wanted to see how they would handle this situation. Dark Feather aimed at the opponent captain's barrier and broke it, and taking advantage of this, Tilly's rushed behind her. The captain uttered that even if her barrier were broken, she wouldn't be affected by the gravity swirl, so that they couldn't interrupt her casting. She was startled when she heard Tilly's voice asking her if that was the case, and she attacked her, thus interrupting the opponent captain's spell casting. Using the flaming ring of the judgment, she attacked her and wished her to fall into the swirl and receive the judgment of these flames. Ruko and Tilly's worked together, achieved the combined skill of the flaming gravitarian swirl of judgment, and attacked her. This was the combined skill in which the flames were tempered by gravity and contained the blazing ring of judgment that would rise above the disrespectful. The captain was burning due to their skill effect, and with excruciating pain, she instructed her comrades who were left to hurry and call for reinforcement. Soon, she died as Dark Feather put the bullet straight in her head and apologized as he couldn't let her do as she wished. So they all worked together and defeated them, which astonished the protagonist. He wondered when they had learned to use combined skills, as Ling Si expected of the top players from his previous life. The combined skill was all about timing because being too fast or slow would ruin everything. 
he was contended as three of his teammates were growing much faster than he had imagined. The protagonist was sure that the heights shadow would reach in the future were perhaps something he could not foresee anymore. The protagonist didn't want his growth to be slower than his team members, so he knew he had to work harder. Conversely, in the guild-owned dungeon's battle for resources, everyone broke the gems and tried to get more resources than others. Chana led her team members from Nebulous and instructed Team 6 to go to the front. She instructed all squad to listen up that they had taken damage, so they should retreat and heal up, and instructed clerics to prioritize healing the tanks. Dira was worried as the wolf fangs were replenishing their reinforcement at a much faster rate than them. She was sure that at this rate, they would be slowly pushed out of the areas they controlled. On top of that, the average level of wolf fang members was higher than theirs, so she wondered why they weren't deploying their reinforcements from the second division. Tiana tried to calm Dira as she had considered all of this, so they had to do their best to stand their ground before revealing their second division reinforcement. Suddenly, one of the opponents attacked Chana. Still, Dira saw this and attacked him using the skill Earth Quacking Slice as she didn't want to let him lay a finger on her. She rushed toward Chana, got behind her, inquired if she was all right, and uttered that her mission was to protect her, not her position. Tiana blushed and wondered what she was doing, so Dira explained that she was their captain and that without her they would lose the backbone of this team. She asked if she didn't protect her and who else she should protect had to protect her then. So, it's her duty to keep Tiana safe, otherwise she would be held responsible for this. Tiana instructed Dira to get behind her shield and she hoped they could hold on until they received the Ling C signal. Before the opening of the guild-owned dungeons, the protagonist judged from the guild master's intentions that the battle depended on the synergy between Shadow and the division Tiana commands. The protagonist requests her to promise him that before receiving his signal, she should limit her encounters with wolf fangs to inner skirmishes and not reveal their actual strength. Then, they will surprise them in the final critical moment with a wave of coordinated assault. When that time came, if the forces of wolf fangs collapsed, Ling Si was sure they could take them down in one go and seize all of their checkpoint stations. Meanwhile, they were near checkpoint station 5, Ruko thought they had at least attracted the attention of some of Wolf Fang's people. But in the end, they got out quite smoothly. Tilly's instructed him to quiet down, or else they would be discovered. The protagonist instructs both to be quiet as they are on the outskirts of Station 5. There were many Wolf Fang people around, so they would be in trouble if they did get their attention. The protagonist commanded them to follow him as they head out from Station 4, past Stations 5 and 6, and then go straight to the cliff's edge. Dark Feather inquired if Ling Si was sure they could get into Station 6 via the cliff there. He wasn't sure where he got his information from but asked if he had tried it out. Even though the protagonist hasn't tried it out, he is sure it works. He bet no one else has discovered this method yet. Tilly's always wanted to ask him where he got these unusual strategies from, as he always seems to be able to come up with unexpected solutions. She wondered if he had some secret connections and if someone was leaking details to him in private. The protagonist uttered that they should browse the forums of Ten, pay attention to the official write-ups on dungeon maps, and spend loads of time in the Heavenland library. That way, they all could think of unconventional ideas. Three of them were speechless upon hearing this. The protagonist apologized to them in his thoughts as he couldn't tell them that he was a regressor. He explained that it was all about research because it was almost time to leave, so he instructed them to follow him while they were confused. They hid behind while checking the areas to progress further, and they rushed and jumped inside. On their way, they saw the two guild members fighting with each other, and they appeared before them and were defeated. The protagonist asks Dark Feather, who was searching the area, if they have lost them. Dark Feather clarified that no one was behind them. So Ling Si instructed them to be prepared, and then they would go around via that cliff. Ruko sighed as they were finally there, that was tiring, and he looked at the cliffside and was relaxed as there was no one around. This was their chance, so they headed there as no one was guarding the cliffside. But as they moved forward, his foot touched the magical trap specially set for them. Ling Si was shocked to see a rune trap. They had already stepped inside the trap. Those triggered Rune's prison, so Ling Si instructed them to retreat. Contact-based Rune Prison, an item-based spell, is a hidden spell that will be triggered upon contact. This higher-level spell was a proud invention of the legendary wizard Durant. 
the rune prison has to be continuously channeled by two mages to be maintained, if either mage is interrupted, the spell will be cancelled. The imprisoned targets could not use their skills and the maximum duration was six minutes. The protagonist immediately rushed back using his top time and thus managed to get out of it. The protagonist was shocked, wondering when they were spotted as it was impossible because there was no way they had been followed. Dark Feather also confirmed that. So he figured out someone must have set this up in advance and he was startled as he heard someone's voice. The Vice Guild Master of Wolf Fang, Depraved Squirrel wondered why it was the four of them again and supposed that he would have to teach a lesson to them again. The protagonist looks up and is shocked to see Depraved Squirrel at the cliff. Ling Si figures out it must be him and looks at the people behind him. The protagonist understood everything and wondered a few moments ago when his black hunt would show up. Depraved Squirrel believed that people should all clearly understand their limitations. He only let Ling Xia's team off last time because he didn't want to drive them all into a corner. The protagonist was amazed and asked if he said he didn't want to drive them to a corner. Depraved Squirrel said that's right, as they were so easy to guess, so there was no challenge. It seemed to him that Nebulous was running low on pro players, seeing that they had to resort to the likes of them. Depraved Squirrel sighed as he knew Nebulous was up to something, so he guessed he should strike at least the defended border. He didn't think he would be suitable and decided to make it simple as he didn't want to waste time on such trivial things. Wolf Fang's vice guild master decided to give them all one chance, drop their equipment and scram. One of his men smirked and uttered that they, the Black Hunt, would spare their lives this way. The protagonist furiously stared at them and uttered that he was not the one whom they were insulting. Instead, they were humiliating his whole team's shadow. Ruko was furious and decided to leave the interruption of their mages at their leader, Ling Si. Black Hunt was amazed to hear this and remarked that they all talk big. Their mage uttered as she wasn't sure if Squirrel noticed this. She spoke that the thief managed to evade the contact-based rune prison, and this sort of reaction speed was a little unexpected. They knew that contact-based rune prison was a skill with a cast time of one second, even though he could escape from the skill range. This was nothing to be surprised by depraved squirrel as they portably cast it a little off target just now, or it might just be his dumb luck. It could be that, or he was prepared beforehand, otherwise he couldn't have that speed. The vice guild master was shocked as he looked ahead, but could spot Ling Si there as he had already rushed away and headed toward the mage. Depraved squirrel noticed him and instructed the black hunt to be in a defensive stance. He was stunned by this thief's speed, Black Hunt rushed there to protect the mage while blocking the protagonist from attacking using their shield. One of the members of Black Hunt immediately rushed behind Ling Si and attacked him, but he noticed earlier. The protagonist pushed himself back using his opponent's shield and ran away. He was amazed as he expected from the number 3 guild elite team as they had switched to a defensive stance so quickly. The protagonist asks Depraved Squirrel if he is saying that his speed was just dumb luck and asks why he didn't have a look and see if what was coming next was something that could be achieved by just luck. Depraved Squirrel was shocked and asked if he was threatening him, and he called Ling Si a loser as he was the one he had bested before and instructed his man to kill him. The Black Hunt rushed toward him and one of the men used a bird tracer and wondered how a mere thief of Nebulus dared to act so fearlessly in front of them. Bird Tracer was a thief-exclusive skill. By tracing the calls of the birds, the user of this skill will speed up after locking onto their target. Their first subsequent attack will deal three times the damage and will last for two seconds. Other members of Black Hunt were shocked to see that their thief fellow got the protagonist first. The thief attacked Ling Si and was glad, but his happiness soon turned into shock as that wasn't a person but an evil spirit that started haunting him. He was trapped inside it and wondered when he made a clone while the protagonist rushed away while attacking others. Depraved Squirrel was surprised as he seemed to have improved this time and instructed his men to block him. One of his men rushed toward him and continuously attacked him, and he was shocked by the frequency of Ling Si attacks and how their blades caught him. The man can't believe he is being pushed back and knows that Ling Si might intentionally not give him time to use his skills but he doesn't want the protagonist to forget that he has his teammates to back him up, and he instructs his comrade behind Ling Si to get him off. The warriors attacked the protagonist using their skills, crashing Sword Ripple and Sword Edge Shadow. 
The protagonist thought it was convenient for him as both were attacking him at once, so he jumped up and, using rapid shadow thrust, rushed behind them to attack the mage. The mage instructed them to look behind them as she found the protagonist, and they were shocked. The man wondered if he was taking advantage of the Zeno three seconds of invulnerability from rapid shadow thrust to evade targeted skills like crashing sword ripple. The protagonist then successfully cancelled rapid shadow thrust to follow up damage, and the protagonist smirked. They wondered if using Zon three seconds to coincide with the exact moment when the damage of crashing sword ripple is dealt with and wondered if that is even possible. Depraved Squirrel wasn't much impressed because, as he expected, it's still the micro-movement of top time like their last encounter. He wanted to see if the protagonist had improved and called him a loser, and Ling Si appeared before him. Depraved Squirrel was turning into something dark and said the result would be the same. Using his shadow snake technique, his body turned into a dark shadow, which rushed toward Ling Si to attack. The protagonist is startled as he suddenly gets ambushed by him, and depraved squirrel wonders if his top time is only good for dodging, or if he is trying to tell him this was all Ling Si got. Black Hunt members thought their boss squirrel was toying with Ling Si as he wasn't using any skills, but instead he was imposing the way that the thief exerted pressure on them. They assumed their opponent thief wouldn't be able to stand up to their boss squirrel as he could only defend. Depraved Squirrel was suspicious, so he wondered if his attacks pressured him to counter. He could flawlessly dodge every one of Depraved Squirrel's attacks. As he expected from top time, these attacks weren't enough to make Ling Si slip up. Since this was the case, he wanted to use something more terrifying, but Ling Si looked at him, smirked, and thanked him for getting him there, as this was where he wanted to be. Depraved Squirrel was shocked as he realized something was wrong. He had been so focused on him this entire time that he hadn't even noticed that Ling Si had been leading him around from this distance. They reached close to the mage, which worried her, and she called her boss, but soon the protagonist attacked her using the skill Throat Slasher. Depraved Squirrel was shocked to know that he was toying with him all this time to bring him there. The protagonist successfully interrupted the mage casting and clarified that if he hadn't done that, then Depraved Squirrel wouldn't have lowered his guard enough for him to get close. The second mage worriedly reported to her boss that she couldn't maintain the spell independently so that the prison would dissipate. Depraved Squirrel cursed the protagonist and Ling Si apologized to him for not taking him seriously just now, but now they can. All of the protagonist's team members were freed from the magic prison and gathered around him, and he instructed Shadow to pay them back a thousandfold. Depraved Squirrel directed the Black Hunt to slaughter them, so they rushed at them. The mage attacked them with azure flames of destruction, but Ruko protected himself using the golden shield. The mage was startled as Tilly's appeared behind her. She uttered that if she wanted to play with fire, she should take it up with her and instructed them to leave the mages at her. Dark Feather has taken an interest in fighting thieves, so he decided to fight those two thieves. Meanwhile, the Ruko smirked and his eyes shone brightly. He transformed into his giant form and wanted them to leave the warriors to him and attack them. The protagonist smiled as it seemed they had all selected their target, so he settled the score with Depraved Squirrel. Soon, the battle commenced, and all of them were fighting their chosen targets. The thief used the invisibility spell and couldn't believe an archer would send himself to the chopping block. He was amazed at his arrogance and wondered where this glass cannon archer got the courage to challenge them who were thieves and not just one but the two of them. He whispered to his fellow thief to work together and use backstab on that idiot simultaneously as he was certain they could one-shot him like that. One of the thieves landed near Dark Feather to attack, but Dark Feather smirked as he found him and shot him, thus cancelling the thief's invisible status. The thief was shocked as this was impossible and wondered how he was able to detect the both of them at the same time. Dark Feather uttered that hunting them down was a piece of cake, and he doubted they would know this, but to him, the most important thing for an archer is good vision. Dark Feather's eye shined as he used his Starlet Golden Eye, an exclusive archer skill. With this skill, the user's pupil is transformed into golden eyes, thus massively boosting the user's perceptiveness and ability to observe for a short duration. No manner of disguise or invisibility could hold from these eyes, its duration was 60 seconds. The protagonist looked around and said the situation was getting busy, so he called Depraved Squirrel to capture his attention. He said it was about time they settled the score too. 
Depraved looked at him and smiled as it seemed that Ling Si had also made some progress. The protagonist takes his initial stance to fight and clarifies that his improvement could be much more than Squirrel could imagine. He rushed toward depraved Squirrel to attack him, as this was the time for the showdown. Conversely, Coco Lai inquired about the guild master Stillwater's opinion on whether Ling Si could complete the mission. She thought if their intel were accurate, Ling Si's shadow would be up against rather the nasty opponent, depraved Squirrel. She didn't know he would have gone and put together his own elite team, Black Hunt. But from what she could infer from their intel, the six members of the Black Hunt were from Wolf Fang's first division, and the guild master Stillwater wondered what it was. Coco Lai uttered that Stillwater have left an extremely crucial step to Ling Si because if his plan fails, it will directly affect the outcome of the entire operation. Although Ling Si showed promise, she was afraid because he was up against a tough opponent this time. She can't even say that he has been able to defeat the current depraved squirrel himself. She asked Stillwater if he knew what dungeon depraved squirrel had been grinding these past few days, it was the dark crevasse of the depths. This dungeon has been said that a powerful skill can be obtained for that dungeon, as the official introduction was rather vague, so the exact details aren't known. The drop rate of this dungeon was so low that no one has obtained it yet, but depraved squirrel has formed a few teams to run it over a hundred times, so she doesn't even know if he has it. The guild master Stillwaters thought it would be even more of a challenge for Ling Si after hearing about the dungeon dark crevasse of the depth. Coco Lai was stunned and remarked that he was making her look like a fool for being worried. She couldn't understand why the guild master had so much confidence in him. The guild master asked her if she remembered what he had told her when he invited her to join Nebulous. She thought for a while and uttered that she surely remembered his words as no one could forget such shocking words. Coco Lai recalled that the guild master asked her if she would assist him in his search for a truly capable leader who is a leader that could surpass that man. She uttered that he said he wanted to find a leader who could surpass him, and at first she thought he was just all talk. After all, the man he was talking about is the guild master of the number one guild, Divine Chamber Kaiser Storm Mountain. Coco Lai didn't know what kind of spell he cast over her back then to make her agree in a daze and want to forget about it. The guild master clarified that he had never been the type to be all talk as he thought Coco Lai should know what he has been like since childhood. Coco Lai gets annoyed and rambles that it's not like she is his super duper close childhood friend or anything. But he didn't say that and was amazed that she hadn't changed. She got so worked up every time he brought up their childhood. The guild mater always sought the so-called view from the top, but he knew he lacked the capabilities to achieve that himself. At least concerning the number one guild master, Storm Mountain, he will never be his match, whether in Heavenland or in real life. Storm Mountain has been much better than him since they were kids. Coco Lai was startled and clarified that is not what she thinks. The guild master thought there was no better proof than that Storm Mountain could make the Thousand Autumn the number one guild of Heavenland. In the beginning, he gave it his all in hopes of surpassing him one day, but after a while, he changed his mind. The guild master thought that if he couldn't surpass Storm Mountain, he could use his abilities to search for one who could do so. He was certain that if he could find an even more capable leader, they would be able to bring him to the view from the top, or perhaps somewhere higher than that. Coco Lai was shocked and inquired if he was saying that Ling Si was the one he had been searching for. The guild master doesn't know as he wasn't sure about this. He had seen some recordings of Ling Si and his shadow in combat on the forum. He knew that Ling Si might not be the best in terms of skills, but he could see that possibility from his gaze. His expression wasn't something that they could see on an average person, and Coco Lai wondered what gaze as it sounded so strange, and Stillwater uttered it was an undying will. Meanwhile, the protagonist rushed toward Depraved Squirrel and attacked him, but he blocked it using his dagger. Depraved Squirrel was thrilled as it was a rare opportunity to be up against someone with top time. It's even rarer for it to be someone of the same class, so the situation was interesting for him. He saw the protagonist attacking him and remarked it was good thinking. Still, he used his skill in rapid comprehension and piercing through his evil spirit. He rushed behind Ling Si. He had already seen through the protagonist's evil spirit's invisibility, which shocked Ling Si as he managed to read his moves. The protagonist attacked depraved squirrel behind him, who turned into an evil spirit, and his opponent reminded him that he was not the only one with evil spirit invisibility. The protagonist figures out he is behind him, 
so he rushes back and dodges his strike before he can get attacked. Depraved Squirrel laughed and appreciated him as his skills weren't bad. He blocked his attack and attacked the protagonist using the bullet velocity. This skill was usable by all classes and a basic attack was launched at the traveling speed of bullets. Although it seems like a basic attack familiar to everyone, it can still turn the tide at a critical moment. The protagonist was shocked, as expected from the vice guild master of wolf fangs, his top time also seems to have improved a lot. Depraved Squirrel rushed toward him and commented that it seemed that things would turn out to be the same as last time. He thought Ling Si could come up with something to surprise him with in all the time that's passed. He smirked as if it were still hard for Depraved Squirrel to land a killing blow on someone with top time. He wanted to get over this quickly and took out a weapon he wanted to show Ling Si, as this was the treasure he had obtained from the dark crevasse of the depths. The protagonist wondered if it was that skill, and his opponent used the brilliance of gazing into the crevasse, which caused a third eye to appear on his forehead. Depraved Squirrel wanted to end the protagonist with this move, which would be a gift to him. All of them were fighting when suddenly their attention was captured by the appearance of dark red energy from the area where Ling Si and Depraved Squirrel were fighting, and they wondered what this was. Little Ruko also saw this bright light, but had a bad feeling about it. At the same time, their opponents were thrilled to see their boss Squirrel's new skill, the brilliance of gazing into the crevasse. The opponent's thief knew that their boss Squirrel would be using that move, and they were honored to be able to see it in action. The brilliance of gazing into the crevasse was a warrior and thief exclusive skill, which is a power that stems from the darkness of the crevasse. The eyes of Asura will grant the user a greater range of vision, enhancing their agility and perception. The unsettling power of darkness will shape their hands and aid the user in battle, doubling all damage dealt. The bold power of darkness has existed since immemorial, and it is said that all who seek to grasp it will eventually be left crippled by fear. Dark Feather was also concerned that the situation wasn't looking good for Ling Si because they would eventually lose if he lost the match against the depraved squirrel. The opponent's thief remarked as they could see that their boss squirrel wanted to get this over quickly, so they also didn't want to embarrass him and planned to defeat Dark Feather quickly too. But that was assuming for Dark Feather, as he knew they could not do that. He turned around, aiming his gun at them. He continuously shot them using the Silver Blossom Rainstorm. The thieves protected themselves using the bladed shield and instructed his fellow to get behind him. Dark Feather went far away, aiming at them using his sniper. He wanted them to watch him break their shield. Suddenly, one thief appeared close to him and attacked him while he tried to attack him back. On the other side, the mages were ganging up against Tilly's, and they wondered how dare that cheeky little thing try to stand against them, and they didn't want her to think they would just let that slide. Tilly smirked and wanted them to remember every single word that they had said. She separated her weapon and, using the mana materialization form of her fist, covered her fist with mana and uttered that she would make them pay for what they said. The warriors were trying to defend themselves against the massive and destructive attacks of Ruko. They can't even understand what he is because if it is an illusory skill, then it is not possible for it to last for that long. With that physique and explosive power, other than those deviants in their guilds, they wondered if anyone could even get a scratch on Ruko. One of the warriors thought it was not an imaginary skill as he had never seen anything like this before and praised Ruko as he had such tarrying strength. Ruko found it embarrassing and asked if this was all the warriors of Wolf Fang's first division were capable of, and he thought there would be something to look forward to. This infuriated the warrior, and he rambled that he was shooting his mouth off just because he had that physique and strength. He remarked that he hasn't crossed paths with their guild's deviant because Ruko will be unrecognizable after they are done with him. He challenged him to fight them without transforming, but little Ruko wasn't dumb as he wouldn't shrink back down to fight them. He lifted his hand and asked if they thought they had time to spare, and he broke the ground after a single punch. He lifted many of the stones to form a shield and uttered that because they couldn't satisfy his desire for a good fight, he wanted to finish them off and fight with his teammates. Depraved Squirrel looked at his teammates and remarked that he had to admit that the teammates that Ling Si found were pretty interesting. The protagonist affirmed that they were beyond his expectations and selected the mage option from his status bar. He suggested that Depraved Squirrel take care of himself first, but his opponent thought there was no need. 
depraved squirrel believed that he alone was enough to take on the four of them as this match would end like the last time. He rushed to attack the protagonist, the mage sign appeared on Ling Xia's forehead, and he guessed he would have to try this out on depraved squirrel. The vice guild master of wolf fangs was shocked to see an additional sign on his forehead and wondered what it was. The protagonist thought he would have to use his grand debut as a spell thief on depraved squirrel. On the contrary, Tiana was instructing the 6th Division to maintain their formation and move forward. She suddenly received the protagonist's message that it was time for them to move forward. This made Tiana happy as Ling Xia's plan finally worked, and she requested everyone listen to her attentively. She instructed them to withdraw from the battlefield and come with her to attack Wolf Fang's checkpoint station. After activating the mage attribute skill, the energy was emitted from his head, and they wondered if Ling Si had some skill that enhanced his attributes like their boss, Squirrel. Dark Feather looked at him and smiled as he was wondering what sort of trump card he had that they didn't know about. Tilly's was excited as she had a good feeling about this. Ruko was also delighted as he could see that Ling Si was finally getting serious. The protagonist was thrilled as he had been waiting for this day for too long, and depraved Squirrel rushed at him to attack. The protagonist saw him so attacked first, making depraved Squirrel think he was insolent. Depraved Squirrel grabbed his dagger and apologized about his forearms. While diverting his attention toward himself, he tried to attack the protagonist, who was being concealed, but his attack was blocked by something. This shocked depraved Squirrel, and he wondered what this was. Soon, he saw the warrior appear behind Ling Si as he activated his skill Dominion of the Mercenary. The protagonist wants him to forgive him and utters that it means he has eight arms to spare. Depraved Squirrel smiled wickedly and was amazed to see his summoning skill. He doesn't know anything about the protagonist's summoning skill's mechanics, but if this was the extent of it, then it wasn't even worth looking at. Departed Squirrel attacked his warrior using the Leap of Thorns skill, and the protagonist rushed at him and attacked. The Vice Guild Master of the opponent guild wondered if he was trying to play a game of speed. They were confronting each other, and soon, the massive dust covered them, thus obstructing their vision. Soon, the protagonist rushed back and instructed his mercenary warrior to attack his opponent, so they rushed at depraved Squirrel and attacked him. The protagonist takes advantage of this situation and tries to attack him using his skill, Throat Slasher. Depraved Squirrel saw Ling Si attacking him, so using the piercing edge skill of his third eye and his additional magical arms, he attacked them. He rushed to attack him and asked if the protagonist was trying to find an opening by getting his summons to attack him. Still, he clarified that this wouldn't work on him. This concerned Ling Si as he almost found the best time to strike, but soon, he saw colossal destruction in the area behind them. Ruko was blocking the attacks of the warrior of Wolf Fangs, as he expected from Wolf Fangs' first division. He was confident that any other tank would have fallen in the face of their coordinated assault a long ago. But these battles ended there, and he attacked one of the warriors rushing to attack him. The opponent warrior asked his fellow if he was all right, and his comrade uttered that their opponent's size and strength were enormous, so he was in a skill vacuum. The same was the situation with the other warrior as the skill consumption was too great, and he was also going in a skill vacuum. Skill vacuum is the period when all of the player's skills have been used and are on cooldown. This was a perilous state as opponents could easily take advantage of this vulnerability. The warrior was startled as Ruko's shield suddenly broke, fell on those warriors, and injured them. They still wanted to hang in there, but Ruko punched them. Conversely, mages tried their hard to subdue Tilly's and instructed her fellow mage to help her stall them. She was shocked when she saw Tilly's above her head, and Tilly's attacked her using the blazing rainbow fist. They could not stall Tilly's as she was so quick and unpredictable. With no one to cover them, they had no opportunity to deal damage. Tilly's uttered that even though the skills of battle mages do not deal as much damage as other mages, their dexterity was something the likes of her opponent mages would never be able to match. He wanted to make those mages feel fear every time they encountered Tilly's, who is a battle mage in the future, so she attacked and defeated them. Lastly, Dark Feather was aiming at those thieves, and they were startled as they suddenly got attacked by his bullets. The wolf fang thieves wondered why it felt like there were eyes on their bullets. Dark Feather clarified, as he already said that he could see very clearly and defeated them. Meanwhile, the wolf fang warrior captain captured the attention of everyone and asked if the nebulous people were suddenly going crazy. 
They assumed they might be too scared of them and wondered why they were running away. They were shocked because the direction the nebulous members were heading was quite alarming as they exited the dungeons. The Wolf Fangs member inquired about the situation in the dungeon as the nebulous was planning to return to attack their checkpoint station. This situation seemed terrible to the captain, so he decided to inform his boss, Squirrel, about this hurriedly. Conversely, the protagonist is fighting the depraved Squirrel and is aware that Tiana has started to give up. Depraved Squirrel was startled as he received the message from his companions that the nebulous people split up and suddenly pretended to retreat. But they were leaving the dungeon and off to attack their checkpoint station. Depraved Squirrel realized they might not be as obedient as he had imagined, and they turn back to gain the initiative and catch them off guard. However, they will have to see if their nebulous guild can do that, and if they can capture the checkpoint station. The protagonist confirmed that he was right because, from the beginning, that was a race against the clock and an operation to gain the initiative. The protagonist doesn't want to waste further time with depraved squirrel there like this as he has to assist his other team. All of the members of Black Hunt were quickly rushing away, and Ruko was ashamed that he didn't manage to one-shot them. Tilly's and Dark Feather joined him since they were trying to gang up against Ruko. The Black Hunt member asked the others if all six had lost to their opponents. The mage didn't think the three of them would be so strong, and was confident that they would not be able to defeat them with their current ability. Tilly's mocked them on hearing they couldn't defeat them with their current ability. The Black Hunt captain appreciated the others, even though they weren't the division's first best elite, they had their boss squirrel with them. He was sure there was no way their boss would lose, as those nebulous members didn't know how strong their boss squirrel was, and he was on a completely different level than them. Tilly's assumed they hadn't beaten their opponent enough as their mouths still stink. Their opponent admitted that they had lost, so there was no meaning in continuing the fight, so everything depended entirely on the depraved Squirrel and Ling Si fight. The protagonist instructed his spectral warriors to attack depraved Squirrel, so they rushed at him. Depraved Squirrel also rushed at them as he knew he had to get rid of these pesky things first. Using his skill, Pseudo Flower, he formed two clones that rushed toward the warriors to attack. Clones formed with the technique Pseudo Flower last for one minute, and the clone will also be able to deal damage and apply status effects, but will immediately disappear upon taking damage. Both of those clones simultaneously got rid of the Spectral Warrior, and Depraved Squirrel eradicated the remaining one. He remarked that these were brainless summons. While he was busy attacking that warrior, he didn't even realize that the protagonist almost reached behind him, but as soon as he sensed him, he rushed away and thus managed to evade his attack. Depraved Squirrel figured out that Ling Si preferred fighting one-on-one, -on -one, and he was amazed as Ling Si's speed was incredible, and even his third I couldn't see him. On the other hand, Black Hunt members cheer their boss on to finish Ling Si and show them the difference between him and that thief. The protagonist knew that stacked attacks wouldn't work on him as he would indeed interrupt him with his attack. So if he wants to pull off his next move, he has no choice but to put his body movement against depraved squirrel. The protagonist uses his body movements to create a gap, so he rushes toward his opponent who welcomes him as he is already waiting for his attack. The protagonist attacked his opponent using the skill Kiss of the Vile Serpent and tried to kick him, but he escaped. Kiss of the Vile Serpent skill when locked onto one target, the soul of the vile serpent wraps around the opponent and deals magic damage. After selecting the target, the user's physical attack will accumulate vile flames continuously. When the vile flame effect is activated, the ground will rise along with the kiss of the dragon serpent, thus dealing the burst damage. Depraved Squirrel wondered what skill Ling Si was using. And soon, his accessory hand rose in the air and reached the protagonist to attack, but he managed to evade the attack. Depraved Squirrel was shocked to see his speed and couldn't keep up with Ling Si top time. The protagonist was alerted as he could find the gap, so he rushed toward his opponent and attacked him. This time he managed to damage Depraved Squirrel, and his opponent was stunned as if he could believe him. The Wolf Fang's vice guild master was stunned as Ling Si used top speed to make the arms behind him bug out from high FPS lag. He wondered how this was possible. And while pondering, the protagonist reminded him that he already clarified that he was there to settle the account. The protagonist asked if the vice guild master was ready for the evil python's poisonous kiss. The protagonist rushes to attack him while he is evading his attack, and Ling Si is amazed that his opponent's rhythm is a mess. 
depraved squirrel tries to calm himself as he can't let the protagonist mess up his rhythm. Looking at Ling Xia's movements, he predicted that he might be going to his left, but he got attacked by him on the right, which shocked him as his judgment was wrong. The protagonist uttered that there was no time left for his opponent to adjust his rhythm, and he wanted to return this kick to him, so he kicked him. All of the Black Hunt members were concerned about their boss as they saw him being kicked. Dark Feather was amazed to see Squirrel was now in full-on panic mode, and he was sure that with such lightning-fast attacks, it would be difficult to regain focus once he panicked. Meanwhile, Depraved Squirrel is puzzled and thinks the protagonist will attack his abdomen, so he blocks it and then counterattacks. As he covered his abdomen, the protagonist remarked that he had misjudged and attacked him. The Vice Guild Master was stunned as the protagonist predicted his prediction and the protagonist reminded him that his top time was superior to Squirrel. He again attacked him, which made Squirrel spout much blood. He wondered why Ling Si top time was better than his. Seeing their boss in such a condition, the Black Hunt members rushed toward him to help him. Depraved Squirrel instructed them to get away as he didn't need anyone's help, and he was startled as he heard Ling Xia's voice behind him. The protagonist inquired if he was confident he didn't need anyone's help, and he again got kicked by the protagonist and thrown back. His men rushed toward him and were worried. They inquired if he was all right and instructed the mages to heal him. Depraved Squirrel was startled as he saw the black fire wrapped around his body, but what most concerned him was that it wasn't dissipated. The protagonist looked at him, smirked and cast his spell so that the vile flames would burst. Depraved Squirrel's eyes spread wide with shock as he realized it was too late for them to act. The Dark Dragon emerged from the ground and attacked him, which caused enormous damage to him, and the damage, which was based on 150% of the attack power, was also dealt with. The Vice Guild Master of Wolf Fangs, entirely covered by those vile flames, reached out and couldn't believe this, as this wasn't possible. All of them were completely covered with those black flames and were pulled down. The protagonist received the notification that burst magic damage was dealt, so the seven people were one shot, and he was pleased as his score with depraved squirrel was settled. Ruko was amazed and praised Ling Si. He was terrific and wondered what move he used in the end as he had never seen him using it before. Tilly's was also impressed because the fire he used in the end was on par with her magic flames. The protagonist promised to tell them about it later and asked if they had prepared the equipment he had given them beforehand. They have equipped the disposable short-distance paraglider and disposable grappling hook. The protagonist explained that it would be a while before depraved squirrel revived, so they had to coordinate with Tiana and attack from the outside. After some time, they were all ready, so the protagonist instructed them to follow him as they went around the cliffs and landed at Wolf Fang's checkpoint station. The protagonist fled away while instructing them to seize all of their checkpoints, and they followed his lead. Originally, from Wolf Fang's point of view, with Vice Guild leader Depraved Squirrel's line of defense, any scheme Nebulous could devise would automatically crumble before his might. However, not a single person on Wolf Fang's could have guessed that there would be the appearance of such an unpredictable factor as Ling Si. The one who could completely mess up Wolf Fang's rhythm and launch a pincer attack to smash through Wolf Fang's line of defense. In the considerable time it took for depraved Squirrel, the member of Nebulous, led by Ling Si and Tiana, to invade with absolute speed and capture all three checkpoints. Finally, in the face of an offensive, they had no hope of winning, so depraved Squirrel could only retreat resentfully and give up the right to the dungeon. Ultimately, Nebulous successfully seized Wolf Fang's three remaining checkpoint stations. So, this small-scale dungeon rights battle that both parties had planned for a long time ultimately came to a close. Meanwhile, in the Nebulous meeting lobby, Coco Lai called the Guild Master Stillwater and informed him that the battle for the rights to the Guild-owned dungeon had ended. Stillwater inquired about the result, which was, as he predicted, a sweeping victory for Nebulous. Coco Lai gladly informed him that Ling Si executed the plan perfectly. Under Tiana's leadership, Nebulous successfully captured all the checkpoint stations. The guild master requested her to convey his order that the entire guild should go to receive Ling Si and the rest. Later, at the Nebulous main gate portal, everyone was gathered to welcome them on their victory warmly. Coco Lai and Stillwater were looking at them from inside their meeting room, and Coco Lai was amazed as Tiana had become more confident than before. 
Stillwater instructed her to go ahead and distribute the rewards to Tiana and the rest who got them this victory as he wanted to talk with Ling Si in private. After some time, the protagonist knocked at the door and was permitted to enter the room. As he entered the room, he saw the guild Aster standing before the window, looking outside toward others. Stillwater applauded him as he perfectly completed the mission, and he knew that Wolf Fangs would probably still have a hard time accepting this. The protagonist doesn't know about the wolf fangs, but he does know that depraved squirrel would be unwilling to accept the truth. Stillwater wanted to know the reason why the protagonist was doing this and what exactly he was after. The protagonist understood from the look in Stillwater's eyes that was telling him to put their status aside and give him an honest answer. The protagonist said that he wants to get to the point where he would be the unequivocal number one, no matter from any angle. The guild master smiled. Even though he knew he was aiming for the top, he still couldn't help but be astounded by his aura because that was the attitude he was looking for. Since that was the case, the guild master assured him he could assist him with becoming the unequivocal number one and asked if he liked his idea. The protagonist was shocked as that was a sudden proposal he had not expected from the guild master. The guild master stares at him and inquires if the protagonist doesn't have self-confidence or if he is questioning his capabilities, such as who the guild master of Nebulous is. The protagonist was startled by the guild master's aura as he had always been calm during their interactions, so he almost forgot that the man in front of him was Heart Stillwater. The person was one of the top five most excellent clerics in his previous life, so he agreed to his proposal and requested him to stop staring at him as it started hurting his eyes. Stillwater apologized as he added some shining special effects to impress him, so it's his bad. The protagonist was truly flattered, putting aside Stillwater staunch's confidence in him. He was pretty well aware of his limits because, with his current abilities, he knew he was still far from enough. Heavenland was a new frontier with unlimited possibilities, and there were still many pros who remained hidden. But that wasn't a problem for Stillwater as he could wait for Ling Si but hoped he wouldn't dawdle. Stillwater promised to wait for him until he could stand confidently in front of him and tell him that he was ready. Even after leaving the meeting room, it still feels surreal as Ling Si didn't think Guild Master Stillwater would have such high expectations of him or perhaps he was taking a costly gamble on him. He returned to the real world and was thinking about all this. He was pleased as he gained one level from this guild-owned dungeon. While he has reached level 33, he has dropped off the top 10 of the level leaderboard in this short period. He sighed as the level leaderboard was competitive and remembered the highest level attained now as level 45. The protagonist has gained a clear understanding of his weakness after his battle with Squirrel. He knew that he had to replace all of his pre-promotion skills and aside from the dagger that could be evolved, all of his equipment was no longer enough. Also, Vankafus's potion shop has to conduct extensive recruitment. On top of that, he has yet to investigate the mysterious badge of the Glorious. There was a whole pile of this to be done so he could catch a break, and he read the note on the dining table left by his grandfather. His grandfather informed him that he was going out for groceries, so he should remember to go to school after breakfast. Although it was a little tiring, this was pretty good, either in game or in real life. He had never been this fulfilled. Later, he went to school, where children were conversing about the previous night's episode, which was terrific. One student tried to catch up with their friends, but the protagonist was walking alone. He was startled as someone's voice suddenly captured his attention, and the bully asked the student for an apology for bumping into him. The student apologized to Tang Ki as he didn't bump into him on purpose, and explained that he was wiping his glasses so he didn't see him. Tang Ki wasn't willing to understand the student as he was confident that the student would know that he didn't even care about all of his excuses and reasons. Tang Ki punched the student, due to which his glasses fell on the ground, since this was their first meeting he was up front. Tang Ki uttered that the student had hurt him badly just now, so he should compensate him and asked if he had hurt him. The student was searching for his glasses and requested him to let him pick his glasses first. He was crying as his mother had just brought them for him. Listening to this, Tang Ki laughed as those glasses were new. He lifted his foot and cursed the student while talking to him. The bully wondered why he was still going on about his glasses. Seeing this, the student was worried but couldn't do anything, so the bully put his foot on the glasses and smashed them. 
The protagonist passes by while the bully laughs at the student and Ling Si bumps into one of the bullies and instructs him not to block the path. The bully alerted Tang Ki, but before he could give him way, they all got bumped by him and fell. They wondered what he was doing and the students recognized Ling Si as the new transfer student in their class. Tang Ki was furious, but his friend tried to calm him as the people were watching them, so they couldn't lose there and should leave. They decide to leave but curse Ling Si as he wants to make him pay for his behavior. The protagonist asked the student being bullied if he was all right, but the student was concerned about his glasses as his mother worked hard to buy them. The protagonist handed him the wallets of three bullies, which shocked the student and he thought he shouldn't take them. The protagonist uttered that those three accidentally dropped them and was sure the money inside should be enough to get him a new pair of glasses. The student was still reluctant to take the wallet but the protagonist assured him he would keep it as he had the right to use their money for glasses. The protagonist was startled when he suddenly heard someone who asked him if he had awakened. Later, the student was glad as Ling Si was incredible, and Adolf instructed him to hurry as he would be late at this rate. This reminded him about his class, so he hurriedly went in, and the protagonist assured him not to worry. Ling Si knew they would probably come after him in the future, and instructed him not to let his mother worry and get a new pair of glasses. The student expressed gratitude toward the protagonist for his help, and remarked that he was a kind fellow, so he left. The protagonist asks Adolf who he is, but he tries to calm down the protagonist as he answers all his questions but wants to go somewhere else to talk. Later, Adolf was sitting on the bench, and the protagonist wanted him to speak as he was risking being late for his first official day of school to talk to him. Adolf took out the gun from his jacket and shot at Ling Si, which startled him. The protagonist grabbed the bullet and rushed at him to attack, but Adolf stopped him as this was the test. The protagonist wants an explanation for what he did, so Adolf explains that it is a highly plastic bullet. It's made of super lightweight plastic that wouldn't cause any real injuries, though it might hurt a little. To save time, that was his most direct method of finding out if the one he was talking to was a powerful awakened. Adolf was impressed because, in a split second, when Ling Si moved, he simultaneously caught the bullet he aimed at his chest and wondered what kind of speed this was. The protagonist wonders if he will still not introduce himself, and the man says he is Adolf, a middleman who recruits awakened on behalf of the military. The protagonist recalls that in his previous life, most of the awakened did indeed join a particular organization and assumed it might be military. Adolf puts his reason as follows. The military needs the power of the awakened. So they were the middlemen who used aura sensors to look for the awakened and invited them to join the military. The protagonist found their invitation method interesting, but inquired what he would get in return for joining the military. Adolf asks the protagonist if he is interested in status, which is an excellent path. The protagonist smirked at hearing the word status, as this was the word he was unfamiliar with, which is something that used to be so far from his reach, but now it's easily within his grasp. The protagonist finds his offer exciting and asks if he has to pass the test to join them, but Adolf refuses. The man explained that he meant that he had only passed his preliminary screening, which merely confirmed that he was awakened whom he had been looking for. However, he still has to undergo the official military examinations. The protagonist wonders when that examination will be held. Adolf clarified that the examination on that day precisely within an hour startled him. He was stunned to know that it was in an hour and didn't think it a good idea for him to be absent on his first day of school. Adolf assured him not to worry as he would take care of that matter. Ling Si warned him that he would remember what he said. He promised to lodge a complaint about Adolf if something went wrong, but what further shocked him was that the man already prepared the chopper. So they left on the chopper and reached the military base. As the protagonist expected from the military, the scale and imposing style were impressive. He reached where all the awakened were heading inside and wondered if all the people in line were also awakened. One of the awakened wanted the one before him to pick up his pace as all of them were waiting, and the beard awakened stared at the protagonist. On the contrary, Adolf was trying to convince the general of the ground forces, one who was also the West District Wakened Supervising Examiner. Still, he explained that they had all five candidates for the exams this time. So, Adolf's last-minute request to have an extra candidate was not part of the regulations. However, Adolf said he would surprise them and wanted to see if this could genuinely surprise them. 
Adolf assured the general that he wouldn't disappoint him, and the general wondered if that young kid measured up to that guy with an awakening rate of 54%, as he was the most outstanding of this batch. The general asked Adolf if he had measured the awakening rate of the awakened who just joined. Adolf uttered that because the recruit was a last-minute find, he had yet to measure his exact awakening rate, so he brought him there directly to be tested. Since that was the case, the general decided to see what that kid had to show and was observing from the window. All the awakened with different awakening rates were heading toward the central area and the protagonist, whose awakening rate was yet to be measured, was also following them. Soon, the announcement was made by the general, informing all the candidates that the following will be the official examination. This examination will be what is known as a one versus may battle, and the final result will be decided on the treatment they all will receive. The protagonist was amazed to see the battle would be one versus many as he figured out they would measure their awakening rate via a battle royale. The awakened with a 54% rate was startled to hear this and remarked that he might be overthinking it. The awakened explained that they are meaningless to the military before ensuring they are of the awakening rate that the military wants. The awakened was aware of the situation and explained that the military was after their individual combat data. So he suggested to Ling Si that if he is not confident, it's his chance to leave. Soon, the announcement was made that the battlefield was prepared and the ones awaiting ahead would be the elite anti-supernatural ground army. The elite anti-supernatural army was currently the strongest they have in their arsenal. They are the strongest soldiers who remained standing after countless of the most brutal battles. They once took back a town under the control of 3,000 terrorists with only a hundred-man team. Before the particular existence of the Evolved Awakened, these elite armies were undoubtedly the most powerful human beings. But now the once strongest human army and the Awakened with superpower shall decide which is superior through combat, so the battle commenced. Everyone was instructed that according to the order in which they were lined up, they should come up one by one to fight fifteen anti-supernatural soldiers. The Awakened with the highest awakening rate found this exam interesting, and another announcement was made. The military informed them they would collate the relevant data based on awakened individual performance and reassess their actual combat awakening rate. Entrant number one was instructed to be ready to get at the stage, and the awakened with a 12% awakening rate was a bit concerned. He thought it would be tricky as he had to fight 15 alone, but he headed toward the stage. The examination for the first candidate commenced, and he confidently spread his arm and wanted the elite supernatural army to fight him. The boy doesn't believe in their skill. As an awakened man, he will have nothing to fear from people like them, who are so-called elite soldiers. The general was stunned as the boy dared to underestimate the elite soldier who had been through all sorts of life and death situations, which wasn't a smart move. They observed all the contestants move the way he stomped the ground, then made a fist and rushed to attack the elite soldiers. He couldn't do any harm to them, and the soldier feasibly blocked his attack, so he ran back. The boy was worried as his skill didn't work at the soldier. His strike, which was supposed to be able to punch through steel, didn't work at all. The boy was startled as suddenly he saw the soldier attacking him from behind, and they punched him so hard that he spouted out blood. The awakened got unconscious and fell to the ground, which made the result more apparent as the elite soldiers were more robust than the awakened. Another awakened watching this and was dumbfounded as those elite soldiers have such muscular combat strength. The man who was measuring their combat strength informed the general that the entrant number one first measured awakening rate was 12%. However, from this exercise, it is determined that the entrant one's actual combat awakening rate was 6%. The general instructed the man that there was no need to report such a result, so he should continue the examination. Adolf was amazed as the general said most awakened were only at the level of hooligans. Adolf assumes that they might act tough outside with the power they have as an awakened. However, when they are up against soldiers with powerful combat capabilities, they have no chance of winning. This kind of awakening rate wasn't what the military needed. After that, entrants 2 and 4 were also defeated by the coordinated assaults of the anti-supernatural soldiers. Only entrant number 3, with a first measured awakening rate of 39%, managed to scrape by with an actual combat awakening rate of 33%. Next, Awakened number 5 was requested to get ready, and the Awakena, with a 54% awakening rate, was thrilled as finally his turn arrived. He cracked his knuckle and remarked that those four pieces of garbage in front did nothing but waste his time. 
The general was also amazed as it was finally number five, and he heard that he was the one to watch among this batch of candidates. Adolf agreed as number five first measured an awakening rate of 54%, which was a rare talent. According to the contestant, he was also a seasoned brawler. The awakened confidently got to the stage, generated the flames, and instructed the elite soldiers to attack him immediately. Soon, with the combat power pull, his body was covered by fire, and his single stomp generated such vigorous waves, making it challenging for the soldiers to stand. The protagonist was amazed to watch his battle as he used his in-game skills in real life, so he also decided to look at it. This contestant also impressed the general as he differed from the previous few who only drew in their power. Contestant number 5 seemed like he had already awakened his in-game skill, and his current awakening rate reading had moved to 42% instantly and was still rising. The awakened wanted to show those elite soldiers what a real awakened is like, and he generated massive flames and attacked all of the soldiers using the great axe double strike. The soldier was startled and instructed their fellows to shoot, provide cover, and fall back. They shoot the examination bullets at the contestant, which is similar to the extreme plastic bullets that could inflict injuries but no mortal wounds. The awakened smirked and informed them he was a warrior and could use a shield, so he made a total counterattack shield. This shield blocks all the bullet attacks, and after absorbing the bullets, it turns the direction of the bullet and counterattacks the elite soldiers, which the soldiers try to evade. Soon, contestant number 5 managed to strike all those soldiers while they did their best to block it. He remarked that they wouldn't be able to have a decisive outcome in their short time. In the end, the Awakened suggested making this match a draw, and the general agreed to let this battle end as such a performance was more than enough for the contestant to pass. The general made such a decision because the number 5 actual combat awakening rate had also risen to 52%, which was almost the same as his first measured awakening rate. The announcement was made that entrant number 5 had passed the examination, so he requested that he head to the resting area, which was an expected result. After that, entrant number 6, Ling Si, was requested to prepare, so he headed toward the battlefield. The previous contestant requested the protagonist not to go, embarrassing them awakened. The protagonist was concerned as he hadn't grasped how to use his power better as an awakened. Just a moment ago, when the number five was using his skills, he wondered if he was synchronizing his mental state with his physical form. He got to the stage, stomped his foot on the ground, closed his eyes, and wondered if synchronizing with his mind was like this. Soon, the protagonist opened his eyes and was confident as that was relatively easy. The aura was emitting from his body, and he was trying to retrieve his in-game weapon in reality. This shocked the general as he was summoning his in-game equipment, and the man recording the awakening rate was shocked. The man asked the general if he wasn't seeing things as the protagonist's awakening rate jumped to 100% instantly. Meanwhile, the protagonist's whole dress was converted into his in-game costume, and he was highly confident. The protagonist instructed them to hurry up as he might still be able to get back to school by the afternoon. Adolf was shocked to know that the number 6 awakening rate was already 100%, so he decided to look at it. Adolf was terrified as he couldn't believe that Ling Si's awakening rate had capped out right after the start. This was genuinely unprecedented as he had only heard of people with an awakening rate of 90% or so appearing in another district. He already thought it was extraordinary, but Adolf never imagined that the perfect awakened would exist. The general thought the same way, assuming that perfect awakening was merely something in theory. He was thrilled to know it was possible, and he wanted to keep Ling Si no matter what it took, and was willing to give him anything he wanted in return to make him join them. Contestant number 5 was shocked to hear 100% and wondered if he heard it right. The awakening rate of 100% was something he had never imagined. He was mortified to think he was suggesting Ling Si, who is a perfect awakened, to win at any cost just a moment ago. After summoning his in-game appearance and skill, the protagonist felt pretty good and supposed that all he had to do was visualize his in-game condition, and then it would naturally come out. Since he completely understood the summoning process, he knew no difference between him and his in-game self. The elite soldier inquired their captain if they were making the first move against that awakened. The captain was in deep thought as they had been through all sorts of battles and encountered all kinds of vicious and brutal enemies. But he had never experienced anything like this uncontrollable fear that the captain was feeling when facing that young man currently. 
the captain of the elite soldiers knew that even if they were the strongest humans, they couldn't defeat this kind of awakened power. The protagonist doesn't even wait for them to make the move, rushing toward them to attack first. Using his skills Rapid Shadow Thrust and Throat Slasher, he attacked those soldiers, and in a split second, he defeated everyone and appreciated them as they fought well. The announcement was made that the battle was over with his one shot with combined skill. The general was dumbfounded as he heard that he had defeated all the soldiers in one move, but corrected it as if it were a flash. He remarked that was what an awaken should be like, and instructed them to announce the result as he wanted to meet Ling Si personally. The general was sure that with someone like the protagonist on their side, even if the day of the prophecy arrived, there was still hope for humanity. The announcement was that the battle was over, so Entrance 6 had passed the examination. Later, at the military VIP lounge, Adolf was sitting on the sofa, wanting to clarify their intention and explain if he was willing to work with the military. The military promised to give him a position and remuneration according to his performance. The protagonist wondered if there was something that he needed to do for them now as he was working with the military. Adolf clarified that they didn't need him to do anything for them now. While conversing, the general arrived, so Adolf saluted him. The protagonist inquired if he should also salute him, but the general said there was no need to be so formal with him. Because he was the treasure of their western district, the protagonist wondered what sort of treasure he was, as this sounds a bit weird. The general introduced himself to the protagonist as he was the third general of the ground forces and the West District supervising examiner and appreciated his performance as he blew them away. The protagonist inquired if this meant that he had passed and asked what he should do next and what the situation was now. He asked this as there was a saying that there was no such thing as a free lunch and he didn't want to do anything that would put him at a loss. As he told him earlier, the general explained there was nothing Ling Si needed to do currently. The protagonist has passed the examination, meaning he has met their recruitment requirements. They will provide him with everything he needs in his daily life in return for his assistance in the future. The protagonist wondered what kind of assistance they wanted, and the general uttered and supposed he might not know this. But there were more and more awakened now, and while many were willing to join the military, most were unwilling to join them. There are even some antisocial awakened who abuse their powers to commit all sorts of crime and destruction, so he was afraid that there would be more of such awakens to come. The protagonist understood that he wanted the awakened to assist them in dealing with these awakened criminals. The general was glad as he perfectly understood him and remarked that talking to intelligent people is always a joy. However, the general thought that once the prophecy came to pass, things wouldn't be that simple, so everything they were doing currently was in preparation for the future. The protagonist was okay with that, but his current place was small, with little room to move around. Furthermore, he also heard that there was a new gain headset, which the people called the gaming cabin, which was pretty good. The general laughed and understood what Ling Si meant. He was assured that they wouldn't make him do things for free so that he could have that as a sign of their sincerity. He called Adolf and decided to leave that to him so that he could give Ling Si a new place to live and the latest gaming cabin Adolf affirmed. Because everything was sorted, the general hoped to look forward to seeing Ling Si again and instructed him to tell Adolf if there was anything that he needed. From now on, he instructed Adolf to communicate with Ling Si and wanted to get along with them. Adolf assured Ling Si that he would prepare what he requested as soon as possible, but now he had to take him back to his school. Soon, the chopper returned to Ling Si at school, and because it was getting quite late, the protagonist was sure that school might be already over. He had so much for wanting to experience the joys of school life, but guessed that he had to save it for the next time. He contended that he could give his grandfather a better place to live and was confident that he would be delighted with a more prominent place. He entered the game and was welcomed to heaven land because now this game impacted his real life status. It was time for him to power up. He wanted to keep evolving this dagger, upgrade his equipment and continue to level up. But there was something more substantial. Later, he reached Casfado Magical Origin Institute to turn his unique Spell Thief dual class into an invincible existence as soon as possible. Everyone was shocked to see Ling Si inside the Institute and wondered if he was a mage and if the Magic Origin Institute wasn't exclusive to the mage class. Judging by the protagonist's equipment, they could tell he was not a mage and assumed he might be there on a special mission. 
a level 30 luminous mage named Soren was talking to some people and clarified that he had no trouble taking first place in the institute mission ranking that day, so he instructed them to follow him. The female mages gathered around him decided to be in the care of Soren and were delighted to think that if they could maintain first place, they could exchange points for advanced spells, which would be all thanks to him. Soren laughed as that was a small matter as he had already told them many times that as long as he was there, no one could score more points than them. He asked them if they didn't notice as they were the only ones who dared to take on five-star missions, which was the most difficult. Soren was startled as the protagonist asked him for a way, and then he accepted the five-star mission. The system notification appeared and requested him to wait patiently for the mission to load. All of them were shocked as Ling Si took on a five-star mission by himself, without any team. Soren jaw dropped out of shock, and the female mage beside him judged from Ling Si's outfit that he was a thief. Soren hadn't noticed that, but he was indeed outfitted like a thief, and they wondered what was with that. They can't believe this, as only mages are allowed to enter the Magical Origin Institute. Soren smirked and thought the thief was trying to act mysteriously, as he might be a mage no one wanted to team with, so he decided to wear a costume to attract attention. He pointed toward Ling Si and asked other mages if they didn't notice that he even hid his information because he was afraid of being found out. Soren has seen plenty of this sort, as Heaven Land is lacking in many regards, but such dummies were plentiful. He had seen many such dumb people there, and wondered who Ling Si was trying to spook in attempting to take the most arduous five-star mission by himself. The protagonist sighed as this was tiring and wondered why so many such types were everywhere in the game. The protagonist stared at him and turned, which startled Soren, and he got puzzled and wondered why he was staring at him. The protagonist approached him, which concerned Soren, and he questioned what he was trying to do and warned him that if he came any closer, he would call for help. Ling Si asked him how much money he had on him, along with all his equipment and gear, and how much it was worth. This stunned Soren, and he wondered what that had to do with him. The protagonist explained that he wanted to make a bet as he had heard everything Soren had said about him earlier and was not pleased. Soren wondered what bet he wanted to make, and the protagonist uttered that if he failed to rank first on the mission ranking board, he would pay him ten times his current net worth. But if he takes first place, Soren will have to give him everything he has and ask what he thinks about this bet, and if it seems fair. Soren was stunned and asked if he was serious, everyone else was also shocked, and they wondered if it was for real, and if they had heard it right. If he didn't have the guts to accept this challenge, one of the mages wanted to take Soren's place for the bet. Soren uttered that there was no way he would be afraid, but he dared Leng Si to sign an e-gamble agreement with him. That way, the system would be the judge. The protagonist was okay with this condition because, with the e-gamble agreement, the system would enforce the result no matter what. So they signed the agreement, and Soren wondered if that thief was a brainless rich kid or something. There was no need to show off like that, even if he was loaded, and he was glad it was his lucky day. After he was done signing the contract, it was Ling Si's turn to sign it, and Ling Si assured him that he was not going anywhere as he was super eager to sign it. The protagonist's eyes sparkled as he stared at Soren, and he smiled voraciously, which stunned Soren, and he suddenly started getting chills down his spine. Later, the ranking board mission was in progress and held at a five-star mission at the price of the three elements. On each side of the lake, divided into three parts, stands an NPC mage dressed in a different colored robe. In this mission, the elemental mages guarding the elemental lake fell into a deep slumber. The player has to seize their elemental crustal to obtain their unique spell, but any player approaching the lake will startle those mages from slumbering and earn their fury. After 24 minutes have passed, teams holding on to at least one elemental crystal will be rewarded with their corresponding elemental spell and the mission points of this five-star mission. After the mission was explained, they received a notification about the commencement of the mission, so Ling Si rushed inside. From what the protagonist has gathered, it's possible to obtain potent elemental spells from the five-star mission of that magical institute, the prize of the three elements but he was confident that no one in his life had discovered a hidden reward in this five-star mission. This is when the countdown ends, if someone possesses all three elemental crystals on top of being rewarded with the three elemental spells, they will also obtain an additional powerful spell. These four spells were what the protagonist was after, 
so he had to snatch all those elements at any cost. On the contrary, Soren instructed his teammates to follow him and listen carefully, as he had done with many different teams. Soren instructed them to focus on getting just one of the crystals, so they shouldn't even consider taking the other two, as getting their hand on all three is impossible. He pointed at the front, instructing his team that someone had triggered the protective spells. This was why the Guardian Golems appeared from the ground to attack. Magama Golem, Thunder Golem and Vapor Golem all appeared simultaneously. Soren instructed them to remember to pay attention to the other players once they had obtained the crystal. They would be unlikely to try to steal it from them, but it's good to be alert. His companion wondered why it was unlikely. He explained it because they would obtain the elemental crystal protection once they got the elemental crystal. Soren smirked as he had gotten his hands on an elemental crystal three times when the guardian golems protected him. It was so fantastic. He instructed them to remember to support him as he deal damage because once they take out these golems, all that was left was to see who could take down the elemental mage first, and Soren was confident about seizing the crystal, his teammates affirmed. Soren smiled and knew this mission was in the bag. Once he successfully competed with this first five-star mission, he would have to be stressed about the mission afterward. He wanted to be first place on the mission ranking board because he had to win that bet with that brainless guy. He was startled as he heard the protagonist's voice requesting him to step aside. They were shocked to see that costumed mage. He put his foot on the female mage's flying broom, uttered that he would go ahead, and reminded Soren about the bet. He rushed away and thanked them because of them. He was now within range of his backstab. He attacked the magma golem using a backstab and summoned his dominion of the mercenary. Soren was shocked to see his movement as he was so agile and wondered if he was a mage or a thief. The protagonist attacked the golem, and he informed them that he would be taking the first elemental crystal. The mage NPC gets furious as he tries to get near the elemental stone, so she uses her fire elemental dragon flame while golem lifts her. The protagonist guessed that if a mage were going against that NPC, they would indeed need a team to help take her down. As those mages wanted to get close to that NPC, Ling Si was sure they had to put much effort into it. The protagonist retrieved his dagger, rushed toward the magma golem, and uttered that the way it tried to protect its master was no good. Although he was sure it would be enough if that golem opponent were a mage, Ling Si apologized, saying he would break it because he wasn't a mage. The protagonist rushed and attacked using rapid shadow thrust and clarified that he was also a thief. The NPC was trying to attack him, but before she could do anything, she got attacked by the protagonist and he managed to take down his opponent in one shot from the piercing damage. The system notification congratulated the protagonist as he had obtained the fire elemental crystal, and was requested to keep it well protected before the countdown ended. This made him happy as his task was completed, and another notification index appeared before him, which stated that as the bearer of the fire elemental crystal, he was immune to fire-type damage and could control magma golem. The protagonist was standing on the hand of Magma Golem and remarked that no matter how strong their spells are, this is how they will end up if they let a thief like him get close enough. The protagonist smiled as he considered an exciting way to play this mission out. Soon, the notification congratulates the protagonist for obtaining the Fire Elemental Crystal. The location has been marked in Soren's mission mini-map, so he was requested to obtain crystal by the end of the countdown. Soren's team mages were worried as they hadn't even caught a glimpse of an elemental mage, and the fire elemental crystal had already been taken. They were startled by the terrific speed of the person, and Soren furiously clenched his teeth on seeing the notification. He didn't want to panic as there were so many people in there, so he wanted to suppose that the one who got the fire elemental first couldn't be that guy. There were still two other elemental crystals, which meant he still had the chance to win the bet. His teammate called him and asked if she was seeing things, which startled Soren, and they were stunned as they saw Magma Golem was carrying that thief. The other mages flying in the air were shocked to see this scene, and they wondered if that player was the boss of the Golem. This didn't seem right to them, and they asked what was happening there, as the situation was unprecedented. Although the situation is quite pretentious for the protagonist, having Golem clear out a path makes things much easier for him. Soren's jaw dropped out of shock when he discovered that Thief had obtained the Fire Elemental Stone. His teammates were also stunned and wondered who would dare try to seize the crystal from a guy like that. 
the protagonist commands Magma Golem to go straight to the territory with the remaining crystals, and he follows his command. After gaining control of the Magma Golem, Ling Si marched into the No Man's Land. With the Magum Golem, the Thunder Elemental Golem, and the Water Elemental Golem were defeated in succession. The remaining players could only watch on helplessly. Thus, Ling Si obtained the remaining two crystals using the Thief class close ranged burst attack. Simultaneously, he was congratulated on receiving the fiery flames, the swirling water, and the thunderous punishment elemental crystal. With that, for the very first time since the game was launched, the three elemental crystals have been gathered by one player. In the rest of the day, Ling Si reached new heights never seen before since this game launched on the Magical Origin Institute Mission Ranking Board. That was his unquestioned donation of the other players as a spell thief. He cleared it in round two of the five-star mission using the elemental manifestation Thunder Flash. This skill will be transformed into lightning and thunderous bolts of judgment will be bestowed from the heavens to surrounding enemies, dealing massive magic damage. The protagonist cleared round three of the five-star mission using the elemental manifestation of the covert water. Covert water will help the user transform into a lethal water fog and bestow blasts from the deep water upon surrounding enemies, dealing massive magic damage. In the fourth round, he used the elemental manifestation of the burning lava, which transformed into a fiery lava and bestowed scorching flames on the surrounding enemies, thus dealing colossal magic damage. Finally, he reached round five of the five-star mission and the protagonist smirked as he received a hidden spell granted from gathering the three elemental crystals. This hidden spell was Body of the Restless Chaos, which gathers the elements of thunder, fire and water into one body in the name of heaven and earth. The user will temporarily obtain the body of chaotic elemental power, and within nine seconds, the user can control chaotical elemental power to perform a ranged burst attack. This magic covered the whole atmosphere with the strange aura and all the other mages rushed away in worry. By the end of the day, there was an unprecedented phenomenon on the Magical Origin Institute mission ranking board. All the mages gathered outside the mission entrance portal wondered if something was wrong with the board, as that day's ranking board was a bit bizarre. They asked why there was only one player on the ranking board whose name and information were hidden. But after a little bit, they knew that it wasn't an error, Instead, apart from Ling Si, all the mages who participated in the mission were cornered and hunted down. Ling Si didn't let anyone score at all, and on this day, the Magical Institute mission ended. Soren and his team came out of the portal, and the people gathered around the portal wanted to quickly ask what happened there as the mission was finally over. The mage stared at them, and Soren came out, knelt, and was delighted as they were finally out. The female mage cursed his fate as they ran into a bugged player who killed indiscriminately. Other mages were confused about their condition and inquired what happened inside. Soren was delighted as they were finally out and could see the light again. He was relaxed as he didn't have to suffer in that endless loop of being slaughtered and became gloomy as that mission was a nightmare for him. Soren's eyes enlarged out of fear as he heard the protagonist's voice from behind, but Ling Si was glad to see him there, and it was a remarkable coincidence that he found him that easily. While trembling, he gathered up his courage and looked behind, but they became more terrified as they confirmed that the voice he heard was of that merciless slaughterer. The protagonist looked at him and inquired why he was kneeling on the floor like this. Soren was out of his senses, and he got chills down his spine. He pleaded to Ling Si to spare him, and he promised never to be so cocky again. The protagonist wondered what he was talking about, and he reminded him about their e-gamble agreement. All other mages were shocked as they looked above the head of Ling Si, where it was written that he was that day's number one player. The protagonist smiled wickedly and instructed Soren to remove everything he had on him. Later, Soren's screams filled the air, and he remarked that the thief was a mean bully as he didn't even let him keep his clothes. Out of embarrassment, he rushed out of the institute. Other mages were mocking him, and they wondered if Soren was an exhibitionist. The protagonist stared at him and laughed as he was undoubtedly fast. He looked at the stuff he seized from Soren and was amazed as the stuff he had on him was worth quite a bit. Conversing about equipment, he remembered it was almost time to get some new gear as he had been using these outdated weapons for a long time. However, he knew it would take a while to forge a set of the current best equipment. He was startled and couldn't believe he had forgotten about that place, but he had to visit Venkafis before going there. 
he reached Casfado Commercial Leasing Street and was dumbfounded to see a considerable advertisement sign in front of the Van Caffes Potion Store. This was very impressive, so he wondered if he was at the right place as he didn't know that the store had already expanded to this scale. Suddenly, his attention was seized by a man astounded to see the most expensive delivery carriage. The protagonist looked at the carriage, which was bound with the magical beasts. He heard people gossiping as they discussed its cost, which was at least 300 gold for one. The spectators can't believe that someone could afford such a luxurious carriage. They assumed it might be the alchemist emperor because only she would have that much to spare, so they were envious of her. Van Caffes came out of the carriage and instructed her employee to remember that their priority was finding the cheapest supply channels. She was going to instruct him further, but was startled as she suddenly saw Ling Si standing amidst the crowd. She called him boss, which surprised everyone as it was unbelievable for them that the guy was their boss. Van Caffes was furious at Ling Si as he had never read her DMS and wondered how he could do that to her. Ling Si waved at her and greeted her. Later, they were at the Alchemist Emperor's office. Van Caffes uttered that she had been messaging him long ago, but she didn't get his reply. This was why she continued to expand the shop based on her ideas and was delighted as Ling Si gave her the authority to make decisions earlier. Otherwise, it would have been quite troublesome for her. She was continuously calling him boss, which made him uneasy, so he stopped her from calling him boss as she was the one who seemed more like the boss. This concerned Von Kaffes, and she justified and requested not to misunderstand her because her current appearance gives her more weight when negotiating with the suppliers. She was looked down on when she tried to establish collaborations with others because of her appearance. So she had to package herself even though she had to learn how to carry herself. The protagonist assured her that she didn't need to explain herself as he was joking and trusted her. Her selection of words made Ling Si finally understand that the so-called alchemist Emperor Van Caffes didn't just rely on her alchemy prowess. However, on her genius business acumen, he figured out that she was running and growing this potion shop as an enterprise, and he was impressed by that little fellow. Van Caffes was delighted that her boss trusted him, and Ling Si asked about the current scale of their potion shop. The protagonist was speechless as she uttered that they currently have nine branches, along with the one she had just obtained. There are up to 50 employees right now, and as this store was number one and quite big, they needed a little more staff. She was sure they would still expand and make a massive chain as planned. The protagonist was deprived of words to say, so he asked her about their daily turnover. She explained that if they disregard market fluctuations, their total turnover from the nine branches will be about 1 in 200 gold daily. So their overall profits were about 900 gold. Some were still in development, so she was sure they would see better results soon. Ling Xia's eyes spread out of surprise, and he started calculating 900 gold per day with this income, putting aside the exceptional cases like the top five guilds. This was on par with the daily earnings of some of the better-known top-tier guilds. He visualizes himself playing with tremendous gold coins and assumes he is set for life. He smiled voraciously as his wealth could rival guilds, and he was a tycoon now. His bizarre behavior concerned Van Kaffes, so she inquired if he was all right. He coughed, assured her that he was doing great and had never been that better, and inquired how much he could use right now as he had some things to take care of. Van Caffes uttered that she had been reporting him via DMs previously, but he never replied, so she didn't enter his ID for security. She showed him the card and explained that their total asset is about a thousand gold, but most of it is used for development and maintenance. So all she could give him was six ID less obsidian gold cards, with thousands of gold each. This card is not bound to the user's identity. It can be used for all transactions and will not leave any trace of his personal information. She believed this convenience was just what he needed, so she instructed him to take this six for some time. She said he should let her know if he needed more, as she would keep the rest safe. The protagonist feels like a sugar mommy is holding him, but since that is the case, he has even more confidence about creating his ideal number one blueprint. The development of the Alchemist Emperor Potion Shop was far beyond his expectations, so he assumed he should be bolder in the future. Van Caffes requested that he remember to make an appointment before he came next time so she could plan for it. Later, he was at Casfato Auction House No. 3. He was comfortable with the auction house identity concealing gear, and he was all set. He decided to get the new gear from the auction hall, which was efficient for him, 
and he entered the auction area where everyone was gathered. Casfato Auction House No. 3 was considered a good-sized auction hall in the human clan. The protagonist number was 33, so he didn't think there would be so many people in there. Since the entry fee was a hundred gold, he had never stepped foot in those places in his previous life and saw many wealthy people from heaven land in the auction. The man in charge of the auction slammed the table with a gavel and welcomed everyone to auction house number three. The man assured them that, along with equipment with excellent attributes, they also had all sorts of exotic goods. The protagonist discovers that the people who come to such places are either guild representatives or whales who have already begun splashing the cash. They grab what is valuable and sell it again after the market price increases, thus profiting from the difference. The people gathered there couldn't wait for the auction to start, and finally, the auction commenced. The protagonist figured out that some of those wearing masks are naturally those who have an excellent reason to keep their identities hidden. Some do not wear masks on purpose, probably because they are highly confident about their status. Generally, an auction house would hold three auctions daily, with the last auction being the day's highlight. The last item was the one with the most attendees, so he was sure there would be equipment and skills for all classes, such as scrolls and potions. Sometimes, there would even be mythical grade gear that most people would try hard to get. The man in charge of the auction announced the beginning of the auction and revealed their first item. The protagonist smiled as he guessed he could also be considered an entry-level tycoon. He wanted to see what other treasures he could find that day apart from thief-exclusive equipment. The girl revealed the first item for auction, which was the item that could be equipped at level 30, which is irresistible to all female warriors. It was the majestic glass shield. The man explained that this elegant glass shield does not have the best attributes as its drop rates are extremely low, and it is a worthy addition to any collection. This item also boasts a high potential appreciation value, and the design is highly decorative and extremely rare. The starting bid for this shield was 60 silver coins, and the bidding began and elevated to 70 silver coins. One of the ladies was bidding 80 silver counts, but someone crossed her and offered one gold coin. The protagonist was surprised because a level 30 decorative shield should theoretically be about 30 silver coins. Because of the low drop rate and its appearance, the price was gone up to one gold. However, if one sold it again, one would earn quite a bit as there are many female players in Heaven Land, so such decorative shields are very popular. After the person who bid for one gold, the auction counting started, but no one raised the price, so the item was sold to that man. The man congratulated that person for obtaining the majestic glass shield and explained that their staff would contact him after the auction. The next item for the auction was their second item, which was a unique and scarce skill book. This item captured Ling Xia's attention as such auction items are also pretty popular, as he recalled hearing in his previous life that in some large-scale auctions, there would be a mythical-grade skill book for the auction, and he knew the price would also be astronomical. He revealed the item by uncovering it and explained that it was a thief's skill book, Bloodthirsty Shadow. Ling Si was quite interested in this book as it went along with his class since this was an exclusive book. It transforms into multiple afterimages in an instant, and each image will attack the nearest target and absorb 10% of the damage dealt as HP, and the player will become invulnerable. The skill was somewhat sporadic, just 1-5 seconds of invulnerability alone made it very tempting. Besides, there was also the effect of HP absorption, which not only can keep one's life at critical times but it also has a massive counterattack skill. The protagonist smiled as that was initially the perfect item for purchasing. The item starting bid was one gold, so the man requested everyone to begin placing their bid. The bid rose slowly but abruptly. The person with auction number 11 bid for three gold, which pleased the man in charge of the auction, so he pointed toward the bidder and asked for the raise. Everyone recognizes the person who bid three gold as they were people from the Abundant Days Consortium. Abundant Days Consortium recently entered Heaven Land with great fanfare, and the people have heard that they are operating with significant momentum. So they forgot about competing against those finance consortiums, as they were sure they would have come with thousands of gold, so only large guilds could compete with them. The man lifted his gavel while asking if there were any other bidders besides the guest from the Abundant Days Consortium bid of three gold. An old dwarf representative of the Leap of Change Consortium laughed at them and bid four gold. Everyone recognized the old man because the people from the Leap of Change were also there. 
they thought that bid would be fascinating. Everyone knew that in terms of capital base alone, Abundant Days was stronger than Leap Change, and they assumed these finance consortiums weren't there for the game's sake. They were there for the value that the game could create, and they knew that the person who had wealth could speak the loudest. After the person from Leap Change offered four gold, the Ma asked if there was another bid. The representative of Abundant Days gets frustrated, but his fellow wants him to forget about it as their last target was the set of equipment. The bid was about to get locked, so the old man from Leap Change laughed as if that was right. Abundant Days should give them the skill book. The protagonist smiled and apologized to the finance consortium as this skill book belonged to him. He would raise his hand to bid before someone from Nebulous placed the bid of five gold. This shocked the protagonist when he heard about his guild, so he saw Tiana before them. Coco Lai wondered why Tiana wanted the skill book exclusive to thieves as she wasn't even a thief. Everyone was shocked to see the members of Nebulous, who were one of the top five guilds there, and assumed they might have received the news about some particular item. The protagonist supposed that Tiana was there on behalf of Nebulous, but he didn't expect that. The announcement was made about the Nebulous Guild bidding five gold for the skill book. Coco Lai inquired what Tiana was doing and reminded her they didn't come there for this, so she should not thin out their bidding power for later. Seeing that the skill book is scarce, Tiana thought it might be helpful for Ling Si, so she wanted to buy it. Coco Lai started teasing her and asked if it could be that she had developed feelings for Ling Si. Tiana was irritated and asked the vice guild master what she was talking about. Ling Si was also a part of the Nebulous, so it was natural to keep the good stuff for their people. Seeing them behaving strangely, the protagonist was dumbfounded and wondered what these two were doing. The old man from Leap of Change raised his stick and offered ten gold for the skill book, which amazed them as he raised pretty much higher than the previous bid. The old man laughed as these gold coins were nothing to them and remarked that although Nebulous is one of the top five guilds, they shouldn't belittle Leap of Change. Coco Lai thought Tiana should overlook this item as they shouldn't forget the guild master Stillwater's task that he gave them. They were only there for that equipment, so this skill book was unnecessary, but they were startled as Ling Si offered the bid of 50 gold coins. They thought he was so extravagant as he raised the bid to 50 gold, but when they saw him, they were surprised. The protagonist thanked Tiana for her good intentions, and the host asked if anyone could offer a bid higher than that. The old man from Leap of Change was furious and wondered where that weirdo came from as he must be out of his mind to offer 50 gold coins for that skill book. Coco Lai immediately gets furious at him as he provides 50 gold, wonders why he is so extravagant, and inquires if he thinks he is a tycoon. She taught him how they shouldn't bid as he should gradually raise the price because even if he is rich, and asked if he could compete with these consortiums. The protagonist assured her not to worry as he brought some cash and didn't want to waste his time. He assumed it would be good to place a bid that others wouldn't want to compete with. Besides, he wanted to use it to create value that would surpass 50 gold. The deal was locked with the bidding price of 50 gold coins and Ling was congratulated on acquiring the items and informed that the staff would contact him after the auction. The vice guild master sighed as she thought he was a reckless spendthrift who got that skill book with 50 gold. Tiana inquired if Ling Si had also heard the news and especially came there for that equipment. Ling Si doesn't know anything about the equipment as he was coincidentally there to get some good gear. Next was the turn of the item, which was the highlight of the day, and the host explained that when they obtained it, they were in great shock and amazement. Everyone's attention was diverted toward the item, which was the day's highlight. A set of level 30 mithril grade thief equipment. The host uncovered the item and uttered that the item was the mithril grade Black Viper's Scorching Venom. When this item is equipped, the player's HP decreases by 15%, and all the player's attacks will have an added poison effect. In addition, the player will be immune to 45% of the damage from poison type attacks. When inflicted with the poison status, the damage dealt by the player will increase by 30% during the entire duration. Soon, the item description appeared on everyone's screen, which said, according to the legends, this is the special equipment of Bereaved Scorpion, the legendary thief of the Black Blood Desert who strikes fear in all who hear his name. This item has been soaked for countless days in the venom of the deadliest snake in the desert. The Black Sun Viper then lays in the blazing heat of the relentless desert sun, so the person must be prepared to be eaten away by it before putting it on. 
So, the owner thought that only those who could be cruel enough to themselves and their enemies had the right to own it. The protagonist expects that mithril-grade equipment will be auctioned today. Even though it was not a top-tier-grade item, it was more than enough fry now, which thrilled him. The protagonist guessed all those people might have come for this equipment because mithril-grade equipment is scarce. Coco Lai explained that this mithril-grade thief equipment was what Stillwater wanted them to obtain. This was only because they heard the news beforehand that they knew it would be on auction. Because a complete set of equipment like this is complex to come by, she assumed they might also know how much value a good set of equipment can create. The protagonist knew that other people must be thinking the same way, but the vice guild master didn't want it to get into the hands of others. The host was sure that everyone had seen the details of this mithril-grade equipment, so he didn't want to delay the auction. The bid stayed at 30 gold and requested everyone to place their bid, and it rose from 32 gold to 100 gold by the representative of Abundant Days Consortium. Other people were shocked as they bid hundreds of gold from the beginning and assumed they might be rich. The Leap of the Change Consortium bid of 150 gold eclipsed the Abundant Days Consortium bid of 100 gold. Tana was startled as they began the bidding war and was only at the early bidding stages. Coco Lai raises her hand and bids 300 gold. She wants them to stop wasting her time and stop trying to sound each other out and show her what they all have. They were shocked by such a high bid and the old man of Leap of Change remarked that she was a brazen girl. Since that was the case, they didn't want them to belittle the Leap of Change consortium, so they bid 500 gold. The host was amazed and the Leap of Chang was quite forthright as they offered 100 gold and inquired if there were any higher bids. The Abundant Days Consortium representative offered 600 gold, but Tiana soon placed the bid for 700. The protagonist was amazed and thought that a person should never underestimate a woman's desire to buy things as the aura of these two was entirely different from their usual selves. With this, everyone continued raising the bid, which soon reached a thousand gold, and that amazed others as those people were wealthy. After the bid reached a thousand gold, the host wondered if anyone could offer a higher bid, and the female player from Abundant Days Consortium placed a bid of 1,500 gold. This shocked the host, and his eyes spread out of shock, and he asked if there was anyone who would place a bid higher than 1,500. Coco Lai raised her hand, put the bid of 1,600, and was fed up as it was such a headache when these rich finance consortiums got going. Leap of Change representative raised his hand and increased the bid to 1,700. He was concerned as he knew they had come prepared. Abundant Days Consortium raised this bid to 2,000 gold, which shocked everyone as this was an extravagant offer. Her fellow looked at her and laughed as if women had no mercy when it came to shopping. The man wondered if Leap of Change representatives thought they could always suppress Abundant Days and was certain that this set of equipment would be theirs. The other representative's Leap of Change put his hand on the old man's shoulder and instructed him to stop now as they had just brought 2,000 gold. The old man cursed the other group and decided to show them some mercy this time. The bidding was about to be locked at 2,000 gold, and the host lifted his gavel and started the countdown. Tiana and Coco Lai were concerned since the bid was 2,000 gold, and they couldn't place any further bids and were helpless. Abundant Days Consortium representative looked at others and smirked as he was delighted that they knew their place. Soon, the protagonist lifted his hand and placed the bid of 2,500 gold, which shocked everyone. They started staring at him and were astounded as Ling Si again placed a high bid and wondered where this rich man came from. The protagonist gets puzzled and wonders if there is something wrong with offering 2500 gold. Leap of the Change representative was also startled to know that the same person bought Bloodthirsty Shadow for 50 gold. They assumed Ling Si might represent a finance consortium, but they didn't hear anything about any other finance consortium being there. Abundant Days Consortium representatives were also shocked and wondered who that person was and if he was from Nebulous. His female fellow thought that if he were from Nebulous, they would not need to bid separately. Tiana looked at Ling Si and asked if he was going with this price for real, and if he was unaware that he was bidding at 2500 gold as an individual participant. The protagonist is well aware of this, so he wants her not to worry as he would handle it well. The host started the countdown to lock the deal at 2,500 gold, but abruptly, Abundant Days Consortium brought up the bid to 3,000. The protagonist stared at them, and the lady from Abundant Days was shocked when she heard the bid was raised to 4,000 by Ling Si. 
The protagonist looked at her and smirked because he would counter all their offers no matter how high they bid. This shocked all of them, and the protagonist pretended to be free of worry and wanted to finish the fight quickly. But deep inside, he was concerned as he thought it was enough because he was overdoing it and hadn't got much money left. Abundant Day's representative was shocked, and they wondered who he was as this tycoon came out of nowhere and the deal was locked at 4,000 gold. Ultimately, the Black Viper's scorching venom fell unquestionably into Ling Si's hand, and he became the most striking person in this auction. As for the protagonist, he randomly made up an excuse to hoodwink the others even though Tiana and Coco Lai did not buy it one bit. Finally, Ling Si got to put on the mithril grade set as he had wished, and just as he had the chance to catch his breath, there was an unexpected situation. He received a crucial public notification congratulating the players whose information was hidden for being the first to reach level 50. This shocked the protagonist as someone reached level 50 that early, and he couldn't believe he had forgotten about such an important DLC. Another notification appeared that a new DLC would be opened after that day's updates, Thus, the adventurer was alerted as Heavenland's unknown territory was about to be unveiled. They were about to welcome the new era of Heavenland as the Beacon Tower of the Twelve Cities opened its doors. All guild players could obtain torch fire by completing the related missions, so they were instructed to light up the Beacon Towers to seize the cities. Ling Si knew that after level 50, what awaits Heavenland, the oppression of levels would worsen. As for those twelve cities, they are the bringers of the new era, which is the era of the guilds. The protagonist assumes he should start looking for ways to climb the level ranking. Later, at Nebulous Guild Lounge, the players were gossiping about the twelve cities' downloadable content released three days ago. Still, the competition was already heated up, which thrilled them. Since it will be based on completing a mission, every guild can participate, and the guild will be fighting over the control of the cities of Beacon Tower. The guild that lights it up at the end will get to win the city, so they have been doing a few missions the past few days and contributed some torch fire, but other guilds weren't far behind them. The guild master Stillwater heard their conversation and asked Coco Lai if they still couldn't contact Ling Si. The vice guild master was frustrated as he wasn't replying to her messages. She was sure he probably hadn't even read them, so she hadn't seen or heard from him after the auction. Three days ago, before the release of the notice, Ling Si sent the guild master a message that he wanted some time and assured him he would reply after he got back. The guild master honestly told her that he was glad to see his message at first, which shows that he hadn't forgotten his words. But he didn't know how long his time would take. Coco Lai teased him as she saw him concerned about Ling Si. However, she told him that at the auction, Ling Si exuded the confidence that would inexplicably make others want to trust him. She could see why Stillwater chose him. This surprised the guild master as he never thought he had seen the day when his strict childhood friend would speak favorably of someone else. This pissed her off, and she wondered who he was calling his closer than a neighbor's childhood friend. Since the guild master decided she wanted to support him, she favored Ling Si. Stillwater had to give up before her and agreed with her, but in any case, he hoped that Ling Si could hurry up with whatever work he was doing. No one knows, they might still have to rely on Ling Si to complete the Twelve Cities. Meanwhile, the protagonist was amazed at Casfado Information Archives, which was still the same as usual, as hardly anyone was around. Three days ago, when the new DLC was officially released, the usually dormant badge of the Glorious responded. Looking for clues should have been like searching for a needle in a haystack, but this time, the lead served itself to the protagonist on a silver platter, which was entirely unexpected. He also had a suspicion that this lead had something to do with one of the cities of the Twelve Cities. Bearing that in mind, he thoroughly researched what he could find about each of the Twelve Towns, but still needed to find something. There was no sign of anything that could trigger a mission, but his guts told him that he was on the right track. He knew the badge of glorious, unusual activity must have something to do with one of the Twelve Cities. While looking around the archiver, he was certain that there must be something that he had overlooked and assumed the answer could be found there. The protagonist finally found the administrator of the information archives. As usual, Ling Si knew that he would have to raise his affinity level with the NPC before he could ask his questions. There probably aren't many people who know about these mechanics, and he greeted the honorable administrator and asked if he could do anything to assist. The administrator asked him if he could help put these files back on the shelves, and the protagonist affirmed. 
He started putting the files back in their place and knew helping the old man to shelve these away would trigger the inquiry function. If he wanted to look up anything in the future, he could go straight to him and with the administrator reliable information, so he had to save much time. With this, he has increased his affinity level with the administrator and unlocked the inquiry function. After he finished putting the files away, he went to the administrator and informed him about it. The administrator thanked him and commented that patients like him are hard to come by. The protagonist uttered that if he permitted him, then there was something he would like to inquire about. He asked if there were any files related to the recently released 12 cities as he wanted to read them. The protagonist knew he had to use the keyword inquire to express what he was after to get the NPC to react accordingly. The administrator instructed the protagonist to follow him if he wanted to know about the information about the 12 cities. The protagonist was delighted as, luckily, this went well, so he followed him. Soon, they reached a location where some files were explicitly protected by putting them inside the cabinet. The administrator informed him that these were the files related to the Twelve Cities. Ling Si appreciated his help. The non-player character was leaving when the protagonist uttered that these were just information on the lore and customs of the Twelve Cities. These books include some exciting myths and legends, but there needed to be a substantive lead that he could take. But there was nothing related to the Badge of Glorious, and he wondered if he was overthinking it. The administrator heard it, came near the protagonist, and called him, which startled Ling Si. The administrator came near him and questioned if he was talking about the Badge of the Glorious. This shocked the protagonist, and he wondered if the Badge of Glorious was a particular trigger keyword. He affirmed and asked if there was anything NPC could tell him about that. The NPC asked the protagonist if he knew which of the twelve cities was the most ancient and the largest. The protagonist is surprised and utters that this is Moonlight City, which is ruled by the headless rider, Moonlight Lacked. The administrator affirmed that was right because of the twelve cities. Moonlight City was the one that struck the most fear in the hearts of all who heard its name. Not only is it the Headless Rider, Moonlight lacks territory, but it's also flooded with a dense, terrifying aura. It was said that entering Moonlight City could only be done after nightfall. The protagonist agreed, as it is just as the NPC told of all the twelve cities, that the Moonlight City mission was the least popular among players. The map is obscenely large, and all missions can only be done at night because of the terrifying setting. On top of that, one would also occasionally be pursued by the Headless Rider, and hardly any players would take on that city's mission. Since he knew that much information, the NPC asked if he knew what Moonlight lacked appellation was before becoming the Headless Rider. The protagonist apologized as he didn't know about it and wondered if there was something like that. He didn't remember coming across anything related to this when digging through the files earlier. The administrators explained that Moonlight Lacked was formerly known as the Glorious Knight. He was the champion of the Glorious One and also one of the protectors. Also, the Moonlight City they know was known as the Glorious City. The secret of the Badge of the Glorious was hidden there, that was what Moonlight Lacked was guarding. The protagonist was shocked and wondered how exactly this information was coming from the NPC administrator. This was way beyond what the info chip of the Twelve Cities contained. The protagonist was startled as suddenly his badge of glorious was responding. The badge came out of his costume and emitted such tremendous energy that it covered the whole place. The administrator stared at Ling Si and uttered that he who bore the badge of the glorious, it was the time to subjugate the champions of the past once again. The administrator informed the protagonist, who was utterly shocked by such massive energy emitted by his badge, that his glorious journey had begun. On the contrary, after gaining 15 torch fires, the player was delighted and asked the others how many they got. The other player affirmed that they had contributed 75 torch fires in total five of them. After healing, they resumed their mission grinding and did three daily missions. That goes without saying, as their boss has already instructed them, their main priority is to scale the torch fire leaderboard. It has been three days now. Even though it has just started, they can't take it lightly because the momentum of the top five guilds was way too strong. Ruko asked them if they would not participate in this torch fire event as it looked fun. Tilly's refused as it doesn't benefit them much, nor is it an efficient way to spend their time. She could tell at a glance that this event was meant for guilds, and there was no point in them participating. She reminded them that Ling Si told them to level up while he took care of something significant. 
but from what she has heard, the mission has a difficulty range of 1 to 5 stars, and the solo missions are much more difficult even in the same challenging setting. If the reward of a typical team mission was the torch fire per member, then the reward for a solo mission of the same level is about tenfold, making it a hundred torch fires, that was the gist. Ruko was excited as he heard it would be tenfold, and he thought it would be great if they could exchange that for experience. Tilly's clarified that this is unsurprising because the higher the difficulty, the greater the reward. She diverted their attention toward another guild, even among the top five guilds, no one bothered with the solo mission. That was because the probability of failure is too high, so no one bothers with those, so she don't want to waste her time. This makes sense to Ruko, who was pondering that if his brother Ling Si were there, he would probably take on the most arduous five-star solo mission that gives the highest reward without a blink. Tilly's agreed, as this was very much like him, and they wondered what he was up to now. Meanwhile, at the Moonlight City entrance, the protagonist is pleased as it is finally nighttime and he can't believe he must wait until night falls to accept missions from Moonlight City. The notification appeared that he had received a solo mission with five-star difficulty. Its reward was Threethan and Torchfire. To complete the mission, he had to eradicate the Headless Rider. Moonlight City was the largest and most ruined of the twelve cities, and according to what the administrator said, it was formerly known as the Glorious City. This was unexpected because if it wasn't for its connection with the Badge of the Glorious, he assumed it might be no different from the other eleven cities. Furthermore, the moment he set foot into this area, it felt like the Badge of the Glorious was being beckoned by something because it kept glowing. He wondered if it could resonate with the Headless Hunter, the former Glorious Knight. The protagonist opened the gate and entered the mission map. He felt excited as it had been long since he had looked forward to something so much. He rushed inside because he had been there for a team mission in his previous life and hadn't felt anything much. He didn't think being there alone would send chills down his spine, and he wanted to gather his thoughts by recalling his past life memories. He remembered that this mission aimed to annihilate the Headless Knight, but the main point was to look for clues. He knew that to find the Headless Knight, he must first find his grave. Otherwise, he knew he would lose him quickly, considering how swiftly and mysteriously he moved. So many spirits surrounded him, and he remembered that he wasn't in charge of hunting for clues in his previous life, as he was only responsible for dealing damage. He cursed himself, as when accepting this mission, he had forgotten that he was not good at such things. He gets terrified as someone comes near him and asks what he is looking for. Thinking it might be a spirit, he is extremely frightened. The NPC asked him if he needed any help, and when he came back to his senses, he realized it was not a ghost, but he got scared to death by her. The protagonist asked the old lady if she had heard about the headless rider. This startled her, and she got panicked and close to him. She instructed him that this was not something he could say aloud there as that was a cursed name. Another young lady exited the house and requested her grandmother stop talking nonsense. The old lady asked her why she came out, as she had already instructed her many times that she should not come out at night as it was unsafe. She had one foot in the coffin, so it doesn't matter to her, but she can let anything happen to her granddaughter again. The young lady assured her that she was fine, so it was right for her to come outside the door and request her grandmother not to worry too much about her. But the old lady disagreed, so she pushed her back and wanted her to hurry inside. She thought about how she would face her parents if seething happened to her. The girl requested that the protagonist come inside to talk because what he mentioned now she could help him with that. The protagonist apologized for his intrusion and went inside their house with them. He saw the pictures of a man and a woman on the shelf with whom that girl bears a resemblance, so he assumed they might be her parents. The girl affirmed that they were her parents, but they had already passed away and the protagonist was apologetic on hearing this. The protagonist can't believe it as they have programmed responses for this too and is impressed by the AI of these NPCs on another level. The girl became gloomy and uttered that the headless rider had killed her parents. That night, her parents were decapitated and all that was left of them were a pair of headless corpses. She and her grandmother were the only ones left. Her grandmother was getting old, but she still risks the danger of going out at night to look for wild vegetables to keep them both alive. In the past two years, the Headless Rider has decapitated nearly hundreds of their fellow villagers. Everyone knows that the Headless Rider of Moonlight Lact has been driven mad in his search for his head. 
The protagonist is stunned as he knows that many villagers were decapitated and inquires how many villages like hers are there in Moonlight City and if they all experience similar things. She explained that they were the only village and the only other settlement was the large city above, but they were the only ones haunted by the headless rider. Between the people who perished and those who have fled, the only ones left in this village were the old and weak. The protagonist wondered why they were the only ones haunted, and was astounded as these were the things he had never heard of in his previous life. He assumed he would have to treat this as a brand new mission. He knew a mission about the Badge of Glorious wouldn't be that simple. The girls rambled that she heard some elder say that the upper town's mayor seemed to have some secret agreement with the headless rider. She always had her suspicions that that town mayor might be the cause of their unfortunate fate. The protagonist is trying to find a connection between the headless rider and the town mayor and is startled as he thinks it might be an event flag trigger. He was shocked and asked the NPC if she was saying he might have the head. She affirmed that she suspected that the mayor was holding on to the head of the headless rider. The system notification appeared and he was congratulated as he activated the hidden prologue mission trial to the Path of Glory. To reveal the headless rider's secret, he was instructed to follow the young lady to meet with the town mayor. So, his next target was the town on the cliff to figure out the reality, and the girl was willing to lead the way to the upper city because she wanted to make the mayor pay for what he had done. Later, they reached the castle, which many soldiers guarded. The girl explained that those were the mayor's guards, and she heard they were all formidable warriors. The protagonist assumed they had to break in by force and asked if that was the case or if she had a better idea. The young lady apologized as she hadn't got any good idea to get this passed and supposed she was too reckless as she had forgotten that people were standing guard. The protagonist agreed, but he was startled as he saw a guard heading in their hiding direction. This concerned the girl and she wondered what they should do now, and she had no idea how to avoid this situation. The protagonist thought that because the NPC who brought him there had no better ideas, he guessed that he had to barge in. The guards on their rounds were startled as they saw them, asked if they were, and informed them that this was the mayor's residence. The protagonist greeted them, and the guards assumed his eyes might be just for show, so he didn't want the protagonist to blame them for being rough. The guards attacked him, but Ling Si dodged the attack and was glad when they showed him their health bar. The protagonist uttered that if he hadn't revealed it, then Ling Si would be wondering if he was attacking a neutral NPC by mistake. The protagonist attacked the NPC using a throat slasher, which the guards blocked using a skilled chain guard. The protagonist was impressed by their strong defense and assumed this kind of attack wouldn't be any good against them. The protagonist attacked them with his elemental manifestation, Thunder Flash, and wanted to see how they would evade this attack. With this attack, he quickly subjugated those NPC, and they fell to the ground. Ling Si knew that his physical attacks wouldn't work on them, and was certain those NPCs didn't expect that he might be a mage too. Another girl appeared and was impressed as they passed their defenses, so she granted them entry. The protagonist was startled as she could have just invited them in earlier and wondered if it was also part of the mission. They went inside, where the mayor was having dinner, and while drinking, he said he heard someone looking for him. The mayor's servant affirmed that they were an adventurer from a foreign land requesting to meet him. The mayor wonders what the protagonist wants from him and after they explain why they came there. The mayor remarked that was a good one and inquired what that remorse killing machine had to do with him. The protagonist inquired why the headless rider was only targeting the village below, yet the town that was right above was wonderful. The mayor also guessed the same, they wanted to know how his town would remain safe and sound. The protagonist affirmed that whatever the case is, he wants to keep pressing on with the keyword headless rider. The mayor was expecting that from an outsider, and he guessed they might have yet to learn about the dark forces beyond Moonlight City. The young girl is surprised to hear about the dark forest. The protagonist wonders what sort of place that dark forest is. She explained that a forest lies past Moonlight City, and the trees there have all withered away due to a curse. Out of fear, the people there called it the Dark Forest, a forbidden land that no one dares to set foot in. The mayor added to her information that the Dark Forest is also the place where the Headless Rider was buried. The protagonist was a bit confused as this was entirely outside the lore of the Twelve Cities as the original Moonlight City. He knew if he didn't have something like a Dark Forest at all. The mayor explained that the town remains unharmed from the Headless Rider rampage because he found the Witch of Death in the Dark Forest. 
he uttered that the omniscient witch told him how to avoid such a disaster, and he took out his artificial eyeball and said that he had also paid the price for the knowledge. The mayor knew that there were rumors that he had hidden away the head of the headless rider and used that as leverage. There were too many rumors that he had gotten used to them long ago. They were shocked to see this. Since that was the case, the protagonist asked him about the location in the dark forest where he could find the Witch of Death. The mayor instructed them to keep walking toward the moon, and the witch was right under the moonlight. Soon, they reached the dark forest, and he knew this was a game and all, but this kind of atmosphere was still a bit terrifying. The protagonist informs the girl that she is the one who insists on coming along and suggests that she leave if she regrets it. Soon, the notification appeared as he agreed to the NPC's request to accompany him. The protagonist attacks the monstrous trees, and in the process, the girl gets injured, but he chooses not to abandon her, carries her on his back, and progresses further. After some time, they reach the hut, and they assume this might be the right place as the style was exactly what one would expect of a witch dwelling. The protagonist wondered if they should knock on the door, and soon after they knocked on it, the voice came from inside inquiring if they came there to seek an answer. They were standing quietly, and the witch informed them that they had to offer their tributes first. The witch came outside while holding the skeleton head in her hand and said they would get the right to enter her house after offering something. She reached out and smiled wickedly, wanting to have one left hand as an offering from them. The system notification appeared to inform him that the Witch of Death asked for his left hand and inquired if he would accept her demand. He was told beforehand that if he handed over his left hand, he would gain entry into the house, but if he refused, he would permanently fail this mission. But if he agrees to her demand, he will lose his left hand forever and will never be able to perform all actions and maneuvers that require his left hand. The protagonist was dumbfounded to read all these descriptions and wondered if this was for real while staring at two options that appeared before him. The protagonist was puzzled as he could only continue the mission by agreeing, but he would permanently lose his left hand. But rejecting it wasn't an option as it would lead to instant failure. He knew the badge of glorious mission wouldn't be easy, but this was ridiculous. Losing his left hand permanently was a kind of permanent curse. In Heaven's Land, there are times when players would trigger various debuffs known as permanent curses. This sort of debuff is permanent, which means it's bound to their ID forever. He knew that permanent curses come in all shapes and forms. In his previous life, he had heard that a player accidentally triggered a curse from a treasure chest and was permanently unable to equip any chest armor. As a warrior, it was fatal for him as he had no choice but to create a new ID and start over. The protagonist wonders if he will also give up his left hand for good or if it will be restored upon the mission's completion. The protagonist was concerned as he knew that if it could be repaired, there would be a hint or something, but the title of the Glorious One would grant him even greater power. The witch asked him if he decided as the entry requirement was his one left hand. This was a difficult decision for him, but he wanted to try it, so he firmly clenched his fist and clicked the agree button. He thought that if he couldn't restore his left hand, he would have to master his dagger techniques with one hand. Since he agreed to submit his left hand, he was informed that he would lose it permanently. The witch retrieved her weapon and laughed as she took his left hand. Ling Si closed his eyes as she swung her weapon. The blood splattered in the air, and as he opened his eyes, he was stunned as he saw the NPC with whom he traveled in front of him and sacrificed her hand, and her hand flew away in the air. The protagonist was shocked and inquired why she did that. He wondered what was going on as she helped him, even though she was just an NPC. Her hand gets inside the bag the witch holds, and she utters that it is all good as long as it is a left hand, so anyone's hand would be enough to meet her requirement after which the system notification appeared, informing him that he had cared for the maiden the entire way there. She has taken the initiative to sacrifice her left hand to help pave the way for his path to glory. The protagonist now understands the whole scenario, and the witch permits them to enter her house as she will answer his questions. The NPC remarked that he couldn't lose his left hand as she was sure it had a grander purpose ahead, so she sacrificed in his stead. The protagonist realized that this NPC might offer her left hand in his place because of his protection and care, which is probably the scenario designed for this situation. The girl requested him to continue onward and uncover the secret of the headless rider at all costs. Only then will her parents and all the villagers' souls be able to rest in peace.
He thanked her for her sacrifice and promised to get to the bottom of this matter, but he wanted her to get some rest out there for now. The witch opened the door of her house to let him in, so he came inside, and he was pretty uncomfortable with the sight of her home. The witch allowed him to ask three questions. The protagonist was amazed to know three as he thought he could ask one question. He asked his first question, which was about the method the mayor used to keep his town safe from the headless rider's slaughter. The witch uttered that she told him what the headless rider's greatest fear was, leaving him with two more questions. The protagonist was dumbfounded as that was succinct, he didn't want to waste another question to ask what the headless rider's fear. But it seems like that was what the mayor was using against him. Many things in this mission were different from what he had experienced in his previous life. For his second question, he wanted to know about the location of the head of the headless rider to solve this mystery. In his earlier life, the grave of the headless rider was in the depths of a moonlight city. The players only had to fight their way through and engage in a showdown with a headless rider, and victory was rewarded with a ton of torch fire. But now the grave's location has changed as it's no longer in the city's depth, but rather somewhere in this previously unheard dark forest. The witch was startled by this question and inquired if he wanted to know about the head location, and he affirmed. After following the trail of clues, he is confident the head is the key to this mystery, so he has to find it. The witch thinks for a while and clarifies that there is no such thing within Moonlight City as the head of the headless rider. The protagonist is shocked, and the girl standing outside is furious and remarks that it is impossible, so she thinks she might be lying. It was because the headless rider had been looking for his head that he began a killing spree, so there was no way it didn't exist. She started crying as if that wouldn't be the case. Then she wondered why her parents would have died and asked for her explanation. The witch was stunned as she doubted her answer and informed them they had one last question to ask. It was his last question, so he assumed he had to get straight to the point, and he asked her about the location of the headless rider's grave in the dark forest. The witch looked to the side and pointed in a specific direction. She uttered that the grave of the headless rider Moonlight lacked lies beyond this path. She spoke that through the tunnel beneath the glorious moon lies the grave of headless rider. They reach there, and the protagonist is surprised as the headless rider's grave completely differs from his previous life's. He is startled as he sees the horse's soul coming toward him, after which the headless rider's grave emits tremendous energy. This startled the NPC, so she pointed there, and the horse reached his grave from which the hand of a headless rider emerged. The headless rider, level 40 feudal lord rank spirit, came out and sat on his horse. The protagonist is shocked to see a level 40 feudal lord rank knight, and he supposes they are not making things easy for him. The headless rider swung his sword to attack him, which startled Ling Si to see if he would engage just like that. Since that was the case, all he had to do was take him down, so he had no other choice. He could only go at him head on, and he wondered if the strategies from his previous life could still work. The protagonist instructs the girl to go and hide somewhere safe, and the headless rider lifts his sword to attack Ling Si again. The protagonist evaded its attack and rushed back, then, using the backstab, he attacked him, but the headless rider's sword blocked his subsequent attack. The protagonist was startled by his opponent's speedy recovery and was certain things were different from his previous life. The headless warrior swung his sword and attacked Ling Si, but soon realized it was his clone which turned into an evil spirit in visibility and tried to haunt him. The protagonist was impressed by the headless rider because, besides being huge, he was genuinely agile. He was glad as he cast evil spirit in visibility ahead of time and realized that he had quite a troublesome opponent this time. The headless rider rushed to attack the protagonist, and he attacked the protagonist using the trample of lamentation. But he managed to evade his attack and was impressed by his incredible force, which felt like the power of a pile driver. Then, using Knight of the Gathering Souls, he rushed to attack Ling Si again. The protagonist was amazed to see his moves, so he assumed he should forget about winning through the regular strategies. Using Dominion of the Mercenaries, Ling Si summoned the Scarlet Warriors to fight alongside him and rushed to attack him. The Headless Rider also summons his warrior, and the protagonist kills them individually along with his warrior. He was thankful to his opponent for allowing him to gain a free stack, so he used the combination of Thunder Flash and Throat Slasher and attacked him. Ling Si wanted them to get shredded by his thunderous judgment. This startled the Headless Rider, so he used Moonlight Cleaver and attacked the Scarlet Warrior. 
Suddenly, a massive explosion worried the girl accompanying Ling Si. Soon, the dust disappeared, which made the sight visible, and he was impressed by his skill as he managed to reduce Ling Si HP to half. The protagonist rushed and climbed up using the tree, reaching close to the headless rider to attack. He informed the headless rider that he was not the only one who knew how to compliment the moon, but now it was his turn. He used his spell thief combination skill vessel of the restless chaos and bloodthirsty shadow and attacked the headless rider. The NPC was shocked by the massive destruction caused by Ling Xia's single attack. This combination skill was a thief exclusive skill that transforms into multiple afterimages instantly. Each after image will attack the nearest target and absorb 10% of the damage dealt as HP. The player was invulnerable in the afterimage state, whose effect will last for 1 5 seconds, and he gave impressive damage to Moonlight Lacked. The protagonist was congratulated as he defeated the headless rider Moonlight Lacked, and after completing his mission, his glorious badge started shining again, which shocked the protagonist. He was startled as he looked ahead and saw the headless rider was coming back to his life again. The headless rider was stunned and asked if the light of glory shone within him, which shocked the protagonist. The headless rider knelt before Ling Si and was delighted to see his honorable master. With this, his mission is updated as the Guardian Moonlight Knight, the headless rider, recognizes him as his master. The protagonist was requested to restore him to his original form and find a way to help the headless rider recover his original identity. The protagonist is shocked as the headless rider starts calling him his master, and he is amazed to see what the moonlight latch seemed like in the past when he was a knight. The girl was surprised to see the headless ride transformed into a knight and inquired if Ling Si was his master now, and he affirmed. Soon he started getting the experience points from completing the mission and was stunned to see the massive amount of experience leading him straight to level 40. The system notification appeared, informing him that he was at level 40, and he wondered if this was because that mission was related to Badge of Glorious. This unique mission gave him an extraordinary amount of experience, so his level went up. Soon, the image of the knight disappeared, and he assumed that being recognized as his master was the method necessary to restore the headless knight to his original state. The knight started conversing with his honorable master as he needed to find his head quickly. Hearing him discussing shocked Ling Si, and he assumed that defeating him might have triggered that. The knight urged that the glory his master had bestowed upon him in the past be buried alongside his head, which was long forgotten in the sands of time. His head was stolen by someone with ill intentions and was hidden in another territory. The protagonist is stunned to know that the headless rider's head is hidden in another territory, which means it is on another map. Now he understood why the witch said there was no such thing when he inquired about the head's location. It was because the head wasn't anywhere on the Moonlight Latch City map. The knight affirmed that he was also confident that his head was not in Moonlight City and explained that before meeting his master, he had also lost his rationality due to losing his head. He killed indiscriminately in his mad hunt for his missing head, but looking back, the knight realized that the mayor's claim of knowing where his head is present was a lie. The protagonist understood that it might be the weakness of the headless rider, which the mayor learned from the witch, which was why the mayor used to strike a deal with the headless rider in the past. The headless rider requested his respectful master to let this word be enveloped in the light of glory once again. He wanted his master to release his great brilliance once more as he would follow his master in his journey. With this, the protagonist learned a particular summoning phase and was congratulated on obtaining the right to summon the headless rider, Moonlight Latch. The protagonist is dazed because being recognized by the knight grants him the right to summon him whenever he wants. Ling Si received the mount summoning whistle and was congratulated on obtaining the right to summon the spectral horse. The protagonist was delighted to get the mount function and was a bit confused as in his previous life, and the mounts came in another DLC update. What was more shocking was that he was the only player to own a mount in the entire game currently, and he tried summoning the spectral horse, which appeared immediately and amazed him. The headless knight reminded his master that there was no time to waste because they had to set off for the other eleven cities in search of his missing head. The headless knight was sure that once he had restored his identity and regained his former powers, he would be there to protect his master. Meanwhile, the other players were startled by the abrupt increase in nebulous torch fires by 3000. They found this situation petrifying and wondered if that was from a team mission. 
They asked from which city they had that high torch fire reward, and they were concerned as their team mission didn't give them more than a hundred torch fire. The player assumed it might be a challenging mission, but he still didn't believe a mission with that kind of reward could be done solo. They still don't know about the twelve cities, and while gossiping, they are speechless about looking at the protagonist. The protagonist passes by while riding his mount spectral horse, which impresses the other players. On the contrary, unaware of his surroundings, Ling Si remembered that a main road ran through all eleven cities. He must search all those cities individually since he has yet to learn where the head is. Along the way, he could also take on some solo mission to earn some torch fire for Nebulus, but he knew it was best to keep a low profile as much as possible. He rushed toward his next target, those eleven cities, while the players were a bit confused, wondering if there was even a mount in this game, and assumed they might be seeing things. In the following days, Ling Si searched for the Headless Rider Head while taking on the most difficult solo mission in the various cities. It was also during these days when the legend of Ling Si was born, and the players speculated if this existence that emerged after the release of the Twelve Cities was a player or an NPC. He rides a spectral warhorse, accompanying a frightening knight who towers over them, but his movements are shrouded in mystery. There were accounts of players spotting him from a distance, only for him to vanish in the next second. This continued until Ling Si finally found the headless rider head in the ninth city. After defeating the monster, he opened a chest, took out the knight's head, and informed the knight about this delighting and most awaited news. That was a tough one to find as they had been searching for the head for so many days, and he lifted the head, putting it on the headless knight, thus returning him to his original form. The knight was most grateful to his master because with his head returned, he could finally restore his identity and his powers. The energy emitted after acquiring his head and the notification appeared, informing him that the headless rider had regained his missing head. So, he will restore his glorious identity as the Moonlight Knight and regain his massive power. The knight knelt before his master while holding his sword to show his respect to his master for helping him. After the protagonist finds the head, his mission is updated and he is congratulated as the Guardian Moonlight Knight has returned and restored his identity. The protagonist was now one step closer to the status of the Glorious One, and he could summon the powerful guardian whenever he wanted. Ling Si was delighted as the reward from the Badge of Glorious was truly far-fetched, and he wondered if the reward in the future would be even crazier. In addition to summoning the knight, the Spectral Horse mount became his permanent mount. He was requested to continue to search for more clues and find the past guardians so the path of glory continues. His overall mission progression was 20%, and he was ahead of the other two candidates. The protagonist smirked as he finally began understanding why some players in his previous life became so inconceivably powerful. He assumed they might be the same as Ling Si is presently, and they would also happen to obtain extraordinary missions by chance. The protagonist wanted to remember that although he had the badge of glory, he was one of the three who had been chosen as a candidate. The global notification congratulated the player with hidden information about obtaining Heaven Land's first mount. Everyone was informed that the mount function should be implemented in the next update, along with the mount ranking board, so all the adventurer were instructed to go forth and seek their mount. The players were impressed that God-tier player triggered the mount function, and with this, the game was ultimately releasing the mount function. One of the players has been waiting for this, so he has to find a mount that could climb the mount ranking board, he can't wait for the next update. Later in the real world, Ling Si was pleased because the game was being updated so he could finally attend a school day properly. Soon, he was at the school inside his classroom, staring outside toward the bird, which had its freedom. Ling Si can't wait for school to be over and is wondering what his grandfather will cook for dinner that night. He thinks it would be great if there were fried chicken. On the other side, Tang Ki's friend called and informed him that school was almost over, so they had to teach that new transfer student a lesson. Tang Ki agreed and stared at Ling Si furiously, wanting to get back at him for everything he had done to them in the past. He had asked his cousin, who was awakened, to come to the school, which made him further confident. His friend was also delighted as he was expecting this move from him. Later, the car stopped by the school entrance. Tang Ki informed him that his cousin was also the handler for this district. He confirmed with his cousin over the phone and assured him that he would be waiting outside the school gate for Ling Si. The giant, muscular man holding the cigarette came out of the car and was waiting for Ling Si at the entrance. 
After school ended, Ling Si was packing his stuff to leave for home immediately, but he was startled when his homeroom teacher called him. The teacher was slightly confused but still smiled and informed him that their school would hold a sports meet with a few other schools. They still need one more male student from her class, so she thought it would be great if Ling Si could participate in the competition. The protagonist was reluctant as he had never been involved in any sports or school activities in his previous life. Homeroom teacher Zhu Ting tried to convince him, but she had to ask him because there weren't many male students in their class willing to participate. She was surprised as Ling Si agreed with her and permitted his teacher to put his name on the list. Even though he hadn't participated in such things before, he was confident it would be fine in this life. His teacher got excited and thanked Ling Si for supporting his teacher's efforts and helping her. Ling Si uttered that this is what a student should do, so she shouldn't be thankful to him. She decided to leave first. She instructed him to be careful on her way back. After he came out, he started getting nervous for some reason and assumed it might be because it was his first time participating in a school activity. The protagonist winked as he thought he should keep his profile as low as possible. So he wanted to avoid using his power as an awakened when the time came, as it was best for him to avoid needless trouble. The protagonist was startled to see many students gathered in front of the gate and wondered why it was so crowded. Tang Ki saw him from the crowd pointing at him. He informed his cousin that the white-haired kid was Ling Si and he dared to mess with him. The protagonist is infuriated at being called a white-haired kid and the student's concentration is diverted toward him. The bully cousin took out the cigarette from his mouth and asked if he was Ling Si who teased his cousin. Tang Ki told his cousin it was him and said he had gotten in his way many times. His cousin was surprised as that was new because he didn't think there would be anyone in the school who had gone against Tang Ki. He wondered if that new student didn't know about him and who he was and because of this, he messed with him. All of the students were concerned as they thought Ling Si was doomed and wondered why, from all the students, he had to offend Tang Ki's cousin. The students heard he was a new transfer kid and pitied him as they assumed he might have accidentally offended Tang Ki. They were worried as Tang Ki's cousin was the handler of this district, so even the school couldn't do anything against him. The guard suggested that Ling Si head back inside the school because he was sure they weren't bold enough to barge in. The man scolded the guard and instructed him to shut up and get out of his sight. This terrified him, and he started trembling in fear. The protagonist thanked the security guard and was confident he would be all right. Tang Ki's cousin threw the cigarette away and was amazed by how confident Ling Si was. He instructed him to come to him as he wanted to chat with him. The protagonist was frustrated with such a hassle as all he wanted was to keep a low profile and enjoy a peaceful campus life. He wondered why some people like these always had come to mess things up, especially when many people were around. He went to the bully's cousin, which shocked the man, and asked if he didn't know who he was. He remembered Tang Ki's elder cousin and had some impression of him because in his previous life, he was the most infamous hooligan in the school district. Everyone knew him, but the protagonist wasn't bothered to learn more about someone with whom he had nothing to do. Tang Ki looked at the protagonist, grinned wickedly, and introduced his cousin, who was called Big East, to him. Trying to frighten Ling Si, he further elucidated that his cousin was not only awakened, but also the handler of the East District. The protagonist stared at him and assumed that because he was awakened, he might be overconfident. The protagonist inquired about his awakening rate and asked if he had been assessed by the officials yet. This shocked Tang Ki and his cousin, who got so furious that the veins on his face engorged, and he cursed Ling Si. An extraordinary killing aura covered his body, and he inquired how he dared to ask him such a question, and if he was trying to tell him what to do. Tang Ki was flustered, trying to calm down his cousin, and uttered that it was all right to scare him a bit. He doesn't want this problem to get messy and assures his cousin that he is trying to avoid trouble for his own sake. But his cousin was so furious that he didn't even understand him, and being overconfident, he thought there would be no problem for him because he had to be afraid of anyone in this entire district. Tang Ki was concerned and looked at the protagonist and assumed he was a dumbass, wondering why he had to bring that up. The officials had never assessed him because his cousin's awakening rate was not up to par. His cousin has only just managed to let that go recently, yet Ling Si brought back those bitter memories again and assumed he would get beaten to death now. 
The man reached out to Ling Si, telling him to come with him for a second, but Ling Si was calm and inquired if he was sure about that. The protagonist grabbed his hand and pulled him, which startled the man, and he wondered how this kid had such immense strength. It was such an overwhelming power that Tang Ki's cousin couldn't even put up a fight. This shocked all the students as they weren't expecting this from the Big East. Suddenly, another car appeared near the crowd, and the East District boss, Silver Viper, came out of it and was glad to see Ling Si after a long time. This shocked everyone, and they wondered why such a big shot would come to a place like this. They hurried to make way for Silver Viper. While stopping his opponent's arm, Ling Si greeted him and wasn't expecting to meet him there after a long time. Silver Viper was handling his business around the area, but didn't think he would run into brother Ling Si. Tang Ki's cousin was startled to see his boss there, and Silver Viper recognized his man and met him after a long time. He was amazed as he had toughened up. Big East was confused and wondered how that kid got to know his boss, Silver Viper. Silver Viper asked Ling Si if he had time and if they should have dinner together, but Ling Si turned him down as he had to go home and have dinner with his grandfather. Knowing that Ling Si knew Silver Viper shocked all the students because this was entirely unexpected. The protagonist took his bag and was about to leave, but a military vehicle appeared before that. The student was surprised to see the military wild beast, a vehicle on another level, and wondered what they were doing at their school. Looking at the vehicle, they could tell it must be a high-ranking military official, so they were confused to see there. The newly hired guard's jaw dropped out of shock, and he wondered what was going on as all the big shots were showing up all at once and wondered if they could let a security guard do his job peacefully. The military officer came out of a vehicle, saluted Ling Si, and informed him that the general had requested his presence so he should get in the car. Seeing the military official summon Silver Viper, and he guessed he wouldn't get Ling Si to treat him to a meal. Ling Si had no option but to go with them since the general had sent these people there. He supposed there might be something urgent that he could refuse, so he went to the vehicle. While getting inside, he told them his dinner was on them now. Tang Ki, who was witnessing this situation, was puzzled, wondering what Ling Si's background was as the hooligans, the underground, and the military all came there just for him. Silver Viper realized that Ling Si was a busy man, but with his caliber, he wasn't surprised that he had ties with the military. He waved to his man as he was also leaving now. Because Big East was in charge of the area, he instructed him that Ling Si's needs were just like his needs, so he wanted him to assist him to the best of his ability, and they affirmed. On the other hand, the protagonist asks the officer what is happening as they suddenly summon him. The officer looked back and informed him that there were direct general orders because of an emergency. He elucidated that a rebel organization composed of the Awakened had emerged. Some were extraordinarily powerful, hence, the general wanted him to eliminate this organization till night. Soon, Ling Si met Adolf and asked why they were in such a hurry that they wanted him to take care of those rebellions till night. Adolf clarified that the general is not one to let even the most negligible threat develop into an unknown possibility, so eradicating such threats on time is the wisest thing to do. The awakened are the category of existence that no one can afford to understand, so they shouldn't take risks. The protagonist agrees with him as that's true because all the awakened have the potential to become a significant threat, so they can't let their guard down. The general has given Adolf full authorization over this matter, so he will also be the middleman between him and the military from now on. So Adolf instructed him that if there was anything that Ling Si needed or anything that he didn't understand, he should come to him. But there was nothing that Ling Si needed as he wanted to get this done quickly so he could go home. He asked for the address, and when he would set off, Adolf instructed him to leave immediately. He took out the phone from the briefcase, handed it to Ling Si, and ordered him to use it for mission notification and emergencies from now on. He was forbidden to use this phone for any other purpose, personal or any other. Ling Si took the phone and saw the location of the rebel organization on the map, so he decided to leave immediately to reach the area quickly and inquired if someone would send him there or if he had to go there alone. Adolf refused as he had to get there alone because the military vehicle would attract too much attention and might put the other party on guard. Besides, they don't yet have complete information on the rebel organization's capabilities, so the military can't afford to make any thoughtless moves. The location was far away, so Ling Si wondered how he would get there and find them. 
Adolf uttered that because they had hidden in a residential area, it was even more difficult for them to do anything. This was also the main reason why they decided to send Ling Si there. So, the protagonist has no other option but to head there using a cab, thinking it's a drag. Before he left, Adolf delivered some word from the general that the new house he requested was ready. So when he returns to complete this mission, Adolf will take him to see the place. Because he handpicked the place, he was confident that Ling Si wouldn't be disappointed. On hearing this, the protagonist's eye sparkled with veracity, so he looked at Adolf and thanked him for the house. The protagonist figured out that he was reminding him that he would be rewarded if he completed this mission successfully but if he failed, he should forget about it. Soon, he reached the area, and based on the marked location, the rebel organization was in the slums. However, there was still a bit of distance between the point he was standing and the area where he lived. On his way, a lady approached him, calling him handsome, thus trying to flatter him. She wanted to attract him, but Ling Si refused and moved forward. The protagonist has no game plan, so he assumes he will take a look and decide from there. Finally, he reached a parking area of the building, where everything was quite messy and seemed as an abandoned area. He knew it was somewhere around there, but was unsure where they were hiding. The protagonist was startled as suddenly someone called him and asked if he had come there to join them. He looked to the side where the man wearing the strange costume was standing in the dark, leaning on the pillar. He uttered that he was asking him. The man inquired if he was an awakened who had been eliminated and asked if he had come there to join their team, Neo Avengers. Suddenly, many of those awakeners appeared while wearing superhero costumes. Ling Si was surprised to hear their group name. An awakener wearing the blue costume welcomed Ling Si to the Neo Avengers and introduced himself as they called him Captain Superbia. The lady wearing the black dress said she was White Widow, and the other two, named Dr. Tin Weird and the Bulk, also introduced themselves. The man holding the hammer introduced himself as Electrofer and asked Ling Si if he had a code name in mind. The protagonist was confused and wondered if they were indeed the people he had been looking for and why they were so bizarre. They were delighted to have another recruit in their team as their Neo Avengers will only become more vital with this. Then one day they will let the military acknowledge and respect their existence and give them the treatment they deserve. Captain Superbia was pleased to think that their rebellion would surely pay off when they all eliminated the Awakened Band together, then they would be a force to be reckoned with. The protagonist understood the situation as they were a bunch of rejects who were unsatisfied with their situation and thus went on and on about rebellion. He wondered why he had to take care of these weirdos and he couldn't understand what he had done to deserve this. The protagonist turned and remarked that he had gotten the wrong address and requested them to have fun. Electrofer called him and instructed him not to join their group because a splendid future lies ahead, so the eliminated awakened should assemble. The protagonist called Adolf, informing him that he had found the organization, but he gave his opinion that he didn't think there was anything to be worried about. As they are just a bunch of awakened who have been eliminated in terms of skills, Ling Si was certain they wouldn't even be able to defeat an ordinary soldier. Adolf wondered what Ling Si was talking about and if he was saying something was wrong with the military's intel. The intel they received states that they are a rebel organization and that compelling people are awakened among them. There were many strange alliances in the slums, so Adolf assumed that Ling Si might have run into the wrong group. The protagonist was shocked as he could feel the scorching heat and the noise of explosion. The rebellion was frustrated and instructed that he couldn't leave like this. All of them were heading toward him, furious, as the protagonist looked down on them, who were Neo Avengers. Unexpectedly, another member appeared to be a mage who could use fire elements, and he questioned whether if he wasn't there to join the Neo Avengers, then it meant that the officials had sent him. The rebellions were delighted to see their big sister returned, and the female mage asked Ling Si if he was awakened. She smirked and couldn't believe the military would send the awakened to fight them. She remarked that they were just spineless cowards and called Ling Si a traitor to the Awakened. The protagonist, conversing with Adolf, informs him that he has misjudged them as all the rebellions are present there. Captain Superbia was confident that the military was using the Awakened and having them go against each other. He wondered what the military wanted to see and requested his sister to let him finish that young kid off. He tried to toss Ling Si's head on the military's doorstep as a demonstration of how substantial they are, and she permitted him to fight. 
Captain Superbia went ahead and remarked that because Ling Si had chosen to be their puppet, he didn't want him to blame their group for being rough and wanted him to eat his shield attack. The protagonist was confident to clarify their misunderstanding as they were not qualified to be near him. Captain Superbia attacked him using his shield, but Ling Si evaded his attack. The female fire mage was thrilled that their opponent Awakena had some skill with him. So she rushed to attack him and instructed her fellow not to give him a chance to catch his breath so they should all attack simultaneously. The protagonist was impressed as he realized that one was a fire mage, he assumed she might be skilled as she could summon her in-game weapon in real life. He thought her awakening rate shouldn't be too low if she could summon a weapon. She is much stronger than the guy with a 54% awakening rate he met at the assessment. She admired that he had a good perception, but she also didn't want to go easy on him just because he was alone. The protagonist threw away his bag, covering his whole body with aura. He was amazed to see them all trying to gang up against him based on their number. The protagonist smirked, and using the dominion of the mercenary, he summoned his spectral warriors as he wanted to try this skill out in real life. The warrior rushed to attack them, and Ling Si was amazed as he had managed to summon his skill in real life. The mage rushed toward Ling Si while jumping away from that warrior, and she was concerned as she realized that this opponent would be the toughest of Awakenas they had faced till now. She was amazed as the most significant obstacle was standing in the way of the excellent rebellion army. The protagonist didn't expect he would be able to use Dominion of the Mercenary so smoothly, as he had supposed he would take a few more attempts, but this was going better than he had expected. Electrofer requested their leader to stop listening to his nonsense, even if Ling Si was more robust than them, but with their numbers, he was confident they would have no problem taking him down together. It says it's hard for two fists to go against four arms, so he wanted to see how strong the protagonist truly is. Hearing her companion saying this gives her a load of confidence, and her fellow raises his hammer, calling out their name aloud. After this, all Neo Avengers team members were alerted and transformed into their battle form. One of the members became muscular and tore his shirt, while all the others also used their abilities and assembled against Ling Si. The protagonist stared at them and had to admit that those bunch of rebellions were pretty united. The rebellion's leader commanded them to keep themselves from getting too carried away with their emotions and charge in without thinking and listening to her instructions. Electrofer yelled to follow him, and they all rushed to attack Ling Si simultaneously to defeat him. The protagonist knew that Electrofer seemed to have a rare electric elemental awakened, and by class was a warrior. While the old guy looked like a mage and the chubby one was a tank, he wondered if that lady named White Widow was a thief, but that wasn't very important to him. Ling Si figured out this team might have gotten together recently, and only the female battle mage seemed to have serious skills. So he planned to split them up and go straight for the commander, but before that, White Widow appeared close to him, and on seeing him wielding a dual dagger, she realized he was a thief. She somersaulted and rushed toward him, wanting to show him her mighty legs of a thief. While she kicked him, Ling Si evaded, although it was close. Taking advantage of this situation, Electrofer attacked him with his hammer. He couldn't evade, so seeing Ling Si being assaulted by him, the man started laughing and instructed his comrade to finish him immediately. The battle mage was startled as she was sure that someone of Ling Si level wouldn't be taken out that quickly and assumed it might be a trick. White Widow thought Ling Si was a pervert as he was clinging to her for a long time. But she started trembling after being haunted by the evil spirit's invisibility spell on Ling Si and tried to rush away. Ling Si was rushing toward the group leader and assumed he had misjudged them as these Avengers were not as easy to take out as he imagined. All those rebellions quickly attacked his spectral warriors and some managed to defeat those warriors too. He realized that awakened in real life is something else. Seeing the number of his opponents, Ling Si knew he had to end this battle quickly. The battle mage was rushing forward, sure that the protagonist might be nearby, and knew he was stalking her teammates with his clone skill because she was his real target. She used Devouring Fire Snake and commanded Ling Si to come out, informing him that this skill could automatically locate and devour nearby enemies. Even if he is invisible, there is nowhere to hide. The protagonist appeared and asked if that was the case. He knew she used the fire element, so he had to try what weakened it. Using his elemental manifestation of covert water and backstab, he rushed behind her, using water attacks to eliminate all the fire. 
This covered their fighting area in the mist. Since this mist surrounded them, all other rebellions couldn't see what was happening there. After the fog vanished, they were shocked when they saw their leader trapped inside the water ball and in the air. Ling Si informed them that the result was clear, so they should stop wasting his time. They were concerned as it was over because their leader failed to beat him, which meant they lost. Their leader was the one who gave them strength. Since they were lost, they assumed that Neo Avengers were going to be disassembled. After that, Ling Si sent a message to Adolf that the mission was accomplished and was glad that he had made the right call this time, as that female battle mage was the core of this rebellion group. Ling Si knew that if these Avengers were to assemble, they would be troublesome to go against. Soon, the military arrived at the location and arrested all those rebellions. Adolf wasn't expecting that Ling Si would finish this mission in less than three hours. He was astounded by such efficiency, so he wanted to report the result to the general and appreciated Ling Si. He assured him about the house and said he would make time to send Ling Si and his grandfather to their new home. The protagonist was okay with it. There was no hurry to do this. He asked Adolf if he was not afraid of causing a disturbance because he came into the slum like that. Adolf assured him that he shouldn't worry because, without an awakened causing trouble, they could control the area very well. The protagonist wonders how the military plans to handle this so-called rebellion army. Adolf uttered that those Avengers would be kept under watch and undergoing rehabilitation. Since they were awakened, he was sure the military could find some use for them. But for the leader of the group, she went against the military, which was an unforgivable crime, so that she would receive a memorable death sentence. The protagonist was shocked to hear about the death sentence and tried to negotiate as he knew they might be rebels, but it's not like they had committed some irredeemable crime that made her deserve a death sentence. The battle mage passing by heard their discussion and clarified that she didn't need him to speak up for her, but she truly wanted to know why someone as strong as Ling Si was willing to be the military puppet because, with his strength, she thought he could continue to lead the misguided. The protagonist was surprised as she was a strange person because she was the only one who was going to be executed. So he wondered if that is because the military is afraid of incurring a backlash if they eliminate too many awakened at once. That was quite a complicated situation, and he wondered if he made the right decision, so he logged into the game. He was congratulated on finishing a mission in real life, so he received some extra experience, which will be transferred into his account automatically after logging in. His bone knife of the undead mercenary has been upgraded to Slayer Grade. Dominion of the mercenary has been upgraded so he can invoke two spectral giants to aid him in battle. The spectral giant warrior's attributes will also be changed depending on the protagonist's attributes. Ling Si was shocked as he had yet to pay much attention to the weapon progression, which had upgraded without him noticing. Later, the system prompt appeared, informing him that the Dominion of the Mercenary had reached the phase there. This phase's mission is that he had to slay a hundred Lord Rank monsters while being equipped with the Bone Knife of the Undead Mercenary. After completing this mission, his knife will be upgraded to gold, and the weapon attribute will change accordingly. When equipped with the Bone Knife of the Undead Mercenary, the skill Dominion of the Mercenary may be used in which he had two summons to aid him. Since Ling Si has gained a few levels in the past few days, he decided to help Nebulous climb the Twelve Cities Torch Fire ranking. Looking at the current ranking, he realized Nebulous's biggest competitors are the number one and two guilds. The protagonist was confident that in this current life, he could certainly surpass these two significant figures one day. He decided to take advantage of this downloadable content and meet up with the number one guild, Advent of a Thousand Autumns, and the number two guild, the Divine Chamber. Meanwhile, all the players gathered and looked at the Torch Fire rank board. One of the players was amazed as the extraordinary Torch Fire battle showed up that day, a point-based competition. There were only thousands of positions, which concerned him as even entering this was a speed contest. He vigorously clicked on the screen to show it his hand speed from 30 years of being single, shocking the female player behind him. The man knew that the extraordinary Torch Fire battle had a low probability of appearing. The rules of this battler were different every time, which made it super enjoyable for the players. But the man knew that even if they got a position, each guild or workshop would only send two of their members. With this, he was sure that his days of singlehood would be finally over. The girl behind him tried to calm him down as it was just a game, so he didn't have to be so serious. 
Other students were also concerned as Advent of a Thousand Autumns got first place for the first time from the two they have had so far, while the Divine Chamber won second place. The players knew that once the two top guilds got serious, there was nothing the rest of the other guilds could do. His fellow player agreed because even Wolf Fangs, ranked third, can't compare with the top two regarding overall combat strength and number of elites. Some players heard that the top two guilds are extremely strict with their recruitment assessments. Even on the ranking board of the various classes, the top ten on those lists are almost always occupied by either Thousand Autumn or Divine Chamber members. The players assumed that those top two guilds would be victors in this battle again, but they didn't say anything about whether they would take part, as this all depends on the higher-ups to make the call. On the contrary, Ling Si talked with Stillwater, who told him that the Nebulous Guild was counting on him this time. The protagonist inquired if he could refuse it as he planned to take on a solo mission. This kind of special mission is too attention-grabbing, which is the thing that Ling Si always avoids as he doesn't like being in the spotlight. Stillwater said the protagonist couldn't refuse to take this mission because no matter what, Ling Si was still a part of Nebulous, so he had to go along with their arrangements. Besides, the guild master had already sent Coco Lai to assist him, so he wanted the protagonist to do him a favor and get along with her. He wanted him not to lose against their opponents and meet up with the vice guild master at the registration area. The protagonist was startled as the guild master hung up the call without listening to him agree and he hated it when his video calls got cut off like that. He thought it would be embarrassing to lose the competition because the vice guild master was also participating alongside him. Meanwhile, at the nebulous meeting room, Stillwater was certain that Thousand Autumn and Divine Chamber would be sending their top pros this time, so they instructed Coco Lai to be careful. However, he reminded her of her primary mission, he wanted her to see with her eyes if Ling Si could lead Nebulous with his current strength. This was his last time to help her asses Ling Si on the guild master's behalf. Coco Lai informed him that she is pretty strict. Although she supported his choice, she hoped Stillwater would be satisfied. So far, all she knows about the protagonist's capabilities has been nothing but gossip, but this time, she will observe him closely herself. Soon, the notification appeared to inform everyone that the submission of the participant's name for the extraordinary torch fire battle would begin in three minutes, so all the participants were requested to gather at the meeting point. After the bell rang, everyone was informed that the extraordinary torch fire battle would be streamed live for all viewers to spectate. All the spectators were thrilled to know they would stream the fight live, which would greatly help them as they could finally use this chance to learn some skill combos from the pros. They anxiously awaited the battle. Some had already bet three gold on Thousand Autumn, getting first place. Even though the payout is meager, the player was sure he was bound to win. Meanwhile, at the particular torch fire registration area, Ling Si saw the vice guild master, Coco Lai, waiting for him. The protagonist stared at his screen and was startled as the player's information was hidden in the registration area. He assumed this was to prevent participants from knowing the classes and equipment of others in advance. Coco Lai saw him and called him, and she was wondering if Ling Si would even show up there. The protagonist can't help it because the guild master, Stillwater, has requested to participate. Coco Lai informed him that Stillwater had already registered for them and said their designated resting area was ahead. She explained that because this is a point-based competition, there should be several stages, and with this being streamed live after each stage, there will be a chance to rest and recuperate. The protagonist cursed his fortune and the battle because it is streamed live, so he can't keep a low profile now. Coco Lai wants him to get used to being the center of the spotlight as soon as possible because Ling Si is the person on whom the guild master has placed his bet. The protagonist is fed up with such a drag, but he thinks they should know each other's current status first to work together better. Coco Lai was a level 50 summoner archer, and her particular post-promotion skill was parallel summon, which she could use to summon arrows to summon other units. She wants Ling Si to look at his status screen as she already sent him for the rest of the details. The protagonist looked at her description and was impressed as he expected from the vice guild master of a top 5 guild, she is at level 50. The resources and efficiency of the top guild are genuinely something else. But in contrast, even though he has done several torch fire missions in the past few days, he has only gotten to level 42. Her stats were also shocking, and her equipment was perfect for items that were currently difficult to obtain. 
Coco Lai's overall capability was the same as what he had heard in his precious life, as she was a goddess in the eyes of the regular players. Cock Lai looked at him and inquired if he would not tell her anything about himself, so she wanted him to quickly send his information to her as he had hidden his player information. The protagonist uttered that there was no need for that as it was enough that he knew the vice guild master's information. This irritated her as Ling Si was the one who said they could work together better if they shared their player's information, yet he wasn't sharing his details with her. The vice guild master has asked her to work with Ling Si, but his current attitude makes her regret agreeing. She supposed the protagonist would be aware of the difficulty of this mission because the participants for Thousand Autumn and Divine Chamber are no joke. Ling Si wants her to trust him because he knows better than anyone what they are capable of, so he needs her faith in his every move from now on and requests her to back him up. Koko Lai was amazed to see his confidence in his skill, so she thought she should wait and see his capabilities. Ling Si agreed to this only to look at the members of the top two guilds. The protagonist wanted to see how his current self would be compared with the pros of the Thousand Autumn and Divine Chamber and he was also curious about how far they could go right now. Since they had rested enough, Coco Lai instructed him to prepare as the countdown was about to start. The notification appeared, wishing everyone good luck as the break time would end so that the first stage would commence in 10 seconds. The countdown began, so Coco Lai retrieved her bow and was fully prepared. After the countdown ended, the teleportation was activated. Using the teleportation portal, they entered the forest and were welcomed to the special torch fire battle stage 1, Wolf and Sheep. This shocked Ling Si as he hadn't heard of such a competition before and saw the option of choosing the Wolf and Sheep appear on his screen. After this, the rules of the battles were stated, and the teammates had to decide who would take the role of Sheep and who would be the Wolf. The one who becomes a wolf could hunt down the Sheep of the other team, and for every Sheep killed, their team will gain one point. But if another team wolf takes out their sheep, their team will be eliminated, and they will lose all their points. Thus, the team that has dropped to zero points will be immediately booted back to the lounge area to wait for the second stage to begin. The competition will end when only a hundred teams are left, and the team's total points will determine the ranking. The hundredth place team will obtain a hundred torch fires, the ninety-ninth team will receive a ninety-nine torch fire, and so on. A total of a thousand teams participated in this battle, so everyone was requested to take on the roles of the wolf and sheep within the next minutes and have fun. Coco Lai thought it was interesting. From the name, she could tell this competition was about teamwork and speed. The protagonist decided to look for any opponents nearby for the time being, after which they could discuss their strategy there. He took a round and came back. Coco Lai applauded him as he was the careful partner. Ling Si sums up the following things, one person will be a wolf and one will be a sheep, and the wolf may kill another team's sheep to gain one point. But once their sheep are killed, they lose all the points and are out of round. In other words, Coco Lai uttered that no matter how many sheep they had killed before and how many points they had accumulated, once their sheep were taken out, it would be all for nothing. Whether it's a wolf or a sheep, there will be quite some pressure on them, so the decision on the roll was critical. Coco Lai instructed him to hurry up and decide, as they had little time to choose. She rushed away as they still had to look for an advantageous spot, or they would lose out right from the start because if the strong teams lay claim to the good spots first. She guessed that Ling Si wanted to be a wolf because, with his thief flexibility and potential to one-shot opponent, he was more suited to be the wolf than an archer. The protagonist smiled and refused as he didn't want to be the wolf. Instead, he wanted to play the role of sheep as he had a better idea. This was a vast forest area surrounded by tall city walls, and it was a cruel place akin to a stadium. Inside were a thousand teams, a total of two thousand players, so each would take on the role of a wolf or a lamb and enact a battle of trapped beasts. Meanwhile, Guild Shrouded Rain has already obtained twelve points, and its wolf instructed the sheep that this will be where they will camp for a while. They were at the perimeter, which was relatively safer, but they didn't want to let their guard down. The warriors wanted to continue what they were doing, because he was confident they would be fine as long as they stayed away from that powerful guild. They will have to lie low and wait for the chance to nab some points when they can, but his fellow wants him to be careful. The warrior in the role of sheep rushed back as he saw the tornado before him, an earth elemental spell cast by their opponents. 
the female mage was frustrated as she wanted to one-shot them with that earth elemental spell. Her comrade discovered that shrouded rain guild representers' movements became sluggish, so they no longer had to hide and go for the kill. The player rushed at them, but the female mage thought her companion was stupid as they hid to prevent ambush, but he didn't hear her, so he ran down and asked those two players if they were from Shrouded Rain, which concerned the mage from that guild as they got ambushed. Churchill Fire Guild members who got 21 points rushed to kill them, but he still wanted to give them a chance to surrender to those from the Shrouded Rain Guild. The mage was worried to see Churchill Guild members as they had been constantly targeting them recently and cursed his fate as he was unlucky to run into those folks but the warrior didn't lose hope as he thought they should fight them to the end, even if they were going down there. The Churchill Guild fox rushed to end their opponents while his fox was alone on the tree, ambushed and defeated by Ling Si. Then Ling Si attacked the fox of Churchill Guild, and Coco Lai dealt the final blow and killed him. Next was the turn of Shrouded Rain members, who started trembling after knowing they were from the top five nebulous guilds and decided to run. The protagonist already has 114 points, looked at them and smirked. The Shrouded Rain Guild Mage wondered why his warrior was so afraid because their opponent was just a sheep who couldn't kill them. The protagonist rushed toward them, shocking the mage as that sheep was offering himself to them and was asking for it. The mage was startled as Ling Si was so fast. The protagonist lifted his dagger to attack him and uttered that judging from their current situation, it was the wolf being sent to the chopping block. The protagonist said sheep aren't allowed to land the killing blow, but he could still inflict damage and status ailments. He informed the vice guild master that he would leave them with a sliver of health and let her finish them off because in that case it was still the wolf doing the killing. After killing two guild members, they got two more points, looked at her, and smirked as his plan worked. Coco Lai was irritated as she was the one who was a wolf, but she wondered why landing all these killing blows felt so oppressive. He was sparing her from expending extra effort, so she inquired if that was not a good idea. He knew that there were few teams that were on the weaker side along the perimeter. The line of thinking that they should stay on the perimeters and keep their head down was entirely predictable. Coco Lai doesn't want to accept this arrangement wholeheartedly, but following his plan has been smooth sailing. She recalled when Ling Si told her he had a better idea, so he wanted to be the sheep, which shocked her as that was opposite to what she predicted. The protagonist asked her if he didn't look like a sheep, but she refused as he doesn't seem like a sheep from any angle. She thought it would be more advantageous for a thief like him to be the wolf because he could also cover for her if she were a sheep. Besides, sheep aren't allowed to kill, so she thought the protagonist would want to be the wolf. The protagonist smiled and explained that sheep are not allowed to kill, but the system never mentioned anything about sheep being forbidden to attack if that were the case so it would be most advantageous for them if Ling Si were the sheep. Because he could guarantee that not only would he not get killed, but he could also create opportunities for Coco Lai to land the killing blow. As Ling Si said, the situation was all this while he had created all sorts of opportunities for her. Although he plays the role of a sheep, he takes the initiative to hunt down other wolves. The protagonist instructs her to leave as he finds his next target. This stunned Coco Lai because he is even more brutal than a wolf, and he is just a wolf in sheep's clothing. Meanwhile, other players were stunned as only 120 teams remained, so they felt it would be over soon. Another pair of teams is about to clash, which concerns them, and they want to see it closely, but they could zoom in more. Soon, only 116 teams were left, which shocked them again, and they wanted the directors to quickly switch the camera to the Thousand Autumn people as it made him anxious. Another player was startled and wondered if it was him who was seeing a sheep dashing brazenly towards another team's wolf. The other players saw him too and could tell from his appearance that he might be a thief. The player didn't manage to see what guild he was from because he was too fast and they switched to another scene. The female was surprised and wondered if there was such a thing as there were too many exciting highlights that she couldn't catch all the details. She assumed that the thief might be either from Divine Chamber or Thousand Autumn because only the mad pros from those guilds would dare to use that strategy. Soon, they saw the scene of the players from Divine Chamber attacking the other team and were delighted as the live stream finally showed the pro players from the Divine Chamber. The female player gets excited and requests to show her a few shots of the number one guild Thousand Autumn. 
all the spectators were dumbfounded to see that Divine Chamber had already gotten 162 points, which was quite an impressive performance. They saw the tank from the Divine Chamber, one of the top three tanks from Divine Chamber Student Inch, and remarked that there was no better fit for the role of Sheep as he was invincible. But the players were startled as they couldn't see the Student Inch Team Wolf and wondered where he was. They were surprised as Student Inch met someone from another guild, so they started pondering which guild their opponent belonged to. The man decided to check the live stream notification. He uttered that with the kill count of 116, the Student Inch's opponent was from the Nebulous Guild and assumed that Nebulous was done for as they couldn't defeat him. On the other side, Student Inch greeted the players from Nebulous and felt great as he finally ran into another one of the top five guilds. He has been getting stale after greeting nothing but small fry along the way, so he truly wanted to meet someone with skills and strength. Coco Lai informed Ling Si that they had run into the people from Divine Chamber, and their opponent was Student Inch, one of the top three tanks of their guild, so he should be careful. The protagonist was amazed to hear that she thought that they had just run accidentally because Student Inch was the next target he selected. Student Inch, who was overconfident over his mighty skills, wants his opponent from Nebulous to come at him together so that he can have some fun and assure them that he can take much beating. The protagonist instructs Coco Lai that she doesn't have to do anything this time, which startled her. She wondered what he was saying as their opponent Wolf hadn't appeared yet. The protagonist explained that his Wolf wouldn't be showing up there because, according to his guests, they had gone hunting alone. He assumed that their strategy was a bit more radical than the protagonists because Student Inch was purely using his role as the sheep to enjoy tormenting his opponents. Student Inch looked at Ling Si and smirked. The protagonist informed the vice guild master that this was a battle between both teams' sheep. Soon, they started fighting each other, and because their wolves wouldn't interfere, Ling Si wanted to see which one had more complicated sheep horns. Student Inch found him attractive, and he decided to stick around and have fun as he spotted the nebulous Vice Guild Master, Coco Lai. He heard that the Vice Guild Master Coco Lai's style of summoner archery was quite a pain, so he wanted to experience it for himself. Student Inch was apologetic to say that there aren't any thieves in the nebulous that make him harbor any expectations. However, Ling Si's aura caught the Divine Chamber tank's attention, so he assumed the protagonist might be an exciting prey. Student Inch was one of the top three tanks of the Divine Chamber, and Coco Lai's impression of him was that of a guild battle in the past. Wolf Fangs used around 20 members to besiege three Divine Chamber's members. They said they wanted to make the three of them drop their equipment, but she was unclear about why. But for Nebulous, they were fighting a guerrilla battle nearby, so Coco Lai managed to catch wind of what was happening between them. Those Wolf Fangs' 20 members were no pros, but they possessed strength in number, and it was still a troublesome matter to deal with them all. She believed that if she were to charge in alone, even though she had to be able to save the three of them, it would still take some time. But what she witnessed left her at a loss for words because, using the skill casualties of war, students inch created an enormous coliseum, leaving the twenty members of wolf fans with nowhere to run. For the next ten minutes, student inch strolled casually as if in his backyard garden. With his terrifying high defensive stats, he took on all sorts of attacks head-on as he tormented them whole, looking as calm as possible. Coco Lai couldn't sense any killing intent from his expression, but she could feel a depraved aura coming from Student Inch. It was as though beneath that forever smiling facade of his lies a morbid persona who enjoys tormenting his opponent. While she was confident that the show couldn't lose to the likes of him as such opponents are the sort she least wished to meet. She wanted to see how Ling Si would deal with this type of opponent and his battle strategies in such a situation. The protagonist believes that Student Inch's perspective toward the thieves in Nebulous will change after this battle, as he will harbor more than just expectations. The protagonist rushed behind the tank and, using a backstab, attacked him, but he was in doubt and wondered if he had gotten him so quickly. Soon, Student Inch uses the pain dampening and is surprised, as it was unexpected because he doesn't think there will be a thief with this kind of speed in Nebulous. Pain dampening is a warrior-exclusive passive skill with which the mighty warrior shrugs off the pain from physical attacks and seems to have ignored the damage. For six seconds, it reduces 99% of all physical harm, and the player will not be affected by any effects from physical attacks. 
Student Inch apologized to the protagonist by saying that even with his speed, his attack was nothing but mere tackles to him. The protagonist is startled as his opponent uses the force throw, and he wants him to enjoy being tormented by him. Using this skill, Student Inch grabbed Ling Si's throat and choked it as he didn't want to have him running away from him. Using his skill feint inducing throw reverse shoulder toss, Student Inch attacked the protagonist, and there was a massive explosion. Thus, mists surrounded him, making vision difficult. All the other players watching the livestream were amazed, it was a nice shot, as they had expected from one of the top three talks of Divine Chamber. Seeing the reaction phase and the way he pulled it off, they could bet that no name thief would die for the crowd with that one blow. They assumed by judging Student Inch's personality that he would not probably leave that thief a shred of HP and have fun dragging things out. Meanwhile, Coco Lai knew that her opponent looked bulky and slow, but his reaction speed and skill selection were extraordinarily swift and vicious. But she wanted the protagonist to quit playing dead because it was the time to show his actual skills as she could sense that his aura was just as strong as ever. Student Inch was startled as he was suddenly surrounded by the combination skill of evil spirit invisibility and elemental manifestation, burning lava. He can't understand what is happening and why an elemental fire has spread. Taking advantage of his confusion, Ling Si rushes behind Student Inch to attack. The protagonist uttered that between him and Ling Si, not all thieves are limited to dealing only physical damage. Using the combination skill of burning lava and throat slasher, the protagonist attacked him, which shocked his opponent, who wondered why he had such a powerful elemental spell. The protagonist attacked him and threw him back, thus reducing Student Inch HP by one-third and implicating serious damage to him. Student Inch was shocked by the skill of Ling Si. Being from the thief class, he wasn't expecting such attacks from him. The protagonist approached him and uttered that only one-third of his health had gone and assumed that his magic resistance was pretty high. Student Inch recovered his HP using strong recovery domain and stood again. He was not sure why Ling Si could use those strange elemental spells. He inquired if that was due to his post-promotion particular class, but he admitted that Ling Si was the most dangerous thief he had had so far, so he earned the right to witness his full strength. The protagonist smirked to hear that his opponent thought he would have the right to witness his whole strength and refused it because he had got it all wrong. Using Dominion of Mercenary, he summoned his spectral warriors and reminded him, as he had said before, that they didn't run into each other by sheer chance. So, there was no longer a way for him to keep a low profile. He informed Student Inch that his purpose for Ling Si was to assess how far he had come. The protagonist suggested he call over his wolf for help, and then he summoned Knight of the Glorious. The protagonist returned the exact words that Student Inch had said earlier that he should come at him together as he wanted to have fun with Divine Chamber. All the spectators were shocked and wondered who that thief was. They couldn't see his ID because he had hidden his personal. The players can't believe that the figureling C summoned is Moonlight City's headless rider as he looked so much like him. His summon was impressive as he summoned two skeleton generals, so they wondered if his class was a thief or a mage. They wondered when Nebulus had a pro like him and asked others if anyone knew that thief. One of the players recognized Ling Si as he looked like the Captain of Shadow, who became the talk of the town a whole back. They can't believe that the thief is from Shadow, who rushed up the team ranking board a while ago and thought there would be no way they would be the same person. On the other side, Ling Si looked at Student Inch and smiled. Coco Lai was surprised to see Ling Si summon skill and magic elemental spell and wondered how many secrets he had. She was startled as she heard Student Inch's companion calling him and asking what was the matter. The player saw them two going at it and fighting each other vigorously the moment he got there. He wonders what the problem is with his opponent thief, and he finds out that he is a sheep. He is impressed by the summon of the protagonist. Student Inch agreed with him, but he knew he had to stay calm and not let that spook him. He was indeed a little out of his depth with his ability and skills. He has encountered countless pros and quite a few who were stronger than him, but he has never met anyone like the protagonist who has made him feel utterly at a loss. However, the aura that Ling Si gave him was too strange and different from all other opponents. He knew the guild chose him for this competition and even boasted about needing a regular member to accompany him. Student Inch thought that as long as he didn't meet anyone from Thousand Autumn, he would be fine, but he never thought Nebulus would be such a pro. 
he instructed his companion through voice call that he would draw the aggro of the Ling C3 summons onto him. Then he will activate his most substantial defensive setup and try to stall the thief for as long as possible. So he wants his companion to find the best time to use his best skill to one-shot the thief. Student Inch knew there might be one chance as he still determined how high his opponent's DPS was. The Wolf of Divine Chamber understood his senior instruction and assured him not to worry as he would take care of it. The man was surprised as he had never seen his senior Inch look so serious before, not even when exchanging blows with the pros from Thousand Autumn. He wondered who that thief was as he complicated the situation. He had never heard that Nebulus would have someone like that. Soon, the protagonist notices the Wolf of Divine Chamber standing at the tree branch and staring at them. The protagonist was pleased as his timing of arrival was great, and he could take both of them in one fell swoop. He instructed his spectral warriors to attack them as he wanted to see what they could, so the warriors rushed to attack them. Student Inch instructed his fellow to get into a good position for the counterattack, and he affirmed. He blocked the attacks of the skeletal warrior while the other warrior attacked him, and the whole area was covered with mist. The Wolf of Divine Chamber found the perfect time and rushed to attack those warriors while they were busy attacking his comrade. Before he could land a blow against those warriors, the Glorious Knight appeared before him and blocked the attack with a sword. The man can't believe that the Summoned Knight blocked his attack so quickly and wonders how this summoned creature could be more potent than him. The protagonist appears behind him to attack and utters that this knight is at least at feudal lord rank, which shocks him. Before the protagonist could attack him, Student Inch appeared before him. Using the counter-strike, he blocked the attack. This skill absorbs the next non-elemental attack, lashes it back at the opponent, and pushes the opponent back. This creates a considerable distance between them, and the counter is booming, and a shield will also be generated. Inch slammed the ground with his foot, thus using the skill of Absolute Defense Harden, with which all the broken rocks surrounded them. This skill bears the title of Absolute Defense, which draws up the Earth's most muscular strength to form a protective stone shield that absorbs all types of elemental damage and reduces the damage taken to 70%. However, their efforts are unsuccessful when Ling Si Knight attacks their barrier using the Sword of Bond. This exclusive skill was for melee classes, which turned courage and momentum into an unblockable force. The damage of the user's next attack will be tripled, and the allies near them will obtain the same speed buff, but no other skill can be used in three seconds after this skill activation. Student Inch, who was inside the barrier, was pissed off as these two summoned creatures of Ling Si have very high stats. He was confident that if it wasn't for his skill, Absolute Defense Harden negating their attacks, he might already have been done in by them. He thought he should report to the Guild Master about this thief. In addition to his skills, there were also so many things that were way too strange about him. The next was the protagonist's turn, so he rushed near his opponent's barrier and carried all three elements. He smirked as he wanted to see if his opponent's defense was better or if Ling Xia's team assault was better. He attacked their barrier with the combination of vessels of restless chaos and bloodthirsty shadow. This concerned student Inch, who was inside the barrier, so he tried to divert his attention and reminded Ling Si that he was a sheep. Therefore, no matter how much damage he dealt, he couldn't kill him and wanted the protagonist to taste the triple damage from his wolf. The protagonist was amazed to hear his wishing thinking, but didn't stop attacking him, shocking student Inch. Soon, his skill invaded the barrier and moved toward their opponent. Then, using the kiss of the serpent vial, they got attacked by his skill. As the mist disappeared, the Divine Chamber representatives were kneeling on the considerable pit and severely injured, and just a few points of their HP remained. Student Inch coughed and was delighted at the fact that Ling Si doesn't have the right to kill, so he wanted to hurry and heal himself. But he was shocked as he looked above him. A magic spell had been cast by Coco Lai, which soon attacked him. Coco Lai was frustrated with her opponent for forgetting about her presence, they successfully took down the Guild Divine Chamber, so she received two more points. This confirms that they have all fallen for Ling Xia's act of being the sheep, but surprisingly, the result has come out differently every time. Meanwhile, outside the dungeon, all the players witnessing the livestream were shocked to see Nebulus take down Divine's Chamber. They wondered who that thief was as his moves were way too unpredictable, and they didn't get it, but it looked fantastic.
some players became his most incredible fans and were falling in love with that protagonist's smug smile. Meanwhile, at the Nebulous Guild meeting room, the Guild Master Stillwater also watched his performance and applauded Ling Si for such an excellent performance. He became certain that for the future of Nebulous, he had found the perfect man to carry his guild. After the first round of the particular battle, Wolf and Sheep, Ling Si's team astonishingly defeated Divine Chamber. They went to the resting area, where Coco Lai tried to recall the reward for second place correctly. She assumed it should be 9900 torch fire and thought she was very good at math, so she tried to multiply 7 by 7 and thought the answer was 8. But she gets pissed off when Ling Si corrects her mistake and asks if she was taught math by her gym teacher in elementary school. She furiously replied that she had just miscalculated, so he shouldn't underestimate and misjudge her. As the result of the battle between the other teams was slowly revealed, the number of teams remaining quickly came to a hundred. With a score of 117, Nebulous ended the first round in second place. As Ling Si expected, Thousand Autumn secured the first position. Still, the number one guild, Thousand Autumn, was at the top, and with a total of 126 points, they would receive 10 Then and Torch Fire. Coco Lai saw him standing there, staring at the result, and assured him it was already a good result. It was the first time Nebulous had won second place in a Thousand Autumn and Divine Chamber competition. Furthermore, they were the same as Thousand Autumn, so she wanted to continue playing with this momentum. But the protagonist thought it was a shame as he succeeded in meeting the people from Divine Chamber and didn't get a chance to cross swords with Thousand Autumn. Coco Lai thought that if anyone else had said that ten, they would have been deemed insane, but if it had been Ling Si, she was confident that he was worthy of making such a remark. The protagonist felt truly mortified and wanted to get first place in the next round. Otherwise, he knew that it would be extremely difficult to catch up with Thousand Autumn's capabilities. Soon, the second round of the special torch fire battle commencement notification appeared, and the countdown was started. After the countdown, Coco Lai reached the location outside the destroyed city. Looking around the area, she assumed this might be their next stage, and she asked him if he would check out the surroundings first or if they should stick together. She was shocked as she looked behind because Ling Si wasn't there, so she looked everywhere and called him but couldn't find him. She wondered what was happening and if this was a solo mission, and soon, the system notification appeared on her screen. She was welcomed to the second round of the special torch fire battle, which was key parts. She was startled to see half of the keys, and the rules of the round appeared, which were as follows. The key part she possesses can only be pieced together with her teammate's key part to become whole. The key part she possesses has a guiding function, and she could use the guidance of the key to find her teammate. The compass appeared on her screen, which helped her coordinate with her teammates, and she was instructed to find her teammate and complete the key within one hour. It will take three uninterrupted minutes to repair the key, but if the process is interrupted and she fails to be prepared, she must restart it, and the tie counter will be reset. Coco Lai understood the detail as that meant that she had to find Ling Si within an hour, and three minutes would be spent repairing the key out of it. Once the key was repaired, she had to head to the safe zone at the center and open the door to her torch fire reward. The reward for this round was a thousand torch fires. Lastly, she was informed that other players could seize and restore her key parts. She knew it wouldn't just be that simple, and she bet this must be the real meat for this round. She was startled as she read the last dialogue box that the players whose key part had been seized by others would be immediately disqualified and sent back to the resting zone to wait for the round to end. She was notified that the stolen key parts could still be made whole with the relevant key part, and her team didn't need to be the original owner of the key parts to repair the key. This was an interesting key point as she thought if that were the case, this would open up many more options for gaining points. But what delighted her was that the keys completed from stolen parts could be used to increase the rank of the player's team-owned key. The higher the rank, the greater the reward when they open the door. They will also receive an additional 100 torch fire for every rank increment, and if the team were to open the door with only one member remaining, the rewards would be halved. The key parts the team is holding can't vanish, the player can only drop them. Since that was the case, she started calculating that if a team were to gather 999 keys, then the maximum additional reward would be 99,900, which was a mouth-watering situation. 
Since there were thousands of teams in this round, 2,000 key parts can be combined to form a thousand keys. Soon, she returned to her senses because it was doubtful that something like that would happen. She knew they had one hour, so she wanted to regroup as soon as possible to win this round. There will surely be a team that will head straight for the door after repairing their key so that they can at least be safe with the base reward. Six minutes later, Coco Lai was hiding behind the pillar, looking at a few players attacking others, informing them not to think of escaping. She wanted to avoid confrontation and be extra careful even if her opponents were way below her level. The first order of business is to meet up with Ling Si so she doesn't want to attract unnecessary trouble. Coco Lai was startled as she suddenly sensed something strange, so she used Beastly Detection and saw a few players in the building. Beastly Detection is an Archer-exclusive active skill that enhances the senses for some time. This also increases their range for detecting hidden foes and seeing through invisibility skills. She retrieved her arrow and aimed at them. She wanted to drag them out individually since it was an ambush. She shot an arrow enchanted with Spider Domain, creating a massive web above the building where those players hid. Spider Domain is a projectile fired that will turn into giant webs that will envelop the area. Like a spider on its web, the player can accurately pinpoint the exact location of surrounding enemies, including invisible units. She closed her eyes and found one of the players, so she aimed her arrow at him and attacked the player. She gave him a critical hit. Thus, it caused bonus ranged attack damage and gave crucial weakness in a single shot. Other players saw Coco Lai and were concerned as she was from the top five guilds nebulous. They decide to team up to take down these top guilds. This way, they would have a higher chance of surviving that way. Coco Lai could sense that the aura of her enemies was starting to become chaotic, which made it clear that they were just some second-rate guilds. She didn't want to waste any more time, so using the Rapid Summons Beast, she attacked them. This Archer exclusive summoning skill was a projectile fired that transformed into beasts that would last six seconds. These beasts will bite and tear into all enemies nearby, and there is a slight chance of causing the effect of generating a wound, crippling, blind, or fatally wounded, which will last for two seconds. With her single attack, all the players fell and were concerned as there was no way to lock onto these things. Due to the falling of those players, three key parts were dropped, and she received three bonus keys, so after completing the repair, there were three keys. After securing some of the wholly repaired keys, she headed toward Ling Si and was startled as she received the notification that her teammate had obtained another bonus key. In a short period, the number of keys that Ling Si obtained increased and kept going up wildly, which shocked her, and she wondered what he was doing at his end. Meanwhile, Ling Si is holding his dagger and killing some players, he inquired about the remaining person who would want to come next. The players were concerned. Ling Si realized that his opponent guilds had allied together and wanted to ask how many were in this secret alliance. The protagonist initially wanted to go straight for Thousand Autumns but didn't expect their lot to come and seek death themselves. But he was okay with this situation and apologetic to say he couldn't sit there long. The protagonist looked at them and emitted a terrifying aura. He said he detested it the most when others tried shady tricks on him. Since they all wanted to kill the protagonist, he warned them to be prepared to kill themselves in return. The players from other guilds were worried to see that the player who had ambushed the protagonist earlier had all been killed and terrified by his attacks. The player wanted to retreat because he knew they were no match for him, even with all of them combined. His companion refused because he didn't want to run and wanted to have to uphold their guild's dignity, but the warrior didn't care less about that anymore. Soon, the protagonist attacked the warrior, and then he immediately attacked the mage and another player and was startled to see how strong that was. The player realizes that the protagonist's ability is similar to those abnormally strong ones in Thousand Autumn. At the same time, outside the battle area, where other players were watching the live stream, they were terrified by Ling Si's combat and wondered if this was a horror film. They were astounded as the thief from Nebulus was very prominent in the previous round, but he seemed even more domineering in the second round. The other participant from Nebulus was their vice guild master, Coco Lai. All the players knew that she was solid, but now it seemed like she was there to act as a fool. One of those spectators called others and wanted them to quickly check the forum because things were going wild in Heavenland forum and the main page was about the thief. 
Meanwhile, at the Nebulous Guild meeting room, the Guild Master was pleased and wanted to ensure this news kept trending because things kept going in the direction the Guild Master Stillwater wanted. He knew that if Ling Xia's performance were shocking, it would naturally lead to attention and speculation, which would pave the way for the plan's next step. In contrast, if the protagonist's performance were so-so or disappointing, it would naturally not be followed up. Stillwater was delighted because this time, his plan succeeded and his gamble paid off, and Ling Si didn't let him down. Stillwater went outside the meeting room to take a round, where everyone was shocked to know that the thief on the forum was from their guild. They were startled when they saw the guild master and greeted him while he was thinking about it, as things like torch fire dungeons were not the most important things to him. Stillwater was using this opportunity to find an even more domineering person to bring the nebulous to the peak of heaven land. He hoped Ling Si would return with flying colors and was sure he would soon obtain a new status. However, this isn't easy because the person from Thousand Autumn also participates in this competition and hopes that Ling Si won't meet that troublesome fellow. On the other side, the protagonist is standing on the building roof looking at the map and is startled as suddenly a female mage appears above him, out of the blue. White Bone Temptress came near him and whispered in his ears, asking if he was looking for him. The protagonist wondered who she was as he hadn't seen her before. The Temptress gets in front of him, stares at him, and asks if he is looking at the people from her guild, Thousand Autumn. The protagonist was surprised to know that she is from Thousand Autumns and was impressed by her terrifying concealment ability that he couldn't even detect anything when she was so close. She instructed him not to panic and be easy, as she was not the type to take advantage of those caught off guard. She was aware that it was because she used a relatively rarely seen concealment skill just now that she managed to fool Ling Si. She wanted to surprise the protagonists because they had all the time to play. Looking at her outfit, the protagonist guessed she should be a deviant mage and asked her for confirmation to see if he was not wrong. The protagonist has an impression of this mage from his previous life and tries to recall exactly who she is. White Bone Temptress remarked that it was pretty hateful and inquired as he looked at her outfit, but she affirmed, as he guessed rightly, for which he deserved a reward. The protagonist was irritated and inquired if she would keep talking like this. She laughed and clarified that it was part of her personality. She explained that she had been paying attention to Ling Si since the last round and was impressed by his skill. She found him to be an exciting and robust man. The protagonist wondered why she didn't attack him when she could get close to him without making a sound. But she thinks that Ling Si already knows the answer to that question, which startles him. She gets close to him and expresses that it is because she is his fan, which makes him blush, so he rushes away. This saddened White Bone Temptress, and she instructed him not to resist his fans and clarified that she was not like one of those crazy stalker fans. The protagonist wondered if something was wrong with the brain of the mage from Thousand Autumn. Suddenly, he recalled something as her behavior was very much like that of the one known as the most charming and the best mage in Advent of a Thousand Autumn from his previous life. He remembered that even the head of the Thousand Autumn couldn't handle her. She rambled that she was Thousand Autumn's number one mage, White Bone Temptress, and instructed him to call her Temptress. After learning about her, he became certain she was the best mage in his previous life. Temptress was delighted to meet him and rushed toward him, but Ling Si didn't want to be fooled by her charm. He recalled clearly that in his previous life, this woman single-handedly turned Divine Chamber's guild master into a wretched mess. When hundreds of Divine Chamber's members surrounded her, she strolled idly out from the tightly packed encirclement so he knew she was a formidable opponent. White Bone Temptress rambled that she knows that she is looking for members for thousands of autumns and that he wants to remove them from this game. The protagonist was amazed because, knowing all this, she deliberately delivered herself to him. But she denied it as she had come there to tell him something and asked if there was another member from Nebulous there. She was sure that her teammate would have probably already found her. She explained that her team member is brutal and doesn't know how to be tender toward the fairer gender. The protagonist was speechless as he discovered their target was vice guild master Coco Lai. White Bone Temptress pointed at him and wanted to play a game with him in which the loser would have to give up on the second round of this competition. She asked about his opinion on her suggestion, but he didn't know anything about the game, so he asked for the details. The protagonist was concerned and wondered if the Vice Guild Master, Coco Lai, could handle things on her end. 
Temptress clarified that she likes to be direct and said she wants to compete with him to see whether their team members will finish first or not. Soon, their battle commences. The protagonist is impressed by the level of her spell and is sure she has no intention of playing nice. She seemed very confident about her skills and capabilities and thought either Coco Lai's side or their Thousand Autumn would have an easy victory. The protagonist, furious, stared at her and asked what they would do if he refused to play along. She was stunned to hear no as she wasn't expecting this and reminded him that he should know that she was offering him a way out. Because if he doesn't make up his mind quickly enough, things might be over at his companion's side. The protagonist inquired if she wasn't worried about Divine Chamber making a sudden comeback. Whitebone Temptress laughed at hearing this, as Divine Chamber didn't even earn an appointment in the previous round, so she was confident they wouldn't dare to come after them. To keep their points this time, Divine Chamber's representations would probably play it safe and run away with their tails between their legs if they saw them. The rules of her game were straightforward. Whichever side gets taken out first will be the losing team. The losing team must hand over all the key parts they have gathered to the winner and drop out voluntarily. The protagonist pondered about it because the bet included the fight over there, so he knew there would be much uncertainty, but this wasn't a problem for him. So he found the bet interesting and instructed her to remember her words, and he knew that he just had to take White Temptress out before the other side finished. While being prepared to attack him, she remarked that she loved confident men like him and found his personality charming. Abruptly, she threw a magical aura toward his side and created a rose above the sky. Ling Si recognized it as a signal. Next was the protagonist's turn to get attacked by her skills, so she wants him to pay attention better to her now. She rushes and strikes him, but Ling Si immediately steps back and evades her attack. He realized she was trying to close in and wondered if she was trying to run a battle mage setup. The protagonist was startled as she spread her alluring pollens around him. He was impressed by her casting speed, which was too fast. White Bone Temptress laughed and remarked that alluring pollens is her particular signature skill, so she wants him to whiff of it and tell her if it's sweet. The protagonist gets restrained by her alluring pollens and he wonders what kind of skill this is as there aren't any target indicators. White Bone Temptress was delighted to see that he couldn't move a muscle now, so he belonged to her, but she didn't want him to worry as this big sister was willing to shower loads of love on him. She went close to him and inquired if he was curious about why there weren't any target indicators and if she would reveal her trump card right now. While chatting with him, the Sword of the Knight of Glorious appeared from the sky and the Knight of Glorious intervened in her spell by attacking her. But she managed to evade his attack as she had noticed him earlier, so she rushed back and recognized the Knight of Glorious as it was the summon she had seen the previous round. The protagonist was concerned as that was close, and if it wasn't for the fact that all he needed to summon the Knight of Glorious by just thinking about it, then his situation would be worse. The protagonist stood and asked her if he wasn't wrong, and if she just used the skill, it should be exclusive. She uttered that she was a charm mage with a particular deviant mage subclass, and she knew that Ling Si was also not a slouch as his fighting style caught her eyes since the last round and was unique. When Ling Si was fighting the people from the Divine Chamber, he had two types of summons, a total of three of them, and along with his skill set, it was fascinating to watch his match. But what captured her attention was that Ling Si was a thief, yet he seemed able to use mage skills. She explained that they have plenty of top-ranked thieves in her guild, Thousand Autumn, but she has never met one with a promotion bonus that gives access to mage abilities. She had never known anyone with a thief and mage, which was quite interesting, and she was curious about him. The protagonist was impressed as she had observed his combat very closely, and then, using his skill elemental manifestation, Thunder Flash, he rushed to attack her. White Bone Temptress was impressed by Ling Xia's speed, which even comes with his thunder elemental magic damage, and because he was able to learn mage spells, she figured out that this thief might be dual class. She urged it would be tough to defeat him if she took him on as a mage. The protagonist understands the matter and thinks he should know that White Bone Temptress is just like little Ruko and that Van Kaffis is blessed. She used her blessing succubus, her fiendish allure that stirs the hearts of thousands. While all the spectators lovingly stared at her and were impressed by her as she was the number one mage from Thousand Autumn, her perfect figure was killing them. Meanwhile, Stillwater was concerned because the protagonist couldn't avoid that most troublesome fellow. 
He was worried as there was a rumor that, to this day, no man had been able to escape her clutches. He assumed it would be a matter of strength this time, but his character would also be tested. Her outfit was changed, and she got close to Ling Si and remarked that only a few were lucky enough to lay eyes on this outfit of hers, so she wanted to play with him and instructed him to put his weapon down, then she would guarantee that she would be good with him. The protagonist could feel her scent permeating the air. Temptress retrieved her weapon and asked if he was not fond of whipping and was okay with letting him have the way he wanted to be with her. Whether he prefers to be active or passive depends on him, and she promises to satisfy him at all costs. She swung her whip in the air, and the protagonist said he prefers to be passive. She remarked that he was a cute and honest boy and agreed to him, but deep inside, she was glad as she finally got him off guard and managed to lure him. She assumed he was like every other man and thought that might be all Ling Si was capable of. She tried to get close to him, but was startled as the Knight of Glorious attacked her and came between them. Knight of Glorious tried to get his master back to his senses and wake him up with his glorious protection. With this skill, when the user is affected by illusory or lure skills, a glorious follower, if currently active, could forcefully dispel the effects. White Bone Temptress was shocked as it was impossible for any summon to break through her illusory scent just like that, and she wondered what exactly that summon of his was. The protagonist can't believe he was caught off guard and fell for what was aggravating. He appreciated his knight's effort and thanked him because of his knight's help. He had discovered another feature of the Badge of the Glorious. The Knight of Glorious explained that he was only doing his duty. The protagonist clenched his teeth and realized that he was getting severe and didn't want to waste his time anymore. He had always wanted to put himself against the pros for Thousand Autumn long ago, so he decided to take care of that provocative air in her. White Bone Temptress smirked as Ling Si talked big and clarified that he was not the first man to say that to her. Using her skill, Charming Doppelganger, she created a few warriors and urged that she would love to taste what a capable man like him could dish out. The protagonist looked at her summon and was amazed to know that she wanted to fight him with numbers. So he summoned Dominion of the Mercenary Skeleton Tsar, who rushed to handle those creatures. White Bone Temptress clarified that he also shouldn't think he could win just by having numbers on his side. Her summons attacked Ling Si using the Passionate Kiss Assault, which he managed to block using the protection. The Temptress thought it was a shame that he had wasted her this skill, and her summons rushed toward the protagonist, attacking him from both sides without giving him any chance. Soon, he was covered with his magic skill and was impressed by her combo chain, leaving him little time to react. Temptress approached him as they still hadn't had a chance to get up close and personal, and the protagonist used a throat slasher on her, but was stunned as that was a clone. The protagonist recalls that one of Succubus's specialties is its ability to split into many clones that appear out of nowhere. On top of that, they have all sorts of headache-inducing skills too, but he was also waiting for the right time to attack. Out of that pink mist, White Bone Temptress tried to approach him while concealed. She thought he wouldn't be able to notice her. But as she reached the location, she was dumbfounded because he was already gone, and she thought he might have predicted where she would show up. She was shocked as Ling Xia's aura surrounded her body, and she was astounded to see that he was using the mist she created to hide himself. The protagonist immediately appeared behind her and said that the spell aura of Succubus was too much for him to handle, so he wanted to kill her immediately and win this game. Since this was the right time and distance for him to attack, he used the combination skill of Elemental Manifestation Thunder Flash and Rapid Shadow Thrust to attack her. His dagger slowly approached her, and before he could land a single strike, he received the notification that his teammate had obtained the key part. This shocked him, while the white bone temptress smirked as this was the right time to save her, she guessed their little competition was over. She accepted her defeat and said that Ling Si won this game as their other teammates finished the match before them. She was confident that Ling Si might have taken her out if they had been any second slower. The protagonist pulled back his dagger and uttered that rather than winning, he was more interested in cutting her down. She clarified that was also why she let the match end, which made Ling Si realize that he did it on purpose. White Bone Temptress knew that a gambler should always be willing to admit defeat since they agreed that the loser would drop out, so she threw her key part to him. Since she already learned everything that she wanted to know, Thousand Autumns was forfeiting this round. 
Before leaving, she remembered that she hadn't asked his name and was a bit hateful because this was the first time she had asked for a boy's name and he had just taken away her first time just like that. The protagonist told her his name, which she promised to remember as she was interested in him. She got on her magical weapon to leave and instructed him to get first place in this round. Otherwise, she would be disappointed in him. Ling Si assured her that the first place would be there. She remembered that she kept her key part close to her heart all the time, so she wanted him to treasure it. All the other players were shocked to see that the thief defeated Thousand Autumn's number one mage and applauded his incredible skills. Ling Si and White Bone Temptress probably didn't expect their simple spar to cause such a vast uproar outside. The forum was filled with their discussion as the players couldn't believe that the number mage of Thousand Autumn had lost. Some of them weren't sure, but it seemed to them that the mage lost on purpose at the end, but they couldn't understand. They were sure there would be a reason for that and assumed it might be because the thief was more potent than her. Somehow, Ling Xia's name soon became the main topic of all conversations in the special battle. Afterward, White Bone Temptress's impressive skill figure conquered front page ads everywhere. This key part of the battle caused unprecedented heated debate across Heaven Land. Ling Xia's name also became known to all players afterward. Soon, the protagonist finds Coco Lai and appreciates her for her outstanding performance as she defeats Thousand Autumn's representative. She turned and looked at him furiously while he was pretty relaxed and waving toward her. She asked him what this was. As she explained everything, Ling Si was stunned and inquired if what she said was true. That made her furious, as that was a useless question and she had no reason to lie. She was still quite pissed off because Thousand Autumn's opponent was one of the cocky people who dared to underestimate her. She had supposedly been marked by that sword master of Thousand Autumn until that signal sigil spell appeared in the sky. That sword man Taba Zengo sighed as that was lame and guessed that their little sparring session would end there and he called Coco Lai by her name. This irritated her as she didn't think she was close enough to him to address her like that. Taba Zengo agreed as they were not close enough, but treating others with courtesy was a core value of their guild, which gave him a headache too. She had heard of this Taba Zengo of Thousand Autumn, also known as the Bloody Lion and one of the best swordsmen there. Coco Lai was surprised that he was part of the first division of Thousand Autumn, and his current leave was 52. Even though she hated to admit it, she guessed that was what it meant to be the number one guild, as she could tell that they were still behind in terms of their members' levels. Taba Zengo asked Coco Lai if the Vice Guild Master of Nebulous was interested in seeing his rude side instead of gentle. She retrieved her arrow and was amazed as he thought she would be scared by hearing this. He looked at her wickedly while discharging the killing intent. He remarked that the vice guild master was quite bold and spirited and wanted to cut her down to the full extent of his strength. Coco Lai knew she had to keep her distance against an opponent of this level because her careless mistake could see her getting one shot. Taba Zengo sits on the rock and says he was kidding as he got out too exhausted and hadn't slept enough for this. This pissed her off, and she inquired if he so looking down on her, but he refused and clarified that there was no need for him to do that, and that he wanted to forget about fighting as he didn't want to spoil that demoness plan. Coco Lai was furiously approaching him, and was startled when Taba Zengo uttered it should be about the timing. He yawned and wondered why the fight between Ling Si and the White Bone Temptress took too long. Coco Lai was a bit confused because her opponent's movement speed was incredible, and she inquired what he was talking about. Taba Zengo rambled that it was nothing and knew that explaining would take too much effort. Furthermore, she didn't need to know. He willingly wanted to get defeated by her and instructed her to kill him immediately. After she tells him the complete story, the protagonist is dumbfounded and inquires if she obediently obeys Taba Zengo's commands. She affirmed because that guy was acting way too smug back then that she had to kill him, and she made his head explode with an arrow without a second thought. From the look of all the incidents, the protagonist could tell that the moment Coco Lai landed and killed Blow was the moment the match was decided between White Bone Temptress and him. Coco Lai was so furious at Taba Zengo, and just thinking about that dumb, droopy half-awake expression pissed her off, so she wanted to kill him again when she saw him. The protagonist realizes that White Bone Temptress is lost on purpose, which makes him fired up for the third round. Coco Lai furiously told him how furious she was at that guy and asked if he was listening to her. She rambled that the next time she saw Taba Zengo, 
she would go all out and kill him because that type of person was just asking to be killed. He sighed to see how frustrated she was. He said he understood what she was trying to say and assured her he would kill Tabazengo the next time. With the number one guild, Thousand Autumns, out of the picture, and with the number two guild, Divine Chamber, playing it safe. Ling Si and Coco Lai held first place in the second round, with Divine Chamber following behind them and trying had to get second place. In the process, they encountered Student Inch once, which pissed off Coco Lai as it was awful timing. She was in a bad mood, so she said it was best that they didn't waste their time saying anything stupid and that they should pick one option, fight or scram. Her expression was genuinely awful, which concerned Student Inch's comrades, and they wondered if she was having some problem. They had already lost to that thief once, so now, in addition to Nebulous Vice Guild Master Coco Lai, they were pretty threatened. The man feared he would drag his senior inch down because he was not good enough, so he assumed playing safe and securing their points would be better. Student Inch agreed with him, and using the casualties of war skill, he created a wall and assumed it would be able to hold them back while they would run away. The warrior was amazed as he didn't know that his senior skill could be used this way too. Coco Lai was out of control and angrily attacked them with her magical arrows, wanting them to die. The protagonist was amazed to know that an angry woman is genuinely terrifying. But it was good as things turned out like this, which saved them from much trouble. Student Inch avoided confrontation because of the importance of gaining points for this round. So with 126 additional keys, Nebulus obtained a thousand torch fires and a bonus reward of 12,600 torch fires in round 2 for a total of 13,600 torch fires. As both Thousand Autumn and Divine Chamber scored Zo Torch Fire once, Ling Si and Coco Lai took first place after having their mood messed up by Thousand Autumn. Currently on the final leaderboard, Nebulus was undisputedly in the lead for coming in second place in the first round and first place in the second round. While Thousand Autumn and Divine Chamber were no longer at the top of the leaderboard, no one doubted the possibility of them climbing back up in the coming third round with their abilities. Everyone was excited for the third round because Nebulus had become the center of attention. So, all the players of Heavenland have placed unprecedented expectations on that mysterious thief from Nebulus before the initiation of the third round. White Temptress was sitting in her resting room looking at the screen when Tabazengo appeared and was yawning. He was stunned as round two took so long, and he thought the thief would have wrapped things up quickly. Hearing him yawning, Temptress assumed that getting killed right from the beginning should have allowed him to sleep as much as he wanted. Tabazengo comes to their senses and is startled to see that she is still searching. He has never seen her so interested in someone else. She just found Ling Si quite interesting. Furthermore, his skill set and abilities are not like those of the other pros they usually come across. She didn't know how she should put this, but Ling Si always seemed to be able to bring surprises to the table. In short, he was an interesting one, and she assumed Zengo wouldn't understand this. Taba Zengo wondered if Ling Si was indeed that strong, as she almost made him curious about him. His name was not on the Heavenland Thief ranking though, and he wondered if it could be that he was even more potent than the top three thieves there. Whitebone Temptress agreed that being among the top three on the Heavenland Thief ranking was pretty good, but she knew that not everyone was in it for fame and attention. This made Taba Zengo curious about Ling Si's personality, and he guessed that he would have to secure him himself in the next round. White Temptress said that would make her and Zengo love rivals, which confused him as he doesn't swing it that way. White Temptress instructed him not to be in a hurry to deny that as he might never know that he would like guys and urged him to let go as they have rested enough. Taba Zengo gets annoyed at how she treats him like a little child, but she doesn't care much about it and instructs him to leave as it's the right time. The third round is about to be inaugurated, and the viewership of the competition has reached unforeseen heights. Soon, the protagonist and Coco Lai reach the location using the teleportation portal and are stunned to see the representatives of Thousand Autumn and Divine Chamber there. Student Inch thought it was perfect timing that Ling Si arrived and remarked that the last round was truly vexing. Coco Lai wondered if this would be a free-for-all event, and they received the notification that all types of combat were forbidden on this map and that the third round would begin once all teams had entered. Student Inch was also surprised that there wouldn't be any fighting in the third round. Soon, the notification appeared, informing them that the third round of unsheathing the sword would commence soon. 
After the team arrived, they were warmly welcomed to the third round of the special torch fire battle, the sword draw. The game creator knew they would be exhausted after the last two rounds, so he wanted them to rest assured that the previous round would be a statistics test, so there would be no combat. Coco Lai was startled to know it would be a statistics test, and wondered what sort of statistics would be tested then, and Ling Si was also not sure about that. White Temptress approached them and rambled that it would be something to do with their abilities. She guessed they would be scored based on a capability test and went straight to Ling Si. Coco Lai was shocked to see Thousand Autumn White Bone Temptress go to the protagonist and inquire why he had gotten involved with this woman. The protagonist clarified that she was the one who was clinging to him and was a bit embarrassed by her getting lost in him. White Temptress expressed her passion and love toward Ling Si as she had a great time with him in the last round, which was practically love at first sight. She was glad as it was good that Ling Si was the passive type, but she preferred to be the active one. Coco Lai was mortified at seeing how shallow she was and remarked that this sort of woman would toss a guy like Ling Si away after she was done toying with him. So, she instructs the protagonist to be more careful and reminds him of Stillwater's high hopes for him. She didn't think he would be like that and thought she must tell Tiana to discipline her underlings well after this battle. The protagonist is trying to escape White Temptress and explains that he has been falsely accused and is concerned that the woman is such a hassle to him. White Temptress teased Coco Lai by making a strange face and clarified that they do not need someone like her to butt in their relationship. Student Inch witnessed this all and asked Taba Zengo if Thousand Autumn was planning to have a marriage alliance with Nebulus. Taba Zengo was embarrassed and requested not to ask him about things that had to do with that woman. The rules of this round of the sword draw were that each team would be granted two halves to draw out the sword which lay in the stone gates. All the players were allowed to use their strength and skills to draw the sword out. The size of the sword drawn out by each person will vary based on strength and method. All of them were reading the description and visualizing what they had to do, and then the next notification appeared. Regardless of the sword size, the player was instructed to strike the stone gate with the sword in hand, and there were no restrictions to the method that could be used. The protagonist wondered what kind of round it was since he was a thief who had never touched a sword before, so he asked how he was supposed to do that. Torch fire to all the players will be rewarded based on the cut size, and the amount of torch fire rewarded represents the sword draw value. Finally, once every team has used up their two chances to draw the sword, the torch fire obtained will result from the third round. Then, all the torch fires will be counted towards the total tally and requested to line up according to the randomly assigned order issued by the system in front of the platform for the words to be drawn. Then, all of them were allotted their number, and White Temptress was excited to see Ling Si's number, which was 621. She thought that in a test like this, the later he would go, the better it would be. She was annoyed and was given the 114 number. Her partner, Taba Zengo, called him to return to her position. Coco Lai found the third round quite exciting, but what concerned her was that neither of them was a warrior. She supposed that the warriors there would probably be secretly giddy with happiness because drawing swords was second nature to them. The protagonist instructed her to read the rules carefully as that wouldn't be the case, and then he read them so they could use their strength and skill to draw the sword out. Ling Si was confident that even though these two lines may sound straightforward, they had a much deeper meaning. But she didn't get such a feeling, so he emphasized that they could use their strength and skills without restrictions on the method. In other words, he explained that this is not their regular draw the sword out because players are meant to put more thought into it. They should consider how to use their skill and what they are good at to draw the sword out. Similarly, they will also have to think about how they want to strike the stone gate. Finally, Coco Lai gets what he meant by saying this was a test of their techniques. Conversely, Whitebone Temptress was still concerned as they were given number 114 quite early. Since it was a sword draw competition, she thought their win would have to be up to Taba Zengo now. Meanwhile, Divine Chamber representatives were pleased as they were both warriors. The warrior thought it would give him and his senior inch a great advantage in the sword draw competition. He felt that fortune was in their favor and was certain that Divine Chamber would surely rise to the top this time and be at the top in the first place. Student Inch was concerned. Even though he was a warrior, his main angle was shield and defense, which might not be advantageous for him. 
but with both of them being warriors, he was confident that they wouldn't hold back because of a teammate's lack of ability this time. Student Inch wanted to show Nebulous and Thousand Autumns the true power of his guild's divine chamber. Soon, the sword draw competition began, and team number one was requested to step up. Team number one consists of a mage, and one of them forced the other to go first as this round sucks, and they can't get why they get assigned to go first. His companion was terrified and confused, yet he agreed to go first and knew he had to pull out the sword. He doesn't want them to underestimate their talent just because they are mages, and he puts his hand in the stone gate. All the other players were excitedly staring at them as he reached in. One of the players was cheering him or his spirit. Even though they were opponents, he wanted him to do his best. Some other players were astounded to see his guts, as they knew it was too easy to go first. The protagonist applauded him as he had the right attitude, but he knew he didn't understand it because he didn't use magic. Coco Lai was also trying to see him, but she couldn't see anything because she wasn't tall enough. After trying hard for some time, he started crying as the sword wasn't budging out, and he couldn't get any reaction no matter what he did. He supposed there was nothing he could do. He pulled out his arm and was crying as he managed to get hold of it after reaching in, but he couldn't seem to pull it out, so he apologized to his partner. His partner was concerned, thinking he would also be unable to do anything. The players were shocked to know that such a thing could also happen and wondered if there was another condition that they had to fulfill. Soon, Team 1's final result was declared, but it failed because neither could retrieve the sword. The player assumed that rather than unfulfilled conditions, it was probably because they did not meet a certain stat's minimum value. One of the players wondered if it could strength and was worried, thinking what he would do as he is a mage and thought he was going to get screwed by this round. The team that followed continued to fail, and it wasn't until a mage from team number 15, who was from a well-known workshop, went forth that the players were elucidated. They were from the Mana Farmer workshop, which was pretty strong, so all the players wanted to see how they would do it. The Mana Farmer's workshop player remarked that all the previous players were brainless idiots, and he wanted to show them how this game is meant to be played. The player lifted his weapon, and using his skill, Stormbringer tried to take out his sword, but soon it came out. This shocked all the other players, they didn't know they could use their skills to help pull the sword. The player now gets it, like how a thief can use items like bombs to create a knockback force. In other words, their skill usage must be creative and versatile. The mage from the Mana Farmer workshop wanted all the other players to thank him for his demonstration. Then, with Gravitron wind pressure, hurried and struck the stone gate and obtained 3220 torch fire. The players were excited because now they knew how to clear this round, and then mages didn't have anything to fear. The protagonist smirked as this was exactly how he thought, and if that was the case, then there was nothing to worry about. With that burst of inspiration, the team that followed finally obtained positive results and all obtained enormous torch fire. The competition became a spectacular display of how players of all types would draw out the sword. Meanwhile, there was a little disparity in the final score until that woman, White Bone Temptress from Thousand Autumn, stepped up. Coco Lai wanted to have a good look at what that vamp would pull out this time. Temptress was also excited since it was her turn. 